History of English Literature By Andrew Lang Preface A preface to a book on the history of English literature is apt to be an apology, for a writer must be conscious of his inability to deal with a subject so immense and so multiplex in its aspects. This volume does not pretend to be an encyclopedia of our literature, or to include all the names of authors and of their works. Selection has been necessary, and in the fields of philosophy and theology but a few names appear. The writer, indeed, would willingly have omitted not a few of the minor authors in pure literature, and devoted his space only to the masters. But each of these springs from an underwood, as it were, of the thought and effort of men less conspicuous, whom it were ungrateful, and is practically impossible, to pass by in silence. Nevertheless the attempt has been made to deal most fully with the greatest names. The author's object has been to arouse a living interest, if it may be, in the books of the past, and to induce the reader to turn to them for himself. Scantiness of space forbids the presentation of extracts, for poetry there is perhaps no better selection than that of the Oxford Book of Verse by Sir Arthur Quiller Couch.1 for prose, the anthologies of Mrs. Barnett and Mrs. Dale may be recommended.2. It is unhappily the fact that the works of a majority of the earlier authors are scarcely accessible except in the publications of learned societies or in very limited editions. But from Chaucer onwards the Globe editions are open to all, and the great Cambridge History of English Literature is invaluable as a guide to the bibliography. It is better to study even a little of the greatest authors than to read many books about them. If the writer should perchance succeed in bringing any readers to the works of the immortals his purpose will be fulfilled but readers, like poets and anglers, are born to be so. And when born under a fortunate star do not need to be allured or compelled to come into the muse's paradise. That sins of commission as well as of omission will be discovered the author cannot doubt, for through much reading and writing they that look out of window are darkened, and errors come. How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. I. Anglo-Saxon Literature The literature of every modern country is made up of many elements, contributed by various races, and has been modified at different times by foreign influences. Thus, among the ancient Celtic inhabitants of our islands, the peoples whom the Romans found here, the Welsh have given us the materials of the famous romances of King Arthur. And from the Gaelic tribes of Ireland and Scotland come the romances of heroes less universally known, Finn, Dermot, Cuchulain, and the rest. But the main stock of our earliest poetry and prose, like the main stock of our language, is Anglo-Saxon. The Anglo-Saxon tribes who invaded Britain, and after the departure of the Romans, for eleven, conquered the greater part of the island, must have had a literature of their own, and must have brought it with them over sea. For all early peoples, even the least civilized, possess the germs of literature. They have their hymns to their divine father above the sky, and to gods and spirits, they have magic songs, to win the love of women, or to cause the deaths of men. They have love songs, and songs of feats of war. They possess fairy tales, and legends in prose concerning gods and fabulous heroes, they have tales of talking birds and beasts. And they have dances in which the legends of old heroes are acted and sung. These dances are the germ of the drama, the songs are the germs of lyric poetry, the beast stories are the sources of books like Aesop's fables and Ovid's metamorphoses. And the fairy tales are the earliest kind of novels. The Anglo-Saxon invaders were, of course, on a very much higher level than that of savages. They were living in the age of iron, they did not use bronze for their swords, spears, and axes. Much more remote were they from the period of stone axes, stone, knives, and stone arrowheads. They could write, not in the Roman alphabet, but in, runes, adapted at some unknown time by the Germanic peoples, probably from the Greek characters. And there is no reason why they should not have used this writing to preserve their poetry, though it is not certain that they did so at this early, period. 
One early Anglo-Saxon poem, indeed, The Husband's Message, professes to be written in runic characters on a staff or tablet of wood. Even more ancient poems may have been written and preserved in this way, but the wood, the B.O.C. book, as it was called, has perished, while brief runic inscriptions on metal and on stone remain. The Anglo-Saxon Way of Living The society of the Anglo-Saxons, as described in the oldest surviving poems, was like that of the early Irish about A.D. 200 as depicted in their oldest romances, and like that of the early Icelanders as painted in the sagas, or stories of 1100, and later. Each free man had his house, with its large hall, and a fire in the center. In the hall, usually built of timber, the people ate and passed their time when not out of doors, and also slept at night, while there were other rooms, probably each was a small separately roofed house, for other purposes. The women had their bower, the married people had their little bed closets off the hall, and there were storerooms. The house stood in a wide yard or court, where geese and other fowls were kept. It was fenced about with a palisade, or a bank and hedge. Tilling the soil, keeping cattle, hunting, and war and raiding, by sea and land, were the occupations of the men, the women sewed and span, and kept house. A group of such homesteads, each house well apart from its neighbors, made the village or settlement, there were no towns with streets, such as the Romans left in Britain. A number of such villages were united in the tribe, each tribe had its king, while the other chief men, the richest and best born, constituted a class of gentry. Later, tribes were gathered into small kingdoms, with a Bertwalda, or overlord, the most powerful of the kings, at the head of all. This kind of society is almost exactly the same as that which Homer describes among the Greeks, more than a thousand years before Christ. As in Homer, each Anglo-Saxon king had his gleeman, scop, or minstrel, who sang to his household and to the guests in hall. The songs might be new, of his own making, or lays handed down from of old. We shall see that the longer Anglo-Saxon poems, before Christianity came in, were stories about fabulous heroes, or real kings of times past, concerning whom many fables were told. Most of these tales, or myths, were not true. They were mere ancient, fairy stories, in which sometimes real but half-forgotten warriors and princes play their parts. The traditions, however, were looked on as being true, and the listeners to the glee men thought that they were learning history as well as being amused. Meanwhile any man might make and sing verses for his own pleasure, about his own deeds and his own fancies, sorrows, and loves. There was no lack of old legends of times before the English invasion of Britain, or of legends quite fabulous about gods and heroes. We know from Roman and early Christian authors, that the other Germanic peoples, on the continent, had abundance of this material for poetry, thus the Germans sang of Arminius, the Lombards sang of Alboin, or Elfwine, died A.D. 573, and the Scandinavians and Germans had legends of Attila, the great Hun conqueror, in the 5th century, and of Sigurd, who slew Fafner, the snake man, of the vengeance of Brynhild, and all the other adventures of the Volsungs and Niblungs. In Germany fashioned, much later, into the famous Nibelungenlied. Point three. The Anglo-Saxons, too, knew forms of these legends, and mentioned the heroes of them in their poetry. Thus there is no reason why the Anglo-Saxons should not have produced poems as magnificent as those of the early Greeks, except that they, like all other peoples, had not the genius of the Greeks for poetry, and for the arts. And had not their musical language, and glorious forms of verse. They were a rough country folk, and for long did not, like the Greeks, live in towns. But even if they had possessed more genius than they did, much of their old literature would probably have been lost when they became Christians. And when the clergy, who had, most to do with writing, generally devoted themselves only to verses on biblical or other Christian subjects, or to prose sermons, and to learn books in Latin. While plenty of Anglo-Saxon Christian poetry survives, of poetry derived from the heathen times of the Anglo-Saxons there is comparatively little, and much of it has been more or less rewritten, and affected by later changes and additions. In Early Christian Times 
The fragments of old poetry enable us to understand the poetic genius of our remote ancestors as it was before they had wholly adopted Christianity, or come under Latin, French, and Norman influences. From the descendants of the Britons whom they had conquered, or who survived as their Welsh neighbours, they seem, at this time, to have borrowed little or nothing in the way of song or story. Before beginning to try to understand the Anglo-Saxon literature, we ought to set before our minds two or three considerations. Though the language of these very old poems is the early form of our own English, we cannot understand them except in translations, unless we learn Anglo-Saxon. However well a translator may render the ideas of a poem, he cannot give the original words of it in another language. Now the poet's very own words have a beauty and harmony and appropriateness which a translation cannot reproduce. The ideas remain, but the essence of the poem is lost, gone is the vigor, the humor is weakened, the harmony is impaired. Once more we are accustomed to rhyme, and to certain forms of versification in our poetry. The early Anglo-Saxons did not employ rhyme, the peculiar cadence, with alliteration, of their verse cannot easily be reproduced, and there is much difference of opinion as to the prosody or scansion of Anglo-Saxon verse. Thus, till we can read Anglo-Saxon easily, and while we only read its poetry through translations, we are apt to think less highly of it than it deserves. Again, the ideas and manners of the Anglo-Saxons were not like our own in many details. Their poets did not write for us, but for men of their own time, whose taste and ways of thinking and living were in many respects very different from ours. If many people cannot now take pleasure in the novels of Fielding, Scott, Miss Austen, Thackeray, and Dickens, the novels of 1745-1870, because these seem so old-fashioned, they will certainly be unable to admire the poetry of 500-800. Yet it may be excellent poetry, when we put ourselves as far as we can in the place of the hearers for whom it was composed. If we fail to do this we may read Anglo-Saxon poetry as a matter of history, but, as poetry, we cannot enjoy it. Minstrels, Storytellers, and Stories Perhaps the oldest of the Anglo-Saxon poems is that called, Widsith, after the name of the far-traveled minstrel or gleeman who sang it before the people in the hall of a prince or noble. This short poem tells us what kind of tales the people liked to hear. It begins. Widsith spoke. His word hoard unlocked. That is, he opened his treasure of stories as a traveling peddler opens his box of goods. He says that he has wandered, gathering songs and tales, all over the world from the German Ocean to Egypt and India. He means that he knows all, stories. He is merely giving his hearers their choice of a tale about any king and people in the known world. Let us suppose that they choose to hear about Elfwine, or Alboin, king of the Longobards or Lombards, whom Witseth says that he had visited. We know what tales were told of Elfwine. One of these is a fair example of the rest, it is probably not true. Elfwine had killed the father of his wife Rosamund, and had a cup made out of the skull, and he made Rosamund drink out of it at a feast. She determined to be revenged for this cruel insult, and took counsel with the king's shield-bearer and guardsman. By his advice she entrapped Berthio, a very strong man, by a trick, so that he became guilty of high treason. He was now at her mercy, for she threatened to inform against him, and thus compelled him to murder her husband, Elfwine, in his bed. After that, the king's shield-bearer tried to win the kingdom. But Rosamund gave him poisoned wine, and he, when he knew that it was poisoned, made her drink out the cup, and they two died in the same hour. This makes a noble tragic song, but the story is only a form of a much older Greek tale which Herodotus, one thousand years earlier, tells of King Candals of Lydia, of his wife, whom he insulted, and of the captain of his guard. Whom she induced to kill King Candals. Probably an Anglo-Saxon minstrel would recite the poem called, Widsith, and then the listeners would ask him for any of the stories which he had mentioned, perhaps for one about Elfwine, or Alexander the Great. Or Sigurd of the Volsungs, who slew the serpent man, Fafner, or of Hyjlak, who is believed to have been the man named, in Latin, Chocolaicus, a real king of about 520, or of Hrothgar, whom Widsith mentions. This king is befriended by Beowulf, 
in the great Anglo-Saxon poem of that name, the noblest and most famous of all these old songs. The minstrel makes requests for gifts of rings and bracelets, and speaks of his desire to meet generous princes. In the same way Homer loves to tell how golden cups and beautiful swords were given by princes to the minstrels in Greece. The last verses of Widsith run thus, in modern English, and are a fair example of early Anglo-Saxon versification, for S.W.A. Scrithend So wandering on Jesipum Weirfath The world about Glee men gamina Glee men do roam Gian grunda fella Through many lands Thearf seketh They say their needs Thunk word spreekath. They speak their thanks. Simly south of the north. Sure, south or north. Some gemitath. Some one to meet. Get a glon. Of songs to judge. Geofam uncon. And gifts not grudge. There are few early Anglo Saxon poems that can be called lyrics, they are rather narratives, as in the case of the Songs of War the battles of Brunnenburg and Malden. Or, elegiac, and reflective, as in, the ruined city, though personal emotion, a characteristic of the lyric, often appears in the Christian poems and elsewhere as we shall see. Beowulf, the chief poem may be called a brief epic, a narrative of over three thousand lines, on great heroic adventures. Such a poem would be sung in hall, to beguile more than one long winter night. Beowulf it is impossible to be certain about the date when the original form of this great old poem, Beowulf, was first composed, because it contains, on the one hand, descriptions of the ancient heathen way of living, thinking, manners, and customs. And, on the other hand, has many allusions to Christian doctrine, which the Anglo-Saxons knew nothing of till after they had quite conquered this country. The poet of Beowulf, as it now exists, had read the Bible, or knew part of its contents. We must look first at the poem as it stands, and the story as it is told, or rather at the stories, for there are several. One Beowulf, not our hero, was the son of Seyld. Seyld died, and, in place of Christian burial, was placed in his ship, with arms and treasures, and so sailed out to sea at the wind's will. Not so, when his time came, was our Beowulf buried. That is, Beowulf the hero of the poem, for the earlier Beowulf, son of Seyld, was another man. The grandson of Seyld was Hrothgar, whose name becomes Roger in later times, and Hrothgar was a Danish king, builder of Hirat, a princely hall. His happiness awoke the envy of Grendel, a fiend of the wilds. The Christian author of the poem, as it stands, thinks that Grendel and other monsters are descendants of Cain. The nobles slept in the great hall, whither Grendel came and caught away thirty of them. Men sought other sleeping rooms, but Grendel still came and slew them. The house was empty, and men promised sacrifices to their false gods all in vain, they knew not the true God, yet the poet often forgets their ignorance, and makes them speak like Christians. There was a king of Gothland named Hyjlak. A real king living at the beginning of the sixth century. The king's nephew, Beowulf, heard of the evil deeds of Grendel, and set sail with some of Hyjlak's men to help the unhappy Hrothgar. They all wore shirts of mail made curiously of interlaced iron rings, they had spears with iron heads, and helmets crowned with the figure of a boar made in iron, some of these shirts of chain mail and helmets still exist. Coming into the great hall, built of timber plated with gold, the heroes explained their errand, and were well received. As Grendel cannot be harmed with stroke of steel, Beowulf will carry neither sword nor shield, but be slain by Grendel. Or slay him with his hands. If Grendel eats him, Hrothgar will not need to give him due burial, burning his body, and burying the bones in a mound of earth, the custom is that of the unconverted German tribes. Hrothgar accepts the offer, the warriors sit at their ale, they had not much wine, and listen to the clear voice of the minstrel as he sings of old adventures. But Hunferth, a thane of Hrothgar, out of jealousy, taunts Beowulf with having been beaten in a swimming match that lasted for seven nights. Beowulf replies that Hunferth has drunk too much beer, 
he himself swam better than his opponent for five nights, and slew nine sea monsters with his sword. Hunferth, on the other hand, dare not face Grendel, and has been the destroyer of his own brothers. Yet Hunferth does not draw his sword, after these insults, which is strange, and the feast and hall goes on merrily. Such scenes of boasting and quarrelling were, no doubt, common over the ale cups, but Waltho, Queen of Hrothgar, the golden garlanded lady, the peace weaver, enters the throng, and bears the cup of welcome to Beowulf. Thanking God that she has found a helper to her heart's desire. Then she takes her place by her lord Hrothgar. Night fell, Beowulf, committing himself to the all-knowing God, takes off his armor and lays his head on the bolster, the word is the same in Anglo-Saxon. Grendel arrived, burst in the iron-bolted door, and laughed as he saw the sleeping men. One warrior he tore to pieces and devoured. But Beowulf, who had the strength of thirty, gripped the fiend, and the hall echoed with their wrestling and stamping up and down, the clamped benches were torn from the floor. Men smote at Grendel with swords, but the steel did not bite on his body. Beowulf tore his arm and shoulder clean away, and Grendel, flying to a haunted pool, described as a terrible place, dived down through the blood-stained water, and hell caught hold of him. In here it men now made merry, and the minstrel sang a new song of the fight. After, the rejoicings, eight horses and princely armor are given to Beowulf. The minstrel sings of the hero Finn, with a pleasant description of the coming of spring after a long winter. The poem is not all about fiends and fighting, the descriptions of wild rocks and seas, and of happy nature, are beautiful. Then the gracious wife of Hrothgar bids Beowulf farewell, giving him a cup of gold. Other presents are offered, and on so happy a day, wine, not ale, is drunk in hall. But Beowulf's adventure is not ended. That night he slept, not in hall, but in a separate room, and the mother of Grendel, a creature more terrible than himself, came to avenge her son, and slew a warrior. Next day Hrothgar described to Beowulf the home of the fiends. They abode in dark wolf-haunted places, windy nesses, or headlands, wild marshlands, where the hill stream rushes through black shadows into a pool or perhaps sea inlet, under the earth. The boughs of trees hang dense over the water, and at night a fire shines from it. Even the stag that ranges the moors, when he flies from the hounds to the lake, dies rather than venture there to take the water. This is a fine example of the descriptions of nature in the poem. Beowulf is not alarmed, we must all die at last, he says, but while we live we should try to win glory. So they all rode to the haunted pool, Beowulf in his iron armor and helmet. The man who had insulted him now repents, and gives Beowulf the best of iron swords, named Hrunting, for famous swords in these days had names, like King Arthur's Blade, Excalibur, or Roland's Durendal. I will gain glory with Hrunting, or death shall take me, says Beowulf. 5. Beowulf dived into the black water, the fiend strove to crush him, but his iron shirt of mail protected him, and she dragged him into the dreadful hall, her home, where the water did not enter. A strange light burned. Beowulf saw his hideous foe and smote at her with fronting, but the edge did not bite on her body. He threw away the useless sword, and they wrestled, they fell, Beowulf was under her, and she drew her short sword. She could not pierce his armor, but he saw and seized a huge sword, made for a giant in times long ago. With this he cut her down from the neck to the breastbone, and his friends on shore saw the pool turn to blood. All but his own men had believed that Beowulf was dead, and had gone home. Meanwhile the blade of the great sword melted away in the poisoned blood of his foe, and he swam to shore with the hilt, and with the heads of the two monsters, Grendel and his mother. With these he came gloriously to Hrothgar, who wondered at that sword hilt, covered with plates of gold, engraved with a poem in runic letters, for the poet is fond of describing beautiful swords and armor. Hrothgar now made a long speech about the goodness of God, which, of course, is a Christian addition to the poem. Beowulf gave back hunting to Hunferth, saying no word against the weapon though it had been of no service. Then they all departed in high honor, and their swift ship under sail cut the sea into foam as she flew homeward. 
In time Hijlak and his son fell in battle, and Beowulf was for fifty years the shepherd of the people. The last adventure of his old age was a fight with a fiery dragon which dwelt among the golden treasures in an ancient burial mound. In the tomb, says the poet, there is no sound of swords or harness, no joy of the harp. The good hawk flits not through the hall, the swift horse does not beat the ground at the gate. Anglo-Saxon poetry is full of the melancholy of death, and of mournful thoughts awakened in presence of the ruined homes of men long dead. In his last fight in his best fight, Beowulf, with a young prince to aid him, slew the fire drake, but he was mortally hurt by its poisonous flaming breath, and spoke his latest words, Bid the brave men pile up a mound for me. High and far seen on the headland, that seafaring men in time to come may call it Beowulf's mound. These are almost the very words of the ghost of the dead oarsman, Elpiner, to Odysseus in Homer. So much has been said about the poem of Beowulf, because it is by far the greatest poem that the Anglo Saxons have left to us, and best shows how they lived. From Beowulf, we learn that our ancestors lived almost exactly as did the ancestors of the Greeks, in Homer's poems, made perhaps 1,600 years before the making of Beowulf. Both these ancient Greeks and our own ancestors had, and expressed in poetry, the same love, of life and of the beauty of the world, and the same belief that, after death, hope was hopeless, and joy was ended. Both had the same sense of the mystery of existence, and, when they took time to think, had the same melancholy. Our poetry thus began like that of Greece, and, in the end, became the rival of the greatness of Greece. We know from broken pieces of these old songs which have come down to us that the Anglo-Saxons, like their German neighbors on the continent, had even better stories than Beowulf. But they have been lost, and Beowulf was perhaps saved by the Christian parts of it, which must have been put in by someone who wrote it over again after the Anglo-Saxons were converted, the language is like what was spoken and written about 750. One beautiful poem is, The Ruined City. The minstrel, beholding the desolation of the towers and baths of some Roman town which the Anglo-Saxons have overthrown, laments its fall and the perishable state of human fortunes. Other poems may be briefly mentioned. The Wanderer in The Wanderer, there is abundance of gloom, but it is a less noble poem than The Ruined City, for the speaker is in sorrow, not for the griefs of all mankind, but for his own. He is an exile, homeless, in fact a tramp, Erdstipa. He has lost his lord, his patron, and dreams of his kindness, in the old happy days. And wakens, an aged man, friendless, to see the snow falling in the ocean, and the seabirds flitting with their white wings through the snow. The house where he had been young has fallen, and he laments over the ruins. The Plaint of Dürr. This complaint is also rueful, but it is manly. The poet cock to mind old heroes and heroines, such as Welland, remembered still as Wayland Smith, in Scots, Kenilworth, who suffered many misfortunes, but endured them bravely. The poem is in stanzas, each ending with the burden or refrain. That evil he overcame. So may I this. It is like the often repeated word of Odysseus in Homer. Endure my heart. Worse hast thou endured. One sorrow of the poet is that his lord has taken from him the land which he held as a minstrel, and given it to another singer. Now he is in new trouble. That I surmounted. So may I this. Probably there were many other poems with refrains, or recurring lines at the end of each stanza, this is a very old poetic device, originally the refrains were sung in chorus by the listeners as they danced to the music of the minstrels. The Seafarer In this poem, as in, Beowulf, the sea is spoken of as it would be by men who knew its wild moods, cold, tempest, biting salt water, danger, and grey waves under driving rain, yet the seafarer loves, it. The poet says that, like the gentlemen of England, who live at home at ease. Many a one knows not the dangers of the deep, while the minstrel has heard the swan sing through the ice-cold showers of hail and the spindrift. But the coming of spring and the cuckoo's cry, admonish the brave man to go seafaring, despite the distresses, they are more inspiriting than life on land. He is a Christian, 
but he falls back on the old melancholy for the passing of kings and gold givers. Though he preaches over much, he still thinks of the bale fire as the mode of burial, as if Christian rites of earth to earth were not yet adopted. Wald here. Of this poem only some sixty lines exist. They were found at Copenhagen, written on two pieces of vellum which had been used in binding a book, it is common to find fragments of early printed books or manuscripts in the bindings of books more recent. One page of Wald here contains a speech by the heroine of the tale, Hildegoth, urging Wald here to fight Gut here, the other fragment has portions of a dialogue between the two combatants. The names of the personages show that the poem was one of which we have other versions, the most intelligible is a Latin form in verse.6 The story deals with an adventure, real or romantic, in the wars of Attila with the Franks. Wald here, an Aquitanian hostage, brought up in Attila's court, with his betrothed lady, Hildegoth, daughter of the king of the Burgundians, is now keeper of Attila's treasures, he and his friend Hagen escape. Hagen, who first fled, reached the court of Guthir, king of the Franks, and hearing there that a lady and a knight, with a treasure, are wandering about, he recognizes his friends, and follows them with King Guthir, who mainly wants the treasure. And with eleven other warriors. Hildegoth sees them coming, and Waldhir, who will not give up the treasures, slays the eleven companions of Guthir, who are chivalrous enough to set him man for man, as the Scottish ballad says, in place of overpowering him by numbers. Hagen, of course, does not want to fight his friend Wald here, but fate, the Anglo-Saxon W.I.R.D., is too strong, Wald here has to encounter both Gut here and Hagen, for Hagen is Guther's man, or Thane, and may not disobey him. Moreover, he must avenge his nephew, whom Wald here has already slain. All three men receive terrible wounds, and then they make friends, and Wald here keeps both his lady and the treasure. This version of the story is more like a later romance than the other Germanic epics. In these, as in this tale, there is usually a tragic conflict of passions and duties, as when the law of blood vengeance compels a woman to avenge a slain father or brother, or her husband or her lover. The end is always tragic, but the Latin poet has probably contrived a happy ending, while retaining the many good fights, and the conflict of friendship and duty to a hero's lord, which make the interest of the story. In the Anglo-Saxon fragments, Hildegoth, encouraging, her lover to fight, praises the swordsmith, the old German hero, Welland, the Tubal Cain of the race. He made the sword miming, the best of all swords, which never fails the fighter. Hildegoth has never seen Waldhir flee the fight, now he must not be less noble than himself. The other fragment is like the dialogues of the heroes in the Iliad before they come to blows. The whole of Wald here must have been, when complete, a poem much more complex, and even more interesting, at least to modern readers, than Beowulf. It had love interest, a brave heroine, good duels, and the tragic conflict of duties, while it was full of allusions to other ancient epics of the Germanic peoples. The Fight at Finsburg In a song of the Gleeman at Hrothgar's house in Beowulf, there are obscure references to the slaying of Naif, brother of Hildebur, wife of the Frisian king Finn, and the slaying of Hildebur's own sons by the men of Naif. In a fight within the royal hall of Finn. They are all burned together on the funeral pyre, while Hildebur weeps for sons and brother. A fragment of an Anglo-Saxon epic on this affair exists only in one copy, the original is lost. It is a complicated story of slayings and revenges among folk akin by marriage, and the interest clearly lay in the tragic situation of Hildebur, who owes vengeance against her husband, Finn, and also against the family of her brother. Who have slain her sons? As Hildebur returns to her own people, the Danes, after her husband is killed, she probably preferred her own blood kindred to those of her husband. 2. Anglo-Saxon Christian Poetry when the Anglo-Saxons became Christians, 597-655, they took the gospel, and the rules of the church, in the north, from the Irish missionaries who, under St. Columba of Ireland, settled in the Isle of Iona, in the south from Roman teachers, such as Theodore of Tarsus, who had studied at Athens, and, in 668 became Archbishop of Canterbury. Both in the south, and north, 
In Northumberland, great schools were established, in connection with the monkish settlements, in the monasteries Greek was not unknown, and the language of Rome, Latin, was taught and was used in writing all learned works, and hymns. With the language of Rome, almost dead as a living speech, came knowledge of ancient history, and of the great Roman poets, especially Virgil. The 7th and 8th centuries were thus a new epoch, a century of learning, and of division between the educated and the unlearned. The learned, mainly priests, no longer cared much for making songs and stories about fighting, love, and the adventures of their heathen heroes. They were occupied with the history of Rome and of the Old World. And still more with their new religion, and the stories of apostles and saints and Hebrew kings and patriarchs, and with the making of sermons and hymns. Thus the old heathen tales and poems were lost or half forgotten. Cadman The first sacred poet of whom we hear is Cadman. His tale is told by the great and learned Bede, born at Wearmouth in Northumberland in 673, and trained in the new monastery there. Says Bede, there was in the monastery of Asti. Hilda at Whitby, a brother who, when he heard the scriptures interpreted, could instantly turn the lesson into sweet verses. Just so the minstrel of Hrothgar, when he heard the nobles talk about Beowulf's defeat of Grendel, turned the story at once into a song. This was improvisation, and Cadman improvised religious poems, no man has equaled them since, says Bede. But he began when he was far from young, and was not yet a priest. Till then he had not been a poet, indeed, if he were at a feast where every man sang in his turn, when the harp was brought to people near him at table, he arose and went home. One night he ran away from the harp into the stalls of the cattle, and there fell asleep on the straw. In a dream one appeared to him, and bade him sing. He answered that he had left the feast because he could not sing. You must sing. About what am I to sing? The beginning of things created. Cadman then made in his sleep a poem about the creation, and when he awoke he remembered it, as Coleridge made Kubla Khan in a dream, and remembered part of it until he was disturbed by a person on business from Porlock. After this Cadman made sacred poems, doing scripture into verse, with perfect ease, and he became a monk. Now there exist long Anglo-Saxon poems on parts of Genesis, Exodus, and Daniel, and it has been very naturally supposed that these are the poems of Cadman, which, as Bede thought, had never been equaled in the Anglian tongue. Nothing is known for certain, and only one short hymn has a good chance to be by the poet Cadman. The ideas of the poet singing of the war in heaven, so closely resemble those of Milton, in Paradise Lost, that Milton has been supposed to have known something of the Anglo-Saxon poem. Seven no lines in Paradise Lost, are more familiar than those which describe a land of fire. Yet from these flames, no light, but rather darkness visible, served only to discover sights of woe. The old Anglo-Saxon poet says, They sought another land, that was devoid of light, and was full of flame. The speech of Satan, too, in Anglo-Saxon, the speech in which he blames the justice of God. His threat of what he would do, were he free for but one winter. His design to avenge himself on Adam and his posterity, are all like Milton, whose fairest of her daughters, Eve, is exactly like the fairest of women that have come into the world. In the fighting scenes of these Anglo-Saxon biblical poems, the poets appear to enjoy themselves most and to feel most at home. They have only to write in the manner of their own old battle songs, about the howling of wolves and crying of ravens to whom the victor gives their meat. Indeed Anglo-Saxon poetry reminds us of an ancient casket of whalebone in the British Museum, with its scenes from the heathen story of Welland or Wayland Smith, the adoration of the Magi, Romulus and Remus and the Wolf. And a battle between Titus and the Jews, such as the mixture of Christianity, heathenism, and learning in the Christian Anglo-Saxon literature. 8. Thus in the long fragment Judith, based on the well-known story of Judith and Holofernes in the Apocrypha, there is vigor in the descriptions of the intoxicated roaring Holofernes, and of the cries of wolf, raven, and eagle. And of the clash of swords and shields. Kinnewulf. The best Christian poem, 
called Christ, is full of the happiness bestowed by the new religion. The verses are by a poet named Kinnawulf of whom nothing is known but his name, recorded in a kind of acrostic written in the runic alphabet. He took his matter from sermons and hymns in Latin, but Kinnawulf makes the poetry his own. He is joyously religious. After all the melancholy of the heathen or half-heathen minstrels, their wistful doubts about the meaning and value of our little life, the author of the Christ comes as one who has seen a great light. He rejoices like the shepherds who heard good tidings of great joy at Bethlehem on the first Christmas night. It is as when spring comes to the world and the thrushes cannot have enough of singing, the night and the darkness are over, the grave has lost its sting and death his victory. The poet is as happy as the birds in March. To him the message of Christ is no old story, but a new certainty, he has no doubt, no fear, and this gladness of faith is all his own, whether he sings of our Lord or of Our Lady. That is the charm of Kinnewulf, his fresh delight in his work. Thou to us. The bright sun sendest. And thyself comest. That thou mayst enlighten. Those who long ago. With vapour covered. And in darkness here. Sat, in continual night. The legends of, Saint Guthlac, and Festi. Juliana, on the other hand, are not, it must be confessed, such spontaneous bursts of song. Andreas. In the, Andreas, the poet, whoever he was, sings of what he has heard, adventures of Saint Andrew and Saint Mark. St. Matthew has fallen into the hands of the cannibals of old Greek legend, the Lestragonians, the poet calls them the, Myrmidonians, point nine. The cannibals have caught, and are about to eat St. Matthew, but the Lord appears first to him, in his dungeon, and then to Saint Andrew, who is living among the Achaeans, in Greece. The voyage, the fighting, are in the old heathen style, and the deity appears with two angels, all three disguised as sailors. It is impossible to give the whole tale, which appealed to the natural man as a great story of adventure in waves and war, while it introduced religion. The adventures are many, and much more startling and wild than any that survive from the Anglo-Saxon poetry of heathen times. Dream of the Rood There is a singular poem, The Dream of the Rood, which with many other, masterless, poems, some critics assign to Kinnewulf, on account of the style, and the deep personal feeling which we admire in the, Christ, others attribute it to Cadman. This opinion was partly based on a curious set of facts. The followers of the great reformer, John Knox, in Scotland, 1560, destroyed almost all the monuments of idolatry, as they called works of Christian art. But they forgot to break to powder a tall ancient cross of red sandstone, beautifully carved, and marked with runic characters, in the church of Ruthwell, near Dumfries. Some eighty years later, 1642, when the Covenanters were in arms against Charles I, the preachers began a new war against works of Christian art, and ordered the Ruthwell cross to be destroyed. It was broken into several fragments, which have now been pieced together, and the cross stands in an apse-shaped building adjoining the church. The runic characters record a part of the poem styled, The Dream of the Rood, and give the inscription, Cadman me made, probably Cadman was really the artist who made and carved the stone cross, indeed the name is rather hard to read. The poem speaks of the author's wonderful dream of the gold-adorned and jeweled true cross, and, in Telim, Kinnewulf also speaks of the revelation to him of the light of the truth of the cross. Conceivably, then, Kinnewulf really had a dream or vision, and became devout after a life of war and minstrelsy. Elin. It would, in that case, be in old age that Kinnewulf wrote, in the Elin, a poetic version of the legend of the discovery of the true cross by Helena, mother of the Emperor Constantine. This poem, probably based on a Latin legend, has been very highly praised. But before we can take any pleasure in it, we must try to think ourselves back into the state of mind of England when the heathen poetry of war was still popular, and Christianity, with many medieval legends, was a fresh inspiration. Even when we have done that as well as we can, the Elin awakens only an historical kind of rapture. The natural man is much more at home with Beowulf and Waldheer than with Elin. The poet begins with an imaginary battle, 
Allied Franks and Huns attacked the Emperor Constantine. The motive of Kinewolf is to introduce plenty of fighting, probably he never fought himself, but like other men of peace, he loves to sing of war. His treatment of war is conventional, he introduces the usual cries of wolf, eagle, and raven. Constantine is encouraged by a dream of a bright being who urges him to trust in God. He also sees a vision of the cross, gay with jewels, as in, the dream of the rude, and letters making the words, in this sign conquer. Then the battle is described, with more zest than originality, and the heathen are routed, many are converted. Helena next takes a large force, and sails to Palestine to look for the true cross. The usual formulae descriptive of a seafaring are employed. Helena preaches to the Jews in the medieval way, and they, naturally, reply, We know not, lady, why you are so angry with us. A crafty Jew, Judas, guesses that she has come to demand from them the true cross, which he is reluctant to give up. Helena threatens to burn the Jews, and does put Judas in a pit, without meat or drink, for seven days. Broken in spirit at last, he says that he will do his best, he prays. A miraculous vapor arises from the spot where, twenty feet underground, three crosses are discovered. Another miracle points out which of the three is the holy rood, Judas is baptized, and the shining nails of the cross are discovered. Then follow the verses in which the poet describes his own old age, and his beholding the true light that lighteneth all men. Riddles Among other poems vaguely assigned, in part, to Kinewolf are riddles. The sword describes itself, so do the burnie, or shirt made of iron rings, the helmet, the shield, and there are many other riddles, some derived from late Latin. The best are really poetical. In addition to the riddles there are several curious magical songs, or charms, for curing diseases, and removing spells of witchcraft. In these there are remains of the old heathen magical songs. Phoenix The phoenix, assigned to Kinewolf as usual, is based on a late Latin poem attributed to Lactantius, 290-325, and ends as an allegory of Christ. It is interesting to observe in the Phoenix a description of an ideal land of peace, where comes not hail or rain or any snow, the picture is borrowed from Homer's lines on Olympus, the home of the gods, and Elysium. The abode reserved for Helen of Troy and Menelaus, in the Odyssey. Anglo-Saxon poetry, without knowing it, came in touch, through Lactantius, with the most beautiful verses in the most ancient poetry of Greece, verses paraphrased in Latin, by Lucretius, and in English by Tennyson, twice, Lucretius. And the, Mort de Arthur, and in, Atlanta, in Caledon, by Mr. Swinburne. The golden thread of ancient Greek poetry thus runs through Roman, Anglo-Saxon, and English literature. 3. Anglo-Saxon Learning and Prose Latin among the Anglo-Saxons Books written on English soil in the Latin language are no part of English literature. It is necessary, however, to notice them, because they testify to the knowledge and taste of the educated. While the ideas expressed in Latin reach the less instructed people through sermons and in conversation, and through the translations into Anglo-Saxon which were directed and in part executed by King Alfred. Though written by a native of our island we may omit the Latin book of Gildas, of about 516 to 570, for he was a Briton of the Romanized sort, who fled to Brittany. His book, where it does not contain mere lamentations, gives a kind of history, very vague, of events in the country, and of the sins and crimes of the British princes down to about 550. Such as the information was, Bede, the great early Anglo-Saxon historian, used it, as did the author of, The History of the Britons, attributed to Nennius, say 800, who, like Gildas, mentions the Battle of Badon Hill, but, unlike Gildas, brings in King Arthur. As we shall see later, Bede does not mention Arthur. Leaving these vague British writers in Latin, we come to Bede. Bede. When we think of the time in which Bede, the greatest of our early scholars, lived and worked, it seems amazing that he had such a wide knowledge of books and so comparatively clear an idea of the way in which history should be written. Born in 673, died 735, 
he was in his thirteenth year when his king, Egfred of Northumbria, was killed by the Peats, practically Gaelic-speaking Highlanders, in the Great Battle of Nectonsmere, 685, in Angus beyond the Tay. For so far into what is now Scotland had English Northumbria pushed her conquests. Great part of these was lost, and in the 8th century, there came an age of anarchy and civil war, as fierce as the contests of the old times of heathendom. To us the Anglo-Saxons of these ages seem barbarous enough, but Bede speaks of the Peats of Scotland as barbarians. He constantly deplores the greed and ignorance of the clergy, in terms much like those used by the Protestants before the Reformation. In an ignorant age Bede wrote unceasingly and copiously about such natural science as was within his reach, especially using that popular and fanciful book of Pliny, Mere Fairy Tales of Natural, or Unnatural, History. He wrote much and usefully on chronology in relation to history, and on theology, of course, he wrote abundantly. Most important is his Church History of the Race of Angles, without which we should know little indeed concerning the Anglo-Saxon invasions of Britain, and the development of events both in England and Scotland. His tale of the reception of Christianity by Edwin is very commonly quoted, it is of much literary interest, and proves that the sense of the mystery and melancholy of the world, so often expressed in Anglo-Saxon poetry, weighed heavily on men who were not poets. A council or witnagamote was held to consider the Christian doctrines preached by Paulinus. One noble, Coifi, said, in jest or earnest, that the heathen religion was useless, for no man among your people does more to please our gods than I, but many are more favored by you and by fortune. Coifi, therefore, voted that Christianity deserved consideration. But another noble, agreeing so far, added, Human life, O king, seems to me to resemble the flight of a sparrow, which flits into your warm hall at a feast in winter weather. The bird flies into the bright hall by one door, and out by another, and after a moment of quiet, slips from the wintry darkness into the wintry darkness again. Such is the life of man, that is for a moment, but what went before, and what comes after, as yet we know not. The practical Coifi then proposed to destroy the old temples of the old gods, rode off, and threw his spear into a shrine. Coifi's idea was merely to change the luck, and to enjoy the pleasures of destruction, he was of a common type of reformers, while the other speaker desired intellectual satisfaction, and the understanding of the mystery of existence. Latin and even Greek learning, we have seen, found footing in southern England with the arrival of Archbishop Theodore and Abbot Hadrian at Canterbury in 669. Latin had never been quite extinct. A non-English writer in Latin, in Scotland, is a Damnon, died 704, author of a life of the Irish Saint Columba, who brought Christianity to the Picts of Scotland, while later from his little holy Isle of Iona missionaries reached Northumbria. A Damnon's book may be read with more pleasure than any other of the time, it is so rich in pictures of highland life and sport on sea and land, and in tales of magic and the second sight. This was one of the works used by Bede in writing his history. The numerous books which were within the reach of Bede were brought, in five journeys, by Benedict Biscop, abbot of Wearmouth, from Rome to Northumberland. Before Bede, such books had been studied by Aldhelm, bishop of Sherburne, died 709. He wrote poetry in the native language, which King Alfred greatly admired, but none of the extant poems are attributed to him. His Latin would have surprised Cicero, he delighted in strange words, and in strings of alliterations. He wrote edifying treatises on Christian virtues as exemplified by biblical characters and by saints, some of them rather fabulous personages. He knew many early Christian authors, and Virgil, Cicero, Ovid, and Lucan, but his own style was as absurdly bombastic as that of many of the ancient Irish romances. He had disciples in style, who manufactured acrostics in Latin verse. The Latin literature of the southern Anglo-Saxons thus fell for a time into full decadence, very different was the learning of the northern Bede. His taste was uncorrupted by the sudden arrival of ancient literature among a people almost barbarous. He wrote in plain Latin without affectation concerning things worthy to be known and remembered, he gave us a frank and charming picture of the great street Cuthbert. He had, no doubt, 
too great a love of miracles, and rather exaggerated some which he found in earlier lives of early English saints, such as the said Cuthbert, the saint of the border, whose body sleeps in Durham Cathedral. The authors whom he quotes are mainly Christian, including many of the chief fathers of the church, and he is not certain about the propriety of studying the heathen classics, though he cannot abstain from Virgil, who, it was fancied, predicted the coming of Christ. He had Greek enough to read the Greek New Testament, but this learning was lost, in England, in later times. The translation of Bede's history into Anglo-Saxon under King Alfred was not the least of his gifts to his people. Alquin Alquin, 735-804, a pupil of the School of York, lived at the worst period of the savage attacks made by the still heathen Danes on England. What the Anglo-Saxons had done to the Britons, the Danes after 780 did to the Anglo-Saxons, slaying, plundering, torturing, and burning, wherever they came. Happily for Alcuin he passed most of his life abroad, aiding the great emperor Charlemagne in founding schools and fostering education. Charlemagne collected the old war songs of his people, little dreaming that in three centuries he would become as fabulous a hero, in the French epic poems of the 11th to the 13th century, as Beowulf or Alboin had been in Germanic lays. Alcuin had far more influence as a lecturer and as a writer of letters than as an author. In a poem he preserves the names of the books in the libraries of York and Wearmouth, beautiful manuscripts that would now be almost priceless, but the Danes burned them all. Other Latin writers there were, they mainly dealt with religious themes, and their works are of very little importance. Alfred Not till the Kingdom of the West Saxons, Wessex, became the most powerful state in England, and made successful resistance to the Scandinavian invaders, who had destroyed monasteries everywhere. Were learning and literature able to raise their heads again? It was the most famous of English kings, Alfred, 849-901, that, among all his other labors as warrior and ruler, restored education. It is unfortunate that so many matters of interest in Anglo-Saxon times are veiled in obscurity. The Life of Alfred, by Asser, a Welshman, Bishop of Sherburne, is a confused record. Alfred was certainly taken to Rome by his father at a very early age, but all that is told on this subject is most perplexing. He is said to have been untaught in the art of reading till he was twelve years old, but he heard Anglo-Saxon poems repeated by others, and knew many of them by heart. The famous tale that his mother offered a book of Anglo-Saxon poems to the first of her sons who should learn it, and that Alfred was taken by the beauty of the illuminations, learned to read, and won the prize is absolutely unintelligible in Asser's Latin. But Asser says, and Alfred, in his preface to an Anglo-Saxon translation of Pope Gregory's pastoral care, himself averse, that learning was almost or quite extinct south of the Humber, when his reign began. While in Northumbria matters were little better. But his father's second wife, Judith, was daughter to the emperor, Charles the Bald, and though Judith, a young girl, was far from being sedate and erudite, the connection with the continent enabled Alfred to bring over Frankish scholars. Such as Grimbald, while from Wales came Asser, who, for part of each year, lived with Alfred as his tutor. The king wrote a handbook, or commonplace book, of Latin extracts, which he translated into his own native tongue, and later he translated, or caused to be translated, the pastoral care of Pope Gregory. The very popular work on Consolation by Boethius, a philosopher who was slain about 524, the Church History of Bede, and a kind of History of the World by Orosius, a Christian writer of the 5th century. Of these books, the History by Bede was of the greatest value for Englishmen, the Consolations of Boethius are at least as consolatory as any others, and were long popular. While whoever reads Orosius will learn many things, though he will learn them wrong, about the whole history of the human race. Still, the Anglo-Saxon reader became aware of the elements of geography, and of the existence of the powers of ancient Assyria, Egypt, Crete and Athens, while much space is devoted to the empire of the Amazons. 10. It is shameful, says Orosius, nobly, 
to speak of such a state of things, when such miserable women, and so foreign, had subdued the bravest men of all this earth, a conquest which the women repeated, he says, during the Peloponnesian War. When Orosius reaches Roman history he is much more copious, and not so amusingly incorrect. Alfred, as a rule, paraphrased rather than translated his originals, omitting and adding at pleasure, and amplifying the geography of the North, by information received through Otheer and Wolfston, contemporary voyagers. He found learning on its deathbed and he restored and revived it, saving erudition from the natural contempt of men by the royal example of a great statesman, sportsman, and warrior. It was plain to the world that, in spite of the human tendency to despise books, learning was not merely an affair for shavelings in cloisters, for the great king himself loved reading and writing. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle To the influence of Alfred is attributed, with much probability, the organization of the earlier parts of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which briefly tells the history of the country from year to year. There were several versions of these annals, containing the most notable events of each year. It seems that copies of one manuscript, containing the remotest events, beginning with the invasion of Britain by Julius Caesar, and going on to Alfred's own age, were given to several monasteries. In each the scribe afterwards continued to make, as it were, a diary of the chief occurrences, and, later, various editions about past events would be inserted in various religious houses, so that the dates are not always to be trusted. After the year of Alfred's birth, the records become more full. In his Life of Alfred, Asser turned much of the Chronicle for Alfred's reign into Latin. The materials of the Chronicle, therefore, existed in his day, an early part of it was by a Northumbrian writer. The Chronicle now exists in several versions, done by various hands in various monasteries. Some Chronicles are lost, such as that of Kent, whence much matter has been borrowed by that of Peterborough, which is the longest, and reaches the year 1154. The early entries in the Chronicle are very short, here is the history of the year 774. In this year a red cross appeared in the heavens after sunset. And in this year the Mercians and Kentish men fought at Otford, and wondrous serpents were seen in the South Saxons' land. This reads like a journal kept by a child. In later days events are recorded at more length, such as fights with the Danes. Meetings of the Witnagamot, or Great Council of the Wise, slayings of kings and earls, even foreign facts of interest about popes and emperors. But as late as 1066, the chronicler is brief enough, when he tells how William, Count of Normandy, sailed to Pevensey on Michaelmas Eve. This was then made known to King Harold, and he gathered a great army, and came to meet Count William at the Hoare Apple Tree. And William came against him unawares, ere his people were in battle order. But the king, nevertheless, fought boldly against him with those men who would follow him, and there was a great slaughter made on each side. There were slain King Harold, and Earl Leofwine his brother, and Earl Gyrth his brother, and many good men. And the French held possession of the place of carnage, as to them God granted for the people's sins. We who write long books about a single battle, such as Waterloo, are surprised by the brevity of the Chronicle. Some seventy years later, just before it ends, the Chronicle has a long and famous passage about the cruel oppressions in Stephen's reign, 1137. By that date the language has changed so much, that the meaning can easily be made out, even by readers who do not know Anglo-Saxon. The style of the Chronicle is always extremely simple, and the good monks are usually more interested in events affecting their own monasteries, than in matters which are of more importance to the history of the country. Nevertheless, there are records of periods in the War Age when the Danes were burning, plundering, and slaying through England, and there are characters of great interest among the kings, earls, and counselors, lay or clerical, of whom we should know little or nothing if the monks had ceased to make their entries in the Chronicle. To students of language, with its dialects and changes, the Chronicle is priceless, and a few poems and ballads are contained in its pages. The most famous poem in the Chronicle is on the Battle of Brunnenburg, 937, when the English, under Athelstan, defeated the Scots and Danes. 
This song, translated by Tennyson, does not so much describe the fighting as the triumph after the battle. 5 Lay On that battle stead Young kings By swords laid to sleep So seven eke Of Olaf's earls Of the country countless Shipmen and Scots Olaf fled in his ship over the barren sea, the aged Constantine, king of the Scots, left his son dead on the field. As usual the raven, wolf, and eagle have their share of the corpses, an Anglo-Saxon poet could not omit these animals. This poet boasts that there has been no such victory since first the Anglo-Saxons, the Welsh overcame. Perhaps the enthusiasm of English students rather overrates the poetical merits of this war song. There is more poetry, and more originality in, Burtnoff, a song of a defeat at the hands of the Danes. The warrior entering the field of battle. Let from his hands his leaf hawk fly. His hawk to the holt, and to battle he stepped. He haughtily refuses to accept peace in exchange for tribute which the Danes demand. The armies are divided from each other by a tidal river, and Burtnoff chivalrously allows the heathen to cross, at low tide, and meet him in fair field. There are descriptions of hand-to-hand -hand single combats, and of the wounds given and taken, and the boasts of the slayers, who throw their spears, piercing iron mail, and shields of linden wood, and strip the slain of their armor and jewels. The friends of the fallen fight across the corpses. Burtnoth falls, some of his company flee, the rest make a ring of spears about the hero, one cries. The more the mood, as lessons are might. That is. The braver be we, as our strength fails. The whole poem might be translated, almost without a change, into, the strong-winged music of Homer, or the verse of the old French, Song of Roland. The song is not conventional, it is a noble war poem. For some reason the best war poems are inspired by glorious defeats, at Malden, at Flodden, at Bosworth, at Roncesco, at Culloden. The Monks and Learning the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, running from Alfred's day to King Stephen's, and thus surviving the Norman Conquest, is the earliest historical writing in English prose. As we have seen, it was the work of the monks, regular soldiers of learning, living together under strict rules. On the other hand the secular clergy, parish priests and others, were the irregular levies against ignorance. The monks were fallen on evil times for learning and literature. During the long cruel wars against the Danish raiders and settlers, 900 to 960, many monasteries were overthrown, others, like Abingdon, became poor neglected places. Into others the kings and nobles placed their younger children, to live comfortably on the rents and revenues of the church, and neglect prayer and books. Under Edwig the Fair, St. Dunstan, born 925, appeared as a reformer, making the rule of the church respected, and being therefore at feud with Edwig, as Thomas a Becket was with Henry II. Under Edgar, 957-975, peace was restored, and Dunstan could carry out reforms as Archbishop of Canterbury. He brought back from Flanders the new rule of the Order of St. Benedict, which the monk in Chaucer despises as not up to date, for the strict living of monks, and was backed by bishops Oswald and Ethelwald, men of learning and reformers of education. New monasteries, which often had schools attached to them, were built, and old monasteries were restored. Dunstan was an artist, a picture of him as a monk is still preserved, and is said to have been drawn by himself. He was skilled in music and metalworking, and fond of the old Anglo-Saxon poetry. He has left no books of his own writing but there are curious early lives of him in Latin. As a boy he climbed in his sleep to the roof of a church. He used to see visions of people at the time of their deaths, a large stone is said to have flown at him of its own accord, and, before his death, his bed, with him in it, was slowly raised up in air, and softly let down again. According to these tales, Dunstan must have been a medium, there is nothing saintly in such prodigies. Like many people of genius who were not saints, he was of a visionary nature, though a thoroughly practical and energetic man. Thus he, with Oswald, Bishop of Worcester, later Archbishop of York, Abbo, Athelwold, Berthforth. 
and others, introduced, regulars, Benedictine monks, in place of married priests into the cathedrals, and encouraged schools and learning of all kinds. Athelwold himself taught Latin to boys at Winchester, and had the Latin book of the rules of the Benedictine monks done into Anglo-Saxon. A set of Anglo-Saxon sermons survives from this age called the Blickling Homilies, from Blickling, a house of Lord Lothian, where the manuscript has been preserved. Homilies are simple statements of scriptural facts for simple hearers. The preacher already addresses the congregation as, My dearest brethren, mine Gibraltar the Leofaustin. Bethlehem, says the preacher, means being interpreted, the house of bread, and in it was Christ, the true bread, brought forth. The divine nature is not mingled with the human nature, nor is there any separation, we might explain this to you by a little comparison, if it were not too lowly, see an egg, the white is not mixed with the yolk, yet it is one egg. The sermons, these quoted are by Alfred, are all plain teaching for plain people, but there is a famous address by Bishop Wolfston, encouraging the English, by biblical examples of Hebrew fighting patriots. To defend themselves against the cruel heathen Danes, 1014. Alfric. In the school at Winchester Alfric was trained, born 955, and thence went to instruct the young monks in the Abbey of Cern in Dorset, where he preached homilies, he wrote them both in English and in Latin. His sermon on the Holy Housel, that is the Holy Communion, contained ideas which the Protestants, at the Reformation, thought similar to their own, and they printed this homily. All is to be understood spiritually. It skills not to ask how it is done, but to believe firmly that done it is. The style of the prose is more or less alliterative, and a kind of rhythm is detected in some of the sermons, as if they were intended to be chanted. The Latin grammars written by Alfred do not concern English literature, his dialogue, colloquium, between a priest and a number of persons of various occupations, throws light on ways of living. He wrote Latin, Lives of Saints, and edited part of an English translation or paraphrase of the Bible, suitable as material for homilies. He produced many other theological works, and died about 102- being abbot of Eincham in Oxfordshire. The interest of Alfred, Wolfston, and the rest, for us, is that they upheld a standard of learning and of godly living, in evil times of fire and sword, and that English prose became a rather better literary instrument in their hands. The Bleachdoms, and works on herb lore and medicine of the period, partly derived from late Latin books, partly from popular charm songs, are merely curious, they are full of folklore. After the conquest, Anglo-Saxon prose, save in the Chronicle, was almost submerged, though, in poetry, there were doubtless plenty of popular ballads. For the most part lost or faintly traceable as translated into the Latin prose of some of the writers of history. There would be songs chanted among the country people about the deeds of Hereward the Wake and other popular heroes. Minstrels, now poor wanderers, would sing in the farmhouses, and in the halls of the English squires, but not much of their compositions remains. We have, however, a few famous brief passages of verse, like the poem of The Grave, familiar through Longfellow's translation, and probably earlier than the conquest. It is written on the margin of a book of sermons, and the author's mood is truly sepulchral. The rhymed poem is celebrated only because it is in rhyme, which was a novelty with a great future before it. It is older than 1046, its muse is that of moral reflection. The one verse of a song of King Canute is handed down by a monkish chronicler who lived more than a century later. The king in a boat on the ooze, near a church, bids his men row near the shore to hear the monks sing. Mary Sunjen the monaks bin an Ely. The nut ching ru thurby. Roweth nights near the land. And here we thess munches sang. This contains a kind of rhyme, or incomplete rhyme, of the vowel sounds only, assonance, in Ely, Thurby, Land, Sang. St. Godric, died 1170, also left a hymn to Our Lady, in rhymed couplets, with the music. Of about the same period is a rhymed version of the Lord's Prayer, the number of syllables to each line varies much, as in Anglo-Saxon poetry, contrary to the rule in the poetry of France. 
There are other examples all showing the untaught tendency of the songs of the people towards rhyme and towards measures unknown to the early Anglo-Saxons. 4. After the Norman Conquest At the time of the Norman Conquest, 1066, the invaders possessed a literature in their own language, poems on the adventures of Charlemagne, and of Roland and the other peers and paladins. But perhaps none of the French poems on Charlemagne, or only one, the Song of Roland, now exists in a form as early as the date of the conquest, and they did not then reach the English people. On the other hand the Norman clergy, many of whom obtained bishoprics and abbeys in England, were much more learned than they of England. And Lanfranc, the conqueror's archbishop of Canterbury, threatened to depose Wolfston, the English bishop of Worcester, for his ignorance of philosophy and literature. Yet Wolfston excelled in miracles and the gift of prophecy. Many new monasteries were founded by the Norman kings, homes of learning, each with its scriptorium, writer's room, in which new books were written, and old books were copied, almost all of them in Latin. St. Albans became a specially learned monastery and home of historians, while Roman law, medicine, and theology were closely studied, and books were lent out to students from the monastic libraries, a pledge of value being deposited by the borrower. Latin Literature the books of the age which most interest us are the histories written in Latin, by various authors of known names, who often were not cloistered monks, but clergymen who lived much at court, and knew the men who were making history. Kings and Great Nobles Of all of these authors the most important in the interests of literature, not of history, is Geoffrey of Monmouth, a Welshman, whose History of the Kings of Britain is really no voracious chronicle but a romance pretending to be a history of Britain, especially of King Arthur. The name of Arthur spells romance, and Geoffrey's book is almost the first written source of all the poems and tales of Arthur which fill the literature of England and the continent. But it is more convenient to discuss Geoffrey when we reach the age of the Arthurian romance. It is not necessary to speak here of all the writers of Latin histories in the 12th and 13th centuries. In the north were Simeon of Durham, and Richard, prior of Hexham, who wrote, The Deeds of King Stephen, and Aylward, whose account of the defeat of David I of Scotland at the Battle of the Standard, 1138, is very well told and full of spirit. In reading Aylward we find ourselves, as it were, among modern men, he speaks as a good English patriot, yet as a friend and admirer, in private life, of the invading Scottish king and prince. Florence of Worcester attempted a history of the world, compiled out of other books, called, Chronicon ex Chronicis. The habit of, beginning at the beginning, namely with the creation, took hold of some of these historians, whose books are of little use till they reach their own times, if they live to do so, and speak of men and events known to themselves. Edmer, on the other hand, wrote of what he himself knew, a history of recent times in England, down to 1122, and especially about the Archbishop of Canterbury, Anselm, and his dealings with William Rufus and Henry I, Henry Fairclerk. A Patron of Learning William of Malmesbury, 1095-1143, like Geoffrey of Monmouth, was patronized by Robert, Earl of Gloucester, to whom they dedicated books. William understood, and said that there were two Arthurs, one a warrior of about 500-516, the other a hero of fairyland, but, as time went on, people began to confuse them, and to believe as historical the stories of Arthur which Geoffrey had written as a romance. William wrote the History of the Kings of England, with several lives of saints and books on theology. The History of the Kings begins with the coming of the Anglo-Saxons, and ends in 1127, the reign of Henry. Towards the close of its sequel, the Historia Novella, his patron, Robert of Gloucester, an enemy of Stephen, is his hero. The book contains a history of the First Crusade. William sometimes treats history in almost a modern way, he quotes his sources of information, chiefly Bede and the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. He refuses to vouch for the exact truth of events before his own time, he throws the responsibility on earlier authors, his authorities. Later, he speaks of what he has seen, or learned from trustworthy witnesses. When he reaches the time of the British resistance to the Anglo-Saxons, he mentions, warlike Arthur, 
of whom the Bretons fondly tell so many fables, even to the present day, a man worthy to be celebrated, not by idle tales, but by authentic history. Happily for his readers, William is not above telling anecdotes like the romance of the statue at Rome, with an inscription on the head, strike here. How this was misunderstood, how at last a wise man marked the place where the shadow of the forefinger of the statue fell at noon, and what wonderful adventures followed when men dug there. And found a golden palace lighted up by a blazing carbuncle stone, is narrated in a captivating way, but is not scientific history. Book 2, CHX William mingles real letters and other documents with miracles and ghost stories, indeed, he is determined to amuse as well as to instruct, and he succeeds. In describing the enthusiasm stirred by the preaching of the First Crusade, he falls into the very manner of Macaulay. The Welshman left his hunting, the Scot his fellowship with lice, the Dane his drinking party, the Norwegian his raw fish. Certainly William was not a wholly scientific historian. He is never uninteresting. If he finds any set of events tedious, he says so plainly, and passes onwards. He is very fair, is learned in the manner of his age, and his love of digressions and good stories reminds us of the Greek Herodotus, the father of history, and the most entertaining of historians. Among the names of other Latin chroniclers is that of Henry of Huntingdon, writing in 1125-1154. The author of the Deeds of King Stephen is unknown, the work of William of Newburgh in the reigns of Henry II and Richard Cur de Lyon, is well remembered for his attack on the lies of Geoffrey of Monmouth. The assault on Geoffrey's truthfulness was not so superfluous as it seems, because his romance won the belief of many generations. Richard Fitz Neil, who was treasurer of England and for nine years Bishop of London, 1189-1198, wrote the dialogue De Scicario, concerning the Exchequer, which is still studied as the best authority on medieval national finance in England. And on our early constitutional history. Jocelyn de Brakeland left a chronicle, 1173-1202, much concerned with life in his own monastery at St. Edmundsbury, and with the wise rule of Abbot Sampson. This book forms the text on which Carlyle preaches in his Past and Present, it proves sufficiently that the monks were not the lazy drones of popular tradition and abounds in vivid pictures of men and of society. Gerald of Wales, Gerald de Bari, called Cambrensis, the Welshman, 1147 1217, was of royal Welsh and noble Norman birth. His family, the de Barris, were among the foremost Norman knights who took part in the invasion, it can hardly be called the conquest, of Ireland, under Strongbow and he himself was a great fighter in the disputes of churchmen. There was not much schooling to be had in wild Wales, then very rebellious, but he probably learned Latin from the chaplains of his uncle, a bishop, before he went to the University of Paris, to study law and science. Gerald was more like a modern literary man than a medieval chronicler. He never ceased from traveling, now following the court, now rushing to Paris, now to Rome. When Archdeacon of Esti, David's, which the Welsh wanted to make a Canterbury of their own, with their own archbishop, he stood up against the bishop of St. Asaph. When the bishop threatened to excommunicate him, he had bell, book, and candle ready to excommunicate the bishop, whom he frightened away. But Henry II would not permit Gerald to be bishop of Esti. David's, thinking him certain to stand up for Wales against England. In 1184, Gerald went to Ireland with Henry's son, Prince John, who cannot be better described, as an insolent ribald young man, than he is in Scots Ivanhoe. Gerald wrote a Topography of Ireland, which is really a little tour in Ireland. His chapters on the Marvels of Ireland lead us to suppose that the natives hoaxed him with strange stories, for example the tale of a church bell that wandered about the country of its own will, the innumerable fleas at Asti. Nannan's in Connaught is more credible, but the tale of the wolves who asked to receive the Holy Communion was not believed in England. One miracle was only a beautifully illuminated manuscript of the kind decorated by Irish artists four hundred years earlier. The art had been lost, and the artist was supposed to have copied the designs of an angel. Gerald found the Irish very ignorant, lazy, dirty, and ferocious. 
Every man used a battle axe in place of a walking stick, and manslayings were frequent. The Irish clergy were devout and chaste, but drank too much. On the wild beasts and birds of Ireland Gerald wrote like a naturalist and a sportsman, though he supposed that salmon, before leaping a fall, put their tails in their mouths, and letting go, fly upward by the spring thus obtained. His History of the Invasion of Ireland is valuable, but he introduced, in the manner of some Greek and many Roman historians, long speeches which were never made. He also, after an energetic wandering life, always fighting to be made Bishop of St. David's, wrote his own autobiography, an amusing conceited book, full of adventures of travel. He wrote, too, On the Natural History and the Inhabitants of Wales, a book very valuable to this day. He died after reaching the age of seventy. Walter Mapp Among his friends was a native of the Welsh border, Walter Mapp, Archdeacon of Oxford. You write much, Master Gerald, said Mapp to him, and you will write more, and I deliver many discourses. Your books are better than my speeches, and will be remembered longer. But I am much more popular, for you write in Latin, and I speak in the vulgar tongue, meaning French. Poor Gerald confesses that he made nothing by his books, and looked for his reward, not in vain, to the applause of future ages. But Mapp has had his own share of praise, more than he should get, if, as he said, he wrote little. He was born about 1137, studied at Paris, was one of the king's judges who rode on circuit, and, in 1197, was made Archdeacon of Oxford. One book which he certainly wrote, on courtly trifles, De Nugis Curialium, in Latin, is a collection of anecdotes clumsily told, and of reflections, with stories of the Welsh, historical jottings, folklore, tales, and attacks on the clergy of the Cistercian order. As a judge he said that he was fair, except to Jews and Cistercians, who did not deserve justice, for they gave none. Satirical Latin poems against Golius, a type of a noisy licentious bishop, are also attributed to him. In the confession of this bishop occur the famous lines, thus translated by Lee Hunt. I devise to end my days, in a tavern drinking. May some Christian hold for me, the glass when I am shrinking. That the cherubim may cry, when they see me sinking. God be merciful to a soul, of this gentleman's way of thinking. The lines, in rhyming Latin, became a drinking catch, conceivably they were that before, and were merely put into the bishop's mouth as a proof of his bad character. The word Golius as a nickname for a ribald Philistine priest was hundreds of years older than Mapp's time. A long romance in French, on Lancelot, the Holy Grail, and the death of Arthur, is attributed to Mapp in some manuscripts, and as a contemporary romancer says that Mapp could lie as well as himself, that is. Like himself wrote romances of love and tournaments, he may possibly have been the author of the great book in Latin which treats openly of the history of the Holy Grail. But no copy of that Latin book is known to exist, nor is it certain that it ever existed, while Mapp, as we know, said that he did not write much of any sort, especially not in Latin. Changes since the conquest. It is plain that, Within a century from the Battle of Hastings, new influences of many kinds were working in England, and changing the national character and intellect. There was the learning from Paris University, and from the continent in general, there was the clearer intellect and energy of the Normans, the vivacity of such Welshmen or men from the Welsh marches as Geoffrey of Monmouth, Gerald, and Mapp. Anglo-Saxon literature had never been vivacious. There were the new topics, the matter of Britain, the Celtic legends of Arthur, whether derived from Wales or from Brittany, matter most romantic, and suited to the coming poets who, unlike the Anglo-Saxons, were to glorify love. There was, too, the constant excitement and variety that came from travel, whether in the Crusades, in pilgrimages, or to France and Rome on public or private business, or in search of books and teachers. In various ways knowledge of Saracen science and learning, translations of Aristotle from the Arabic into the Latin, and romantic ideas derived from the fables and tales of far-off India, filtered into England. These things were for priests and book-loving lords and courtiers. Their wits were sharpened by knowledge of several tongues. All educated men knew Latin. 
All men of this land, said Robert of Gloucester, about 1270, who are of Norman blood, hold to French, and low men hold to English, but high men of English blood would talk in English to their farmers and servants. All who learned Latin learned it through French books, but country priests would preach in English. The Anglo-Saxon language and grammar were slowly changing, though very few new words from French or Latin had yet come into common use. Cow, sheep, calf, and swine were Anglo-Saxon words, as Geth the swineherd says in Ivanhoe. Englishmen herded the animals, but the meat of them was called by French names derived from Latin, like beef, mutton, veal, and pork. From the conquest, 1066, to 1200, learning, Latin, and knowledge of French books would filter slowly into the native English mind, partly through sermons. And rich Franklins, and Englishmen in the service of the conquering race, and English priests would be anglicizing French words. V. Geoffrey of Monmouth. The Stories of Arthur. Of all these Latin chroniclers by far the most important was Geoffrey of Monmouth, Bishop of St. Asaph, who finished his History of the Britons, about 1147. Geoffrey, as has been said, is not a real historian, but something much more interesting. He introduced to the world the story of King Arthur, which at once became the source and center of hundreds of French romances, in verse or prose, and of poetry down to Tennyson and William Morris. To Geoffrey, or to later English chroniclers who had read Geoffrey, Shakespeare owed the stories of his plays, Cymbeline, and King Lear. Though Geoffrey did not write in English but in Latin, he is one of the chief influences in the literature, not only of England, but of Europe, medieval and modern. All readers of the Mort d'Arthur, of Sir Thomas Mallory, about 1470, and the Idols of the King, and William Morris's short poems about Arthur and Guinevere, are naturally curious to know if ever there were a real fighting Arthur. And to trace the sources of the countless French and English romances about him and his court. Where did Geoffrey of Monmouth get his information about this island, from the days of the fabulous Roman who settled it, Brute, or Brutus, to King Arthur's time? We must look at what is known or reported about Arthur. Bede, the historian, writing about 700 to 730, says nothing about Arthur, but he does speak briefly about the period, 500 to 516, in which Arthur, if there were such a prince, must have existed. Bede takes from the Welsh writer in Latin, Gildas, about 550, the fact that, up to the date of the siege of Badon Hill, 516, 44 years after the Anglo-Saxons came into Britain. The British, Welsh, had considerable successes under Ambrosius Aurelianus, perhaps the last of the Romans. But more of this later, says Bede, who never returns to the subject. He may have expected to get more information, and that information might have included some account of Arthur, of whom Gildas makes no mention. Bede says nothing of the fable of Brute, which may not have been invented in his time, or, if known to him, was regarded by him as fabulous. Next we have a book attributed to the Welsh Nennius, a History of the Britons, which is really a patchwork of several older records, and there is the Annals Cambri, Annals of Wales. Nennius, about 800, makes Arthur, the war leader, not the king, win twelve great battles, ending with Badon Hill. The names of the battles are given, the first is on the river Glane. Now one Glane is in Northumberland, the other in Ayrshire. For battles are, on the Douglas water in the country called Linuis, if Linuis is the Lennox, there are two Douglas waters there, which fall into Loch Lomond, between them is Ben Arthur. The sixth battle was, by the river Basses, a base being a hill shaped like an artificial mound, for example the isle called the base in the Firth of Forth. There are two bases on the river Carron, in Stirlingshire, and here may have been the sixth battle. The seventh was, Cat Coit Celadon, the battle, Cat, of the wood of Celadon, that is Ettrick Forest, perhaps the fight was on the upper Tweed. The eighth battle is thought to have been waged at Wed Ale, in the Strath of Gala Water, a tributary of Tweed, which it reaches at Gala Shields, the ninth at Dumbarton, which means, the castle of the Britons. The tenth near Stirling, where a very late writer says that Arthur kept the round table, the eleventh at Aenid Hill, that is Mynyd Aenid, Edinburgh Castle Rock. 
And the twelfth was, the siege of Badon Hill, perhaps a hill on the Avon, near Linlithgow, which has remains of strong fortifications, and is called, the Budden Hill, or, Buden Hill. It is not easy, however, to see how the A in Badon became the U in Budden. Finally the great battle of Camlon, where Arthur fell, is taken to be at a place long called Camelon on the Carron, in Stirlingshire, where Arthur met Saxons, Picts, and Scots, under Medrout, Modred, son of Lu, or Lothus. To whom Arthur had granted Lothian. On the other side of the river was an ancient building called, as far back as 1293, Arthur's Oven, it was destroyed by a laird at the end of the 18th century. If all these conclusions, drawn by Mr. Skeen from legends, Nennius, and place names, be correct, Arthur was a real war leader, fighting for the Britons, that is the Welsh of Strathclyde, whose country stretched from Dumbarton down through Cumberland. Even Geoffrey of Monmouth makes Arthur fight between Loch Lomond and Edinburgh, and give Lothian to King Lot, that is Lu, whose son, Medrout, Modred, turns traitor to Arthur. Bede places the battles at a time when the Picts had made an alliance with the Saxons, and these two peoples were in contact with each other not down in Cornwall, where later writers place the last battle in the west. But exactly where Arthur seems to have fought, in the fighting place of Edward I and the Scots, from Carlisle to Dumbarton and Falkirk, and in Ettrick Forest and round Edinburgh, a region where several hills bear Arthur's name. We need not, then, give up Arthur as a fabulous being, though legends far older than himself came to be told about him. In the oldest Welsh poems that survive he is mentioned among scores of other old heroes, now forgotten, and is always named as a great war leader, emperor and conductor of the toil. One mention is important. In a long Welsh poem on the graves of many heroes now forgotten, we read. The grave of March, the grave of Gwither. The grave of Gwan Gledivrad. A mystery to the world, the grave of Arthur. Or, not wise to ask where is the grave of Arthur. Thus it appears that, even in very early Welsh poetry, the grave of Arthur, like that of James IV, slain at Flodden, was unknown, hence he was believed, like King James, not to be dead. He was in, the island valley of Avilion, and would come again to help his people, when he was healed of his grievous wound. Several of his companions in the later French and English romances, such as Geraint, Kay, and Bedivere, were also known to these very early Welsh poets. Moreover, there exist in the Welsh Mabinogen, Tales for the Young, very ancient stories of Arthur which do not resemble the ordinary later romances about him. But are infinitely older and more poetical, such are, Coolwich and Olwyn, and, The Dream of Ronobli. Probably about 1066 there were many tales of Arthur surviving in Brittany, a Brython, Welsh, country from which the exiled prince of South Wales returned home in 1077. If he brought these tales back and if the Welsh poets took them up, there would be plenty of Welsh Arthurian literature between 1077 and 1140, or thereabouts, when Geoffrey of Monmouth produced his History of the Britons. He says that he has had the advantage of using a book in the Breton tongue, which Walter, Archdeacon of Oxford, brought out of Brittany, this book he translates into Latin. No such book can be found. It is probable that Geoffrey used Welsh and Breton traditions, and the patchwork book, parts of it very early, called the History of the Britons, attributed to Nennius, about 796. In this we have a mixture of the real fighting Arthur of about 520, and the fabulous Arthur, a wonderful, powerful being, like all the old heroes of fable, who goes down to the mysterious land of darkness, like Odysseus and the Finnish Wainamoinen. The patchwork book of Nennius derives the name of Britain from that person of pure fantasy, Brute, Brutus, great-grandson of Aeneas, who sailed to the Isle of Albion. Now, Brute was invented merely to explain the name, Britain, and to connect the Britons, or Welsh, with the Trojans. In the same way the Scots had framed false histories of their ancestor Scota, who came from Scythia to Ireland, by way of Egypt, Athens, and Spain. All these legendary and fictitious materials, and others, were used by Geoffrey in what he called a history, and his history, in spite of criticism, became the most popular book of the age. He begins with the flight of Aeneas from Troy, and the flight of the great-grandson of Aeneas, 
Brutus, to the Isle of Albion, inhabited by none but a few giants. Brute builds New Troy, London, on the Thames, and so the romance runs on, a mere novel of adventures, those of Shakespeare's, King Lear, and Cymbeline, for example, mixed up with history from Bede, till we come to Merlin the Enchanter. And Uther Pendragon, and the mysterious birth of Arthur, who is crowned king, and slays nine hundred Saxons with his own sword in one battle, conquers all northern Europe and France, and defeats the Romans, all of which is sheer medieval fable. At home, in a great fight, the Battle of Camlin, it is called in older books than Geoffrey's, he kills Modred, and is carried to the Isle of Avalon or Avilion, to be healed of his wounds. Geoffrey ends by requesting historians, his contemporaries, such as William of Malmesbury, to be silent concerning the history of the Britons, since they have not that book written in the British tongue, which Walter, Archdeacon of Oxford, brought out of Brittany. This is mere open banter. Geoffrey was not likely to show them that book. Even in the old Welsh tale of the Great Boar Hunt, a story far earlier than Geoffrey's time, Arthur is surrounded by many fabulous heroes, really characters of fairy tale, like them who follow Jason in the search for the Fleece of Gold. All of them can do miraculous feats, like the heroes of The Dream Time, the Dark Backward of Unknown Ages. These companions of Arthur become, at least some of them do, the Knights of the Round Table in the later romances, but we do not yet hear of Lancelot, or of the Holy Grail. From Geoffrey's book come the French poetical and adorned version of Was, 1155, many French romances, and finally a vast throng of chivalrous and romantic fancies cluster round the great name of Arthur. Geoffrey's was a book that gave delight to every one, ladies as well as men, for in the marriage of the traitor Modred with Guinevere the wife of Arthur, and in Arthur's revenge, was the germ of a world of romances. The conquest, too, by Arthur, of Gaul and Aquitaine, inspired, and, to their minds, gave an historical excuse for the ambition of English kings to recover these old dominions of Britain. Caxton, our first printer, long afterwards wrote that not to believe in Arthur was almost atheism. Geoffrey also translated into Latin out of Welsh the prophecies attributed to the enchanter Merlin. If they had any meaning in Welsh, in Latin they have none. Hotspur, in Shakespeare's Henry IV, is weary of Owen Glendower's talk. Of the dreamer Merlin and his prophecies. And of a dragon and a finless fish. A clip-winged griffin and a molten raven. A couching lion and a ramping cat. And such a deal of skimble-scamble stuff. Nevertheless, three centuries after Geoffrey wrote, men who thought themselves wise and learned believed that not only Merlin but Bede were true prophets, who foretold the victories of Joan of Arc, 1429. It must be kept in mind that Geoffrey says nothing about these great characters in later Arthurian romances, Lancelot, Galahad, Tristram and Isolt, and nothing about the mysterious Holy Grail, and the quest of the Grail. How and whence these parts of the Arthurian legend arose, how much of them comes from ancient Celtic legend, how much from the invention of French romancers, is still a mystery. Geoffrey, however, made Arthur, Merlin, Guinevere, and Modred familiar to all his readers. All Englishmen were proud of Arthur of Britain, though, of course, in his life he was the deadly foe of the English. 6. Lyman's Brute. Thanks to Geoffrey, at last, some time about 1200 to 1220, came an English poet, Lyman, a true poet, now and then, whose work reminds us occasionally at once of the Greeks whom he had never read, of masters whom he did not know. And of the things most romantic in the verses of the last great poet of England. Lyman, the author of The Brute, had no ambition, he had no hope of gain, the king and the courtiers would never hear of him. Lyman was an English priest in a quiet country parish, not far from the Welsh border, at Ernley, near Raidstone, on the Severn, as he tells us. Yet the new French culture had reached him and inspired him. He gave it to Englishmen in their own English language and he is therefore readable, is more than a mere name. It came into his mind to tell the history of England, in verse, and he says that he travelled far to get the books of Bede, in Anglo-Saxon, the fair Austin and St. Albin, in Latin, and the book made in French by a French clerk, Master Was, who well could write. 
Lovingly he beheld these books, but, in fact, he only used one of them, namely Wasse's French version, 1155, of Geoffrey of Monmouth's romance. Wasse had altered Geoffrey as he pleased, and Lyman took the same liberty with Wasse, his book is twice as long as that of the French clerk. He also inserted many things not to be found in the text of Wasse as now printed, but derived partly from still unprinted manuscripts of Wasse, partly from other sources, perhaps from Welsh legends known to this priest who dwelt beside the Severn. Wasse added to Geoffrey's account of Arthur, the story wherever he found it, of the table round, so shaped that the knights could not quarrel about the highest place. Lyman adds that the fairy ladies came to Arthur's birth, as in a very old belief, found in ancient Greece and ancient Egypt, and that they later carried him away to Avalon, there to be healed of his wounds. He calls the fairy queen Argante, possibly a French corruption of a Breton name. His account of the birth of the enchanter Merlin, no man's son, is romance itself. Merlin's mother, who had become a nun, knew not who was her child's father, only that in her dreams there came to her, the fairest thing that ever was born, as it were a tall knight, all dyed in gold. This thing glided before me and glistened with gold. Oft me it kissed, and oft embraced. What can be more romantic than this tale of the golden shadow of love that glides through the darkling bower, told by a nun with bowed head, shamefast? We are reminded of the lines in which Io, in Aeschylus, tells of the shadowy approaches of Zeus, the king of gods, and the voice that spoke to her in dreams. The Greeks had another such tale of the gold that fell in the Tower of Danae before the birth of Perseus. The origin of Lyman's story may be in some ancient Celtic myth of the loves of gods and mortal women, and of Merlin, son of a god. From his shadowy nameless father, Merlin received his gift of prophecy, and, from the first, foretold the passing of Arthur. In Lyman's poem we find what does not occur in the older Anglo-Saxon poems, such as, Beowulf, the use of similes in the manner of Homer, whose warriors charge like lions, hungry, and beaten on by wind and snow. Thus, too, in Lyman's verse. Up caught Arthur his shield, before his breast, and he gone to rush as doth the howling wolf when he cometh from the wood, flecked with snow, and thinketh to seize what beasts he will. Arthur defeats the Saxons, and drives them from the ford of the river, through the deep marshland. And as the wild crane in the fun, when the falcons follow him through air, and he wearies in his flight, but the hounds meet him in the reeds. As he can find no safety whether in field or flood, even so the Saxons were smitten in ford and field, and went blindly wandering. These similes give clear, vivid pictures of life in fun and forest, and enliven the poem in the true epic way, and Lyman gives, perhaps, the first English picture of an English fox hunt. In his poem, Guinevere does not love Lancelot, but the traitor Modred, and when Modred is defeated by her husband, Arthur, she flies to Curlean, where she hooded her and made her a nun, and her end is unknown. In the last great battle in the West, both hosts fall, it is a field of the dead and dying. Arthur bears fifteen wounds. He is alone with Constantine, to whom he entrusts his kingdom. But I will pass to Avalon, to the fairest of all maidens, to Argante the queen, an elf most beautiful, and she shall make my wounds all whole with draughts of healing. And afterwards I will come again to my kingdom. Then came floating from the sea a little boat, and two women therein, shaped wonderfully, and they took Arthur anon, and bore him to that boat, and laid him softly down, and went their way. Bretons believe that he liveth yet, and oneth in Avalon, with the fairest queens of fairy. Do we not already seem to hear the voice of Tennyson's weeping queens, as the king floats into the night? Romance has come to England, and from the mingling of races and tongues, Celtic, French, English, an English poet has been born, a man who sees with the eyes of imagination. And who can make us share his visions of the golden shadow that was father of Merlin? Of the wolf with the snow caked on his matted hide as he rushes from the wood, of the hawking party in the fens, of the battle by the tidal waters of the west. Lyman is full of promise of good things to come, as in his description of Goneril and her husband, when she begins to grudge to her father, King Lear, the expensive service of his forty knights. While her husband feebly opposes her unnatural avarice. 
The story of Lear is also in Geoffrey of Monmouth, and is based on a common folk tale. Again, when Lyman's Arthur laughs over the slain Colgrim, lie there, now, Colgrim. High hadst thou climbed this hill, as if thou wouldst win heaven, now shalt thou fare to hell, and there find thy kinsfolk, we are carried back to the boasts over the dead that Greeks and Trojans utter in the Iliad. But these great touches are rare in the thirty thousand lines of Lyman, the mass of his poem is blank enough. Lyman thought himself a chronicler in rhyme, a historian, in his book he has many tales, not that of Arthur alone. He has dull passages in plenty, nonetheless the good priest had many qualities of the great poet. The verse of Lyman is sometimes of the old Anglo-Saxon sort already described, with alliteration and without rhyme. And in other parts consists of rhyming couplets varying in length, all intermixed. A rhyming couplet is. That avere either other. Luvid als if brother. That ever either other. Loved as if brother. In the words the tendency is to drop the old inflections, the language is shaking off its original grammar and approaching modern English. In the later of two manuscripts of the poem this tendency is much more strong. Thus the older manuscript has. He was a swithe eight gyum. And he striand, begot, three o snell sunen. The later copy has. He was a strong gom. And he strianid three o sones. The word snell in the older version still survives in Scots. There came a wind out o the east. A sharp wind and a snell. Snell meaning keen. Ormulum. Lyman was too great a poet to mingle sermons with his song. The pulpit was his preaching place, he scarcely ever preaches in his poem. On the other hand the worthy brother Orman or ORM did nothing but preach in his versified book, The Ormulum. He was an Augustinian canon of the North Midlands who, about 1200, paraphrased the Gospels read on each day, and the homily which followed, often drawn from Bede, for ORM was not an advanced theologian, in a kind of blank verse. Nothing could be more simply edifying to plain congregations, but edification is not the aim of literature. ORM is best known for his determination to have English properly pronounced. A vowel, in English is, and was, sounded short before two consonants, and ORM was bent on making the reader pronounce the vowels thus and not otherwise. He therefore wrote the two consonants after every short vowel, and explained himself thus. The lines also give the meter of his verses. And ways wyland shall this hawk. Eft others sith writen. Him bid icc that het right right. Swa sum this hawk him teacheth. And tat he loke wel that he. And boxstaff right twice. I wear this itt upo this boc. Iss written oath that wise. By using some Scots words we may translate this in the original meter. And wasey willen shall this book. Another time be writing. Him do I bid that he write ricked. Even as this book him teacheth. And that he do look well that he. Ain letter writeth twice. I there were it upon this book. Is written in that wise. The meter is very like that of the Scottish rhymed version of the Psalms, though ORM, as in the second verse above, only uses rhyme by accident. The formulum is not to be read for human pleasure, though it is interesting to students of the language and versification while in a state of transition. The same may be said of a number of works in prose or verse which are to be found by students in editions published by learned societies. It is necessary to say something of them, because it is a kind of duty to be aware of their existence, though few but specialists can be enthusiastic over their merits, save in one or two cases. They show how the language and the modes of versifying were going forward, and becoming such as a great poet like Chaucer could improve, or, on the other hand. Language and verse were going backwards, deserting rhyme and depending, as in Anglo-Saxon, on alliteration, or alliteration mixed with rhyme. Ancrin Roll among the works of this period which were useful or pleasant in their day, the longest book in prose is the Ancran Roll, or Rule of Anchoresses, ladies who were not exactly female solitaries, 
but lived together religiously, each with her maid. The author, whoever he may have been, bids them say, if any one inquires, that they are, of the order of St. James. There was no such order, but St. James bids us visit the widow and the orphan, and keep ourselves unspotted from the world. This, says he, is true religion. The three ladies dwelt together at Terente in Dorset. The language is of the same period as Lyman's, Brute, very early in the 13th century. The style is simple and free from decoration, the dialect is that of Western England. The advice to the ladies is excellently pious, no severe austerities are recommended, except silence at meals. An anchoress should not speak with any man often or long, and should have a witness, probably out of earshot, even when she confesses, since, the innocent are often belied for want of a witness. Flirting, and belief in luck and in dreams and witchcraft, are severely reprobated. Skepticism is attributed to intellectual pride. Where no iron, James IV wore an iron girdle under his clothes, nor hair cloth, nor hedgehog skins. The ladies are not to flog themselves, unless their confessor permits, and their shoes are to be thick and warm. The author remarks that, God knows, he would rather set out on a voyage to Rome than write his book over again, he may have feared that the ladies would lose their copy. Other religious books of the time are the, Poma Morale, in lines of fourteen syllables ending in a double rhyme, as lore, more, deed, read, and a new metrical paraphrase of Genesis and Exodus. The story is told with some vivacity, in rhyming couplets of eight syllables. The dreamt pharaoh king a drem. That he stod by the float a strem. And the then ut come seven neat. Evril wel swithe fet and gret. And seven lena after the. In places the meter of Coleridge's, Cristobal, which was the model of Scott's, Lay of the Last Minstrel, is recognized in the casual couplets, thus. For sixteen year Joseph was old. Quain he was into Egypt he sold. But it is a far cry from this to. The feast was over in Branksome Tower. And the meter, when Scott's, Lay, appeared, seemed to be a novelty. The Owl and the Nightingale in rhyming eight-syllable couplets, seems to have been written about 1250. The theme is a debate, in the fashion of French poetry, between the owl and the nightingale, as to the comparative merit of their songs. The nightingale, deserting her art, rather feebly asserts the moral influence of her own music. And attacks the owl in a very personal strain of invective, reflecting on his want of good looks, and on his taste in food. We are far indeed from Keats's Ode to the Nightingale, if you are so great a teacher, replied the owl. Why do you not sing to men in Ireland, Norway, and Galloway? La Fontaine might have made a witty poem on the dispute of the owl and the nightingale, but the poet was not a wit, and made a poor use of his opportunities. He is supposed, but not with certainty, to have been Nicholas of Guilford, who is credited with being neglected by the bishop in the distribution of patronage. The owl quotes the Proverbs of King Alfred, of which there is a 13th century collection in rhyme. There are also the Proverbs of Hending, the latter in stanzas of six lines each, the first two rhyming with each other, as do the last two, while the third line rhymes with the sixth, a very popular jingle. Lyrics Far more interesting than these things, whether moral or religious, are the rhyming songs, the voice of the English people, laymen, not priests, the love lyrics, 1300. For example, one on Alison, beginning. Bituine mer she ant averil. When spray bigeneth to springe. The little fowl hath higher wyll. On higher lud to sing. Each stanza ending. From Allah wyman me lo is lent. Ant lyht on Alison. This is the first sweet English love song that has escaped the ruins of time. Everyone knows by heart. Sumer is a cumin in. And. Blow, northern wind. Send thou me my suiting. Reminds us of. O gentle wind that bloweth south. From where my love repaireth. There were all the sounds and scents of spring in the hearts and songs of the poets. Lenten is come with love to town. 
with blosman and with brids round. That all this bliss bringeth. This meter came to be used in telling stories in verse, a purpose for which it is not well fitted. But truly English poetry, with rich re-echoing rhymes and many forms of verse, is awake at last. Political Songs To politics as well as to love and the delights of spring the muse of the people was alive. The popular hatred of Richard of Cornwall, brother of Henry III, expressed itself thus after the Battle of Lewis, 1264. The English is here but slightly modernized. Be thou leaf, be thou loath, Sir Edward. Thou shalt ride spurless on thy lyre. All the right way to Dover Ward. Shalt thou never more break forward. Edward, thou didst as a shrewward. Forsook thine uncle's lore. Richard, though thou be ever trichard. Trick shalt thou never more. A lyre is a grey, spoken of a horse. The Dinlay snaws were ne'er so white. As the lyre locks o oh, hardens hair. Says the ballad of Jamie Telfer. Dot. The English view of Wallace, the patriot knight of Scotland, cruelly executed, is thus set forth. To warn all the gentlemen that be in Scotland. The Wallace was drawn, thereafter hanged. Beheaded alive, his bowels burned. The head to London Bridge was sent. To abide. After Simon Frisell. That was traitor and fickle. And known full wide. Frisell or Fraser, a later Simon Fraser, Lord Lovat of 1745, was traitor and fickle enough. Robert of Gloucester. By no means so lively, though useful in its day, is the very long metrical chronicle, about 1300, of Robert of Gloucester, whether it be by two hands or by one. One, at least, named Robert, was living at the dates of a great Oxford town in Gown Row, which he describes, and of the Battle of Evesham, 1265. He was fortunately not nearer than a distance of thirty miles from that stricken field, and records his own fear of a dense darkness which prevented the monks from reading service in church. Robert dwelt in Gloucester, as his minute local allusions prove. He began his chronicle by versifying the fabulous work of Geoffrey of Monmouth, but put into it not a glimmer of the poetry of Lyman. For the rest, till he reached his own time, he copied Henry of Huntingdon, William of Malmesbury, and Lives of the Saints. Robert's learned modern editor, Mr. All this right, outworn by all the tediousness which the poet bestows on us, says, as literature, the book is as worthless as twelve thousand lines of verse without one spark of poetry can be. But Robert's praises of England, a W.E.L. God loud, and of English folk, so clean and handsome, have a sound spontaneous note of patriotism, and there is a swing in what Mr. Wright cruelly styles his doggerel verse in ballad meter, which is not to be despised. To be sure he has, without knowing it, several different sorts of verse, and is nearly as irregular as Lyman himself, in his measures. His readers would not be offended by these defects, and they learn from him, with a great deal of inaccurate history, a sense of pride in their country, and to speak English, though the nobles and gentry, he says, spoke French. Cursor Mundi A book in verse about twice as long as the lengthy world chronicle of Robert is the Cursor Mundi, the overrunner of the world. The author, like the makers of many pretty lyrics on religious subjects, perceived that people preferred songs to sermons, and romance to homilies. To modernize his language. Men yearn jests to hear. And romances read in diverse manner. He gives the themes of the romances, Matter of Rome, which includes all antiquity, Troy, and Greece as well as Rome, Matter of Britain, the stories of Arthur in his knights, and Matter of France, concerning Charlemagne, and his twelve peers. Nothing is in fashion but love and lovers, but this poet will sing of her whose love never fails, namely Our Lady. He begins before Satan and his angels fell, and goes on endlessly, yet, to his readers, perhaps not tediously, for he enlivens the biblical narrative with legends to the full as fantastic as could be found in any romance. There is the story of how Moses found, through a dream, three wands that grew from three pips placed under Adam's tongue. David, through another dream, 
found these wands in the grave of Moses, which, like that of Arthur, is a mystery to the world. The wands turned ugly black Saracens into handsome white men, the branches grew into a tree, and round that tree were thirty circles of silver. The wood was made into the true cross, and Judas received the thirty pieces of silver. The most absurd tales are told of the boyhood, by no means exemplary, of our Lord, variegated by miracles not wholly beneficent. Thus the Cursor Mundi may have been found amusing enough in its day, when the ceaseless octosyllabic rhyming couplets were not reckoned tedious, they are sometimes varied. And adventures wholly unknown to the authors of the Gospels occur in every page. Devotional Books Books more purely devotional are, The Iron Bite of Inwit, The Biting of Conscience, and The Prick of Conscience. The former states itself to be written, in English of Kent, by Dan Michelis of Northgate, and to be in the library of St. Austin's of Canterbury. The author, or rather translator from a French book of 1274, finished his writing in 1340. The author of The Iron Bite classifies sins and virtues in the allegorical manner, his moral advice, for example, as to the duty of giving alms promptly, gladly, and without the discourtesies with which too many accompany them, is excellent. But nothing, he says, is to be given to minstrels, he calls their harmless art a crime. The dialect is uncouth and rather difficult. The prick of conscience is in octosyllabic rhyming couplets, about ten thousand lines in all, and is the work of a singular person, Richard Rawl, who, after being a wandering hermit, settled at Hampole, and died in 1349. A Latin biographer of Richard states that he was born at Thornton in the Diocese of York, was well educated by the care of his parents, was sent to Oxford by Thomas Neville, Archdeacon of Durham, and made good progress in his studies. Especially in theology. In his nineteenth year he left the temptations of Oxford, went home, and turned two dresses of his sisters, one white, one grey, into what he thought the appropriate costume of a hermit, covering his head with his father's rainhood. His sister fled from before him, thinking him insane, he took Lady Dalton's seat in church, was allowed to preach a sermon, and was kindly received by the lady's husband, Sir John. In a cell provided by the night he had unspeakable raptures, and felt as if he were being burned by a physical fire, which proved to be that of divine love. Some ladies found him writing at a great pace, while he simultaneously discoursed to them for two hours. It seems to follow that either his writing or his preaching was automatic. He wrought some miracles of healing, and he must have written rapidly indeed if he produced all the works attributed to him, his prose treatises of religion are as fervent as the letters of Samuel Rutherford. The Covenanter, his anecdotes of his own temptation by the phantasm of a full, fair young woman, who loved him dearly. And of a repentant scholar, who wrote out a list of his own sins which vanished from the paper, are interesting. He allows that the brains of eagerly pious people sometimes turn in their heads, thereby causing empty hallucinations, and the hearing of wonderful songs that are merely subjective impressions. This strange being, with the ardor of Crashaw, had something of Crashaw's poetic fire. Minot. The verses of Lawrence Minot, celebrating events from 1333 to 1352, are of almost no literary merit. The muse of Lawrence is the patriotic. He crows, for example, over the defeat of the Scots by English archers at Halidon Hill, in 1333, but he merely babbles in the vague, and does not give a single detail as to the fighting. When he promises to tell of the Battle of Bannockburn, in place of doing that he glories in the recovery of Berwick by Edward III. The best praise we can give him is that he loved to celebrate the victories of his countrymen. And had at his command many meters that were ready for some better poet to use. It must also be admitted that there are very few successes in our British essays in patriotic poetry, and that an enemy of the Scots, as mine it was, may be not impartially judged by a critic of that race. 7. The Romances in Rhyme When romance is in, and, after Geoffrey of Monmouth, romance was in, every other kind of literature, is out, is unfashionable and little regarded. The English rhyming chroniclers, and even religious writers such as the author of the Cursor Mundi, felt constrained to make their works resemble fiction as nearly as possible. 
Owing to the supremacy of French romances and English translations and adaptations of French romances, in the late 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries. Many of these productions grouped themselves round the table of King Arthur, Matter of Britain, others dealt with Matter of Rome, that is all the ancient world, others with Matter of France, others with legends or fancies, English or foreign. Their subject was often the chivalrous theory and practice of love, as a kind of religion, a fantastic semi-idealized devotion to the beloved, who, as a rule, was another man's wife. This breach of recognized religion and morality was often set down to fate, to the power that the Anglo-Saxons named W.I.R.D. The two greatest cycles of romantic love are found in the lives of Tristram and Isolt, the wife of King Mark of Cornwall, and aunt by marriage of Tristram, and of Lancelot and Guinevere, the wife of King Arthur. Tristram, whose name seems to be altered from the Welsh name Driston, has but little original connection with the court of Arthur, though he is a mythical hero of a very old Welsh triad. He and Isolt love each other because they have by mischance drunk together of a love potion intended for Mark and his wife, their love is fatal and inevitable, and immortal. Lancelot, on the other hand, has been sent to bring the bride Guinevere to Arthur, and they fall in love before the lady has seen her lord. Everyone knows their joys and sorrows, from Mallory's Mort d'Arthur, 1470, a prose selection and compilation of the French books, which excels them and supersedes them, and from the poems of Tennyson, Matthew Arnold, and Mr. Swinburne. The romances of love and tournament are pervaded and darkened by the influence of the Celtic Merlin, the enchanter and prophet whom men call Devil's Son, he represents destiny. A wide circle of romances, Merlin and the Sweet de Merlin, attributed to Robert de Boron, at the end of the twelfth century, are concerned with him. As if to counteract the fanaticism of love which, in the romances, becomes a non-moral counter-religion, the mysterious story of the Holy Grail came into literature, French, German, and English. The Grail is perhaps originally one of the many magical things of Celtic legend, a vessel as rich in food inexhaustible as the purse of Fortunatus in gold, but conceived by the romance writers to be a mystic dish or cup. Used by our Lord before his passion, and still existing, but only to be seen by the pure of heart, such as Sir Percival, and Sir Galahad, the maiden son of Lancelot. By accident or design the romances fall into a tragic sequence, the youth of Arthur, and his unconscious sin, the mysterious birth of Merlin, the fatal loves of Lancelot and Guinevere. The coming of the Grail and the search for the Grail by many knights, the failure of all but Galahad and Percival, the falling of Lancelot and Guinevere to their old love again. And the sorrows and treacheries that precede and lead up to the king's last battle in the West, and his passing to Avilion. France and Ireland, like England, have their own romances on the adventures of knights under the feudal sway of a chief king, in France, Charlemagne, in Ireland, Concobar or Finn. In England, Arthur, and in all these cases the king becomes much less interesting than his knights, such as Roland and Oliver in France, Cuchulain and Dermot in Ireland, Lancelot, Tristram, Gawain, and Percival in England. Yet Arthur, at first and at the last, is the supreme as well as the central figure in the epic, or cycle, of romances. These are a great treasury of brilliant imaginations, rising from Celtic traditions of unknown antiquity, and then transfigured, first by the chivalrous counter-religion of love. Next by the reaction to celibacy, and the yearning after some visible and tangible Christian relic and sign, the vision of the Holy Grail. From this horde of medieval fancies later poets have taken what they could, have placed the jewels in settings of their own fashioning. The Romance writers were by no means restricted to Matter of Britain, with Celtic traditions. Or to Matter of France, the epics of Charlemagne and his peers, or even to Matter of Rome, ranging through all antiquity. Material came in from popular tales of all countries, and from recent historical events, as in the romance of Richard Coeur de Lyon. In the 15th century there was a romance of Jean d'Arc, as fantastic as any. The matter of it survives partly in the prose of the Chronique de Lorraine, and has drifted into Henry VI, P.T.I. In France the most famous and fashionable novelists of the late 12th century were Crétine de Troyes and Benoît d'Estilly. Moore, author of The Great Romance of Troy, 
whose manner, long-winded and elaborately courtly, was strangely revived by the French romancers of the years preceding Molière. Tristram The earliest English romances, or novels of chivalrous adventures, are couched in metre. Among the first is Sir Tristram, usually spelled Tristram, certainly this has been the most popular in modern times. Sir Walter Scott edited it, from the copy in the Ahenlec manuscript, a collection of early poems once in the possession of Boswell of Ahenlec, father of Dr. Johnson's Boswell. 11. Sir Walter was persuaded that Sir Tristram was written from local Celtic tradition, by the famed Thomas of Ursuldown, called the Rhymer. Thomas, who dwelt at Ursuldown, Earl Stone on Leader Water, was a neighbor, as it were, of Scott at Abbotsford. He died between 1286 and 1299, and he had great though obviously accidental fame, as a prophet. The poem on Tristram begins with the words. I was at Ursuldown. With Thomas spake I there. There heard I read in round. Who Tristram gat and bare. That is, I heard who the father and mother of Tristram were. Who was king with crown. And who him fostered yar. And who was bold Baron, As their elders were. By year. Thomas tells in tune. This aventures as tie where. The English poet uses this difficult stanza in place of the simple rhymes of a French original which knew nothing of Ursuldown. In similar stanzas, of French origin as usual, the whole romance is told. Throughout, Thomas is mentioned as the source of the story, as Thomas hath us taught. There are fragments of an earlier French romance in which Thomas is also quoted as the source, and an early German version, by Godfrey of Strasbourg refers to Thomas of Brittany. Scott was well aware that the story of Tristram was popular in France long before the time of Thomas of Ursuldown, but he liked to believe that Thomas collected Celtic traditions of Tristram from the people of Lederdale and Tweedale. Though they, by 1220-1290, were English in blood and speech. In the romance, Tristram is peerless in music, chess playing, the fine art of hunting, and of cutting up the deer, and his main virtue is constancy to Isolt, wife of his uncle, King Mark. This unfortunate prince is not the crafty avenger of his own wrongs, as in Mallory's, Mort d'Arthur, but a guileless, good-natured being, constantly and ludicrously deceived. Isolt is treacherous and cruel, but everything is forgiven to her, and, as the manuscript, is defective, we do not know how the poet handled the close of the tale, the episode of the other assault of the white hands. Scott finished the tale in the meter and language of the original. Tristram is dying in Brittany, only assault of Cornwall can heal him, as only Enoni could heal Paris. Tristram sends for her, the vessel is to carry white sails if it bears her. Black, if it does not. The idea is from the Greek saga of Theseus. The second assault, wife of Tristram, falsely reports that the sails of the vessel are black. Tristram dies, and Assault of Cornwall falls dead when she beholds him. Switch lovers ALS they. Near shall be mo. Concludes Sir Walter. Havelock. In Havelock we naturally expect, thinking of our historical hero Havelock, to find a true English romance. The scene is partly in England, the tale is of a Danish king's son kept out of his own by one of the most fearsome guardians of romance, who chops up the hero's little sisters, is saved by the thrall Grimm, who was ordered to murder him, and, after adventures as a kitchen lad, marries an English princess who is in the hands of another usurper. The story is truly English in sentiment and style. The poet curses Goddard, the murderous oppressor of Havelock, in a thoroughly satisfactory fashion. The noble birth of the hero is recognized by the battle flame of the ancient Irish romances. The flame with which Athene crowns Achilles in Homer shines round Havelock. This light warns Grimm not to drown Havelock, and teaches the oppressed lady whom he wins that her wooer is no kitchen knave but a prince in disguise. The story has abundance of spirit, and may be read with more pleasure than the romance of the perfidies of assault. It is written in no affected and entangled rhymes, but in rhyming couplets. King Horn In King Horn we have a novel that must have been reckoned most satisfactory. 
The course of true love is interrupted by accidents which caused the utmost anxiety to the readers, who probably looked at the end to see if she got him. He was Prince Horn, son of Murray, king of Sadine, the realm is, by west, and is invaded by Saracens. They spare Horn for his beauty's sake, but launch him in a boat with his friends, Athulf and Feichenhild. His land they overrun, and disestablish the church, being themselves professors of the Moslem religion. Horn drifts to the shore of the realm of Westerness, under King Aelmar. Here the king's daughter Rymenhild falls in love with Horn, but cannot have an opportunity of declaring her passion. In the romances the lady, as a rule, begins the wooing. By Athelbris, the steward, Athulf is brought to her bower, apparently in the dark, for she addresses him as Horn. Horn, quoth she, well long. I have thee loved strong. Athulf undeceives her. Horn is brought, in the absence of King Aelmar, Rymenhild again speaks the secret of her heart, and when Horn alludes to their unequal ranks, she faints away, one of the earliest faints executed by any heroine in English fiction. Horn kisses her into consciousness, and she devises that he shall be knighted. The king consents, giving him a ring which secures him from dread of dunce, sends him to win glory. Horn at once kills a hundred Saracens. But Feichenhild, his false friend, finds Horn consoling Rymenhild for a dream of a great fish that burst her landing net. Feichenhild, in jealousy, warns King Aelmar, who discovers Horn and his daughter embracing. Horn is exiled, and bids Rymenhild wait seven years, and then marry if she will. Like the daughter of, that Turk, in, the loving ballad of Lord Bateman, she, takes a vow and keeps it strong. At another court Horn, now styled Cutbird, not only slays giants, but encounters and routs the very Saracens who had invaded his father's dominions. The king of the country offers Horn his daughter and realm, he, however, is true to his vow, but, at the end of seven years, Rymenhild is betrothed to a king. She sends a boy to Horn with a message. In returning with Horn's reply the boy is drowned. The princess finds his dead body. Disguised as a palmer, like Ivanhoe, Horn returns to Westerness, and, like Odysseus, sits on the ground at the palace, as a beggar. Rymenhild does not recognize him, asks him if he has met Horn, and is shown her own ring. Horn, she is told, is dead. She had secreted a knife to kill her bridegroom, like the bride of Lammermoor. Then Horn reveals himself, the pair are wedded, but he has still to recover his own kingdom. This he does, but Feichenhild has carried off Rymenhild. Disguised as minstrels, Horn and his friends surprise him in his new castle, and all ends happily. Horn is a fair example, happily short, of the novels of the period, which, in essence, are like all good novels that end well. Assonance, rhyme of vowels but not of consonants, occurs in the verse. He lockied on his ringe. And thogged on Rymenhild. It is not necessary to analyze the plots of all the romances, two or three enable us to estimate the kind of fiction that was popular with ladies in Bower. Bews of Hamtown Sir Bews of Hamtown is another English romance, concerning the son of the Earl of Southampton and his wife, a princess of Scotland. The Earl is old, and his bride proposes to the Kaiser to kill the Earl and wed herself. The Emperor promptly invades England and cuts off the head of the good Earl. The Scottish traitress orders the murder of her son, Bewes, but is deceived by her agent, and Bewes knocks down the Kaiser. The boy is sold and sent to Armenia, where he refuses to worship Aplin, Apollo. The pagan king has a fair daughter, Josian, who becomes the mistress of Bewes, while he has a conquered giant, Ascapart, for page. After a thousand adventures, Bewes and Josian, being true lovers, make a good end, and die together. The English writer, prolix as he is, has shortened his French original, in places, made additions in others, and generally writes with freedom. Guy of Warwick The same happy end, simultaneous death, rewards the hero and heroine of Guy of Warwick. The hero's unexplained forgetfulness of his lady, Felice, is borrowed from the ancient popular tale in Scots, The Black Bull of Norway, where the forgetfulness is explained. 
Many stock incidents of the romances come from popular tales, Merkin, of unknown antiquity. Felice is a very learned and rather hard-hearted maiden, and Guy, when in love, faints frequently. The romance contains every kind of adventure with dragons, lions, and human foes, and as much religion as devout damsels could desire, or even more, for Guy, in a devout mood, deserts the learned Felice for a life of chastity in military adventure. As usual he returns in the guise of a palmer. Arthur and Merlin The Art Hour and Merlin, a rhymed romance of the old story, from the Ahenlech manuscript, about 1320, has not the gleams of true poetry that shine in Lyman's Brute, and is verbose and incomplete, the tragedy of Arthur is absent. We find, however, the story of how Arthur won the sword Excalibur, thereby proving himself a true prince, for no other man could pluck it from the stone into which it was driven. King Lot, Lu, a historical personage apparently, could not draw forth Excalibur. Sir Kay, one of Arthur's companions in the oldest Welsh tales, appears, with Sir Gawain, whose character, as in the Welsh romances, is far above that which he displays in the Idols of the King. Merlin continually exercises the art of glamour, appearing in various forms, and Arthur loves Guinevere, but the poet wearied of his toil long before the last battle in the West. He professes that, as many gentlemen know not French, and as right is that English che understand. That was born in England. He sings in English of the glory of England, Arthur. The final English form of the great Arthurian tale may best be considered when we arrive at the date of Sir Thomas Mallory and Caxton. In Mallory's Mort Arthur, the long dull wars of the king against the Anglo-Saxon invaders are much compressed, while the epic, tragic, and mystic elements, the great character of Lancelot, the mournful victory of the winning of the grail, and the end of all, are handled with genius. The Tale of Troy The story of Troy had a hold on the medieval mind only less strong than the story of Arthur. In early English, at the end of the 14th century, we find the romance in the revived Anglo-Saxon alliterative form. It is the, jest historial, concerning the destruction of Troy, and the story is told once more in the rhyming couplets of the, Troy book. The manuscript of the, Troy book, is marked, Liber Gilielmi Laud, Archiepiscopi Cantuar et Cancellariae Universitatis Oxon 1633. The book of William Laud, Archbishop of Canterbury and Chancellor of the University of Oxford. The author of the alliterative romance begins by saying that learned men wrote the history in Latin, but that poets have corrupted it by fables and partisanship. Homer, he says, was notoriously partial to the Greeks. Moreover, he introduced incredible gods fighting like men. Ovid, on the other hand, was honest, Virgil was true to the rightful cause, that of Troy, but the best authority is Gido, Guido de Colana. Such was the nature of historical criticism as understood by the medieval romancer. For love of lost causes, and, as descendants of the Trojans through the brood of medieval myth, the romancers detested the Achaeans, the conquering Greeks. The Story of Troy from Homer to Shakespeare The history of the development of the Tale of Troy, as Chaucer and even as Shakespeare knew it, is very curious. Homer himself, perhaps living about 1100 to 1000 BC. Tells, in the Iliad and Odyssey, parts of the tale, as it was known to his own people, the conquering Achaeans, who were to the older dwellers in Greece what the Normans were to the English. They finally melted into the older population, who, about 800 to 700 BC, wrote poems of their own about the tale of Troy, altered the facts, and blackened the characters of Homer's greatest heroes. Later, again, the great Athenian tragedians, of the 5th century BC, wrote dramas more on the lines of the conquered population of Greece than on those of Homer, and they still more deeply degraded some of the heroes of Homer. The Romans, looking on themselves as descended from the Trojans, persevered in the same course, and a Greek, after the Christian era, wrote a prose version of the Tale of Troy, pretending that it was a manuscript by Dictys of Crete, who was a spectator of the Trojan War. A similar prose book was attributed, to another spectator, Dares of Phrygia. These books tell the story of Troilus and Cressida, of Polymedes, and many other tales unknown to Homer. 
But, in Western Europe, Homer was unread, and unknown in England till Chapman translated him, and all the romancers about Troy, Lydgate, Chaucer, Caxton, and the rest, down to Shakespeare, depend on the false tales whose growth we have described. Probably the first romancer who expanded the bald prose narratives of dares and dictis was Benoit de saint maur 1160, in a long French rhyming poem. He unites the fates of Breseda, Briseis, daughter of Calchas, the Greek priest who is made a Trojan, and Troilus, son of King Priam. Breseda, through a confusion with Homer's, Chryses, daughter of Chryses, the Phrygian priest of Apollo, later becomes the Cressid of Chaucer and Shakespeare. Meanwhile, Gido, or Guido de Colana, did the French of Benoit into Latin prose, 1287, and Guido is the source of the English authors of the alliterative and the rhyming romances of Troy. The pedigree of the story is Pseudo dares, pseudo dictis. Benoit de Saint Maur. Guido de Colana. The English romances. Through Caxton's printed Book of Troy, the story continued popular a cheap edition appeared in the 18th century. Each of Homer's poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey, deals but with the adventures of a fortnight, or six weeks, but the medieval readers wanted, and from the romancers received, the whole history of the Ten Years' Siege, and more. With Christian legends thrown in, with minute descriptions of all the characters, Cassandra, Gleit a little, had a slight cast of the eye like Mary Stuart. The heroes fight as mounted knights, not in chariots, they use crossbows as well as longbows, and Hector kills men by the thousand, with more than Irish exaggeration. As Hector must be killed, Achilles suddenly charges him in front, while his shield is slung behind. Had a Trojan poet left an epic on the war he would not have told the story otherwise. The poet of the laud, Troy Book, bids God curse Aeneas as a traitor, forgetting, apparently, that the British are descendants of Aeneas. King Alessandra The history of Alexander with all manner of romantic and fabulous additions, under the name, King Alessandra, is in rhyming couplets of eight syllables to each line. The couplets are often irregular, as in Coleridge's, Cristobal, and the story, like most of the English romances of this period, is borrowed through the French, from a late fabulous Greek work. This kind of versified romance endured till Chaucer thought it tiresome, and parroted it, in Sir Thopas. These rhyming English romances, in various forms of verse, were made for ladies and gentlemen who, already, were not able to read the more artistic and elaborate French romances for themselves. But were very well able to take pleasure in stories of true love and miraculous adventures. The romances set a fashion which was continued in the endless heroic novels in prose, French, and English, down to the end of the 17th century. The Middle Ages had no taste for novels of ordinary life, about people of their own time. These, in England, do not begin to appear till the reign of Queen Elizabeth, and then nearly a century and a half passed before they became really popular. If much has been said about these old romances it is because they have so powerfully impressed themselves on the fancy of all later English poets, from Shakespeare and Milton, who dreamed of an epic on Arthur. And delighted in the sonorous names of Arthur's knights, to Tennyson and William Morris. The romances, composed of fancies from so many sources and times, Greek, Celtic, Roman, and French, and English, are like that Corinthian bronze composed of gold and silver, copper and lead, all molten together at the burning of Corinth. In this rich metal poets of later times have molded figures in their own fashion. 8. Alliterative Romances and Poems Though English poets, in the 14th century, had a full command of rhyme, and of many forms, simple or complicated, of rhyming verse, there began a return to the old Anglo-Saxon alliterative verse. Sometimes combined with rhyme. Chaucer, later, makes his parson say, I am a Southron man. I can not jest, rum, ram, ruff, by letra. Na, God what, rym hold I but lytel betre. The parson's opinion is his own, not that of Chaucer, who certainly liked rhyme, whether he liked alliterative rhythm or not. Gawain and the Green Knight. A famous and really amusing alliterative romance, with a rhymed close to each passage, is, Gawain and the Green Knight. 
This tale is found in a manuscript which also contains two devout poems, Patience, and Cleanness, with an elegy of remarkable merit, The Pearl. All four poems are attributed by several critics to the same author, and some of the Scottish learned believe that author to have been a very prolific and accomplished Scot. A few words may be said on this question later, meanwhile, Gawain and the Green Knight has the merit of being readable. Though Gawain is best known in modern times through Tennyson's Idols of the King, in the romance he was by no means the false, fleeting, perjured knight of the great laureate. In the Welsh triads and other early Welsh versions, he is one of the three golden-mouthed heroes, one of the three most courteous. He was the eldest son of King Lu, Loth or Lot, a contemporary of Arthur, from whom he received Lothian. In Geoffrey of Monmouth, Gawain appears as Walwainus. The figure of Lancelot comes later, as we saw, into romance, and Lancelot and Gawain then become foes. When Tristram, or Tristan, was introduced into the circle of Arthur, later, the authors of the Tristan, under Henry II and Henry III, had, for some reason, a bitter spite against King Lot and all his family, and calumniated Gawain on every occasion. This vein of detraction pervades Mallory's Mort Arthur, where Tennyson, looking for a false fleeting knight, found the Gawain of the Idols. In Gawain and the Green Knight, Arthur's friend displays great courage, courtesy, tact, and chastity under severe temptations, while, if he falls for a moment short of heroic virtue, he redeems his character by frank confession. The story is too good to be spoiled by a brief summary, grotesque as is the figure of the gigantic Green Knight, who suffers no inconvenience from the loss of his head, the trials of Gawain are most ingeniously invented. And he overcomes them like the flower of chivalry. He is rewarded by the magical, green lace, which may, it has been suggested, symbolize the Order of the Garter, about 1345, though the ribbon of the garter is now dark blue. Pearl In the manuscript volume containing, Gawain and the Green Knight, is the singular poem, Pearl, which has been described as the, in memoriam, of the 14th century. It is, indeed, an elegy by one who has lost a, pearl, probably a Margaret, who dies before she is two years old. The poet bewails his loss, and speaks, in a vision, with his pearl, concerning religion and the future life. The poem, edited, paraphrased, and annotated by Mr. Gollinks, was praised by Tennyson as, true pearl of our poetic prime. Pearl, is written in stanzas of twelve lines, with some resemblance to the form of the Italian sonnet, in fourteen lines, with which the author may have been familiar. The system of rhyming may be roughly illustrated thus. Pearl that for prince's pleasure may Be cleanly closed in gold so clear Out of the orient dare I say Never I proved her precious peer So round, so rich, and in such array So small, so smooth the sides of her were Whenever I judged of jewels gay Shapeliest still was the sight of her Alas, in an arbor I lost her here Through grass to ground she passed I what? I dwine, forsaken of sweet love's cheer. Of my privy pearl without a spot. The same rhymes persevere through the first eight lines, as in a sonnet, the rhyme of the second, fourth, sixth, and eighth lines continues in the ninth and eleventh. A new rhyme appears in the tenth and twelfth lines, and throughout there is much alliteration. In stanzas one to five, pearl without an spot, comes always as a refrain at the close, and other refrains end each set of five or six stanzas, as in the old French ballade. The form is thus difficult and highly artificial, the making of the poem was, as Tennyson says, the dull mechanic exercise, to deaden the pain of the singer. The poet, fallen on the grassy grave of the lost child, lies entranced, but his spirit floats forth to a strange land of cliffs and woods, where the leaves shine as burnished silver, and birds of strange hues float and sing. He comes to a river crystal clear, whose pearls glow like sapphire and emerald, but that river has no ford, and may not be crossed by living man. On the farther shore he sees a maiden clad in white and in pearls, fresh as a fleur de lis. She is the blessed damoiselle, the lady pearl. Her locks are golden, and her crown is of pearls and gold. 
she tells the dreamer that she is not lost, his pearl is in a coffer, safely set in the garden of paradise. She comforts him with the hope and comfort of Christ. Henceforward her discourse is religious, he strives to cross that river, and to reach the shining city of the Apocalypse, but he wakes on the grave of his child. And consoles himself with the promise of the communion of the saints. The machinery of the dream, and the river, are borrowed, as all poets then borrowed, from the famous French, Roman de la Rose, 1240, with its allegorical characters. This fashion of poetry, always beginning with a dream, in which the dreamer has visionary adventures with allegorical personages, became a kind of literary epidemic, terribly tedious and conventional, as time went on. The poet has given to his lay the charm of sorrow not without hope, and a dainty grace of artifice that is not insincere, of his tears are pearls made. As to the author of Pearl, there is much difference of opinion. Nothing in the two edifying poems in the same manuscript, cleanness, and patience, makes it improbable that he wrote them. Gawain and the Green Knight is a very different composition, yet of lofty character. The author of Pearl may have written it, just as the author of The Lotus Eaters wrote The Northern Farmer and The Charge of the Light Brigade. Hutchown. With a number of other poems, Pearl has been claimed for a Scot, Hutchown, Sir Hugh of Eglintown, an Ayrshire laird, known as a fighting man, a diplomatist, and a judge, in the reign of David II of Scotland, he flourished between 1342 and 1377. Or perhaps Hutchown was a priest, nobody knows. The process of argument is this. Some 43 years after Sir Hugh died, in 1420, a Scottish writer of history in rhyme, Wintown, produced his original crony kill, his spelling is original enough. He says that, Hutchown of the All Reali, wrote learnedly, on the Brute and Arthur themes, in his, Jest Historial, that is a rhymed romance named, Mort Arthur. Wintown also says that Hutchown made the, Gret Jest off Arthur, apparently the, Mort Arthur, the, Ontire off Gawain, perhaps, Gawain and the Green Knight, or perhaps the, Aunters of Arthur. And the, Pystyll of Sweet Susane, a poem still extant, on Susanna and the Elders, the story in the Apocrypha. Some claim for Hutchown not only these pieces, but Pearl, Cleanness, and Patience, and long poems on Alexander the Great, and the Tale of Troy, and much more. Hutchown, on this theory, must have been a professional poet, yet he has been identified, we saw, with Sir Hugh of Eglintown, a soldier, diplomatist, and man of affairs. It is certainly improbable that a man so busy as Sir Hugh of Eglintown wrote such a huge mass of poetry unless he were as energetic as Sir Walter Scott. The great alliterative, Mort Arthur, wanders from the true way, pointed out in the ancient Welsh verses on, The Graves of Heroes, and by Lyman. The grave of Arthur, is no mystery to honest Hutchown. Of the king it cannot be said, in Avalon he groweth old, he does not dwell with, the fairest of all elves, he is buried at Glastonbury, a fable invented late, in the honour of that beautiful and desolate home of old religion. Hutchown shows that he was intimately familiar with minutiae of English law, which Sir Hugh of Eglintown was more likely to know than an obscure parish priest. Many other curious arguments in favour of Sir Hugh of Eglintown as author of the Mort Arthur have been set forth, by the learned ingenuity of Mr. George Nielsen, who also claims for him, Pearl, but we still marvel how a busy man like Sir Hugh, living in a rough age, found time for all his labours. The Pistol of Susan adds little, save in one passage, to the laurels of Hutchown. It is a tale of Susanna and the Elders, told in stanzas, both alliterative and rhyming, of eight lines, followed by one short line of two syllables, then come three, rhyming lines of three feet, and a fourth rhyming to the first in this set, thus. And told. How their wickedness comes. Of the wrongest dooms. That they have given to Gomez, men. These judges of old. The Garden of Susan is described in a manner both copious, florid, and inconsistent with botanical science, but there is a touching scene between the falsely accused Susan and her husband. Hutchown is also credited with the Aunters, Adventures, of Arthur, 
which contains a curious appearance of the ghost of Guinevere's mother to Sir Gawain and Dame Gainer, Guinevere. This is certainly the Grislest Ghast, the grisliest of ghosts, but she has all of Hutchown's delight in theology and edification, prophecy, heraldry, and hunting. The meter is not unlike but is not identical with that of Susan. By Scottish critics the Mort Arthur and Susan, at least, are claimed for the Ayrshire Bard, Sir Hugh, and, if they are right, Scotland was civilized enough, and fortunate enough, to have a considerable poet before Barber. Author of The Bruss, 1376, a rhymed history of King Robert Bruce, the great hero of his country. But the literature of Scotland is more conveniently to be treated in a separate chapter. 9. Chaucer. Hitherto we have known scarcely anything about the lives, and usually have not even known the names, of the writers in English verse and prose. About. The morning star of song who made. His music heard below. About Geoffrey Chaucer, we know more than we do of Shakespeare. Chaucer is the earliest English poet who is still read for human pleasure, as well as by specialists in the studies of literature, language, and prosody. A few of his lines are part of the common stock of familiar quotations. Coming between two periods of literary twilight, the second saddened rather than cheered by notes more like those of the owl than of the lark and nightingale. Chaucer is himself the son of England during the age of the glory and decline of the Plantagenets. His Canterbury Tales show us the world in which he lived, or at least part of that world, his pilgrims are personages in that glorious pageant which Froissart painted, kings, ladies, nobles and knights in steel, or in velvet and cloth of gold. Tournaments glitter in all the colors and devices of the heralds, while the horizon is dim with the smoke of burning towns and villages. It is not really possible to say what conditions produce great poets, they may arise in times of peace or war. In times quiet or revolutionary, at prosperous courts or in the clay-built cottages of peasants. At least Chaucer lived a long time in an age eagerly astir, lived through the light cast by the great victories of Edward III, Cressy and Poitiers, the years when London knew two captive kings, John of France and David of Scotland. The years when Edward turned away from the all but conquered Scotland to fight the France which he could not conquer. Chaucer knew the court triumphant, and the court overshadowed by the discredited old age of Edward III, the fatal malady of the Black Prince, the troubles of the minority of Richard II, and the peasant rising of what Tyler. He had his part in the patronage of that art-loving king, by character and fate more resembling a Stuart than a Plantagenet, and he was in friendly relations with the rising house of Lancaster. He marked the dawn of the religious and social revolution in the doctrines of Wycliffe and of the Lollards, the hatred of the rich and noble, the scorn of priests and monks and friars. He felt the poetic influences of France and Italy, and, if not in Italy, certainly in France, had poetic friends. He bore arms in France, in Italy and France he fulfilled diplomatic duties, at home he held a courtly place, he sat in Parliament. He was a complete man of the world and of affairs, as well as a man of learning and of letters. He was always of open, kind, and cheerful humor. Still, when nicknamed Bold Grizzle, by his friends, dipping a white beard contentedly in the Gascon wine, still, not without the liar, not a deserter of the muse. His portrait, as Old Grizzle, white-bearded and white-haired, a rosary in his hand, shows a face refined, kindly, and humane. The father of the poet, John Chaucer, was a citizen of London, a prosperous vintner, or wine merchant. The date of the poet's birth is unknown, that he died an old man in 1400 is certain. His birth year was for long given as 1328, when his father was scarcely sixteen, and was unmarried. The date 1328 for the poet's birth must be wrong, and the year 1340 is uncertain. In a trial of 1386, to decide whether the Scropes or Groveners had the better right to blazon the famous Bandor, Chaucer was described as, of the age of forty years and more, having borne arms for twenty-seven years. And more is vague, we cannot be certain that it means, just over forty years of age, though that, as far as I have observed, is the usual meaning in old records of ages of witnesses. In some cases, on the other hand, 
they are given most incorrectly. Chaucer's own remarks about his ELD in late poems tell us little, at forty Thackeray wrote of himself as if he lay in Methuselah's cradle. As, in 1386, Chaucer had borne arms for twenty-seven years, that takes us back to 1359, when he went, under the standard of Lionel, Duke of Clarence, on a far from triumphant expedition of Edward III against France. He is unlikely, at that date, 1359, to have been under fifteen years of age, he may have been born as late as 1343, or anywhere between 1340 and 1343. The household accounts of the wife of the Duke of Clarence prove that Chaucer was a member of her household, and, in 1357, she, and Chaucer, were staying with John of Gaunt, at Hatfield, in Yorkshire. In the campaign of 1359, when Chaucer bore arms, Edward III failed to take Reims and Paris, he wasted the country vainly, and made peace, at Bretigny, in 1360. Somewhere and somehow Chaucer was taken prisoner by the French, whether in a skirmish, or while foraging, or when visiting his lady, or absorbed in a book, or meditating the muse, and contending with the difficulties of rhyme. His captors thought that there was money in his case, or they would have knocked him on the head. There was money. Edward III paid, sixteen pounds, whether as the whole or as part of his ransom, March 1, 1360. The sum, equivalent to our two hundred pounds, was not then insignificant for a youth not of noble birth, though, in 1368, an esquire. Account books show Chaucer, 1367, as a valet of the royal chamber, like Moliere, and Shakespeare. In France during the time of war in 1369, salaried by the king, a married man, pensioned by John of Gaunt in 1374, and receiving a daily pitcher of wine, commuted for money in 1378. In 1372 to 1373, he went on a mission to Genoa and Florence. Whether he then met the famous poet Petrarch or not, is uncertain, in his, Clerk's Tale, the clerk says that he met Petrarch, it does not follow that Chaucer was so fortunate. In 1374 he got a good place in the custom house, in the wool department, and, 1375 to 1376, had valuable gifts from the king. In 1377 he went on a mission to Flanders, and on another to France. Froissart the delightful chronicler mentions him in this connection. In the following year he went on a mission to Visconti in Milan, and to the celebrated English commander of mercenaries, Sir John Hawkwood. His experiences made Chaucer equally fit to sing of, the court, the camp, the grove, his various posts in the civil service brought him acquainted with merchant men, architects, all sorts and conditions of men. In 1386 he sat in Parliament for a division of Kent. Parliament made an attack on the court, and Chaucer lost his offices, which he had for some time performed by deputy. Later he received valuable appointments, but by 1398 he needed and obtained royal protection from his creditors. Probably he was never a frugal man, he was not in the best circumstances towards the end of his life, but neither Richard II or Henry IV let old Grizzle starve. Henry was no sooner on the throne, September 30, 1399, than, October 3, he gave the poet a pension of forty marks and ratified a pension given by the ill-fated Richard five years previously. If Chaucer's wife, Philippa, was the sister of Catherine, mistress and, 1396, wife of John of Gaunt, father of Henry IV, the poet had a friend in the Lancastrian party. But the fact is uncertain, unimportant, and a great cause of the spilling of ink. Chaucer died on October 25, 1400. We only know, as regards Chaucer's children, that he had a little boy, Louis, whom, in his prose work on the astrolabe, he addresses in a style that makes us love him. He gives him, at his earnest prayer, an astrolabe and writes for him, in English, a little treatise on its use, for Latin canst thou but small, my little son. The poet, the friend of that less charming minstrel, Moral Gower, left a fragrant memory. When we open Chaucer's works at the prologue to the Canterbury Tales, usually placed in the forefront, and when we remember the wilderness of long romances through which we have wandered, the happy change of scene. The return to actual human life, is surprising. 
Chaucer is by no means free from the blemishes of Middle English literature. If he is not to be called prolix in his narratives, when his eye is on the object, the main object, he is none the less profuse in digressions. His mastery of verse was not born fully armed, he had to acquire it by effort, by experiment, he had to feel his way. An unusually large number of his poems are unfinished, some he seems to have abandoned, like the Legend of Good Women, because he felt that he was on the wrong path. That his task was no longer pleasant to himself, and therefore certainly could not give pleasure to his readers. He was, at first, eager to impart information, as the early Scops conceived it their duty to do. Gathering his materials from all sources, Latin, French, and Italian, he, in The Book of the Duchess, about 1369, makes the bereaved husband not only allude to many classical tales of sorrow, but actually give his authorities for each case. And so saith dares frights, or Aurora telleth so. Even the old habit of preaching at great length, the habit of edifying, clung to Chaucer. He was a man of the world, the last man to risk martyrdom for any advanced theological ideas which he might be inclined to entertain, and not the first to suppose that any set of opinions contained the absolute truth. In his day a fierce attack was made against the wealth of the church and the luxury into which many members of the regulars, of the various monkish orders, had fallen. The curse of a parson was no longer so much feared as it had been. The exhibition of saintly relics for money, the arrival of pardons hot from Rome, could safely be derided. The friars had been the butts of the French authors of fablios, tales of coarse popular humor, for two centuries. Such censures were not heterodox, they did not assail matters of faith, and the satire of Chaucer is always as good-humored as it is humorous. To him the partner and summon hour of the Canterbury Tales, and the rest of the riff-raff of the church are amusing knaves, he has Shakespeare's smiling tolerance for such a rogue as paroles. He is earnestly sympathetic in his famous portrait of the good and gentle parish priest, a man of true religion and undefiled, a man of the Order of St. James, like the ladies in the Ancran Roll. It were much more pleasant, perhaps more profitable, to linger over and lovingly enumerate the charms of Chaucer at his best. Then to trace him through his early experiments to such masterpieces as the blending of old Greek romance and manners with the manners and romance of chivalry in The Knight's Tale, and in Troilus and Chryside. But it is customary to trace the making of Chaucer, not only through his experiences of court and camp and grove and city, but through his literary work. It is certain that in youth he translated that great popular French poem, the Roman de la Rose, for he says so in his prologue to his Legend of Good Women. The French poem was begun by Guillaume de Loris about a century before the birth of Chaucer, as an allegory on the refinements of the doctrine of love, as taught in the courts of love. Guillaume says that he has the warrant of Macrobius, in his Dream of Scipio, for supposing that dreams are not wholly to be neglected, so he dreams, of course in May, of how the bird sang. And how he walked beside that very stream which the author of Pearl borrowed, and converted into the river that sunders the living and the dead. He encounters allegorical works of art, representative of all things evil, outside the walls of a beautiful garden, within which are love and all things good. The ideas have a sweet vernal freshness, on their first presentation, but by repetition become as artificial as those of the carte du tendre, the map of love's land which amused the preciouses, the affected literary ladies. In the youth of Moliere, 1650-1660. The dreamer desires a lovely rose, watched by a squire, Belle Acuel, fair welcome, and the adventures, and fables from Ovid, are of a kind so taking to medieval readers that henceforth every poet had his May dream, birds, river, love, Venus. Allegorical personages, and the rest of the t machinery. Dolores left the lover in despair, but Jean de Mung continued the poem at enormous length, and in a spirit far from chivalrous, he introduced every kind of new heresy against the feudal ideals, and so began a controversy in which Gerson, who lived to befriend the cause of Jean d'Arc, 1429, took up his pen in defense of Christianity and chastity. This Roman de la Rose, or much of it, Chaucer assuredly did translate, 
but on the question as to whether the Ramant of the Rose, printed in his works, is holy, or only in part, or is not at all from his hand, scholars dispute endlessly. It is not possible, here, to follow the mazes of the dispute, which turns on the quality of the work, the closeness or laxity of the translation in various parts. The presence or absence of traces of the northern dialect, Chaucer wrote Midland English, the correctness or incorrectness of the rhymes, and other details. The opinion that the first 1,700 lines or so are Chaucer's, that his manuscript was defective, that the later portions, some 6,000 lines, were filled up from manuscripts by other hands, is not certain, but is not improbable. Many other views are defended. Early Poems Though we do not often know the dates of Chaucer's poems, the development of his genius can be traced with much probability. Roughly speaking, in his first period he is mainly inspired by French influences, in his second are added Italian influences, he was always reading such Latin authors as he could procure. He was suppling his style by experiments in French measures demanding much search for rhymes. And finally, in the Canterbury Tales, his best work is purely English in character, though he still introduces translations from other languages when it suits his purpose. The Deed of the Duchesse is of 1369-1370, for it deplores the decease of Blanche, wife of John of Gaunt, Lancaster, and the lady departed this life in 1369. Here Chaucer works in accordance with the usual formula of the Roman de la Rose. He begins with a dream, but his sleep is a respite in a period of eight years of insomnia, described so pitifully that the passage seems autobiographical. He cannot tell, he says why he is unable to sleep. I hold it be a sickness. That I have suffered this eight year. Perhaps his nerves were shattered by the circumstances of his capture and durance in 1360, for prisoners of war were treated with great cruelty, placed in holes under heavy stones, or locked up in wooden cages. Unable to sleep, Chaucer has Ovid's story of Sikhs and Alcyone read to him. He says elsewhere that in youth he made a poem on this tale, now he probably utilized his old material in the poem on the Duchess. In the Sikh's tale, Alcyone prays to Juno for the grace of sleep and dream, and Chaucer, humorous always, vows that he will even risk the heresy of presenting gifts to heathen gods, Morpheus and Juno, if they will give him slumber. His prayer is heard, and this prologue is by far the best part of, The Deed of Blanche the Duchess. It is personal, it is touching, and the story is charmingly told. In his sleep comes the usual dream of the chamber decorated with works of mythological art, a stock feature, as in the Roman de la Rose, there is a hunting scene, with French terms of venere, and then Chaucer meets a mourner, John of Gaunt, whose long plaint and narration of similar sorrows in fable, with due reference to authorities, is prolix and pedantic, to a modern taste. This piece is in rhymed octosyllabic couplets. Other Early Poems The Complaint unto Pite, Pity, is the earliest of Chaucer's poems in Rhyme Royal, so called, some think, because James I of Scotland used it much later in The King's Quair, a far-fetched guess. The poet seeks pity, and finds her dead. He adds the petition which he meant to have presented to her, that of a despairing lover. The ideas are hackneyed, and the piece is a mere exercise. The meter, later much used by Chaucer in narrative runs thus. This is to sane, I will be yours ever. Though ye me slee by cruelty, your fo. Allgate my spirit shall never dissever. Fro your servise, for any pain or we. Sith ye be deed, alias. That hid is so. Thus for your death I may wel weep and plain. With hurt sore and fill of Bessie pain. The ABC is a hymn of prayer to Our Lady, each stanza beginning with each successive letter of the alphabet. It is an exercise in translation from a French original, the stanzas are shorter than in the French. The complaint of Mars tells of the wooing of a medieval Mars and Venus, interrupted by Apollo with Torche in Hand. The original source of the story is the song of the Phaeacian minstrel in the Odyssey, but that is humorous, while Chaucer is sympathetic, Mars asks poets not to make game of his passion. Take it not a game. 
the Phaeacian singer did, take it a game. A complaint to his lady, is of the conventional kind, and an exercise in meters. Anelida and Arcite, is also scholar's work, but the scholar has now learned Italian, during his Italian mission of 1372. Has read and in places translates the, Tessiide, of Boccaccio, which he often utilized. He had also Statius, a late Latin poet, and other models, or he dealt in his own inventions. As in the Knight's Tale, Theseus returns from conquered Scythia, with his bride, Hippolyta, queen of the Amazons, and her sister, Emily, the heroine of the Knight's Tale. The unpopular tyrant, Creon, is ruling in Thebes, where Anelida loves Arcite, who is a true lover, in the Knight's Tale, but here, double in love, a follower of Lamech in Genesis, the first man who loved two ladies at once. His second love holds him tightly up by the bridle, so Anelida despairs, expressing her woe in a kind of ode, strophe and antistrophe, in stanzas of eight, and next of nine lines, with complicated rhymes. Finally with rhymes in the middle as well as at the end of each line. The poem, more interesting than the previous experiments, and not without passion, is unfinished, ends abruptly. The Parliament of Fowls appears to be a kind of laureate's ode on the marriage, January, 1382, of Richard II with and of Bohemia, who previously had two other wars, a prince of Bavaria, and the Margrave of Meissen. When the birds hold their parliament, the Formel Eagle represents and Richard is the royal Tercel Eagle, the two other Tercels are the German wooers. Chaucer was always a most literary poet, and was still an adaptive poet. As he must begin with a dream, he versifies the contents of Cicero's Dream of Scipio, he takes a little from Dante, a little from Claudian, the whole pageant of birds he borrows from Alain de Lille's Plaint of Nature, greatly improving on it. While, in the debate of the birds' honesty, Valentine's Day, as to which Tercel shall win the Formel Tercel, he gives way to his own sense of humor. The verses are vers de société, designed not for our taste, but for that of the society of his time. Chaucer himself perceived the tediousness of the love pleading of the Tercels, like the host in the Canterbury Tales, when bored by Sir Thopas and the monk's tragedies, the jury of birds cry to be released. The noise of foals for to been delivered. So loud Rome, have Dune and let us Wendy. In giving their verdicts the goose is remote from sentiment, saying to the unsuccessful wooer, but she will love him, let him love another. The turtle dove blushes, and gives her word for immortal hopeless love. The poem, in the seven-line stanza, ends with a rondelle, confessedly translated from the French, and the poet wakens from his dream and returns to his dear books, on the lookout for new material. He has shown his mastery of style, and his knowledge, but he has not yet, come to his kingdom. Troilus and Chryside not to linger over other minor pieces, we may say that, in Troilus and Chryside, Chaucer does come to his kingdom, and proves himself a master, granting the taste and conditions of his age, while, in many beautiful passages, he attains to what is good for universal taste, to what is universally human. The subject is an episode in the medieval legend of the Siege of Troy, as it was embellished on the lines of the pseudo dares and the pseudo dictis, by Benoit de Saint Maur then by Guido de Colana, and then by Boccaccio in the Philostrato. The last gives Chaucer his starting point. Out of 8,239 lines, 2583 are reckoned to be translated from Boccaccio, while there are borrowings from Petrarch, and much moralizing is rendered out of the prose of Boethius, whom King Alfred translated into Anglo-Saxon. And Chaucer into the prose of his own time. Chaucer uses his materials as he pleases, greatly expanding, transposing, and omitting. Almost all his own is the character of Pandarus, who, in Homer, is merely notable for having broken a solemn truce by wounding Menelaus with an arrow. Boccaccio made him a young cousin of Chryside, who, in the medieval legend, stays shamefaced in Troy, while her father, Calchas, deserts to the Greeks. Troilus, scarcely mentioned by Homer, is the brother, and in battle almost the equal of Hector. Troilus, though he had scoffed at love, is smitten by the eyes of Chryside, and is on the point of dying without avowing his passion, when Pandarus, whom Chaucer makes the uncle of Chryside, 
acts vigorously as go-between. And saves the life of Troilus by bringing the pair together. Pandarus is a good-natured but the reverse of a scrupulously delicate friend and uncle. Nevertheless, a conscience he has, in his way, and lectures Troilus at length on the infamy of men who boast of their victories in love, and of men who play his own part from any lower motive than kindness and pity. For thee am I Beckoman. Betwixt in game and earnest, switch a mean. As makin woman unto men to comin. I'll say I not, thou wost wel what I mean. Pandarus has a conscience, to this extent, and it is to be presumed that he did not go beyond the medieval idea of what a gentleman might do to help a friend in love. Yet, he will be mocking, and his conduct is as remote from our ideas of honor, as from those of the heroic Greeks and Trojans themselves. Shakespeare has debased the Pandarus of Chaucer in his treatment of the same character in Troilus and Cressida. Chrysite herself, granting the ideas of Chaucer's time about love, is an honorable and most winning lady, the soul of honor, she wears widow's weeds for her father's shame, but she has not the faintest idea of marrying her lover. In the beautiful, the magical story of The Vigils of the Dead, in the medieval Miracles of Our Lady, we meet a most devout and pious damsel, whose views are precisely those of Chryside. No modern novelist could treat the struggle of Chryside with her passion more psychologically and more delicately, and none so charmingly as Chaucer has done. We all see Chryside, so young, gay, and winning, with the eyes of Troilus. And Troilus, brave, gentle, courteous, and modest, with the eyes of Chryside. She, learning his love from Pandarus, and deeply pitying him, sees him ride past from the battle, his helmet hewn, his shield shattered with sword strokes, the people welcoming him, and her love outruns her pity. It must be confessed that the maneuvers of Pandarus are told at very great length. The poet has all our sympathy when he cries. But flee we now prolixity best is. For love of God, and let us fast go. Right to th effect. When he does come to the point it is in a scene where delicacy tempers passion. Considered a la things as they stowed. No wonder is, sin she died al for goad. Trapped by pandarus, and yielding to love and pity. Assuredly Chryside seemed so true a lover that, like Queen Guinevere, she should have, made a good end. But as she must pass to her father in the Greek camp, being exchanged for Antenor, the end came which all the world knows, and which she foreknew. Alas, of me, unto the world's endy. Shall neither been Wyrighten nor Wysange. No good word, for thy spokes will me shende. Oh, rolled shall I been on many a tonge. Destiny in Diomede prevailed, but Chaucer speaks of false Chryside as tenderly and chivalrously as Homer speaks of Helen. Nemi any list this saily woman chide. Further than the story will devise. Her name, alias. Is published so wide. That, for her guilt it ought why now suffice. Had Chaucer left to us nothing but Troilus and Chryside, he would have given assurance of a poet so much greater than any English predecessor that the difference is one of kind, not of degree. Chaucer is our first poet of great and various genius. Space being limited, we can only say that, the House of Fame, 1383, is much influenced by Dante, while, even in modeling himself on Dante, Chaucer gives play to his natural jollity in humor. Dante was never jolly. The poem in rhyming couplets of eight syllables shows Chaucer born heavenwards by an eagle, like a middle-aged Ganymede, to Jove's house of fame. He addresses the eagle with charming banter, and the bird tells him that he is to have a holiday, for all day he sits, at his reckonings, in the custom house, and, when he returns home. Also dom as any stun. Thou sittest at another boak. This was just before the spring of 1385, when Chaucer was allowed to have a deputy. This may have been granted at the request of the Queen, and of Bohemia. And, if she did not ask Chaucer to write his next work, The Legend of Good Women, as counterbalancing the naughty Chryside, he may have chosen the subject in gratitude. It concerns ladies who were true lovers. And this book Alcestis, who gave her life for her lords, bids Chaucer present to the Queen. 
If he meant to celebrate nineteen of St. Cupid's saints, he tired of his work, and tells only of ten, of whom Cleopatra and Medea are less than saintly. Boccaccio's book, On Famous Ladies, and Ovid, On Heroines, gave him hints and materials, he also uses Ovid's, Metamorphoses, the Aeneid, and other sources of information. He is extremely severe on male flirts. Have at thee, Jasoun I now thyn horn is blow. But, far from being prolix, he merely gives the briefest summary possible of Medea's case, and leaves out almost the whole of the wonderful romance. He bids Theseus be read for shame, as the deserter of Ariadne, but here again he is very brief, and leaves Ovid to tell the tale. As all the stories are of man's cruelty and all the complaint of the women, who usually die forsaken, is. Oh, do not leave me. The poet felt that the thing was like the tragedies of his monk in the Canterbury Tales, was becoming stereotyped, and he left off in the middle of a story. The poem is in heroic measure, and Chaucer's command of this practically new instrument is perhaps the main merit of the book. The Canterbury Tales Chaucer's aim, in the Canterbury Tales, in which most readers begin to study him, though a great part of the book belongs to his late maturity, was to be universal, to paint all his world, to appeal to every taste. From that of the lovers of the broadest and coarsest humor, as in the Miller's and the Reeves' tales, to that of devout students of saintly legends, the Man of Laws, the Second Nuns, and the Prioress's tales. In the prologue to the Canterbury Tales, and in the discourses of the pilgrims, he is entirely English, the mirror of his own people. We are in a throng of Shakespearean variety, while their talk is dramatically appropriate. Each speaks in character, though the wife of Bath's tale, for example, is far more philosophic, being a reply in part to St. Jerome's praise of celibacy, than anything that we are to expect from Dame Quickly, or from Scott's Mrs. Saddletree. The prologue and the conversations of the pilgrims are the thoroughly English work of Chaucer, in the maturity of his genius. So are the humorous pieces, the wife of Bath, the reeve, and the miller, and that striking contrast with all these, the knight's tale, a noble masterpiece of true chivalry, which was composed in another form, in stanzas. And was again refashioned in couplets of ten syllables, before the idea of the pilgrimage occurred to the poet. 12. Several of the tales had been first undertaken earlier, and were later fitted into the general scheme of pilgrims to Canterbury telling their stories as they ride. Chaucer supplies his own criticisms, often in the rough banter of the host, who cannot endure the sing-song romance of Sir Thopas, a parody of the form of many romances, or the dismal tragedies of the lusty monk. The prologue and conversations and some tales are thus the work of the very Chaucer, in accomplished maturity of power, but he is giving examples of many tastes and fashions older in literature than his own free, humorous, and ironical view of life. He professes, in his art, to be all things to all men, he must rehearse. Tales à la, be they betre or worse. And whosoever does not like the humor of the reeve or the intoxicated miller may, turn over the leaf and tell another tale. The modern reader, for one good reason or another, may, turn over the leaf, and choose another tale, whether the reeve, or the monk, or the parson, or Chaucer himself be narrating. Like all old poets he wrote for his own age, not for ours. But in him, as in all great poets, however old, much is universally human and is immortal. The scansion, in the so-called heroic couplet, practically Chaucer's own conquest and bequest to our literature, gives little trouble, especially if, as in the Globe edition, the final yes which are to be sounded, are marked by a dot over the letter. The spelling repels the very indolent, but no attempt hitherto made to modernize the spelling has been successful, though the task does not seem to pass the powers of man. The device of setting stories in a kind of framework, so that the variety of each narrator, according to his kind, lends dramatic interest, is very old. Chaucer is especially happy in his idea of making thirty pilgrims, of all sorts and conditions, meet at the ancient inn of the tabard in Southwark and agree to journey together to the tomb of St. Thomas a Becket. This was a favorite shrine of pilgrims, the road led through a smiling landscape, the saint had always been popular and a great worker of miracles, 
and the pilgrimage was dear to an England still merry. In less than a century and a half after Chaucer's death, Henry VIII seized the wealth of the saint, the gold and jewels given by noble pilgrims, and destroyed this pleasant pilgrimage. Chaucer's prologue with his description of the pilgrims, is the most kind, genial, and jocund of his works, a perfect picture of a mixed multitude of English folk of many classes. And with no awkwardness caused by a keen sense of distinction of class. The knight is a flower of chivalry, he has sought honor everywhere, in the dangerous crusade against the barbarians of Prus, Prussia, against the Moors, against the Turks, he is a fighting man who speaks no evil and bears no malice. His tale is from the old romance of Thebes and Athens, and has its root in ancient Athenian literature, though its flowers are derived from medieval fancy, and mainly from the Italian poem, the Tezid, or Poem of Theseus, by Boccaccio. It is written in the rhyming couplets of five feet apiece which are practically the great metrical gift of Chaucer to English poetry, he took to them late in life, about 1385 to 1386. And his tales in this measure were made later than his stories in stanzas. The jolly host of the tabard, who directs the tale-telling of the company, next asks, out of respect, the monk to follow the knight, but the rude miller is drunk, and insists on being heard. For I will speak or else go my way. Thus the noble tale is followed by a churl's tale, for the sake of contrast, and Chaucer warns his readers that a coarse story it is, and that whoever does not want to hear it must turn the pages over and pass on. The miller begins decorously enough with a description of a pretty young musical scholar of Oxford, that could read the stars and predict the weather, and lodged with an old carpenter that had a pretty young wife. And had never read Cato who would have advised him to mate with an older woman. The miller's description of the pretty young woman is more delicate than we expect from this noisy drunkard. A parish clerk, not more godly than the scholar, is next introduced. And a peculiarly broad piece of rural pleasantry finishes the story of the miller. The listeners laughed at this nice case, all but the reeve, who was a carpenter by trade, and did not like a carpenter to be mocked. He therefore tells a tale against a miller, a proud and dishonest miller, who suffers loss and infinite dishonor and has his head broken, at the hands of two young Cambridge men. This tale also may be judiciously skipped, the fourth is that of the cook, and is only a fragment, manifestly it was to be matter of rude, mirth, but Chaucer dropped it. The host calls in the man of law, whose story is told in stanzas. The man of law was himself told it by merchants. It is an early piece of work by Chaucer, fitted into this place. He had plenty of short stories of many kinds, written by himself at various dates, and he placed them into the mouths of the pilgrims. Not always quite appropriately. The man of law's tale of fair Constance, daughter of an emperor of Rome, herself a pearl of beauty and goodness, persecuted by elderly ladies professing the Moslem or heathen religion, and driven from Syria to pagan Northumberland is partly based on a widely diffused fairy tale. It is pure and tender, and more fit for the ears of the prioress than several of the coarse comic stories. In these days, as Chaucer would learn from the Decameron of Boccaccio, ladies listened to very strange narratives. The host next bids the parish priest to tell a story, and swears in a style which the good parson resents. The host smells a lollard, or Puritan heretic, in a clergyman who objects to swearing, which suggests that the orthodox priests were very indulgent. The sailor, or shipman, a rough brown man and, a good fellow, cries. Here he shall not preach a. He shall no gospel gloss and hear any teche. He is a heretic, a sower of tares among the wheat. And, to check heresy tells a story far from creditable to the morals of a monk. This is in the heroic verse, rhymed couplets of ten syllables each, like the coarse stories of the reeve and the miller. As this measure was adopted late by Chaucer, in place of the earlier stanzas, it appears that his taste did not grow more delicate with his advance in years. The dainty prioress, as becomes her, now tells, in stanzas, the legend of a miracle of Our Lady, how a little boy used to sing her praises through the Jewish quarter of a town. How the Jews slew him and cast him into a pit, and how he nevertheless continued to sing his hymn like, Young Hugh of Lincoln, 
who cursed Jews, slain also in 1255, if ever the thing occurred, it was a common fable of the Middle Ages. The poet himself is called in next and recites Sir Thopas, a parody of the rhymed romances of chivalry. It bores the host, no more of this, he cries, you do nothing but waste our time, so the poet tells, a Lytel thing in prose, the story of Melibus. It is not so very Lytel, and is freely translated from the French of Jean de Mung. There are about 12,000 words in Melibus, which is full of quotations from all sorts of learned books and moral lessons. The host, however, thought it would have been very edifying to his ill tempered wife, a fierce woman. The monk now tells sad stories of the deaths of kings, and of the miseries of celebrated persons from Lucifer, Adam, and Hercules to Nero, and Croesus, and Julius Caesar. Chaucer borrowed from the Bible, Boccaccio, Boethius, the Romance of the Rose, in fact he seems to have begun the collection while he was young, taken it up again after his visit to Italy, and finally wearied of the long series of miseries. So he makes even the courteous knight rebel, and cry, Good sir, no more of this. He wants more cheerful matter. The host is of the same mind, and calls one of the three priests that ride with the prioress. Since the monk is described as a jolly hunting clergyman, it is not clear why Chaucer put old work about mortal tragedies into his mouth. The priest tells a form of the tale of the cock, his hens, and the fox, which includes a ghost story, a good deal of learning and morality, and a great deal of humor and of brilliant description. The tale is in ten-syllabled verse. And in Chaucer's late manner, as is the physician's tale, the Roman story of Virginia, as in Macaulay's Lays of Ancient Rome. Chaucer in part translates the version of Jean de Mung in the Romance of the Rose. The tale is told with sweet pitifulness and delicacy. The partner with his wallet. Breadful of pardown come from Rome al Hoot. Pardons hot from Rome, and with a large collection of spurious relics of saints, is an odious kind of sacred swindler, but his tale is pointed against avarice. It is derived from a very old story found in Asia as well as in Europe. The pardoner begins by a satirical account of his profession and of his practices, his greed and lust, his spoiling of the poor, before he preaches his moral tale of the evils of greed. For, though myself be a full vicious man, a moral tale yet I you tell can. And a terrible tale of murder it is. The host himself is sickened by the cynicism of the partner, but the tolerant knight makes peace between them, in the nature of things the knight would have ridden forward out of his odious society. It has been said that the tales display the literary and artistic side of Chaucer's genius. And many of them were not made for their places in the pilgrimage, while Chaucer's observing dramatic genius appears in the prologues and places where the characters converse together. These passages are often, to us, the most curious and interesting, for they are dramatic and humorous pictures of actual life and manners. But the tolerance of the partner by the knight is almost too great a stretch of gentleness. The rich, businesslike, proud, luxurious wife of Bath who has had as many husbands as the woman of Samaria, begins with a long prologue about her own past life and her distaste for the medieval exaltation of virginity. She prefers the example of the much-married King Solomon. She boasts herself to be a worshipper of Venus and Mars, love is not more her delight than domestic broils and domineering. Her prologue and tale are in Chaucer's best later style of verse, the tale is like that of courteous Sir Gawain, and his bride, the loathly lady, in a romance, and the friar, or frere. Justly says that she deals too much in school matter of great difficulty, and in learned authorities. The frere and the summoner next tell tales jibing at each other's profession. They are of the coarser sort, and are relieved by the clerk's tale in stanzas. It is a form of the famous legend of patient Griselda, whose patience is like that of Enid in The Idols of the King. The clerk says that he learned the story from Petrarch, the great Italian poet, in Padua. The story, like most of those which are serious, is given in stanzas, Boccaccio wrote it in Italian, Petrarch in Latin. The poet would not wish wives be as meek as Griselda. There is a happy mean between her invincible patience and the tyranny of the wife of Bath. The merchant's tale continues the debate on marriage, started by the wife of Bath, 
and carried into clearer air by the modest clerk of Oxford. Chaucer had Latin sources for the discussions, and the humorous laxity of the story of January in May is based on an old popular jest story of which Boccaccio's version, in the Decameron, seems nearest to the original form, the tree. As in Asiatic versions, is enchanted. A more pleasant variety of Asiatic tale, that of the flying horse, as in the Arabian Nights, is left half told by the squire, the son of the knight, as good a man as his father. Chaucer either never finished the story, or the conclusion was lost. The story told by the Franklin is, after those of the knight and the prioress, perhaps the most poetical of all. It is a romance in which the problem of marriage and the supremacy of husband or wife is once more touched on and happily settled by the steadfast love of the knight and lady. They are separated for years, a new lover is rejected by the lady, and, to win her, makes a magician cause by glamour, something in the way of hypnotic suggestion, the apparent disappearance of the black rocks of Brightony. But loyalty is stronger than magic. This charming tale is based on a Breton original, but the handling is entirely Chaucer's, and is done in his best and gentlest manner. The second nun's tale is the legend of the marriage and wooing of Saint Cecily. It was composed in stanzas, and is put into its place without the removal of lines which show that it was written separately before Chaucer thought of his framework. Among the latest additions are the prologue and tale of the canon's yeoman, neither yeoman nor canon is among the original characters of the general prologue. The story contains a satire of the golden dreams, self-deceptions, and impostures of the alchemists, with their search for the philosopher's stone. The tale of the manciple, or kitchen servant, is really a just-so story explaining why the crow is black, and is taken from Ovid, who took it from an old Greek fable. Finally, the honest country parson has his chance. He announces that being a man of southern England, he likes not rum, ram, rough, alliterative verse, nor cares for rhyme, and he preaches in prose at very great length. His sermon is a free translation, with alterations of all sorts, from a French source, the same as the source of the iron bite of in wit, remorse. The immense variety and character of the tales, covering all the tastes of the time, is now apparent. For the gay and the grave, the lively and severe, Chaucer has provided reading. X. Piers Plowman. Gower. Contemporary with Chaucer, and in perfect contrast with Chaucer, whom he probably never met, was the author of the alliterative, Rum, Ram, Ruff, poem, Piers Plowman. This author is generally supposed to have been named William Langley or Langland. By piecing together many detached pieces of evidence the conjecture is reached that William first saw the light at Cleoberry in Shropshire or at Wickwood in Oxfordshire, about the year 1332, was well educated, was in minor orders, and a married man. But if everything that the author of Piers Plowman makes his dreamer say about himself is also true of the author, he must have been a strange and unhappy character. His poem, following the convention of dreams and allegories, is the record of dreams into which he fell, first on the Malvern Hills, later, wherever he chanced to be. The poem exists in three forms, A, B, C, and, from the allusions to contemporary events, such as the Peace of Bretigny, with France, 1360, and a Great Tempest of January, 1362, the A version may have been composed in 1362. The B version, much altered and enlarged, is dated, from its allusions to events, in 1377, and the C version, also enlarged, from its references to the unpopularity of Richard II, must be later than 1392. If the poet drew his dreamer and narrator from study of his own character, he must have been, in some ways, not unlike Mr. Thomas Carlyle. Though he had a noble appreciation of the dignity and duty of manual labor, the honest and pious plowman was his favorite character, he never did toil with his hands. In reply to the remonstrances of reason, he says, I am too weak to work with sickle or with scythe. Overeducation in youth has sapped his manhood, and, since his friends who paid for his schooling died, he has never joyed. He praised the country, but, as Dr. Johnson said, hung loose upon the town, a man of a modern type. Itch live in London, and on London both, he writes. 
The instruments of his craft are not sickle and scythe, but the paternoster, the psalter, and my seven psalms, that I sing for men's souls. In return for such services he picks up a bare livelihood. Clerks like himself should come of Franklins and freemen, not of bondmen. The sons of serfs, he thinks, should do manual labor, and should not be admitted to holy orders. This was the view of the English House of Commons, under Richard II, and it may be that the poet is rather satirizing their exclusiveness, and the hand-to-mouth lazy life of poor clerks, than describing himself. The narrator, after the sermon preached at him by reason, goes to church in a penitent mood, and beats his breast, but does not change his course of life. The poem, or, as some think, the series of poems by various hands, represents in the most vivid way, the unrest, discontent, and doubt which came over Western Europe towards the end of the 14th century. The cruel and endless wars, the brigands, the ravages of the Black Death, which caused demand for higher wages because so few were left to work, drove the poor into revolts like that of what Tyler. There were frightful cruelties and terrible reprisals. The wealth and licentiousness of the regular orders of clergy caused them to be hated and despised. The people called Lollards advocated a kind of evangelical Protestantism, and something very like modern socialism. All these things Chaucer passed by or treated lightly, but whoever wrote Piers Plowman threw into his picture of the age his vivid and fiery but lurid and confused genius. He paints himself as poor, discontented, powerless, and always angry. The dreamer states that he went about London, a tall lonely discontented man, loath to reverence lords and ladies, and never saluting the great, and the well-clad, nor doing any courtesy, so that, folk deemed me a fool. He describes taverns full of bad company, as if he were familiar with them. He states the doubts that arise in clerkly minds. Why should the penitent thief have been allowed to go straight to paradise? Who was worse than David, or the Apostle Paul? when he breathed out threatenings against the earliest Christians. Beset by such questionings, and by the skepticism which haunted the ages of faith, clerks may curse the hour when they learned more than their creed. The narrator seems to know a good deal about law, and despises men who draw up charters ill, and in bad Latin, he speaks as if he may have eked out his livelihood as a scrivener. He says that he dresses like a lawler, however they may have dressed, but he is not a lawler, which may mean either an idle loiterer or a heretical lollard, who was apt to be a kind of evangelical socialist. Entertaining advanced ideas about property. The poet himself, in the spirit of the contemporary House of Commons, denounces the foreigners who obtain benefices in England, and the Englishmen who buy them from Rome. He would not throw off all allegiance to the Pope, but the Pope ought to follow the example, not of Saint Peter, a very human character, but of the divine master of Saint Peter. He hates the friars as much as John Knox did, who called them fiends, not frères. He denounces the lawless rapacity of maintained, the liveried followers of great lords. In fact his poem is often an alliterative rendering of the complaints of the House of Commons preserved in the rolls of Parliament, for parliamentary institutions he has the highest respect and admiration. He is the warm advocate of peace with France, and opposes the idea of settling the Eastern question by a crusade. If he is the author of Richard the Readless, he gave good advice, in a severe tone, and too late, to Richard II, when that prince set himself, like Charles II and James II, to govern England without a parliament, and was near his fall. The dreamer, or the poet, was no friend of revolution, but his works were quoted by John Ball, priest and agitator, who was hanged some time after what Tyler was done to death. Chaucer was a poet who did not write on political, social, and ecclesiastical reform. Langley or Langland, wrote about little else, he is for reforming a world full of inequality and injustice. In his time the revolution stirred in its sleep, as it were, like the great subterranean reptile of Australian mythology, and caused the crust of society to tremble, and the spires of the church to rock. He professed that a reforming king is to come. And Than shall the abbot of Abindown and all his issue for ever a. have a knock of a kinge, and incurable the wound. The prediction was fulfilled by Henry VIII, 
but the poor, in whose interests Langland wrote, were none the better but much the worse for, the great pillage, of the Tudor king. We cannot, let it be repeated, feel certain that the dreamer's description of himself, as a moody, idle, discontented clerk, spoiled for work by much study, and unable to find a market for his science. Striding angrily and enviously through the London streets where he has not a friend, is the poet's description of himself, a satire on himself, or whether it is a dramatic study of an imaginary character. We cannot be certain that he has lived much at or near Malvern, where the hills, overlooking the vast plain, form the natural scene for his vision of the sad pageant of men's miseries, of poverty and toil, of wealth and injustice and oppression. Of the poet we really learn nothing, even his name, whether Langley or Langland, or neither, is matter of conjecture. We only know that his heart burned within him at the many evils which he was impotent to cure, and that he had a kind of apocalyptic faculty for visions of good and evil. As readers usually take the narrator and preacher in the poem to be a portrait of the poet himself, he appears as a character neither happy nor the cause of happiness in others. He is not so much a poet as a prophet in the Hebrew sense of the word. The world owes to him no such gratitude and love as it owes and pays to the kind, happy Geoffrey Chaucer. The visions of Langland are visionary, now the dream is luminous and distinct. Now it merges, as dreams do, into shadowy shapes of things half-realized. In sleep the poet first sees a vast plain, on the eastern side is a tower, westward is the den of death. In a field full of folk some labored. Others, gaily clad, took their ease, some were hermits in cells, others were merchants, and there were minstrels who hate work, swink not, nor sweat, but make mirth. The poet, like the author of the Cursor Mundi, detests minstrels. There were sham hermits with their women, pilgrims with leave to lie, from Rome, pardoners who took money from men for remission of their sins, parish priests who seek gold in London as the Black Death has impoverished their people. To them all conscience preaches at great length, denouncing idolatrous priests in the manner of John Knox. Then follows a version of the fable of, Belling the Cat, told with some vigor and political point. Holy Church now appears as a stately lady, explaining that truth dwells in the tower to the east. And she preaches at much length on the functions of kings, which were not fulfilled in any godly sense by the aged Edward III, and on the nature of conscience, and the duty of, having ruth on the poor. Now appears a magnificent lady, Mead, that is recompense. In the poet's opinion, some people get far more than their due recompense, others do not get half enough, like the poor laborers. And Mead, or reward, on the whole, is won by bribery and corruption. Mead is to be married to falsehood, simony, liar, civil law, and so forth, are of the wedding party, with the Count of Covetousness, the Earl of Envy, the Lord of Lechery, and the rest of them. All this, we must remember, was written by the poet for his own age, which was insatiably fond of allegory devoid of the human merits of Bunyan's immortal dream. How theology forbids the bands between falsehood and Mead. How Mead goes to town, and wins all hearts, how she is taken to court, and offered as a bribe to conscience, who refuses her hand, all this the poet narrates. He is very firm on the iniquity of writing the names of the donors on windows in churches, now the historian would be glad to know who the donors were. The king, who has Mead's marriage to arrange, listens to reason, and so ends the first vision. How reason, later, admonishes the narrator for this way of life, has already been described. The deadly sins make their confessions, and repentance gives them good advice, as does Piers the plowman, who describes to these rude pilgrims the nature of the road which they must tread. Here there is a considerable resemblance to the pilgrim's progress. Piers directs the industry of the pilgrims, aided by the night, and always and every day Piers preaches without stint. A realistic picture of the life of poor laborious women in cottages is drawn, see, Passus X, 1. 77. Also himself suffering mush hunger. And we in winter time, with waking and nighties. To rise to the rule, to rock the cradle. Boda to card and to chem, to clouten and to wash. To rub and to rely, rushes to pily. That reuth is to read, other in rhyme show. 
the we of these women that oneth in coats. It is an old over true tale, a tale not told by Chaucer. Pity for the poor, earnest, clear-sighted, not to be controlled, is the most admirable point in the nature of Langland. He returns to his complaint that men give gifts and gold to minstrels, while the poor suffer cold and hunger, and lollers, idle, loafers, gain money in the abused name of charity. Yet the poet is not so revolutionary as to attack the game laws. In irony or in earnest, he bids lords to hunt every day in the week but Sunday, to hunt foxes, wolves, and other beasts. That is what lords are fit for, it amuses them, and is of service to the farmer. Bishops are the cause of most of the mischief, their dogs, the priests, dare not bark. With Knox, two centuries later, the bishops themselves are the dumb dogs. The dream ends, another begins about do well, do better, do best. Do well, good conduct, is better than indulgences, as Luther preached later. The poet sets off on the quest of do well, who has a castle somewhere. The poet rather leans to heresy when he introduces the Emperor Trajan, boasting that, though a heathen, he was saved, without singing of mass to Trajan he keeps returning. Reason rules all beasts, but not men, and why not? Reason declines to answer. Finally, after giving a summary of Christian morals, the plowman vanishes away, he returns later, but, whoever comes or goes, the sermons and the satire go on forever with the same illustrations. The friars are drubbed from end to end, and when at length the narrator awakes, he finds things just as they were, while conscience goes off to seek Piers Plowman. Probably the most famous and singular part of the poem is the reappearance of Piers Plowman, or of one like him, riding on an ass, barefoot, without spurs or spear, but looking like a knight. Faith peers forth from a window, and cries, Ah, son of David, as heralds do when knights ride to tournaments. Jesus is to joust with Satan, then the crucifixion is described, and the terror of Satan, who calls his forces out, places his bronze guns, and orders Calthrops to be thrown on the ground under the walls of his castle. 13 The idea of the guns was used by Milton, in a lapse of his genius, in Paradise Lost. The conclusion is that righteousness and peace kiss each other. The dreamer awakes, for the last time, and with Kit his wife, and Kalodi his daughter, creeps to the cross, and gives thanks for the resurrection. It may be remarked that the style of Piers Plowman could be easily imitated. Any man who chose could prolong a poem so lacking in organization and plan. Consequently, in compliance with the habit of contradicting all tradition and denying to authors the books with which they have from the first been credited, efforts are made to prove that much of Piers Plowman is the work of other hands. Not of the author of the shortest and earliest version A. In this case critics discover differences in diction, in meter. In power of visualizing objects and scenes presented, in topics of interest to the author and in views on social, theological, and various miscellaneous questions. 14. The other, the usual theory, is that the author kept adding to and altering his poem through some thirty years. In that time new topics would interest him, his views on all questions would change with his moods. His alterations, meant for the better, might turn out for the worst, as in the case of Wordsworth and other poets, and his powers, of course, would not always be at the same level. It is true that the first eight passes, or cantos, or books of version A are more distinct, better organized, more consecutive, more brilliant than the rest of the book, while passes 9 to 12, are perhaps more allegorical and less orderly. More vague, more controversial, and one John but is said to have made this end, because he meddles with verse-making. The author of B is supposed to be a new hand, working over and altering the A version of his predecessor, and often misunderstanding him, while C misunderstands B. It is quite certain that in some MSS. Of the 15th century the whole poem is attributed to William Langland, or Langley. And also that the whole poem at its longest, was composed between 1362 and 1392 and was very popular because it turned over and over, in every light, all the political, social, and theological problems that vex the minds of men. Whether it is all by one hand or not is a question of very little importance. 
many men could have written various parts of it. Most can raise the flowers now. For all have got the seed. The poem retains an historical value which would not be diminished if much of it were cut out. In style it led nowhere, the rather careless versification, the ancient unrhymed alliterative rhythm were doomed to disappear. The moral advice was wasted on Lancastrian England, which rushed into the madness of the 15th century, the burning of Lollitz, the attempt to conquer France, as vain as unjust, the burning of Joan of Arc. The twenty years of defeat and disgrace which followed and avenged that crime, the fury of the Wars of the Roses, the butcheries, the murders, and, accompanying all this, the dull prolix stuff that did duty for poetry and literature. Gower Chaucer's other prominent contemporary, the moral Gower, in Chaucer's own phrase, was a far more commonplace character than Langland. John Gower was entitled to write himself Esquire, and owned lands in Norfolk and Suffolk. He died in 1408, and his tomb, with his three great books under his head, exists in St. Saviour's Church, in Southwark. Chaucer was a friend of Gower and, during one of his missions abroad, left Gower in charge of his affairs. At the close of Troilus and Chryside, he writes, O moral Gower, this book I direct. To thee, and to the philosophical strode. To vouch and sof, their need is, to correct. Strode is unknown, and we need not examine conjectures about him. Gower was not ungrateful for Chaucer's compliment, and in the earlier version of his Lover's Confession, Confessio Amantes, he repaid it very prettily. Venus bids Gower's poems greet Chaucer well, as my disciple and my poet, who, in his youth filled the land with ditties and glad songs which he made for my sake. This passage was later omitted by Gower, who, it has been suggested, was annoyed by some words in the prologue to the Man of Law's Tale, in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. At the same time, Gower may have removed the compliment to Chaucer merely to make room for more matter. If not, literary people have quarreled bitterly over smaller things than the criticism by the man of law. With Gower's French and Latin poems we have little to do. His fifty ballades, in French, to his lady, are very pleasing examples of that old formal verse, with its difficult rhymes. And but for the grammatical liberties which the Anglo-French writer took, would secure for Gower a high place among the French versifiers of his age. In French he wrote, Le Mirard de Elami, Man's Mirror, which has a curious history. 15. The Mirror, in French, and the Speculum, in Latin, deal allegorically with virtues, vices, and the way of salvation, they contain many stories from all quarters, which are retold by Gower in English, in his immense, Lover's Confession. In his Latin, Vox Clementis, 1381, The Voice of One Crying, and in his, Mirror de Elami, but especially in the former, Gower had given his testimony against the sins of the age, and had impartially rebuked all sorts and conditions of men. He described the peasant rising, under what Tyler and others, of 1381, exculpating King Richard, who was only a brave boy. But, as time went on, and dissatisfaction increased, Gower turned from Richard, and, very early, to the son of John of Gaunt, later Henry IV. Gower transferred his affections so early to Henry, that it would be unfair to call him a venal turncoat, he saw no hope for English liberty except in the Lancastrian cause. Probably about 1390, and at the suggestion of Richard II himself, Gower abandoned unmitigated sermonizing in verse, renounced the ambition to reform the world by rhyme, and mingled, as he says. Pleasure with morality in the endless, lover's confession, the work on which his reputation as an English poet rests. He professes his desire to make a work for England's sake, and, in early versions, declares that Richard II called him into his barge on the Thames, and set him to the task. It was to be, some new thing, readable by His Majesty. After a moral prologue Gower tells how he met Venus, in May of course, and how she gave him her chaplain, Genius, as a confessor. To genius Gower makes his confessions as a lover, and genius preaches to him, illustrating every homily with a tale. It is by the tales, and by some pretty passages descriptive of true love, that the poem survives. Most of the stories are borrowed from Roman literature. 
The Greek reader is surprised to find that the sirens had fishes' tails, a fact unknown to Homer, or to Greek art, which usually represented them as birds with the heads of women. The Trojan horse is of bronze, whereas it was notoriously of wood. The tale of Alboin and Rosamund, and the cup made of her father's skull, is told pleasantly, but the truly tragic situation is slurred over and lost. And the tale of Hercules and Diana, and the fatal garment of Nessus the centaur, is also far from worthy of the tragic Greek theme, of the pity and terror of the legend. Perhaps Shakespeare admired Gowers, Pyramus and Thisbe, which the Athenian craftsmen dramatize in A Midsummer Night's Dream. The Jason and Medea is one of the best tales. But Gower did not know the Greek version by Apollonius Rhodius or the Medea of Euripides. And his own genius rises to no such picture of a maiden's love as Apollonius draws, to no such tragic passion as Euripides conceives, while he has little or none of the humor of Chaucer. None the less here was a book of many thousand lines, full of the material of old romance, medieval or classical, here the verse ran easily, copiously, and sweetly, for Gower was a master of the rhymed octosyllabic couplets. Through his knowledge of and practice in versification both French and English. Indeed his style, soon to be lost by English versifiers, is his main virtue. At last he confesses to Venus that he knows not the true nature of love. She gives him a black rosary of beads, like that which Chaucer holds in his portrait, with the motto in gold, poor reposer, take thy rest. He is to write of love no more, no more to come to Venus's court, so, in 1398, the foolish veteran did make love, and married Agnes Groundolf. He survived this unseasonable wooing for ten years, when Agnes came into his property. The reputation of Gower, for long, was very high, people spoke of Chaucer and Gower as we speak of Browning and Tennyson, or of Shelley and Keats. But no longer with Chaucer is Gower equaled in renown, and his most enduring monument is Shakespeare's introduction of him in Pericles, Prince of Tyre. 11. The Successors of Chaucer After Chaucer and Gower, English poets wandered back into the wilderness. They are most valuable to students of the development of the language, they were popular in their own time and for more than a century later. Specialists find in them some literary merits, oases in the sandy desert, but it would be false to say that they are generally entertaining and attractive. John Lydgate, the monk of Estee. Edmunds Berry, would have obliged us had he written prose memoirs of his own life, for he came in contact with some very interesting persons, and knew London and Paris as well as his cloister. Born, 1370, at Lydgate near Newmarket, where good drink was hardly to be come at, he tells us, he was, before the age of fifteen, received into the great Edmundsbury Monastery School, where he was a reluctant pupil, and, later, a not very willing monk. He proceeded to Oxford, it is thought to Gloucester Hall, now Worcester College, and, by 1397, was a priest in full orders. He speaks of Chaucer as his master. But probably he means his master in the spirit, probably he never sat at the feet of the great poet. In 1423 Lydgate was made prior of Hatfield Brodoke. In 1426 he was in Paris, and, by order of the Earl of Warwick, the cruel jailer of Jean d'Arc, he translated a French poetical pedigree by Laurence Callot, a French clerk in English service. Laurence is notorious for having called the Bishop of Beauvais a traitor, when he accepted the abjuration of Jean d'Arc, May, 1431, and for being very busy in the tumult which then arose. Lydgate returned to his cloister at Bury in 1434, and we last hear of him, in connection with a pension which he held, in 1446. The dates of his poems are not certainly known, as a rule. The Flower of Courtesy, The Black Knight, and The Temple of Glass, may be between 1400 and 1403. The Troy Book, made from Dares, Dictis, Benoit de saint maur and, mainly Guido de Colana, is of monstrous length, and is dated 1412 to 1420. This poem has some fine passages in which Lydgate, for example, when describing the penitence of Helen, seems to be translating the actual words of the Iliad. The story of Thebes followed, 1420, 
then came, The Falls of Princes, and a translation of de Guileville's Pilgrimage of Human Life, made for the Earl of Salisbury. The Legend of St. Edmund was written for the devout Henry VI. The date of Reason and Sensuality is earlier, 1406-1408. About forty works are attributed to Lydgate, all, or almost all, being marked by his curious flatness. His lines have, for the ordinary mind, the unpleasant peculiarity that you may read many of them several times before you discover, if you ever do, how he meant them to be scanned. It is not to be found out when he meant the final E to be sounded, and when he did not. His poems may have been badly copied, or badly printed, or both, but the bewildering result remains. When we add that Lydgate is usually a translator, and is always a copyist of all the old formulae of spring and dreams, and that he is as prolix as an Indian epic, it must be plain that he cannot be said to hold a high place in living literature. The Book of the Duchess, a thing of Chaucer's immaturity, is not one that a young poet of the next generation would sedulously ape, yet Lydgate imitated it in The Black Knight. The best-known piece of Lydgate is a short satiric poem, London Lickpenny, describing the misadventures of a poor countryman who finds that in London he can get nothing, neither law, nor food, nor any other commodity, for nothing. His hood is stolen in the crowd. Ockleave. Ockleave is not merely a less voluminous Lydgate. He is a character, or assumes to be a character not unlike the French poet, François Villon, but with little of Villon's genius. Ockleave was born about 1368, about 1387 he got a little post in the office of the Privy Seal. In 1406, in a poem, La Male Regla, he petitions for payment of a pension, he has wasted his youth, his health is lost, and no wonder. But twenty winter passed continually. Excess at board hath laid his KNYF with me. The great number of public houses excite people to drink. So often that man can nat wel say nay. He would have drunk harder if there had been more money in his pouch, had Ockleave been a richer man there would be less of the rhymes of Ockleave. He liked the society of gay girls, which is expensive. To suffer him pay had been no courtesy. He abstained from discourteous language. I was so furred with any man to fight. The tapsters said that Ockleave was a real gentleman, a very jaunty man. He was too lazy to walk to his office, this indolent civil servant, he took a boat, and the oarsman knew and flattered him. He is rather impudent and impenitent, but he seems to ask for no more than was his due in the way of money. The picture is drawn from the life, whether dramatically studied, or only too truly told of Ockleave. Being what he calls himself, Ockleave wrote over five thousand lines of good moral advice to the Mad Prince, the friend of Poins and Falstaff, 1411-1412. He acts as his own, awful example. He asks for money, and his poem is a compilation from various musty sources, but he is always laxly autobiographical, a loose, genial, familiar knave. Conceivably he may have met the prince in a tavern. It is a pity that Shakespeare did not think of bringing this shuffler, in Falstaff's company, to take purses at Gad's Hill. He bids the prince to burn heretics, and, in the interests of peace with France, to marry Catherine, daughter of the mad Charles VI. Henry took both pieces of advice, but the marriage brought not peace, but the sword in a maiden's hand. Like Villon, Ockleave wrote a poem, more than one, to the Blessed Virgin, he is always very orthodox. He had an interval of darkened mind, but recovered and went on versifying, a pathetic figure, for he was a married man, and his wife must have endured things intolerable. Ockleave was very human, as a poet his versification is as loose as that of Lydgate. He died about 1450. Hawes Stephen Hawes was the last of the English followers of Chaucer who deserves notice. Between him and the genuine Middle Ages a great gulf exists. The art of printing is familiar to Hawes. Writing of Chaucer he says of the poet's many books. He dyd compile, whose goodly name. In printed books doth remain in fame. Where the jostling vowels of name, remain, and fame prove Hawes to be a careless author. In his own time, 
he says, writers spend their time in vainful vanity, making belades of fervent amity, as jests and trifles without fruitfulness. Haas alone, of my master Lydgate will follow the trace. Haas is all for allegory and moral instruction in his long poem, misleadingly entitled, The Passatime of Pleasure. All the old formulae of the romance of the rose are retained, and the castles of rhetoric, logic, and the whole curriculum of learning are not much more joyous than the den of Bunyan's giant despair. Even combats with seven-headed monsters fail to excite pity and terror, for Hawes has seen, in a work of art, his own future, and we know beforehand that Grand Amour married La Belle Pucel. Hawes was born about 1475, was overeducated at Oxford, and was groom of the chamber to Henry VII. He made the words of a ballet for the court in 1506, ten shillings, and, for Henry VIII. 1521, a play, now lost, six pounds thirteenths. 4d. He also wrote, The Example of Virtue, and several poems, some of which have not been found in print or manuscript. The Passatime of Pleasure is of 1506. It is in rhyme royal. With more or less humorous interludes concerning the facetious Godfrey Gobelev, a dwarf who tells tales against women, in rhyming, heroic, couplets. The Example of Virtue, another moral and allegorical poem, is in the same measures. Spencer may have known the works of Hawes, there are coincidences in the allegorical details of both which can scarcely be all accidental. Hawes, in a sense, would have raised the table round again. If he could I he knew Mallory's great prose work, the Mort d'Arthur, and would fain have restored ideal chivalry. But chivalry died at the burning of Jean d'Arc, under the eyes of the father of courtesy, the Earl of Warwick. The flower of chivalry was sacrificed like Odin, herself to herself, 1431. Hawes was a chaotic versifier, it is not easy to guess how he scanned many of his own lines. In the Passatime, the words of the hero's epitaph are probably a versified proverb. For though the day be never so lunch, at last the bells ringeth to evensange. Long were the poems, and long the day of the followers of Chaucer. Now for its even song the bells were rung. 12. Late Medieval Prose As far as literature is concerned the poetry of the period which we have been considering is infinitely more important than the prose. For most prosaic purposes, Englishmen still wrote in Latin, Richard Rawl, that eccentric hermit, and Wycliffe, the premature reformer, were even more prolific in Latin than in English. Prose was used in writing of science, as in Chaucer's treatise concerning the astrolabe, for translation out of Latin, as in Chaucer's translation of Boethius, and Trevisa's rendering of Higdon's Chronicles. In sermons, and by Wycliffe and his followers for their tracts against the rich, against the friars, against the endowments of the church, constantly threatened in Parliament, and against the Catholic doctrine of the Eucharist. And for their translations from the Latin Bible. Wycliffe. John Wycliffe, born about 1329, was a man of great influence in his day. And the Reformation, when many of his ideas revived, probably found the embers of the fire which he had tended still glowing. He is said to have been born at Hipswell, near Richmond in Yorkshire, and certainly was of the Diocese of York. He was master of Balliol College, Oxford, in 1361. In 1372 Wycliffe took the degree of doctor in theology, he had already written not a few Latin treatises on philosophical subjects. As a philosopher he was a believer in predestination, on which much might be said, but averse to the theory of the disintegration of matter, indeed his views on this subject controlled his theory of the Eucharist. His desire to reform the Church by reducing her endowments endeared him to a political party in the state, and when he was summoned before convocation in 1377, he was supported by John of Gaunt, uncle of Richard II. The affair ended in a brawl. And in a later examination his ideas were not pronounced heretical. The London mob as well as some persons of high rank were on his side, and when one pope, Urban, proclaimed a crusade against the other pope, Clement, Wycliffe opposed it in manuscript pamphlets. He had, about 1378, started a kind of order of poor priests who spread his doctrines, and, in regard to the unlawfulness of owning private property, 
went beyond him. The Bible, not the tradition of the Church, was the center of Wycliffe's inspiration, it would be a mistake to suppose that the Bible was then generally ignored, the literature of the time is full of quotations from Scripture. There was no authorized translation of the Latin Bible, but many separate books of Scripture were circulating in English. There is much controversy as to whether or not Wycliffe translated, or caused to be translated, the entire Bible, as a chronicler declares that he did, certainly he made much of it known in English tracts and sermons. In 1382 he was suspended from teaching at Oxford, he retired to his rectory at Lutterworth, continued to write, and died on Old Year's Day, 1384. It is impossible, here, to enter into theological details, but Wycliffe anticipated many of the great multitude of ideas which flooded Western Europe at the beginning of the Reformation. If we open his sermons at random, we find him preaching on Lazarus and Dives, how riches this be parallels, for light lie wole a rich man use him unto most lust, that is, luxury. Words of Latin origin are nearly as common in his style as in that of Chaucer or Piers Plowman. In his Englishing of the Bible, Wycliffe uses, and, at the beginning of many sentences, just as Mandeville does in his amusing and fabulous, travels. The sermons have the double merit of being very short, and very plain, with no rhetorical flowers. The tracts can scarcely be called amiable, the word, stinking, for example, is not thought by Wycliffe too strong to apply to, proud priests of Rome and Avignon. All these brave and earnest men, the Wycliffeite pamphleteers, and, poor priests, and peers plowmen, with their socialism and their doubts, their, new theology, were rehearsing in medieval costume the drama of today. While Chaucer was arraying the heroes of the Fleece of Gold, of Troy, and of the Achaeans, in the armor of the men who fought at Cressy and Poitiers. What remains as a gain to literature is the art of Chaucer. Sweet reasonableness and urbane irony are not to be expected from men full of righteous indignation, and in great danger of being burned alive. For by this penalty did the church and state suppress the preachers of doctrines which were apt to cause dangerous popular tumults. The Wycliffeite biblical translations look like a canvas later embroidered on by the authors of King James's authorized version, that immortal monument of English prose. Chaucer's Prose Style it was not in the nature of these reformers to follow the counsel of Chaucer's good parson in the parson's tale, the spelling may here be modernized, as an example of the poet's prose. Certainly chiding may not come but out of a villain's heart, for after the abundance of the heart speaketh the mouth full often. And ye should understand that I look ever when any man shall chastise another, that he beware of chiding and reproving, for truly, unless he be wary, he may full lightly kindle the fire of anger and of wrath which he should quench. And peradventure slayeth him whom he might chastise with benignity. Lo, what saith St. Augustine, there is nothing so like the devil's child as he that often chitteth. Now cometh the sin of them that sow and make discord among folk, which is a sin that Christ hadeth utterly, and no wonder it is. For he died to make concord. And more sin do they to Christ, than did they that him crucified, for God loveth better that friendship be among folk than he did his own body, which he gave for unity. Chaucer's country priest, not the chiding Wycliffeite sons of thunder, is the true Christian. There is more of the spirit of the master in the caressing words of Chaucer's address to, Little Lewis my son. Pray God save the king that is lord of this land, and all that him faith beareth and obeyeth, each in his degree, the more, and the less, than in torrents of bitter chiding, and a hail of unpublishable vituperation. The English of Chaucer's treatise of, The Astrolabe, despite its difficult astronomical matter, is pellucid, and there is a charm of rhythm in his prose translations of the verses in Boethius. Trevisa The English prose of John Trevisa, a Cornish priest, educated at Oxford, and a traveller on the continent, died 1412, was entirely given to translation from the Latin. He is said, by Caxton, to have translated the Bible, he certainly made an English version of the Polychronicon of Ranulf Higdon, the monk of Chester, which begins with the creation, and is rich in geographical and social information. Trevisa occasionally inserts notes of his own. His versions of Higdon, and of the mythical popular science and prodigious fables contained in the De Proprietatibus Rerum, 
concerning the properties of things, of Bartholomeus the Englishman, were very popular, as their amusing nature deserved. And the Polychronican was printed by Caxton. Trevisa himself tells us that in his day English boys in grammar schools were ceasing to learn French, and there was a public for English books supposed to be educational. Mandeville the most famous and by far the most interesting of these adapters of foreign books is the so-called Sir John Mandeville, with his Voyage and Travail. The author of this book was not an Englishman, at least he did not write in English, and did write in French, at Liège, about the end of the 14th century. It is impossible and unnecessary to discuss here the fables about Mandeville. The author of the book declares that he himself is Sir John to all Europe, is an Englishman born at Asti. Albans, that he passed the sea in 1322, that he traveled in Tartary, Persia, Armenia, Libya, Chaldea, the land of the Amazons, India, and so forth. In fact he resembles Widsith in the ancient Anglo-Saxon poem, he has been almost everywhere and knows almost everything. He especially writes for pilgrims to Jerusalem. He first wrote his book in Latin, then translated it into French, and finally into English. There are countries that he has not seen, and he says that he could not play a part in the deeds of arms which he beheld. Now he suffers from arthritis, gout as artetikes, and he amuses himself by writing his adventures in 1357. Another version of Sir John's career is given by Jean Diotremus, a writer of histories, who had the felicity of hearing from an old man with a beard in 1472. That he was the genuine Mandeville, but that the author was really Jean Diotremus is not so certain. The author, whoever he was, stole from a manuscript of the time of the First Crusade, and from the book of Odoric, a Franciscan missionary, and the itinerary of William of Bolden Seal, 1332-1336, from a history of the Mongols. From a forged letter of Prester John, from every source whence he could pick amusing stories. He fabled with a direct and honorable simplicity which is comparable to that of Defoe, and to the straightforward and moderate statements of Swift's Captain Lemuel Gulliver. With the spelling modernized it is thus that the good knight tells the story of the pygmies who were known to Homer for their battles with the cranes. The folk be of little stature, but three span long, and they be right fair and gentle, after their quantity, both the men and the women. And they marry them when they be half a year of age, and get children. And they live not but six or seven years at the most. And he that liveth eight years, men hold him their right passing old. And they have often war with the birds of the country that they take and eat. These little folks labor neither in lands nor in vineyards. But they have great men among them of our stature that till the land and labor amongst the vines for them. And of the men of our stature have they a great scorn and wonder as we would have among us of giants if they were amongst us. Mandeville speaks as calmly about the ants, known to Herodotus, which guard the hills of gold, and are as large as hounds. And of the devil's head in the valley perilous, through which the knight and his company traveled in great fear, and therefore were we the more devout a great deal. Thence he reached an isle where men are from twenty-eight to thirty feet in stature, and they eat more gladly men's flesh than any other flesh, being indeed the Lestragonians who devoured the men of Odysseus. Or the Myrmidonians of the Anglo-Saxon poem of Festi. Andreas, who meant to devour Street Matthew. Mandeville enjoyed and deserved great popularity, being a follower of Lucian's true history, and a predecessor of Gulliver. Peacock. The Repressor. A writer of English prose even more interesting, though much less popular and amusing than Mandeville, is Reginald Peacock, 1395-1460, the deposed Bishop of Chichester, author of The Repressor of Overmuch Blaming of the Clergy. The clergy blamed Peacock and repressed him. This remarkable man, born shortly before the date of Chaucer's death, in North Wales, was a fellow of Oriel College, Oxford, 1417, was patronized by Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester. Obtaining the mastership of Lord Mayor Whittington's school in London, 1431, became Bishop of Asti. Azaf, 1444, and passed his life in attempts to convert the Lollards by persuasion, not by the stake. 
The clergy shall be condemned at the last day, he writes, if by clear wit they draw not men into consent of true faith otherwise than by fire, sword, and hangman. Although I will not deny these second means to be lawful, provided the former be first used. In the opinion of the Lollards, nothing in ecclesiastical matters was defensible that was not positively inculcated in the Bible as interpreted by the average Christian man, however unlettered. Peacock defended episcopacy, and even defended non-preaching bishops, on the score that they had to discharge more important duties. Even the much-abused friars he stood up for, arguing that, whatever their offenses, they and the world would be worse rather than better if there were no religious orders. His arguments in support of the begging Franciscans who, in counting up money, touched it with a stick, not with the hand, are certainly even more sophistical than ingenious. He wrote many pamphlets still in manuscript. The Repressor is of 1455, and is a most remarkable book in all ways. Peacock became vastly unpopular, because he was too clever, and, in his dislike of religious persecution, as well as in the nature of his arguments, was in advance, not only of his own age, but of the age of the Reformation. He was thought to give far too high authority to reason, and to the natural faculties of man in the way of developing unrevealed morality and unrevealed religion. No virtue or governance or truth into which the judgment of man's reason may sufficiently ascend or come to, to find, learn, and know it without revelation from God, is grounded on Holy Scripture. This conclusion arrives at the end of a sentence of thirty lines, a fair example of Peacock's logical and legal style, by him first used in English. It is not possible, here, to discuss Peacock's ideas, which are concerned with questions that still divide the Church and the world, Anglicans, Catholics, nonconformists, and agnostics. The Repressor has been described as the earliest piece of good philosophical disquisition of which our English prose literature can boast, it may still be read with interest, especially by students of the Reformation. Peacock was opposed to the unjust and brutal war of conquest and of disaster waged by England in France. In 1450 he became Bishop of Chichester, and shared the unpopularity of the Duke of Suffolk, who was blamed for the disasters in France. His Book of Faith, 1456, practically abandoned the infallibility of the Church in 1457, he was as unpopular with the clergy as with the mob. Twenty-four doctors reported unfavorably on his works, he was a defender of drowsy reason and of unrevealed morality, he was found guilty of heresies which were no heresies, and with no choice except that of being burned alive. He signed a confession and abjuration of sins which he had not committed, he was consigned to close confinement in the Abbey of Thorny, was deprived of his bishopric, and of writing materials, and died obscurely. The source of his misfortunes was this, he was not only clever but he knew it, and wrote that whatsoever man did not agree with an argument of his, is duller than any man ought to be. As few agreed, most were dull, and they did not like to be told it. Capgrave John Capgrave, 1393-1464, a Norfolk priest, an Augustinian canon, author of many scriptural commentaries and of a work on Illustrious Henry's, wrote in English a Chronicle of England, beginning with the creation and ending in 1417. Capgrave reminds us that Adam was made on a Friday, in the field of Damascus, the date was unlucky. He is nearly as brief as the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, his account of Agincourt is no longer than the Chronicle's description of Hastings. Here is a sample of his style. In the same year three beggars stole three childer at Len, and of on they put at his eyne, the other they broke his bock, and the third they cut off his handies and his feet, that men should of pipe give him good. Long after the fatter of on of hem, which was a march on, came to London, and the child knew him and cried loud, This is my fatter. The fatter took his child fro the beggaries and mad him to be arrested. The children told Allah the process, and the beggaries were hanging, full well worthy. Such is Capgrave's work, described by himself as, a short remembrance of old stories. Lord Berners Later by two generations, John Borsia, Lord Berners, was born about the time of Capgrave's death, and while Mallory was writing his, Mort d'Arthur, born 1467, died 1533. 
As captain of Calais, the last spot of land held by England and France, Lord Berners had leisure enough, which he spent in translating Froissart, and the French romance of Juan of Bordeaux and Oberon the Fairy King, Arthur of Little Britain. And Guevara's Spanish Dial for Princes, with the Carcel de Amor, and the Libro Oreo, books which more or less anticipate the antitheses of Euphuism. In his translation of Froissart, Berners follows the style of the original, his language is much akin to that of Mallory, in his prefaces he is more rhetorical and oriot, and has a habit, like Sir Robert Hazelwood in Guy Mannering, of treble shotting his verbs. Histories show, open, manifest, and declare to the reader by example of old antiquity, what we should inquire, desire, and follow, and also what we should eschew, avoid, and utterly fly. This mannerism is tedious, but the translation itself is in admirably simple and expressive English. 13. Mallory. Much the most important novelty in the literature of this period is the Mort d'Arthur, finished by the author, Sir Thomas Mallory or Mailer, in 1469, and published in 1485. Mallory is believed to have been the squire of Newbold Revel in Warwickshire, born about 1400, and a retainer of that Richard Beecham, Earl of Warwick, who was called the father of courtesy by the Emperor Sigismund, and was the cruel jailer of Jean d'Arc at Rouen. 1430-1431, where she was burned. Mallory appears to have joined the Lancastrian party in the Wars of the Roses, he, or a man of his name, was left out of a general amnesty granted by Edward IV, in 1468. He may have fled to Bruges and there made the acquaintance of Caxton, and Caxton, in his preface to the Mort, says that the book is printed, after a copy unto me delivered which Sir Thomas Mallory did take out of certain books of French and reduced it into English. Mallory died in England, and was buried in the Grey Friars, near Newgate, in 1471. As we have seen already, the true first sources of the immense body of Arthurian romance are obscure, the fountainhead is certainly Celtic, but the affluents are mainly French, without France the legend would have been but a small thing. Mallory constantly refers to the French book for his statements, to what book he does not say, but the learned industry of Dr. Sommer has detected that, for the youth of Arthur, Mallory used French romances of Merlin the Seer. Used French authorities for the tales of Sir Tristram and Lancelot, and also freely employed an English metrical romance, Mort Arthur, attributed to the mysterious Scott, Hutchown. There are other sources, and Mallory treats his authorities with much freedom, omitting, adding, and introducing confusions. His great romance has a definite beginning. It has a middle in the fatal revival of Arthurian chivalry in the search for the Holy Grail. And thence turns towards its end with the falling of Lancelot to his old sinful love of Guinevere, wife of Arthur, the decadence, the rebellion of Mordred, the passing of Arthur, and the penitence of Lancelot and Guinevere. Mallory's book may be called a work of true genius, so simple yet so noble is the prose style, so fine, loyal and chivalrous the temper, while even the confusions add to the element of mystery and to the expectation and curiosity of the reader. Mallory purges away the stupid monkish fables about the birth of Merlin by a machination of a devil, he does not linger over the long dull fables of Arthur's wars against the Anglo-Saxon invaders. He gathers the flower of the chivalry of the fourteenth century, while true love is his theme, with no palliation of the guilt of sinful love. His Lancelot deserves the Douglas motto of, tender and true, though. His honor rooted in dishonor stood. And faith unfaithful kept him falsely true. Hence comes the inevitable tragedy, the greatest in romance. Herein, says Caxton, rising to the height of Mallory's own style, men shall find many joyous and pleasant histories, and noble and renowned acts of humanity, gentleness, and chivalry. For herein may be seen noble chivalry, courtesy, humanity, friendliness, hardiness, love, friendship, cowardice, murder, hate, goodness, and sin. Do after the good, and leave the evil, and it shall bring you to good fame and renami. Many recent critics of Tennyson's Idols of the King, which is mainly derived from Mallory, appear to think that Mallory's Mort d'Arthur is a violent, brutal, licentious book, and that Tennyson invented the noble courtesy, chivalry. 
humanity to suit the middle-class morality of 1860. This opinion is merely stupid. The mort, it has been well said, assumes the recognition of a loftier standard of justice, purity and unselfishness than its own century knew. The motive forces are the elemental passions of love and bravery, never greed, or lust, or cruelty, except of course in traitors like Meliagrounce and Mordred. The knights have the strongest sense of fair play, Sir Lancelot bears no spite against Sir Palamedes, a pagan knight, who, from ignorance of the rules, deals a stroke in a tournament which the rules forbade. Their sense of honor is crystal clear, and, as in Tennyson's idols, this honor and loyalty make the tragedy, the struggle between Lancelot's love of Guinevere, and his friendship for and loyalty to King Arthur. His sin brings its own punishment, he cannot win the vision of the grail, that holy thing, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Arthur himself, after the wars of his youth, is but faintly drawn, it is not for the king to seek adventures, but to hear the suits of his people who come to him for help and justice. A mystery of fate hangs over him, he is smitten by the sins of his knights, and passes away, sorely wounded but alive, as strangely as Oedipus in the tragedy of Sophocles, perhaps, who knows, to come again. In Avalon he groweth old, in the peaceful hidden land of apples and apple blossom. The scenes all pass in a world where colors are magically soft and bright. There is an old song of the fourteenth century which gives the kind of color that abounds in Mallory. Lully, 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 lully. The falcon hath borne my mate away. He bear him up, he bear him down. He bear him into an orchard brown. In that orchard there was a hall. That was hanged with purple and pall. And in that hall there was a bed. It was hung with gold so red. And in that bed there leeth a knight. His wounds bleeding day and night. By that bedside kneeleth a may. And she weepeth both night and day. This is like a song made on some scene in the quest for the grail. Mallory's world is an unsubstantial fairy place, yet there is no fairy non-morality. There is the loftiest ideal among the knights who follow the gleam and fragrance of the Holy Grail. That all do not attain to their ideal is but the failing of human nature, the ideal is among them, they aspire to reach the spiritual city. For Guinevere, Mallory has the chivalrous compassion of Homer for Helen. Of Chaucer for Chryside, but while Helen wins, with light penance, to her home by the Euorotus, and her translation to Elysium, the Avalon of Greece, it is through many years of penance that Guinevere comes to her rest. What Shelley said of the end of the Iliad may be said of the last chapters of the Mort, they die away, in the high and solemn close of the whole bloody tale in tenderness and inexpiable sorrow. The prose with all its simplicity has rhythm and charm. Thus, therefore all ye that be lovers call unto your remembrance the month of May, like as did Queen Guinevere, for whom I make here a little mention, that while she lived she was a true lover, and therefore had she a good end. The words spoken by Sir Ector over the dead body of Lancelot are one of the noblest passages in English prose. The very titles of the chapters call us into the realm of romance, like a blast blown on Arthur's horn. How Sir Lancelot came into the chapel perilous, and gat there of a dead corpse a piece of cloth and a sword. How the damsel and Beaumains came to the siege, and came to a sycamore tree, and their Beaumains blew an horn, and then the knight of the red lands came to fight him. How Sir Lancelot, half sleeping and half waking, saw a sick man born in a litter, and how he was healed with the sangreal. Who can read the titles, and not make haste to read the chapters? The beautiful close of Tennyson's, Mort d'Arthur, is merely done into verse from the fifth chapter of Mallory's twenty-first book, the casting of Excalibur into the mirror, and the coming of the barge with the elfin ladies, many fair ladies. And among them all was a queen, and all they had black hoods, and all they wept and shrieked when they saw King Arthur. But for Mallory, the old Arthurian romances would be known only to a few of the learned. Mallory made them common coin, his romance was neglected only in the 18th century. It has been the inspiration of many poets, but none can recapture the first fine careless rapture, to which Tennyson comes nearest in the best of his Idols of the King, and in Sir Galahad, and The Lady of Shallot. 
Next to Chaucer's poems, Mallory's romance is the greatest thing in English literature from Beowulf to Spencer. To boys, and to men who retain the boy, the mort is an inestimable treasure, which is not to be sought for in the seldom visited shelves that hold the publications of learned societies, but is within the reach of all. Point 16. 14. Early Scottish Literature For purposes of convenience the development of Inglis literature north of the Tweed and Esk may be treated in this place. Originally the Scots or Scottish tongue was Gaelic, the language of the Irish Scots who, landing in Argyll about AD 500, finally gave a dynasty and its existing name, to Scotland. When the dynasty acquired the anglicized Lothian and much of Cumberland, it adopted the English speech, consequently the writers of the 13th and 14th centuries in Scotland used a form of Northern English or English, and knew not Gaelic. They called their speech English, till the long wars with England led them to draw a distinction and patriotically style it Scots or Scottish. Thus by 1562, Ninian Winsett upbraids John Knox for napping English in his writings, and forgetting the Scots that he learned at his mother's knee. Gaelic was no longer reckoned Scots, it was Irsh, Yearish, or Erse. Even before the days of Edward I, the town seal of Stirling, on the 4th, describes the Gaelic-speaking men north of Forth as Scoti Brody. The Scottish writers did not know, and therefore despised Gaelic, from which they have scarcely borrowed anything. Latin and French they knew, and enriched their tongue by borrowing from these sources. The one verse of Scottish poetry that may have survived from the end of the 13th century, the lines on the death of Alexander III, are charming, but, if they were written at the time, or shortly after, they must have been modernized. More or less, when Wintown, the rhyming chronicler, quoted them about 1420, twenty years after the death of Chaucer. Barber Setting aside the enigmatic Hutchown already discussed, John Barber, author of The Bruss, A History of King Robert Bruce in Rhyming Octosyllabic Couplets, is the first poet of English-speaking Scotland. He remains one of the most spirited and readable, the most like Sir Walter Scott, who used his book in poetry and in prose historical writing. By 1357 Barber was Archdeacon of Aberdeen, he was probably born at least ten years before Chaucer. In 1357 he went, with others, to study at Oxford, probably at the Scottish College, Balliol. He also visited France, for studious purposes. He held a position in the Exchequer, and, after finishing, the Bruss, in 1376, received a pension from Bruce's grandson, Robert II, other pensions he received, he died in 1396. He had written other works, Lost or Disputable, and A Romantic Genealogy of the Stuarts, who were really Fitz Allens, and of ancient Breton origin, not, as was fabled, of the old Scoto-Irish dynasty. A Bick of Alexander, The Romance of Alexander the Great, is attributed to Barber with much probability. Barber possesses, unlike most of the narrative poets of the Middle Ages, one supreme advantage. He is not telling, for the twentieth time, the tale of Troy, of Alexander the Great, of King Arthur, or of any dim mythical hero. The events in the history of Scotland which his own father witnessed, make one of the best stories in the world. Bruce was far from a faultless hero, but his adventures are picturesque facts, not inventions, though sometimes Barber tells the same story twice, with variations. His many defeats, his wanderings in the heather, with a little company or with a single attendant, his flight over sea, his crossings of perilous locks in frail boats, his single combats, the desperate chivalrous valor of his brother Edward. His own sagacity as a strategist and tactician, his kindness of heart, his love of the romances, the sufferings of his loyal friends, men and women, all his days of almost desperate warfare. All his escapes when surrounded in the hills of Galloway and of Argyle, are matters of historical fact, and can often be traced in English documents of the time. His, crowning mercy, Bannockburn, is as historical as Marathon or Waterloo. When we think of the wild scenes in which Bruce Warden wandered, Loch Troll, Loch Awe, the whole of the Lennox, the uplands of Don and Dee. When we remember the blending of English armed knights, and of the plaid clans in the ranks of his enemies, 
his own combination of the Isles men with the dark impenetrable wood of the lowland spears, the many hued silks of the standards. The cowled friars who prayed while the warriors fought, the fair ladies who shared the hero's dangers, we see that Barber has a theme fresh, brilliant, and unique for his poem. He has a true story which is more thrilling than any invented romance. Barber notoriously, perhaps in the interests of poetic perspective, rolls up three Bruces, the grandfather, the father, and the hero himself, into one personage. Yet his statements of the numbers of the English engaged are sometimes corroborated by the English muster rolls. Before he has written three hundred lines he strikes the sonorous keynote of his narrative in that praise of freedom which is worthy of the poet who fought at Marathon. Ah! Freedom is a noble thing. In what other medieval romance can these lines be equaled? What wearies us in Barber is the common defect of medieval poets, the occasional display of learning, references to what Cato did, or Hannibal, or Scipio, and the like, but Barber is not tedious when. After giving a minute portrait of the good Lord James of Douglas, he compares him to Hector, though, for valor. To Hector dare I none compare. Of all that ever in world were. The story never drags, adventure follows adventure, and there is none of the weary exaggeration of romance. Bruce does not slay his thousands, like Arthur. When he, a mounted man in armor, ms the better of three plaid clansmen, McNaughton, who is of the hostile party, cries. Surely, in all my time. I never heard, in song or rhyme. Tell of a man that so smartly. Displayed such great chivalry. But Bruce is soon obliged to give his horse to one of the ladies, and go on foot, like Prince Charles, living on such venison as his arrows may procure. Barber has to invent no fanciful dangers. He knows the racing tides and dangerous shoals of Argyle. The waves wide that breaking were. Weltered as hills, here and there. Unlike Chaucer, Barber has a scorn of astrology, no man ever, he says, made three correct prophecies, by knowledge of the stars. He is far from scrupulous, and does not blame Douglas when, like Achilles, he slays prisoners of war, apparently because he could not take them with him in his retreat and secure their ransoms. Barber has not, of course, the genius of Chaucer. But he has a touch of the genius of Scott, he has spirit, and a true sense of loyalty, chivalry, and patriotism, these, with his subject, place him beside Chaucer in so far as that he may still be read with unaffected enjoyment. Windtown Between Barber and the first true Scottish disciple of Chaucer, James I, comes the author of a chronicle in rhyming octosyllabic couplets, the original crony kill. This is Andrew Windtown, who was a canon of St. Andrew's Cathedral, and prior of St. Serfs on a little island in Loch Laven, the lock of Queen Mary's captivity. Windtown appears to have been an old man when, in 1413, the first Scottish university was founded at St. Andrew's, by a bull of the anti-pope, Pedro de la Luna. The place must, with its Augustinian canons, have been a seat of learning before 1413, but the new university was very poor, and a thing of small beginnings. Windtown's book commences with Adam and Eve, and is at fifth hand and fabulous till the author approaches his own time. Mythical as is his work when he approaches his own date he, with Ferdun, the really industrious author of the prose Scottish Chronicon, died about 1384, is one of our few sources of information about Scottish affairs. Windtown is amusing, but does not pretend to high poetic merit. The Kingese Quare To people who only know King James I of Scotland in history, his poem, The Kingese Quare, book, must be rather disappointing. Fortune was his foe, as he says in the poem, and the foe of his house. Born in July, 1394, young James was made prisoner in March, 1405 to 1406, and, for about eighteen years was a captive in England, or was led with the army of Henry V against his natural ally, Charles VII, the Dauphin of Jean d'Arc. The ransom demanded from James when released, in 1423, was ruinous, of his hostages, noblemen, some died in England, he found his country full of anarchy and treason, the disorders he suppressed with illegal vigor. He seized earldoms to which he had no right, 
he made powerful enemies, and, in 1437, he was slain by Robert Graham and a band of Highlanders, at the Black Friars in Perth. In England he had married Joan Beaufort, daughter of the Earl of Somerset, who lived to avenge him on his murderers with unheard of cruelties. When a man of James's intellect, character, and experiences writes a poem on his own taking at sea by faithless foes, his own long captivity, and his own love story, we naturally expect something of poignant personal interest. But we expect what his time, his taste, and his rank forbade him to give. Never was poetical tradition so crushing to originality as the tradition of the Roman de la Rose. For centuries each medieval poet aimed at saying just what his forerunners had said, and in much the same style, Barber, of course, is an exception, he does not open with a sleepless night, a book read in bed, a dream of a May morning. A walk to a pretty river, a palace near the river, and all the rest of it. Barber writes, like a man of this world. But King James follows the fashion of allegory. He cannot sleep, he reads Boethius in bed, Boethius, full of moralities. He lies thinking over his sorrows when, this is original, the bell for matins rings, and I me thought the bell said to me, tell on, man, quot the befell. He did not think that the voice was a real voice, impression of my thought causes this illusion, said he, and though he had spent much ink and paper to little effect, he sat down, made a mark of the cross, and set to work at his tail. First comparing his life to a ship in perilous seas, and then briefly mentioning his capture when about three years past the age of innocence, which was seven, he was, when taken, for years past seven. Birds, beasts, and fishes, he says, are free, why does fortune make me thrall? He looks out of his window into a green garden, the nightingale sing, he sees, and describes very prettily, a fair lady walking with her two maidens, and falls in love. In all probability this is a mere imitation of the first sight of Emily by Palamon and Arcite, in Chaucer's Knight's Tale. James would meet Jean in society, he was not a close prisoner, we are told that he knew many English ladies, and the course of his true love ran smooth enough. But the description is charming, as is the address to the nightingale which follows. After this long and excellent passage of true poetry, fashion compels the king to visit the palace of Venus and see the lovers of old times, converse with Venus and with Pallas, and visit fortune with her wheel, and take his place on it. Then he awakes not, seeing all his own mischance. A white turtle dove brings him flowers, and a glad message in letters of gold. And he blesses birds and flowers and even his prison wall, and the Sanctus Martial. That me first cause it hath this accident. The poem ends with an invocation of the shades of his master's dear, Gower and Chaucer. The manuscript, of about 1488, ascribes the poem to King James, so does Major or Mayor, a not too trustworthy historian. The language is Northern English, mixed with Scots, with many borrowings from Chaucer. The story indicated is true of James and of no one else, but the usual attempt has been made to deprive him of the authorship, wholly without success. The measure is the rhyme royal of Chaucer's Troilus and Chryside. The scansion is remarkably correct, and the lines have a melody not common in the works of Chaucer's followers. There is a strong moral element in the reflection and discourses. Henryson. Not a king like James I, nor a courtier priest, like Dunbar, his junior, but a schoolmaster of the Benedictine Abbey School at Dunfermline, Robert Henryson had, among Scottish poets of his day, the greatest share of the spirit of their master. Chaucer. He may be the Robert Henryson who, already a Bachelor of Arts, joined the University of Glasgow in 1462, but nothing is certainly known of him. He wrote his Moral Fabilis of Aesop. By request and precept of a lord. Of whom the name it needs not record. To he apparently had a patron destitute of vanity, and not ambitious of publicity. Henryson regarded Aesop, the mythical Greek slave, as a noble clerk, and made his own use of the tales of talking beasts, birds, and fishes, which are told among savages in most wild countries, and reached him, some of them by way of India. Filtered through Latin, French, and English authors. 
The animals are perfectly human in character, and give to Henryson, as later to Pryor and La Fontaine, the opportunity to show his own wit, humor, and tolerant gentle nature. The tales are told in the seven-line stanza, Rhyme Royal, of Chaucer's Troilus and Chryside. Even today they may be read with unfeigned pleasure, for their humorous and human studies of character, for their unostentatious pictures of nature, of the little nest of the field mouse, the moors, the stubble fields. The warm storeroom of the Burgess's house, where the town mouse has her hole, and for the unaffected sympathy with our wild kindred of fur and feather. The chatter of the hens, the widows of Chanticleer, when the fox, who has claimed old family friendship with the cock, flatters his vanity and carries him away, is far more pleasing than Dunbar's satire on his revolting widow and two married women. One hen, Pertok, makes bitter moan for the cock, the common husband of them all, but Spurtok declares her intention to sing, was never widow so gay, she enumerates the faults of the dear deceased, Pertok comes into her way of thinking. And Topic speaks of the faithlessness of their late lord. Heaven has punished Chanticleer, who, after all, cheats the fox, and returns to his harem. The Two Mice is especially humorous, and as sympathetic as Burns's poem, The T.W.A. Dogs. The tale is so vivid that we feel the keenest anxiety when Gib, or Gilbert, our jolly cat, pounces on the country mouse, the town mouse knows her hole, and has fled thither. The horror of the town mouse when she has rural dainties placed before her by the country mouse, her mincing airs of patronage, are delicately touched, in short, with the fox's confession to the priestly wolf, and the trial of the fox. And the strained law which the wolf administers to the lamb, the fables are animated and delightful poetry in their kind, the morals, as when the hard lot of the poor husbandman is described, are far from contemptible. Had Henryson left nothing else we must recognize in him a true son of Chaucer. His Testament of Cresside begins from a bitter winter night, when alone and snug in his warm room, he mends the fire, takes a drink, lays down his Chaucer, and ends the tale of fair false Cresside, whom Chaucer pitted. Chaucer was not the man to have created, like Thackeray, that other Cresside, Beatrix Esmond in her matchless bloom of triumphant beauty, and later to have drawn her as the old Baroness Bernstein. What Chaucer held his hand from, the medieval tale of the punishment of false Cresside, Henryson, not without a passion of pity, undertook. The god sent on Cresside's beauty the plague of leprosy, a terrible malady scarcely known by name to the Greeks, but as common in the Middle Ages as in ancient Israel. Diomede deserts Cresside. She becomes the common, spoil of opportunity, and returns to her father Calchas, priest of Venus. But, into the kirk, Cresside is ashamed to go. In a trance she comes into the presence of Saturn, a frozen god, and of the other old deities. Saturn then condemns her. The lady awakes and sees in her glass that she is a leper. She goes to the Lazar house, she dwells and begs with the lepers, Troilus rides past, and knows her not, but, in some faint way, memory of his love for Cresside wakes in him, and for his lost love's sake he gives to the leper lordly alms. A purse of gold and many a gay jewel. And nevertheless not are our youth or new. But another leper recognized Troilus, and Cresside, smitten to the heart, made her moan and her testament, leaving to Troilus the royal ring and red ruby that he had given her long ago. So she died, and Troilus raised a tomb of marble to. Cresciot of Troyes tune. Sometime count it the flower of womanhood. In the poem of this adventure there are but 616 lines, and it contains the poignant essence of romance, all passion and pity. Nothing in the poetry of Scotland excels, perhaps nothing but here and there the cry of a ballad, or of Scots, proud Maisie, approaches in excellence this work of the schoolmaster of Dunfermline. His Robine and McKean, or love dialogue between a lad and lass, the girl first wooing and repulsed, then wooed and scornful, is in a charming measure, and may have imitated some ancient French pastorel. The Orpheus and Eurydice, that sad and beautiful tale, told by Maoris in New Zealand, and by Iroquois in America, of the man who seeks his dead wife in Hades, has merit in Henryson's version. The passage of Orpheus to and through Hades, 
where his music consoles Tantalus and Theseus, and wins the grace of Persephone, is excellent, the tragic close is not successfully handled, and the long moral is tedious. A number of moral poems do not transcend the common course of those things, and Henryson lives by his Fables, his Testament of Cresciad, and Robine and McKean. These, with the sympathetic kindliness of his unrepining nature place him, if an individual opinion may be given, high above his more famous contemporary, Dunbar. Dunbar. William Dunbar, whom Scott declared to be the greatest poet of Scotland prior to Robert Burns, took the degree of Bachelor of Arts at St. Andrews in 1477. Much later, lads of seventeen or even of fourteen, graduated, so Dunbar may have been born, in East Lothian, so early as 1460. His language, with some Southern English tincture, is that of the most anglicized part of Scotland. The Earls of Dunbar were a great shifting power on the border, and Dunbar's name, at least, was noble, he may have come of Cospatrick's line, Earls of March. A favorite Scottish form of verse was the flighting, scolding, or humorous raillery, and Dunbar's opponent, Walter Kennedy, represented a very old Celtic clan of Galloway and Ayrshire, Dunbar banters him on his Irish dress and accent. Dunbar was brought up to be a churchman, and was a novice in the Order of St. Francis, begging with a pardon in all kirks. From 1479 to 1491, he was traveling abroad, preaching and begging in France, far from honestly, he says. I wess I ready all men to beguile, like Chaucer's partner, but perhaps Dunbar was merely copying Chaucer. He is thought to have been attached to the Scottish embassy in Paris, and he may have read, in print, the works of the famous burglar poet, François Villon. His recognized masters, however, were Chaucer, Gower, and Lydgate. From 1500 to the great defeat of Flodden, 1513, and the death of James IV, Dunbar was a priest and poet at the court of that magnificent prince, in whose day Scotland was peaceful, comparatively rich, and addicted to letters and the arts. Her poets, a century after Chaucer, and eighty years after their royal leader, James I, were all Chaucerians, but were confessedly more vigorous, tuneful, more original in genius, and much less prolix and pedantic than the English Chaucerians. Lydgate, Gower, and Hawes. But what Dunbar lacks in length, he more than makes up for in breadth. He made court poems on the royal marriage of The Thistle and the Rose, Margaret, the Rose, was really as prickly as the thistle. He was but thriftily rewarded, and emitted many rhymed petitions for money. Benefice he got none. Probably, like Dean Swift, he was thought no credit to his cloth, even in days far from respectable. As Chaucer was styled Bold Grizzle, so the Scot speaks of himself as This Grey Horse, Old Dunbar. At about forty-eight, and in sickness, he wrote his Lament for the Macaris, the dead makers or poets, including Chaucer, Gower, and Lydgate, with the recurring burden, To more mortis conturbeth me, fear of death disturbeth me. In 1511 he was with the Queen at her reception in Aberdeen, which he celebrated, as he had already made immortal the filth and stench of Edinburgh, a town famous for its dirt till after Dr. Johnson's time. His humorous poems, his satires on society and clergy, are coarser than the English poetic attacks. His Three Wanton Wives, Two Married Women and the Widow, is inspired by Chaucer's Wife of Bath's Tale, or rather by the prologue. Historically, these poems are full of matter, with their pictures of a society not more pure than that to which Piers Plowman preached, but they have not the gentle and humane wit of Chaucer. Like all the poets following Chaucer, Dunbar shines in descriptions of gardens and woods in spring, though May, in Scotland, is not always what his fancy painted it. Indeed these vernal glories are borrowed from the verse of sunny France. The sun rises fair in France. And fair sets he. But he has tint the bonny blink. He has in my ain country. Writes the Jacobite exile, accustomed at home. Only to a blink or gleam of the sun through clouds. After 1520, or thereabouts, Dunbar saw no more of the sun. Dunbar, with his satires, flightings, court poems, allegories of the usual kind, 
rhymed petitions, poems of penitence and faith, and the rest, was versatile enough, and wrote in many forms of verse. Even in the old unrhymed alliterative cadences, the Tua Marriott Woman and the Widow. To his glory be it said that this, his longest piece, is only of 530 lines. He also used the heroic rhymed couplet, writing rhyme, and the rhymed octosyllabic couplet, strophes of various arrangements, and even the tripping French trilet. One allegorical poem, The Golden Targe, full of classical mythology in the usual praise of May, contains the lines. O Reverend Chaucer, Rose of Rhetoris all. As in our tongue are flower imperial. Rhetoris, being masters of rhetoric. Dunbar escapes from Venus and other gods, and from a crowd of allegorical people, including danger, of course, at the end of 278 lines. Apparently Scotland did not love the long-winded style. The flighting combines with rhyme copious alliteration. For wealth of strange coarse terms of abuse Dunbar may compare with Urquhart, the translator of Rabelais. A poem to the young queen is unspeakably nauseous. In short to be plain, it is not easy to see why Dunbar has been reckoned above James I and Henryson, while Barber, with a chivalrous heart and a spirited story, is infinitely more agreeable and profitable than the court-haunting priest of James IV. In Scotland, Dunbar at no time has been so popular as the poets already mentioned. He praises Chaucer, but the lesson of Chaucer he never fully learned. Blind Harry Blind Harry, or Henry the Minstrel, is a mysterious personage. Who was Harry? John Mayer or Major, 1469-1550, is not an accurate historian, the antiquary, in Scott's novel, calls him a pillar of falsehood. Major says that, in his own infancy, say 1480, a man blind from his birth wrote, Sir William Wallace, and supported himself by chanting it to the nobles. The manuscript is of 1488. A few entries of small sums paid to Blind Harry occur in the royal accounts, ending in 1492, and Harry was dead when, 1508, Dunbar printed his lament for poets dead and gone. Harry may have become blind, but can hardly have been blind from his birth. Though he calls himself a Borel man, an unlettered man, he had some education, he was not a ballad maker, but produced a romance of nearly 12,000 lines. He says that he had a Latin source, a narrative written by Wallace's chaplain, John Blair, of which nothing is known. He is full of anachronisms, and tells long adventures of Wallace with Edward I and his queen which never occurred. Tradition, already mythical, is his chief source, his Wallace is but little more historical than Greta in the Icelandic saga, and like him has dealings with a ghost, that of a slain man, which appears with its head in its hand. Wallace, whose wife, it is said, was slain by the English, is a very bloodthirsty hero, his manslayings and burnings of houses are many. Harry has not too high an opinion of Bruce. His hero, Wallace, has always been, thanks mainly to Harry, the most popular of Scottish heroes. Harry tells his tale with abundant energy. He hates the English infinitely more than the chivalrous barber did, and he is perfectly free from the influence of the Roman de la Rose. His verse is not wholly correct. Eight consecutive lines have the following rhymes, bin, keen, saw, mean, seen, raw, gnaw, tear, faw, indeed some passages have a kind of stanza formation, in the second book, lines 260 to 360. We must not look on Harry as an unlearned maker of border ballads. He had read Windtown, and Chaucer, though he does not make Chaucer his model, and he borrows from the alliterative romance of Arthur ascribed to the mysterious Hutchown. Moreover, it has been proved, and anybody can see it, that he stole adventures of Robert Bruce from Barber's poem, and made Wallace, not Bruce, their hero. Harry takes some of Bruce's battles and transfers them to Wallace. Harry nearly uproots Barber. Whereas Bruce, on the eve of Bannockburn, cut down Sir Henry Bohun, as he charged, with a blow of his axe, Harry declares that Wallace dealt this very stroke on Bruce's spear and horse's neck. To Wallace he attributes the famous campaign in which Bruce drove Edward II within the walls of York, 1322. 17. 
Harry is, in short, a mystery, and his book, Wholly Worthless as History, is a colossal perversion of Barber, the Bruce, with other matter from pure fancy or from unknown legend, while great parts are played by men of Harry's own time. English Innovating Knights of 1483 The Buke of the Howlat Sir Richard Holland, or de Holland, a cleric, and a partisan of the House of Douglas during its encounters with the Crown, and its fall under James II, wrote, to please his patroness, the Countess of Moray, and to flatter the Douglas. The Buke of the Howlat, the Owl The poem, in stanzas of thirteen lines, rhyming and alliterative, begins with the usual dream and leads up to a kind of allegorical, parliament of fowls. The allegory is entangled, the poet's real desire is to glorify his patrons with their motto. O Douglas, O Douglas! Tender and true. True, they had been, to Bruce and to Scotland, but they became the allies, against king and country, of Edward IV and Henry VIII, while, tender, the Douglases never were. The most interesting passage describes the voyage of the good Lord James towards the Holy Land, with the heart of Bruce. In Spain he meets the Saracens in battle, and throws among them the heart, in its jeweled case. Among the Hethan men the hurt hardly he slang. Said, wend on as thou was wont. Throw the battel in front. I foremost in the front. Thy foes among. There fell the Douglas, above the heart of his king, that was rescued by Logan and Lockhart, and brought back to Scotland, a noble feat of chivalry, nobly told. Here Holland, stirs the blood like the sound of a trumpet. It may be said of these Scottish poets that while, in initiative and in models they owe almost all to England. Their long and desperate war with that country gives them a martial fire and spirit to which the English poetry of the time furnishes no rival. Lawrence Minot does not stir the blood. Gawain Douglas Gawain Douglas was of the family of the Red Douglases, Earls of Angus, who rose on the ruin of the turbulent Black Douglases, of the House of Bruce's good Lord James, when they failed in their alliance with England against the Crown of Scotland. The Red Douglases also rose high, and had their own feud with the Crown and alliance with or servitude to Henry VIII and the Protestant cause. Gawain was a younger son of the Earl of Angus called Bell the Cat, who hanged the artistic favourites of James III. As an old man he was present at Flodden, 1513, where James IV died so gallantly, and his grandson, now Earl of Angus, married Dunbar's Rose, Margaret Tudor, widow of James IV. Gawain himself, born about 1473 or 1474, was educated at St. Andrews University, took orders, and, being of a powerful house, received rapid clerical promotion. His poems were written in the peaceful and prosperous years of James IV, between 1501 and 1513, the date of Flodden and of the completion of Gawain's translation of the Aeneid of Virgil. His earlier works, The Palace of Honor, and King Heart, are merely rhymed allegories after the manner of the unceasing Roman de la Rose, and have no special interest. What is true about one of these belated last allegories is true of another, they are no longer to be read for mere literary pleasure. In his, Aeneid, Douglas introduces original prologues to the books of the Aeneid, rather in the manner of Scott's poetical epistles between the cantos of Marmion. He describes winter, spring, and summer in Scotland. He criticizes, not unfavorably, the theology of Virgil, whom the Middle Ages regarded, now as a magician, like Ovid among the Italian peasantry to this day, and now as an inspired prophet of the coming of our Lord. He attacks Caxton for printing a translation of Virgil, not from the original Latin, but from a French version. His criticism of Caxton is full of detail, and severe. He himself is, bound to Virgil's text, and he does not treat it, as a rule, with the license of Chapman when rendering Homer into English verse. But Gawain remarks, truly, that sometimes of one word he must make three, must occasionally expand in exposition, and add, in coloring. Sometime I follow the text als near I may. Sometime I am constrained our youth or way. His remarks on the task of the translator show considerable reflection. 
On comparing the poem with the Latin it seems more close in sense to the great untranslatable original than might have been expected in an uncritical age and country. It is the first attempt in our language at the rendering of a great ancient classic, and, as such, looks forward to the new times, and to the Renaissance which, in Scotland, was mainly confined to biblical criticism. After Flodden, Gawain was immersed in politics, and in a long and futile struggle to obtain, through English influence, the Archbishopric of St. Andrews. For this he fought a triangular duel, nor were the weapons of the flesh in used, with Hepburn, the prior, and Foreman, a clerical diplomatist, who was successful. Gawain obtained the petty bishopric of Dunkel, on the Tay, and died when on a political mission to London, 1522. Gawain is almost the only Scottish example of a nobleman and a churchman, in his age, distinguished for devotion to literary scholarship. There are a number of Scots poems, of this date, such as, Christ's Kirk on the Green, and, Peebles at the Play, the best of them which show much command of lively meter and rude descriptive powers where rustic merriment and horseplay are to be painted. But their dialect is usually uncouth, and they are only appreciated by special students. Sir David Lindsay The most popular of the old Scottish poets was not so poetical as Henryson, but gave pleasure by his genial character, his extremely coarse humor, and his attacks on the churchmen and on abuses in the state. This author, Sir David Lindsay, was born, perhaps at his family place, the Mount, in Fife, about 1490. His name, de Lindsay, if it be his, appears in the register of St. Andrew's University besides that of the man whom he hated so much, and attacked in verse after his murder, the great Cardinal Beaton. By 1511, Lindsay was a page at court, and acted in a play at Holyrood. In 1512, Lindsay was master of the household, or chief attendant of the infant prince, later James V. He was present when the apparition described in Marmion gave a warning, in church, to James IV, just before Flodden, and told Lindsay of Pitscotty, the amusing chronicler. That he tried to arrest the figure, but he vanished away as if he had been a blink of the sun or a whiz of the whirlwind. Till 1522 his chief business was to teach and amuse the boy, James V. I bore thee in mine arm. Full tenderly. And, later, told him fairy tales such as the story of the Red Eden, or disguised himself as, the grisly ghost of Guy. About 1528 Lindsay wrote, The Dream, the usual allegorical dream, in 1529 he was made chief herald, Lord Lion King of Arms, and as such went on many foreign embassies. In 1539-1540 his great play, The Satire of the Three Estates, was acted before the court, it is the only early Scottish drama that survives. There are two parts, and three interludes full of matter wonderfully coarse. The play is all in favor of reforms, and is full of the satire of the churchmen and pleadings for the poor which ensured its popularity. There are some seventy characters, most of them allegorical personages. The king delighted in the satire, and as Lindsay attacked the vices of the clergy and the pardoners, not the doctrines of the church, he ran no risk of martyrdom. The verse is in many forms in different sorts of stanzas, in rhyming couplets of eight syllables, or of ten or more. After James's death and the murder of Cardinal Beaton, Lindsay wrote a poem, The Tragedy of the Cardinal, in which his ghost accuses himself of many sins and crimes, and is sure that Boccaccio would write, My Tragedy. If Boccaccio were still alive. Lindsay died early in 1555. His most popular poem, probably, was a good humored romance, Squire Meldrum, about the fighting adventures, at home and abroad, of a young fife laird of the period. He wrote many other things, humorous or grave, admonitions to the king, and a reply to a flighting or scolding of the king against him, in verse, Unluckily, the royal lampoon is lost. A Lament for James's First Wife Who Died Young A very humorous set of verses on the king's dog, and a dialogue between experience and a courtier, with shorter pieces, grave or gay, make up Lindsay's contribution to the literature of his country. They are full of historical hints, but, merely as poetry, are now seldom read, as Henryson may be read, for pleasure. The Reformation, 
breaking out in 1559, distracted men's minds from secular literature, to which, for more than a century, Scotland contributed nothing of real importance except the History of the Reformation, by John Knox, the Reformer. This work is written in such English, not Scots, as Knox could command, for in origin it was meant to be read in England, and to justify the proceedings of the Reformers. It is partly derived from memory of the events and the memory is sometimes strangely inaccurate. Public documents are inserted at full length, in one case with some lack of candor, and actions are denied which, later, were acknowledged. The book, as history, needs to be cautiously studied, but as a picture of the men and women of the age, especially of Knox himself and Queen Mary, it is most vivacious, and may be read with interest and amusement. Knox's other works, theological, epistolary, and political, were written to meet the needs of the moment, and are of little value except to historians and students of the career and character of the author. 15. Popular Poetry Ballads The 15th and 16th centuries in England and Scotland were rich in popular poetry and in ballads. We must define the meaning of popular and ballad poetry, as used in this chapter. Much confusion and much controversy exist regarding this matter of ballads and popular poetry. To understand the subject it is necessary to be acquainted with the results of research in the orally transmitted verse of peoples in every stage of culture. For till elementary instruction in reading and writing become universal, the untaught rural classes retain, in their songs, the literary methods of the quite uncivilized races of Australia, North America, Africa, and so on. Taking the people's lowest in civilization, we find that the Australian blacks and the American Red Indians have several kinds of songs, usually sung in dances, whether festive or religious or magical. They have magic chants, and even hymns, often unintelligible to those who sing them in the dance, either because the language is obsolete, or because the songs have been borrowed from tribes of alien speech. It is clear that in Europe, too, the ballad was originally a dancing song, Ballad is from Balair, to dance, and where a story was told, that was given in recitative, while the dancers followed each line of narrative with a chorus or refrain. Such as. There were three ladies lived in a bower. Oh wow. Bonnie. And they went out to P.U. a flower. On the Bonnie banks oh, for die. The story told in the recitative, in surviving examples, was probably, at first, composed by one author, versifying a popular tale, of unknown antiquity, or narrating some recent event. Even now in the remoter isles of the Hebrides, various singers, each in turn, improvise and chant verses, and thus a kind of ballad is made collectively. But it is plain that for each of our oldest surviving narrative ballads there must have been one original author, whether his theme was an old story or a recent occurrence, on the borders usually a cattle raid, the escape of a prisoner, or a battle. There would be no professional poet, as Queen Mary's ally, Bishop Leslie of Ross tells us, in his History of Scotland, the borderers themselves make their own ballads, about the deeds of their ancestors, or crafty raids or forays. Such unwritten songs would be altered by every singer, as time went by, so that these ballads as they stand are thoroughly popular and masterless, many hands have combined to bring them into their present state. The Robin Hood ballads, or songs about Robin Hood, are mentioned by Piers Plowman as popular among the peasants at the end of the 14th century. They would be sung in connection with the very ancient festivities of May Day, held in England and Scotland, when money was collected, rather roughly, from spectators and passers-by. Now WNKYN de Ward, the successor of Caxton as a printer, published a Lytle Jest of Robin Hood, about 1490. But we are not obliged to suppose that the songs known to Piers Plowman were borrowed from the long jest of Robin Hood. More probably the jest was derived from the popular traditions and rhymes of the May Day show of Robin Hood. How far these ballads as they now exist have been organized and improved upon by a professional minstrel it is hard to say. In any case the older ballads are worthy of Merry England. The ballads of King Arthur are manifestly popularized and reduced to the simple ballad form from the long literary romances, and are probably the work of lowly professional minstrels. 
The long ballad of Flodden Field is the work of a partisan of the Stanley family, it is far too long, over five hundred lines, and too full of historical detail, for a ballad made by the borderers themselves. Scottish Field, Flodden, is another piece of the same sort, in alliterative measure. The class of ballad which was made as a narrative of current events, or a satire on contemporaries, of such ballad satires Henry VIII complained to James V, was usually, in England, the work of a versifying journalist of the humblest sort. And was printed. John Knox tells us that ballads were made on Queen Mary's for Mary's, Mary Livingstone, Mary Fleming, Mary Beaton and Mary Seton, and these, it is plain, were satirical. But the only survivor of these ballads, Mary Hamilton, is romantic, and in all its many various forms transfers, to a non-existent Mary, the misfortunes of a French waiting maid of the Queen, who, with her lover, an apothecary, was hanged for the murder of their child. In only one text is the lover an apothecary, the lady is sometimes not an apocryphal Hamilton, but a Campbell, daughter of the Duke of Argyle, or a daughter of the Duke of York, or even Mary Mild, or Mile, which is the name of Our Lady in Old Carols. For the lover, the poet chooses Henry Darnley, husband of Queen Mary, or that old offender, Sweet Willie, or any one. And this is a good example of the changes which popular ballads underwent in recitation. As they stand, the multitude has collaborated in them, reciters have altered the original in many ways. Such ballads differ much from Lady Bessie, with its 1080 lines, probably written by Humphrey Brereton in honor of the House of Stanley and of Lady Bessie's revenge on Richard III. Some verses are as spirited as those of Kinmont Willie, a border ballad to which Scott lent the vigor of the last and greatest of the border makers. For probably the finest verses in the song are by Sir Walter himself, at all events he improved what old verses he found. At Bosworth Field, when all is lost, Sir William Harrington says to Richard III. There may no man their strokes abide. The Stanley's dints they be so strong. Ye may come in another time. Therefore methink ye tarry too long. As lion-hearted as his namesake Richard I, Richard III replies. Give me my battle-axe in my hand. And set my crown on my head so high. For by him that made both sea and land. King of England will I this day die. One foot of ground I will not flee. While the strength abides my breast within. As he said so did it be. If he lost his life he died a king. The early history of our purely romantic ballads, such as, Clerk Sanders, The Douglas Tragedy, The Dowie Dens, O, Yarrow, Young Bay Chan, The Wife of Usher's Well, Fair Annie, Tam Lane, and many more, is obscure. They have analogues in all European countries, from Greece to Scandinavia, and in popular tales, the oldest things in literature. Their extraordinary charm, their touch of supernatural terror, their simplicity, their recurring formulae of words, their brevity and pathos, make them things apart. The heart of humanity is their maker, though in each country where they exist local illusions and local color have been given to them by the singers. When such ballads have been worked over by some hack of the early press they are often worthless. The best have been collected from oral recitation, or old written copies. There can be no universal theory of the origin of ballads. Each ballad must be examined by itself before we can say whether it is a popularized shape of a literary romance, or a versified, merkin, worked over by many hands in many ages, or a mere mythical newsletter, like, King James and Brown. Or the work, like, Otterburn, of a humbler poet than the minstrels of the Stanleys, but a better poet, or one whose work has been improved by the modifications of later singers. Or whether the thing is a dance song, contributed to by each dancer in turn, or a brief and beautiful lament like, the Bonnie Earl O. Murray. The best traditional ballads have the color and fragrance of wild flowers. Curious and very ancient traits of popular usages may be gathered from the songs of merrymaking, for example in the songs of Ivy, the badge of the women, and of Holly, the badge of the men. Girls and lads bring ivy and holly into halls and a fight ensues, the girls are thrust out into the cold. Nay, nay ivy it may not be, I wiss. For holly must have mastery, 
as the manor is. The girls burned the holly boy of the men, the men burned the ivy maid of the girls. This ancient feud of the sexes, and of their patron birds, exists among the tribes of southeastern Australia, the men killing the bird of the women, the women the bird of the men, and an amorous kind of combat follows. The old ballad of Chevy Chase, a form of the older ballad on the Battle of Audubon, 1388, was warmly praised by Sir Philip Sidney. Later Addison took delight in ballads, they began to be collected and printed in volumes towards the end of the 17th and early in the 18th century. In 1765 Bishop Percy printed many ballads and other early poems from a manuscript, the folio, which he found, tattered and mutilated, in the house of a friend. Percy, in his, relics, omitted, altered and modernized the contents of the folio, but it was very popular. In 1803 and later Sir Walter Scott published The Border Minstrelsy, containing many excellent old ballads, in places modified by himself, from manuscripts, recitations, and printed copies. It is in The Minstrelsy that we find the classical versions of the ballads, there are many other collections. We have put into smaller type a short account of the probable origins and development of the ballad, because a study of these subjects is mainly based on folklore and on research into the unwritten poetry of backward races. The reader of poetry who is not concerned about an obscure and difficult subject, is best advised if he takes up Scott's Border Minstrelsy and reads it for human pleasure. He will find endless variety of strong, simple, passionate poetry, seldom made difficult by obsolete words, for the ballads are, however old, far less Scots in language than the poems of Burns. Another good collection is the abridgment by Professor Kittredge, of the late Professor Child's vast collection of ballads in five volumes, a work indispensable to the special student. Though it is not a ballad, the most beautiful and loyal piece of masterless poetry of this age is, The Nut Brown Maid, already old when it was published in 1502. This is a defense of woman's faithfulness in love, the maid will follow her outlawed lover to the greenwood, ay, even if he have another lady there. Her lover replies. Lo yet, before, ye must do more. Why if ye will go with me? As cut your hair up by your air. Your kirtle by the knee. With bow in hand, for to withstand. Your enemies, why if need be. Scott's song, Greta Banks, in, Rokeby, repeats the sentiment and meter of this beautiful poem, with its music and mastery of changing refrains and various measures. Some of the carols too, such as, I Sing of a Maid, are the earliest notes in the bird-like music of the lyrists under Elizabeth and Charles I. Professional Poetry Skelton Barclay Meanwhile professional poetry of society and the court was sinking to the lowest depth. The verse of the prolific priest and scholar, John Skelton, born 1460, died 1529, leads nowhere, and though it is full of historical and personal interest, must not detain us. Skelton had honours of a sort, as laureate, from Oxford, Cambridge, and Louvain. He translated parts of Cicero and other classics, and, in 1500, was highly praised by the famous Erasmus, who later brought the study of the New Testament in Greek to England, and was the wittiest of scholars in the revival of learning and of Greek literature. Skelton had Latin enough, of Greek not much, and about 1500 was tutor of the future Henry VIII. His profuse poetry is mainly in long but lively stretches of doggerel, very short rhyming verses, generally satirical, poured from him ceaselessly. He had a flighting or scolding match like that of Dunbar and Kennedy, with Sir Christopher Garnash. He lamented at terrible length the death of Philip Sparrow, slain by our cat Gibb, nothing can be less like Catullus's dirge for Lesbia Sparrow, but some graceful compliments to young ladies are intermixed with the doggerel. He owed the rectory of Dis, Norfolk, probably to his patron, Wolsey, but for some unknown reason he later pursued Wolsey with libelous satires. In The Bouge of Court, when he relapses into stanzas and the outworn allegorical verbiage, he satirizes court life. In Colin Clout, his hero is a tramp, as vehement in attack on all sorts and conditions of men as Piers Plowman. 
Woolsey was attacked as a despot in Colin Clout, and much more bitterly assailed in Why Come Ye Not to Court, after writing this piece Skelton fled from his foes and creditors to sanctuary in Westminster. He wrote a long morality, magnificence, with the usual personified vices and virtues. In very bad taste he hurled doggerel at King Jimmy, James IV, after his glorious death at Flodden, and, more deservedly, attacked the Scots who deserted the Duke of Albany in the French when the Duke wished to lead them across the Tweed. A brief sample of Skelton when most skeltonical is his reply to the alleged boast of the Scots that they won the Battle of Flodden. That is as true. As black is blue. And green is grey. Whatever they say. Jemmy is dead. And closed in lead. That was their own king. Fie on that winning. Even in his own country, as he admits, the execrable taste of Skelton was reproved. He had a rude kind of vigor, but his verses make it manifest that a new strain of blood, as it were, was needed in English poetry, old forms, such as the allegorical form, were outworn quite, and verse resembling the poem of Aramis. In lines of one syllable, could not endure, while Skelton's, crown of laurel, mixes his own blusterous humor with the stale learning, and pompous allegory of the fifteenth century. And, the tunning of Eleanor Rumming, an alewife, in doggerel, is as offensive as the Scottish song, there was a haggis in Dunbar, and extends to six hundred and twenty lines. Very truly quoth Skelton. I have written to Mitch. Of this mad mumminge. Of Eleanor Rumminge. Barclay. Alexander Barclay, died 1552, was probably not a Scot, though his name is spelt in the Scots not the English way, Berkeley. His high praises of James IV of Scotland, however, scarcely indicate an English author, and he was very early regarded as a Scot. He was a priest, a monk of Ely, he dwelt long at St. Mary Ottery in Devon, and was a copious translator. His Ship of Fools, 1508-1509, is from the German Narrenschiff of Sebastian Brandt, his Castle of Labor, from the French of Gringor was an earlier work. His Eclogues, in part translated, are very unlike those of Virgil, and their contents are growls in the style of colon clout. Barclay used French and Latin versions of the Narrenschiff, as well as the original, Dutch. He altered and added to his original as he pleased, and he prolongs the cry against abuses raised by Piers Plowman. A writer who takes all follies and vices for his theme, from the frauds of friars, the wickedness of heretics, the oppressions of knights, to the peevishness of the patient who kicks over the table on which the physic bottles stand, can never want matter, and Barclay's matter is exceeding abundant. But the clever contemporary woodcuts that illustrate his satire are better than his two thousand irregular stanzas in Rhyme Royal, and if Barclay quarreled with Skelton, the affair is like a feud between Bavius and Mevius. The two writers are characteristic of their rude and chaotic age, which, as regards all but popular poetry, was the dark hour before the dawn. 16. Rise of the Drama In one shape or another, the drama, acting with or without written words, is always in existence, at least in the form of pantomime, even among the rudest peoples. The church permitted a kind of half-ritual. Half-dramatic representation of sacred scenes at a very early period, but we have no earlier relic of English written plays than the very brief, harrowing of hell, of the first half of the fourteenth century. There are a few speeches between our Lord and Satan, and our Lord and the released Hebrew patriarchs. A good idea of the plays of the fifteenth century may be obtained from the set called the Townley Plays, because the manuscript belonged at one time to the old Jacobite family of Townley. It is thought to have been originally the property of the Abbey of Woodkirk or Widkirk near Wakefield, and one play, the second play representing the shepherds at the birth of Christ, contains allusions to the country scenes near Woodkirk. The plays were acted on movable wooden stages, by the members of the various trade guilds, such as the glovers, the barkers, tanners, there is brass on the target of bark and bull's hide, says Scott in, Bonnie Dundee, the grocers, and so forth. The plays of one town are sometimes the basis of the plays of another town, some of those of York follow those of Wakefield, and in places Wakefield borrows from York. The authors are unknown. If they were priests, 
these clerics had much more of broad humor than of reverence as we understand it. No doubt the plays informed the spectators on points of the scriptural story, but the religion was highly recreative. Nothing can have been more amusing to the crowd than the spectacle of their neighbors playing all manner of highly laughable pranks by way of illustrating the gross, grumbling, reckless, impudent came. Or the rustic waggeries of the local shepherds of Bethlehem. Even now the words of the plays make a man laugh aloud, in the comic parts, as he reads them. They are of the broadest farce, yet our mirth rises more from the character displayed than from mere practical buffoonery and clowning. The tanners enacted the creation, the glovers, the death of Abel. Many Old Testament stories were played, the unaccomplished sacrifice of Isaac, the story of Abraham, and so on, with the birth, crucifixion, and ascension of our Lord, and the soliloquy in suicide of Judas, a fragment. Whoever the authors may have been, they took pains to represent the most unearthly characters as very human, though the opening soliloquy of the deity at the creation is orthodox and majestic. The cherubim then take up the tale, praising the works, especially praising Lucifer, he is so lovely and so bright. Lucifer enters and, accepting the praise, proposes to be lord of all and says that the throne becomes him rarely, taking his seat on it. The bad angels approve in the most colloquial style. The good descent, and the bad, sent down below, express their lively regrets. The slaying of Abel is introduced by Garcio, not a scriptural character, in an impudent speech. And then Cain enters, ploughing, cursing his horses, and wrangling with his boy, who offers to fight him. Abel enters, full of human kindness, but Cain insults him in the coarsest rustic manner, go to the devil and say I bade. Abel insists that Cain should offer a burnt sacrifice of a tenth of his corn, but Cain loves paying tithes no more than any other farmer. He grumbles in the true natural tone of the depressed agriculturist. When all men's calm was fair in field. There was mine not worth a held. The weather is such, says Cain, that the farmer owes no gratitude to providence, no tithes. He selects his worst sheaves, as pay tithe he must. The deity intervenes, but Cain treats him with the most serene insolence, kills the remonstrating Abel with the jawbone of some animal, and, in short, is no more edifying than Mr. Punch, whose lawless and irreverent behavior in the popular street drama is a survival of the humor of Cain. The Rejoicing of the Shepherds, the second play, is much more human and various, the shepherds are full of the complaints of their condition with which Piers Plowman has made us familiar, but the provisions at their picnic are rich and various. And the adventure of Mac, the sheep stealer, is of the best comedy. Hospitably entertained by the shepherds, Mac steals a sheep, flays it, and takes it home to his wife. They put it in a cradle, and cover it with blankets, Next Mac hies to the shepherds again, grumbling that his wife has a new baby. They suspect and follow him, he denies his theft, and will eat the child in the cradle, if the sheep can be found on his premises. It is found. This child, says a shepherd, has too long a snout. Mrs. Mac, with much presence of mind, admits the fact, but declares that her child is a fairy changeling, fairies stole the baby at midnight, and left this ugly substitute. The shepherds forgive Mac, for the joke's sake, after tossing him in a sheet. The same story is told of Archie Armstrong, the border reaver and jester. When the shepherds go back to their flocks, the angel sings Gloria in Excelsis. And the shepherds criticize the music learnedly, there was no crochet wrong, and imitate the air. The sacred part of the play, the adoration, an offering of balls and toys to the newborn babe, is very brief. The play is a most humorous and lively representation of our liberal shepherds, the sacred narrative merely affords a pretext for the gamble. England was merry England in the 15th century, in spite of defeats in France, murder and civil war at home, preachings and burnings of lollards, and all the grievances of Piers Plowman, the cruelty of the great. And the greed and cunning of the friars. The play of Lazarus, on the other hand, is not only solemn, closely following the words of the Gospel, but is as full as the Anglo-Saxon poem, The Grave, of sepulchral horrors. Of the costumes we may judge by that of a sti. 
Paul on the road to Damascus, in the Digby plays, the apostle is dressed like an adventurous knight and is mounted. In place of scene shifting the audience shifted from one open-air stage in the street to another. There were dances between the scenes. Paul's servant has a scene of banter with an ostler. He maintains that he is a gentleman's servant, a superior person. Says the ostler, I saw such another gentleman with you, a barrowful he bear of horse dung, and such other gear. There are forty characters and a crowd in the play of Mary Magdalene, and much skill in stage management must have been needed. In this play of more than two thousand lines allegorical characters abound, including the seven deadly sins. Much of the gospel story of the Magdalene is introduced, with lively scenes from the unconverted career of the Lady of the Castle of Magdala, and there is a long passage of sheer romance, we have a storm at sea. The abandonment of the king's wife and child on a rock, their discovery later, alive and well, in fact the story is akin to that in Shakespeare's Pericles. We see that the secular entertainment, the drama of romance, is ousting its religious occasion and pretext. In Mary Magdalene, too, we observe that the miracle play, on sacred subjects, is combined with the morality, the drama with allegorical characters, as in the romance of the rose, presented in flesh and blood. And therefore more entertaining than they are in the endless allegorical poems. The morality of every man has been revived with much success in our own time. In all these plays the verse takes many rhyming forms, mainly lyric. The chief collections are the Townley, York, Chester, Digby, Coventry, and a macro, named from an owner of the manuscript. In the macro play, Mankind, the actors make collections of money from the audience, they must have belonged to a professional strolling company, not to an honorable and disinterested trading guild. The piece is a gross burlesque of morality, full of blatant jests and dog Latin rhymes. There is a scientific morality, an interlude, the four elements, in which nature, humanity, studious desire, sensual appetite, experience, and ignorance play their parts. Much novel information about the dimensions of the earth and meteorology is given, studious desire is an apt pupil, but sensual appetite and the taverner offer instruction more palatable to the man in the street. They introduce Little Nell A proper wench, she danceth well and Jane with the black lace. We will have bouncing Bess also. And humanity slinks out of the lecture room, being more concerned. To see a pretty girl. It is a world to see her whirl. Dancing in a round. Then to observe the gyrations of the terrestrial globe. In Hick's Corner, an interlude of the same kind, the hero has been in as many places as Witseth himself, including. The land of Rumbelow. Three mile out of hell. Hicks Corner and Free Will are worse roisterers than humanity, and their rude waggeries make the mirth, though Free Will speaks of forswearing sack and living cleanly. Haywood. John Haywood is one of the few known authors of these things. He was of what is now Pembroke College, Dr. Johnson's College, in Oxford, and was an acquaintance of Sir Thomas More, who frankly admits that by nature he was a giglot, a gay fellow, though, by grace, devout. Haywood was merry in mournful times, when Henry VIII began to make martyrs of Protestants, and of Catholics who were not, at any moment, of the same shade of belief as himself. The anecdotes say that Haywood saved his skin by his jests, that after Henry's death he amused Mary Tudor, who was not easily amused, and that he fled from persecution under Edward VI, and died abroad in the reign of Elizabeth. His best-known piece is The Four Peas, Apothecary, Pardoner, Palmer, and Peddler. Why, asks the Pardoner, should the Palmer visit hundreds of remote shrines, while the Pardoner, at his very door, can sell him forgiveness of sins at the lowest figure? He can cleanse a thousand souls for as small a sum as the Palmer spends on one voyage. All four men are impudent rogues, and all, in the spirit of the morality, are rapidly converted, the peddler becoming as pious as Piers Plowman. There is no action, and the great jest is that, in a lying competition, the peddler says that he has never seen a woman out of patience. The diversion must have been derived mainly from the antics of the players on the stage. 
Haywoods, Thersites, the impudent orator in the Iliad, was written about 1537, to make mirth for the birth feast of the Prince of Wales, afterwards Edward VI. Thersites asks Mulciber, Hephaestus, to make him a helmet, Saulet, as he made the arms of Achilles. This enables Mulciber to vent many puns on Salad, they look like the very first puns ever devised, and occupy two pages. The pun seems to have been a novelty in Tudor England. Thersites is a rough-hewn predecessor of Shakespeare's pistol. There is much mockery of sacred relics and some buffoonery by way of action. Telemachus brings a letter from Ulysses, such a thing, said J. J. Rousseau, very foolishly, would have been useful in the Odyssey, and Miles, the knight, ends all with a pious speech. In early Tudor England the drama had sunk many fathoms below the level of the miracle plays, such as that of the shepherds. The rise of the drama, under Elizabeth, is a kind of miracle, like the sculpture of Phidias appearing after the rude art of the artists who worked at Athens before the victories of Marathon and Salamis. In Jack Juggler, however, we find the influence of Roman comedy faintly dawning, for the play is Plautus's comedy of Amphitryon, without Amphitryon, the hero, and with the mischievous and much-beaten Jack Juggler as the source of the fun. The infant drama had wandered out of biblical and allegorical subjects into touch with actual ancient Roman comedy, and, with Bale's King John, was preluding to Shakespeare's chronicle plays. In the dawn of the Reformation, disputants on both sides addressed the people in interludes, just as today a person, with a purpose, puts it into a novel, in place of writing a sober and reasonable treatise which would not be read. Among the plays with a purpose none is more absurd than the King John of John Bale, 1495-1563. Bale, whose best work is a kind of history of English literature in Latin, was a fiery hot gospeler, he had to leave the country under Mary Tudor. In King John, that profane and licentious but astute prince appears as a kind of Protestant martyr. Attacked by Stephen Langton, he says that the church hates him because he does not found abbeys, and is in favor of an open Bible. So he is poisoned by the wicked priests. In the interests of history no less than of her church, Queen Mary issued proclamations against plays with a Protestant purpose, while Elizabeth was equally severe against Catholic interludes. We must think of these interludes, whether moral, religious, scientific, or amusing, being played from the reign of Henry VIII till the middle of the reign of Elizabeth. Till 1575 or 1576 there were no theatre houses. Stages were erected in halls of palaces, castles, colleges, and in open spaces of towns. The king or queen had interlude players in their service, as they had musicians. Companies calling themselves, the servants, and wearing the liveries of nobles and gentlemen, strolled about the country, protected by their more or less nominal masters, and supporting themselves by their skill in their profession. The children, that is the boys, of various schools, especially of St. Paul's, acted under the managership of their teachers. The undergraduates of the universities also acted, at first in Latin, before Queen Elizabeth, who did not conceal her distaste for what did not amuse her. The language of the plays was cast into all sorts of rhyming measures, and, the vice, or lively buffoon of the interludes was the germ of the Shakespearean clown. There was abundance both of writers and players, but the plays had little merit as literature. Ralph Royster Doyster Among the unforgotten of these dwellers on the threshold of the Elizabethan drama is Ralph Royster Doyster, by Nicholas Udall, 1505-1556, of Corpus Christi College, Oxford, later headmaster of Eton, and next of Westminster. He died in the reign of Mary Tudor. The vice, so to speak, or clever buffooning parasite, of the piece is Matthew Mary Greek, who in a long rhyming prologue describes his own way of life and his intention to befool the braggart Ralph Royster Doyster. Ralph enters melancholy, he is in love, he has met the lady at supper, but forgets her name. She is rich, says Matthew, a widow, and betrothed to another man. Ralph is a fatuous ass, like Malvolio, and thinks all women in love with him. Mary Greek fools him to the top of his bent, and presents the lady with a forged love letter from Ralph, who is drugged by the maid servants and generally disgraced, 
while the true love of the heroine returns from a voyage to be happy with her. There is plenty of noise, singing, and beating, and some intrigue in the case of the genuine wooer and his suspicious jealousy. Gammer Girton's Needle The equally renowned Gammer Girton's Needle was acted sixteen years after Ralph Royster Doyster at Christ's College, Cambridge. It is usually attributed to John Still, born 1543, a member of Christ's, Master of Arts in 1565, and later Master of that college, Vice-Chancellor of the University, and finally Bishop of Bath and Wells, died 1608. As Vice-Chancellor, Still was a stickler for Latin plays at Cambridge, which were more educational but not so popular as dramas in English. The plot turns on the loss of a needle by old Gammer Girton, the suspicion, raised by a wag, that another old woman has stolen it, the search for the needle. Combats about the needle, and the final discovery of that implement in the seat of a man's breeches. A sturdy beggar, Dickon, is, the vice, and sets Gammer Girton and another Gammer to a scolding match. Hodge, a servant, with his broad dialect, an insistent demand for the needle, that a large and unseemly hole which ventilates his breeches may instantly be patched, has perhaps the most comic part. And when somebody slaps Hodge and drives the needle, which had stuck in his breeches, into a safe part of his person, the joy of a Cambridge audience knew no limits. The play is thoroughly rustic, the language is of an amazing breadth, and no doubt the drama made abundant mirth among the Cantab wits. Members of the sister university, where poets have been rare in comparison with these glories of Cambridge, need not covet still, unless he wrote the famous drinking song in the second act, Back and side go bare, go bare. The Bishop of Bath and Wells probably looked back with mingled feelings on the jolly, noisy achievement of his youth, which has made him immortal, for all have heard of Gammer Girton's Needle. It is written in rhyming lines of from fourteen to sixteen syllables. Gorbaduck. The Gammer, though low, is lively, not so is Gorbaduck. It is a tragedy of unspeakable dullness composed in blank verse which has no merit except that of regularity, the sense usually, though not always, ending at the close of each line. The author, Thomas Sackville, later Lord Buckhurst and Earl of Dorset, and High Treasurer under James VI and I, was born at Buckhurst, Sussex, in 1536. His grandmother was Aunt of and Bullen, so he was a second cousin of Queen Elizabeth. At the Inner Temple, as a young man, he met Thomas Norton, and the pair composed Gorbaduck, which was acted in the Inner Temple in 1561. The authors were inspired by no other muse than that of Seneca, the moral philosopher, Roman tragedian, and tutor of the Emperor Nero. The play tells how Gorbaduck, a mythical king of Britain, abdicated, and, dividing his realm into two parts, gave the country north of the Humber to the younger, and the portion south of the Humber to the elder of his two sons, Ferex and Porex. Each had a kind of tutor, and each had a favorite. They were both discontented, the younger slew the elder son, and the mother of both avenges the elder on the younger of her children. The result was national ruin, in which, Fergus Duke of Albany, apparently King of Scotland is meant, took an active part. There are very long speeches, no action. A messenger brings the news of the distressing occurrences, and a chorus moralizes on them. Carried away by grief when his wife murders his surviving boy, Gorbaduck pronounces the name of Eubulus with the penultimate syllable short, and expires with decency behind the scenes. Eubulus then utters a political forecast in more than a hundred lines, and the drama concludes. Gorbaduck was printed in 1565, translations of Seneca's plays were also being written, George Gascoigne translated a piece named Jocasta, the wife of Oedipus, from the Italian, and a prose comedy, The Supposes, from Ariosto. This great Italian poet and his countrymen adapted to Italian manners the plots and characters which the ancient comic dramatists of Rome, Terence and Plautus, derived from late Greek comedy of everyday life. Thus an element of orderliness in comedy was introduced in England from adaptations of Italian adaptations of Roman copies of late Greek plays. Such stock characters as the austere father, the spendthrift son, the cunning servant, the boastful soldier, the nurse, soft of heart and loose of tongue, invaded the comedy of France, and, to a slighter degree, that of England. 
Meanwhile Richard Edwards produced a curious interlude of a classical nature, Damon and Pythias, the characters being Greek, Sicilian and English, a dash of buffoonery is mixed with very lamentable matter. The drama was formless, unable to attain definite shape, till some twenty-five years had passed when we reached the date of the immediate predecessors of Shakespeare, such as Marlowe, Green, Lilly, Peel, and the other university young men about town. The influences of the old waggish or controversial interludes, of the Senecan school of stiffness, and of translations or imitations of Italian comedies, were seething in the cauldron of the age. 17. Wyatt and Surrey. Gascoigne. Sackville. The names of Sir Thomas Wyatt, 1503-1542, and of Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, 1517-1547, are forever memorable in English poetry, not so much for what they actually achieved as for what they attempted. They abstain from allegory, still lingering in its unlovely dotage, and from doggerel. They wrote of themselves and their own loves, joys, and sorrows, but though their verse is concerned with their personal emotions, these are treated in a conventional way, borrowed from continental poetry. They turn to the Italian sonneteers, especially to Petrarch, and saw afar the dawning of the Pleiad, the company of French reformers of poetic style and language, Ronsard, Du Bellay, and the rest, or at least of Melon de saint Gallet, Their predecessor. But both Wyatt and Surrey died young, Wyatt by an unfortunate chance, Surrey as a victim of the jealous tyranny of Henry VIII. The two young poets thus live together in men's memories like the Bayan and Moscus of Greece, theirs is, unfulfilled renown. Wyatt, of a Yorkshire family, was son of Sir Henry Wyatt, of Allington in Kent, a man who had strange vicissitude of fortune in the reigns of Richard III and Henry VII. Thomas went very early to St. John's College, Cambridge, married at seventeen, was a glory of the court of Henry VIII, went on diplomatic missions to Italy, Venice, Ferrara, Bologna, Florence, and Rome, studied Italian literature, was now in favor and now in prison and made love. With more or less of earnestness, to Anne Bullen, being fortunate in escaping from the doom of her admirers when Henry VIII took her life. Favored by Henry's minister, Thomas Cromwell, but detested, and accused of diplomatic misdeeds by Bishop Bonner, Wyatt defended himself with a success then very rare, retired from court and wrote satires and poems on the advantages of retirement paraphrased the seven penitential psalms, and died of a fever caught from fatigue and travel, in October, 1542, lamented in verse by Surrey. The reader of his sonnets, the earliest in English, is amazed to find that we have traveled through so many centuries of the life of English poetry, and only reached lame lines that can scarcely be scanned. Since Chaucer the art of verse had become very dim, perhaps in consequence of the transitional state of the language, the obsolescence of the sound of the final e, and the anglicizing of the sounds of borrowed French words by throwing back the accent, as in honor for honor, virtue for virtue. Wyatt, when he began to write sonnets, put accents in strange places, and counted syllables on his fingers, content if he could reckon ten of them, in a line. To rhyme, aggrieved, to, wearied, is like the tramp's effort to make workhouse rhyme with sorrow. The young student in a novel of Henri Mergers reads only the rhymes in sonnets. If we study in that way Wyatt's sonnet, The Lover Waxeth Wiser, we find that the last words in the first eight lines are aggrieved, last, past, wearied, buried, fast, haste, stirred. He usually tried to keep to the Petrarchian arrangement of rhymes in the first eight lines A B B A A B B A, but, contrary to Italian rule, his last two lines were always a rhyming couplet, as in Shakespeare's sonnets, in which the Petrarchian model is wholly disregarded. The sonnet thus ends with an emphatic clench, usually moral, while in the Italian sonnet the last six lines resemble the withdrawal of the wave of the first eight lines. The sonnet, with its concision and its technical difficulties, afforded excellent practice to poets who endeavored to bring delicacy and order into the chaos and coarseness of verse as written by Skelton and his contemporaries. But a good sonnet is among the rarest of good things, and the mere technical difficulties once overcome, 
men's minds may turn out sonnets of no value with the rapidity of machine work. The stock character of this kind of poetry, the lover, with his strange far-fetched conceit in his almost metaphysical refinements, is apt to become as tedious as the old figures of allegory, however, he was a novelty. Why it improved with practice in sonnet-making, though such rhymes as, mountains, fountains, plains, remains, are a stumbling block to the modern reader. But his, and wilt thou leave me thus? And, forget not yet the tried intent, with their brief refrains are immortal lyrics, heralding the music of the age of Elizabeth. His epigrams are not the stinging wasps of verse commonly called epigrams, but are brief poems in the manner of the epigrams of the Greek anthology. The satires on the court, based on Italian poems, and including a form of the town and country mouse, are not in Skelton's violent way, but the work of a gentleman, and the poems in rhyme royal, seven-line stanzas, with six syllables to the line. Are charming novelties. The Earl of Surrey. The date of Surrey's birth is uncertain, it was four or five years after the Battle of Flodden, 1513, in which his grandfather, an old decrepit Carl in a chariot, was victorious over the fiery James IV. The title Earl of Surrey is a courtesy title, borne by the poet as son of the Duke of Norfolk. He was at least a dozen years younger than his friend Wyatt, and was a lively young courtier, who was made a Knight of the Garter in 1541. He married very early, in 1532, and his famous passion for fair Geraldine may have been merely poetical, the usual story about Geraldine and the magic mirror is derived from a novel of 1554. About 1542 he was imprisoned for a matter of a duel, a challenge at least, and in 1543 went about London at night breaking windows with a stone bow. He wrote a poem in which he gravely maintains that he was merely punishing the wicked city for her sins. Again released from prison he saw some fighting in France, and, returning, patronized a poet named Churchyard, who later wept unmelodiously above his early tomb. Early in 1546 Surrey had the worse of a battle with the French near Boulogne, was superseded by the Earl of Hertford, and, in January, 1547, was accused of a sort of heraldic high treason, quartering the arms of Edward the Confessor, who, of course, had never heard of armorial bearings, and executed, shortly before the death of the tyrant, Henry VIII. Surrey's versification, especially in the sonnet, is much superior to that of Wyatt, but he is less apt to keep to the rules of rhyme, in the first eight lines, indeed he writes in the form of Shakespeare's sonnets. His, Prisoned in Windsor, is a pleasant picture of a young gallant's life, who takes his eye off the ball at tennis to watch the ladies in the Dedan, hunts, tilts, and makes friends. The moral poems in lines of fourteen feet are of no great merit, but Surrey's translation of the second book of the Aeneid is the first English example of blank verse, borrowed from Italian practice. The lines are stiff and hard. And the main merit is the novelty, the first birth of the measure that was to become, in forty years, Marlowe's mighty line. Toddles Miscellany The poems of Wyatt and Surrey were not published till long after the deaths of the authors, when they appeared, with many other pieces, in Toddles Miscellany. Other writers represented there are Nicholas Grimald, with his jogtrot meter, the polters, or polterous measure of from twelve to fourteen syllables to the dozen, so were eggs sold by a custom of the trade. Surrey's retainer, Thomas Churchyard, a man very busy with sword and pen, was also a writer in the miscellany, and indeed was a literary hack of all work. There came, after the brief gleam of sunshine that fell on Wyatt and Surrey, another generation of wooden versifiers and translators, with whose names, Tusser the Bucolic, Farr, Golding, Goodge, and Whetstone. It is hardly necessary to fill the page and burden the memory. They may be studied by the curious, but they wrought no deliverance. To generations which possess superabundance of versifiers and no great poets, these barren years are a kind of consolation. For reasons not to be discovered there are such periods in the literary life of all nations, as in England between Pope and Cooper. The versifiers in Toddles Miscellany keep harping unmelodiously on the strings of Surrey and Wyatt, many of their pieces are complimentary addresses to ladies, or laments on the deaths of friends. Poor conceits are twisted and tormented. 
There is hardly any promise of advance, we scarcely hear any of the bird-like musical notes with which the later part of the reign of Elizabeth sang so wondrously. Gascoigne George Gascoigne, 1525-1577, was an interesting character. He was a Cambridge man, a member of the Society of Gray's Inn, a poet who, like Scott, composed his verses in the saddle, a member of Parliament who was opposed as a common rhymer, noted for manslaughter. A notorious ruffian, and even a spy, certainly he owed debts, and was disinherited by his father. He wrote on woodmanship, but was apt to forget to shoot at the deer that came within range of his crossbow. As a captain in the Low Countries he and his command were surprised and taken by the Spaniards, he came home, published his posies, 1575, and, he says, got not a penny by the venture, he then wrote, The Steel Glass, a kind of satire. The Mirror of the Age, in blank verse, and next wrote in common ballad measure the long and amazingly prosaic, complaint of Philomene. In 1572 Gascoigne published, A Hundred Sundry Flowers, bound up in one small posy. The long title sets forth that some of the flowers were culled in the gardens of Euripides, Ovid, Petrarch, and Ariosto, others are from English orchards. The native flowers are the sweeter and more fair. While our poets were turning into stiff measures the sonnets of Italy, Gascoigne could write so naturally and melodiously his own English, as in his Lullaby of a Lover. Sing lullaby, as women do. Wherewith they bring their babes to rest. And lullaby can I sing too. As womanly as can the best. Beneath the stiff borrowed phrases and meters there was always this native and tuneful spirit of unsophisticated song. In 1575 he was a maker of words for the masks at Leicester's famous reception of Elizabeth at Kenilworth, see the novel of that name, where Scott calmly introduces Shakespeare as already a successful dramatist. He satirized drunkards, we have already seen that he translated a tragedy, Jocasta, from the Italian. He wrote a love story in rhyme of a personal kind, and his brief, Instructions, is the earliest English work, in no way indebted to Aristotle on the art of poetry. As he also translated, we have seen, a comedy from the Italian, and a prose tale, a kind of work later fashionable, Gascoigne may be regarded as an intrepid explorer in many fields of literature. He first beat the path to that perfection which our best poets have aspired to since his departure, says Nash, 1589. He break the ice for our quainter poets that now write, says Toft, 1615. But the path as trodden by this pioneer continued to be rough. Gascoigne was an example of the versatility and literary ambition which many young gentlemen displayed in the age of Elizabeth. Mingling poetry and study and serious thought with their gallant adventures in love, diplomacy, war, and travel. His certain notes of instruction concerning the making of verse in English is a very brief pamphlet. He quotes, My master, Chaucer, against alliterative, thunder in R.Y.M., Ram, Ruff, but mentions no other poet. Be original, he says, if you sing of a lady do not applaud her, crystal eye, or, cherry lip, which Spencer did not disdain, for these things are trite and obvious. The great matter is, to avoid the uncomely customs of common writers, says this, common rhymer. Do not use, obscure and dark phrases in a pleasant sonnet. Do not wander out of your Poulter's measure meter into lines of thirteen syllables. Give every word its natural emphasis, do not make treasure into treasure. Chaucer is to be followed as a master of prosody. You should write. I understand your meaning by your eye. Not. Your meaning I understand by your eye. The more monosyllables that you use, the truer Englishman you shall seem. There follows advice on the sejura and all this counsel shows that, in the early years of Elizabeth, versification was at a very low ebb. In practice, Gascoigne did not always shine. There are few passages of interest in the stiff blank verse of his, Steel Glass, the mirror that does not flatter. The best passage, and it is very good, describes the laborer. Behold him, priests, and though he stink of sweat. Disdain him not, for shall I tell you what? Such climb to heaven before the shaven crowns. Because the laborers. 
feed with fruits of their great pains. Both king and knight and priests in cloister pent. It would be cruel to quote, Philomene, no stall ballad creeps more tardily on a longer road than Gascoigne in his tale of her who sings, in a later poet's words. Who hath remembered thee, who hath forgotten? They have all forgotten, O summer swallow. But the world shall end when I forget. Sackville. The poetry of Thomas Sackville, 1536 1608, is not to be found in his dull tragedy, Gorboduc, but in his contributions to a vast and once popular collection, The Mirror for Magistrates. This work is intended to admonish men in power by rhymed histories of the falls of English peers and princes. This was the plan of Chaucer's monk, in The Monk's Tale, which that sound critic, the host, could not long endure. The model was Boccaccio's work on The Falls of Princes, Englished by Lydgate. The enterprise started by Baldwin and others in 1554-1559, suggests a dread lest English verse should return to Lydgate in the den of giant despair. And take up with sepulchral solemnity the tale of tragedies from the darkest days of the unfortunate ancient Britons. A mammoth compilation was gradually evolved, for doleful matter was not far to seek, but Sackville's two contributions, the Induction and the Complaint of Buckingham, the Buckingham executed under Richard III, alone concern us. In the Induction, the poet describes the gloom of winter, and, in the medieval way, dwells long on the constellations. As he muses, he is met by a very deplorable female form. With doleful shrieks that echoed in the sky. She proclaims herself to be sorrow, a goddess, and guides Sackville to the grisly lake of Avernus, over which no fowl may fly and live. A number of rueful figures of allegory are encountered, dread, revenge, misery, care, old age, and sleep, and these are drawn with abundant vigor and variety. The stanza on sleep gives the measure of the versification, which is rapid, concise, various, sustained, and in its music heralds the arrival of Spencer. The body's rest, the quiet of the heart. The travail's care, the still night's frere was he. And of our life on earth the better part. Reaver of sight, and yet in whom we see. Things off that tide, and off that never be. Without respect. Esteeming equally. King Croesus pomp and iris poverty. One stanza in the description of the home of the dead seems to have been suggested by famous lines in the eleventh book of the Odyssey. The induction ends with the appearance of the spirit of Buckingham, who not only tells his own tragedy at great length, and in full historical detail, but introduces several other ancient tragedies, those of Cyrus, Cambyses, Brutus, Cassius, Bessius, Alexander the Great, Clytus, Phalaris, Phereus, Camillus, and Hannibal. From these fallen princes we drop to. 1 John Milton, Sheriff of Shropshire then. Who arrested Buckingham, and 2. A man of mine, called Humphrey Banister. Who betrayed his master. Banister is then cursed in eleven stanzas. May Banister live to the age of eighty, and then be tried for theft. May his eldest son expire in a pigsty, his second son be strangled in a puddle, and his daughter be smitten by leprosy. It cannot be denied that this tragedy, including as it does the murder of the princes in the tower, is rather too rich in terrible components, and does not, especially when Banister is being dealt with, affect us in the same measure as Dante's pictures of the Inferno. On the whole it is the manner, not the matter, of Sackville that contains more than mere promise. His management of the stanza and of the music of the line is far in advance of anything that had come from an English pen since the death of Chaucer. As for the gloom and horror, these were congenial to a people which, since the burning of the Maid of France, 1431, had seen an endless sequence of violence, murder, martyrdoms, and massacres of peers, princes, queens, bishops, and humble folk. 18. Prose of the Renaissance A great, Indeed an inestimable influence in literature at this juncture, was that of the long-forgotten Greek language, Greek poetry, and Greek philosophy. When Erasmus, who then had little Greek, arrived in England and visited Oxford, 1499, he found there Grosin, Lineker, and Collett, who had acquired Greek on the continent, 
and, with Sir Thomas More, were already competent classical scholars. But their Greek learning was mainly turned into the channel of theology, the study of the sources of Christian doctrine, the New Testament, the Greek Fathers. And they were attracted by the philosophy of Plato which appeared to utter a Christian voice, much more clearly than do the writings of the idol of the Middle Ages, Aristotle. Greek, however, does not visibly affect the poetic literature of England much, before the date of Spencer, about 1580. The violent times of Henry VIII and Mary Tudor were not favorable to severe study and exquisite appreciation of the Greek genius, a most desirable corrective of the prolixity of medievalism, and of the English passion for horrors in stage plays. To most people knowledge of the contents of the Greek classics came through translations, and these translations, as in the case of the historian Thucydides, were done from French versions, while Plato was read through Italian commentators. Much influenced by Plato's disciples in early Christian times, the Neoplatonists, dreamers of beautiful dreams concerning things that cannot be uttered. Study produced also a very wide acquaintance with Greek mythology, Shakespeare's humblest characters have heard of many a Grecian fable, yet the spirit, the exquisite balance, and the refinement of the Greek genius, hardly affected our authors. We may detect it in Moore's, 1478-1535, Utopia, where the adventurers carry with them to nowhere, pretty fardel, or parcel, of the cheap neat Greek books printed by Aldous. The fancied state of Utopia, with its comfortable communism and perfect freedom in religion, is derived from the Republic of Plato, and in religion is more liberal than, in his later work, The Laws, he would have permitted it to be. But the Utopia, written in Latin, was meant for the learned. Though the Utopia was published in 1516, and became famous in Europe, it did not reach unlearned English readers till an English translation, by Ralph Robinson, appeared in 1551. They now had Moore's eloquent advocacy of communism before them as regulated in his imaginary state, with a six hours day, universal training of men and women for war, and habit of assassinating the leaders of hostile nations. There is tolerance of all religions which accept a deity and the immortality of the soul, atheists are disqualified for public offices. In his English works on religious and social controversy, which are little read, Moore is not only a Catholic and a conservative, but in discussion is given to abusive and violent language which would have horrified the courteous Plato. The urbane Aristotle, and that model of a devout and ardent student, and perfect gentleman, Pico della Mirandola, whose life more gave in English. On both sides the controversialists of the Reformation delighted in violent personal abuse, in some Greek orators they found examples of that art. The first effect of Greek in England, by producing a new biblical criticism and an attack on the foundations of the medieval church, was to, bring not peace but a sword, the wars of religion. Eliot. No man did more for the intelligence of Greek than Sir Thomas Eliot, 1499-1546, one author of, The Governor, a long treatise, on the education of a gentleman, and on the nature of forms of government. Eliot bubbles over with Greek, and translates such passages of Homer as he quotes into English verse, the alternate lines rhyming. He is of the Greek opinion that a gentleman should be taught, if he has a taste for art, to draw, paint, and execute works in sculpture, not as a base professional artist, but as an amateur. 18 Eliot would have a boy, at seven years old, begin with Greek, learning it through Latin, which he picks up, with French, in conversation. Grammars of Greek are now almost innumerable. Grammar, he says with much truth, if it be made too long and exquisite to the learner, in a manner mortifieth his courage. And by that time he cometh to the most sweet and pleasant reading of old authors, the spark of fervent desire of learning is soon quenched with the burden of grammar. Eliot would start his pupil as early as possible with what will interest a child, Aesop's fables in Greek, and then pass to Lucian, who is amusing as well as elegant. But I fear me to be too long from noble Homer, from whom as from a fountain proceeded all eloquence and learning. Throughout, Eliot wishes first to interest the pupil, but where, he asks, is he to find qualified schoolmasters? They were as cruel as in the days of Asti. Augustine, and while Eliot's system of education, in sports as well as in books, is free and joyous, like that of Gargantua in Rabelais, 
little boys were suffering the horrors described by Agrippa Diabine in his memoirs. Eliot translated works of Isocrates, Plutarch, and others, wrote a medical work, The Castle of Health, was clerk of the Privy Council, and went on various diplomatic missions. Eliot was not a professional instructor of youth, he was, it seems, educated privately, and of neither university, what pleases us in him is his unstaled zest for learning, his fresh enthusiasm. The best English of the age and the most durable is that of Thomas Cranmer, 1489-1556, as we read it in the Liturgy of the Church of England. While much of the merit of King James's authorized version of the Bible rests on the foundation of Miles Coverdale's translation, 1488-1568. How easy it is to translate the Bible into English which is not a marvel of diction and rhythm, we are too frequently reminded by the revised version. Ascom. Roger Ascom, 1515-1568, was a Yorkshire man of the middle classes, who lived by his learning, and did not find that it paid him as well as he wished. Going early to St. John's College, Cambridge, he was a pupil of the famous Sir John Cheek, who introduced the English way of pronouncing Greek. It is certainly wrong, no people pronounce the vowels as we do. But if Cheek resisted the pronunciation of the modern Greeks, perhaps he is not much to be blamed. Askham obtained a fellowship and a readership in Greek, the fellowship he lost when he married, he did not long retain his tutorship to the Princess Elizabeth, as secretary to an ambassador in Germany he continued to teach Greek to his chief. And in his letters, Latin or English, we find him often in straits for money and begging for assistance. Camden, writing under James I, says that he lost money at dicing, and in his attack on gambling, in his, Toxophilus, a dialogue on archery, 1545, Askham shows a rather unholy knowledge of all the tricks on the dice board. Probably he had paid for his education. He contemplated a work on the noble sport of cock fighting, on which, of course, there was betting, and perhaps Askham was not in all respects so severe a Puritan as in his unworthy attacks on that noblest of romances, the Mort d'Arthur. Sir Lancelot is a better gentleman than many who were to be met at a cock fight. Askham had little sympathy with the Italian influences that were so potent in Elizabethan literature. Italy was certainly profligate and luxurious. An Englishman that is Italianate. Doth quickly prove a devil incarnate. Was an English translation of an Italian proverb. Askham, like his contemporaries, was nothing if not patriotic. The bow of you and the grey goose shaft had won many a victory over Scots and French, as in, Toxophilus, Askham reminds these peoples, therefore he desired that archery should be universally practiced. But the harquebus, a musket lighter than the heavy hand gun of the fifteenth century, was already, in disciplined hands, more than a match for the bow. Toxophilus, to our age, appears pedantic. We have endless classical examples, and learn that the Trojans drew the bowstring only to the breast, not the ear, which is true, while they used iron arrowheads as against the bronze arrowheads of the Greeks, a fact not so certain. When he does come to practice, Askham's teaching in archery is reckoned sound and good. His ideas are summed up in the prayer that the English, through Christ, King Henry, the book, and the bow, may all manner of enemies quite overthrow. In writing English, Askham was all for plain English. Foreign words anglicized make such a mixture, as if you put momsey and sack, red wine and white, ale and beer, all in one pot. Yet he advocates in his Schoolmaster, published after his death, a yet more unhallowed blend, the use of Greek measures in English verse. Our English tongue in avoiding barbarous rhyming may as well receive right quantity of syllables as either Greek or Latin. He means, quantity, as opposed to accent, as if one said carpenter. As an example he quotes Mr. Watson's rendering of the third line of the Odyssey into two English hexameters. All travellers do gladly report great praise of Ulysses. For that he knew many men's manners and saw many cities. Obviously if we are to say, men's manners, making, man, in, manners, long, we must not make, vellers, in, travellers, short, as Mr. Watson does. We are reduced to. 
gladly report great praise of Ulysses do the travellers. This absurd manner of imitating Greek measures in English was upheld, twenty years later, by Gabriel Harvey, who, for a moment, nearly corrupted the practice of Spencer, the most naturally musical of poets. Ascham's own prose style is unaffected, not corrupted by eccentricities, but not harmonious. A new perfection, a false perfection, was to be sought later, through the antitheses, alliterations, and pedantic wit of Lily's Euphues. Lily's Euphues. The prose of Ascham was clear and was plain, disdaining decoration in far fetched gorgeous phrases. But for the gorgeous and the exotic, the taste of the Elizabethan age was pronounced, as we see in the strange over gaudy costumes of the period, the various ruffs, the jeweled velvets and silks, worn by men and women. A like dressing for thoughts was demanded, and the supply was provided by John Lilly, whose plays are to be mentioned later. Lilly was born a Kentish man, 1554. Magdalen, in Oxford, was his college, his plays, acted by the boys of the Chapel Royal and St. Paul's, are of 1584 to 1594. But he made his mark earlier, as a prose writer, in his, Euphues, The Anatomy of Wit, 1579, and the sequel. Euphues and his England, 1580. The style became a fashion, a fashion which affected even those who, like Sidney, were in would-be revolt against it. Lilly, like all writers of the periods just before and after him, was copious in classical allusions. He was not the first to hunt in all directions, especially in fictitious natural history, for similes and needless decorations, but he hunted further and more assiduously, emphatically his style is that of the unresting bird of paradise. Every sentence is a thing bristling with points and antitheses and alliterations. The first part of the book was a kind of novel, Two Friends. At Naples, with the same woman, quarrel, write long letters, and the question of education, in the wide sense in which the Renaissance understood education, is always prominent. There is endless conversation and discussion of life, love, and learning, always in the same style of fantastic decoration and illusion, all continued and Euphues arrives in England, all conveying general information not verified by experiment. I have read that the bull, being tied to a fig tree. Laseth his strength, that a whole herd of deer stand at the gaze if they smell a sweet apple, facts on which the cattle breeder or the hunter would not, if well advised. Rely. This was the kind of science against which Bacon uprose. But Lily appealed, in his dedication, and with success, to the ladies and gentlewomen of England, who found in the book a kind of love story. Much philosophizing on that dear theme, and a pleasurable example of a new way of being witty and romantic. Lily was the chief cause of the difficulty in telling a plain tale plainly which besets the minor writers of the age of Elizabeth. Before approaching the chief prose writers of Elizabeth's time, we must turn aside to her greatest poet, and his friend, to Spencer and Sir Philip Sidney, and to the drama. Sidney Spencer did not more surely attain immortality by his verse than Sir Philip Sidney, 1554 to 1586, by his life, writings, and character. He was one of those who, as Plato says, are born good, exemplars of natural charm and excellence. He is the ideal gentleman of the type which Spencer professed to educate by the examples of his virtuous knights, brave, pious, courteous, and just. The son of Sir Henry Sidney and nephew of Elizabeth's Lester, Philip Sidney was born into the court, but was not of it, his heart was set on other things than pleasure, splendor, flattery, and promotion. Educated at Shrewsbury School, he went to Christ Church at fourteen, being already the friend of the noble fool Greville, who, however, went from Shrewsbury to Cambridge. In 1572 he was attached to the English Embassy in France, and, on the night of the Bartholomew Massacre was sheltered in the house of his future father-in-law, Walsingham. Till 1575 he travelled, chiefly in Germany, and made the acquaintance of his constant correspondent and adviser, Languet, whom he celebrates as a shepherd of the Ister, and as his own religious mentor. In Venice his portrait was painted by Veronese. At Vienna he perfected himself in horsemanship under Pugliano, 
whose enthusiasm he describes so amusingly in his Defense of Poesy. For a man so earnest as Sidney was, he had a fine sense of humor. Returning to England in 1575, he, like Gascoigne, was with Elizabeth at the famous pastimes at Kenilworth, now best known through Scott's novel, Kenilworth. Afterwards, at the house of the Earl of Essex, he met the Earl's daughter, Penelope, later Lady Rich, the Stella of his sonnets. Essex desired their marriage, but fate decided otherwise. In 1577 Sidney went, a young diplomatist, to the emperor and the German princes, and later, was obliged to attend the court, while his mind was set on adventures beyond the Atlantic. On failing in that, he trifled with the idea of introducing Greek meters into English poetry. In 1579, he quarreled with the Earl of Oxford in the tennis court. A duel was not permitted, but as Sidney also gave Elizabeth his opinion about her distasteful flirtation with the odious Duke d'Anjou, the worst of the bad Valois princes, he retired to Wilton, the house of his sister, Lady Pembroke. And there wrote the pastoral romance, Arcadia. He was recalled to court, sat in Parliament for Kent, and in 1583 parried a daughter of Walsingham. He was forbidden to join Drake's American expedition of 1585, in fact he was always thwarted in his desire for action and for such deeds of chivalry as the conditions of his age permitted, they leaned somewhat to piracy and filibustering. At length, as governor of Flushing, while Leicester commanded the forces engaged against Spain in the Low Countries, he fell in a cavalry charge against a superior force at Zutphen. His leg was broken by a musket bullet from the Spanish trenches, it was now that he handed the cup of water that was at his lips to the soldier whose need was greater than his. He lingered for some weeks, and died on October 17, 1586. The beautiful character of Sidney cannot be more strongly attested than by the agony of grief exhibited, at his death, by the handsome and wicked master of Grey. He was about to be sent on the Scottish embassy to plead for the life of Mary Stuart, while his desire was to be fighting under Sidney's banner. He expresses, in a touching letter, the sudden revulsion of his nature from his wanted treacheries. And, contrary to the falsehood of tradition, he did not betray, but, to his own loss, did his best to save the queen whose cause he had previously deserted. As a poet, Sidney, whose works were all published after his death, is best remembered for the sonnets of Astrophel to Stella, Lady Rich. There is a controversy as to whether these are mere exercises in gallant but platonic love verse, or whether they reveal a true passion, as Charles Lamb maintained. The sonnet in which he says that he has found his fortune too late, and has lost what he had unwittingly won. O oh, punished eyes! That I had been more foolish or more wise! seems to set forth a truly tragic situation. Perhaps only poets can be the critics in such a case as this of Sidney. The sonnets vary much in poetic value, some are written in Alexandrines, a meter not consonant with the traditions of the English muse. Sidney's Defense of Poesy Readers who fail to find brilliant merit in English literary poetry between Chaucer and Spencer may not be ill-pleased to note that Sir Philip Sidney was strong on their side. Acquainted as he was with the poetry of Greece, Rome, Italy, and France, he could see nothing to admire in the efforts and experiments of such writers as Ockleave, Lydgate, Hawes, Goodge, Churchyard, and Turberville. His Defense of Poesy, or, according to the title of the first edition, 1595, his Apology for Poesy, was elicited by the unauthorized dedication to himself of Stephen Gosson's School of Abuse. Gosson was a young Oxford man who had tried his hand as a playwright, and been disgusted, he says, by the disorders of the playhouses, where his comedy and morality may have been hooted. He therefore tried to make himself notorious, or he expressed his penitence, by assailing poets who deal in the silly conceits of Lily's euphues. The scarab flies over many a sweet flower and lights in a cow shard. It is the manner of swine to forsake the fair fields and wallow in the mire and the whole practice of poets, either with fables to show their abuses, or with plain terms to unfold their mischief, discover their shame, discredit themselves, and disperse their poison through the world. Gossin chooses Virgil as one of his terrible examples, 
and whether he is a genuine or a hypocritical Puritan, or a mere fribble in search of notoriety, he made a mistake when he thought to find a patron or a butt in Sydney. Who does not advertise Gossin's name in the defense of poesy? After a general defense of poetry furnished with precedents drawn from every quarter, even from the respect paid to their minstrels by the Irish. Sidney defines the final end of poetry as being, to lead and draw us to as high a perfection as our degenerate souls, made worse by their clay lodgings, can be capable of. If poetry does not always attain this end, it is not the fault of the art, but that by few men that art can be accomplished. He quotes Aristotle's Poetics to the effect that poetry is more philosophical and more serious than philosophy. Nothing in history is so noble but that, the poet may, if he list, make it his own, beautifying it both for further teaching, and more delighting, as it please him, having all, from Dante's heaven to his hell, under the authority of his pen. Here Sidney seems to differ from Scott, who regarded some examples of human fortunes, for example in the case of Mary Stuart, as beyond the range of the poetic art. But Sidney, foreseeing the objection, adds, I speak of the art, not of the artificer. Sidney then discusses the various kinds of poetry. As to the comedy, naughty playmakers and stage keepers have made it justly odious, so far he sides with the Puritans of his time. In speaking of the lyric, he says, I must confess mine own barbarousness. I never heard the old song of Percy and Douglas, Chevy Chase, that I found not my heart moved more than with a trumpet. Indeed the true spirit of poetry did dwell, disregarded by wits and courtiers, in the popular poetry and the ballads. But poetry, he knows not why, finds, in our time, a hard welcome in England, I think the very earth laments it, and therefore decks our soil with fewer laurels than it was accustomed, for heretofore poets have in England also flourished. If poets are not esteemed it is because they do not deserve esteem, for we are taking upon us to be poets in despite of Pallas, in Vita Minerva. Our would-be poets are destitute of genius, which was very true. Chaucer undoubtedly did excellently in his Troilus and Cressida, of whom truly I know not whether to marvel more either that he, in that misty time, could see so clearly, or that we, in this clear age, go so stumblingly after him. What ailed Sidney's age was lack of terseness and clearness. Most poets did not know what they would be at. They were confused by the tumult of religion, the loss of old ideals, the language in transition, the tyranny of the misunderstood classics, the constant effort to imitate Greece, Rome, France, and Italy. They could not yet see life and literature steadily, and see them whole. Sidney found little that had poetical sinews, except in Chaucer. Parts of The Mirror for Magistrates, The Earl of Surrey's Lyrics, and Spencer's Shepherd's Calendar, hath much poetry in his Eclogues, indeed worthy the reading, if I be not deceived. That same framing of his style to an old rustic language I cannot allow. Sidney then banters the absurdities of the lawless stage, of the alliterative writers, of the seekers after unnatural history, like Lily in his Euphues, and of the love poets. If I were a mistress never would they persuade me that they were in love, so coldly they apply fiery speeches, swelling phrases, learned from books. It was poetry, not the English poets of his age, that Sidney defended. And he might well marvel at our modern zeal which devotes time and scholarship to a chaos of tentative experiments by men who wish to be poets without possessing the poetic genius. Sidney's best poems and his defense of poesy retain their freshness, but that book of his which was most popular suffers from the changes of time and taste. At most periods prose fiction is more welcome to human nature than poetry or criticism. Sidney's book, The Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia, is a novel, written by the author at Wilton, when, as we saw, he was neither in favor at court nor permitted to risk himself in adventures on sea or land. The book was to Sidney what, The Fairy Queen, was to Spencer, a wilderness of delights of his own creation, a retreat into a world of fantasy. He wrote it in sheets read, or sent as soon as finished, to his sister, the Countess of Pembroke. The book was meant for her, not for the world. Not long after his death, an unauthorized copy was published, 1590, 
an unauthorized edition followed, and the general delight in the romance is attested by its constant reissues. The author did not construct any regular plot, he allowed his fancy to wander among the shipwrecks and piratical adventures of the late Greek romances, and in an Arcadia which never existed, and a Laconia most unhistorical. But the high and chivalrous ideals of the author, in his rural prose idols, as in his battles and combats, the truth and constancy of his lovers. The beauty of his descriptions, made this mixture of the Spanish heroic romances that infatuated Don Quixote with the Arcadian pastorals, the delight of four generations. Milton blamed the captive Charles I for copying the beautiful and appropriate prayer of the captive Pamela, long after Shakespeare had interwoven with the story of King Lear, Sidney's tale of the blind king of Paphlagonia. In its new mode, the Arcadia was to four generations what Mallory's Mort Arthur had been in its day. As late as 1660, we find Sir George Mackenzie imitating the Arcadia in his heroic and historic romance, Aretina, where Argyle and Montrose play their parts. Indeed the Arcadia was a fruitful parent of the interminable heroic French romances which Major Bellenden laughs at in Old Mortality, and from which Scott did not disdain to borrow a description in Ivanhoe. It is indeed curious to compare Sidney's description of an Amazon, Book I, Chap, 12, with an actual representation of a genuine Amazon by a Hittite artist, discovered on the stonework of a gate at Bogaz K. That lady warrior wears a corslet of scale armor, while Sidney's has a doublet of sky-colored satin, covered with plates of gold. Her feet are shod in crimson velvet buskins, while the massive legs of the real Amazon are naked. The contrast of fact and fancy are violent, of course, throughout the romance. The style is less conceited than that of Euphues, and is always noble, but the long sentences and overabundance of parentheses are not in accordance with modern taste. The profusion of love passages and of martial adventures, with notable images of virtues, vices, or what else, and the poetic if uncurbed fancies, were what the world demanded from a novel, and what Sidney gave in the Arcadia, with many lyrics. And imitations of the Amoebian verse of the shepherds of Theocritus. Spencer. After two centuries of verse that was tuneless or tentative, the second great English poet came, Edmund Spencer, 1552-1599. We know from his Prothalamian that Spencer was born in London. My most KYNDLY nurse. That to me gave this life's first native source. Though from another place I take my name. An house of ancient fame. That is. The house of the Spencers of Althorpe who are in the ancestry of the Duke of Marlborough's Chichils. Spencer was certainly their kinsman, in what degree is unknown, but his own family must have been poor. He was educated at Merchant Taylor's School, was aided by the munificent Robert Noel, and obtained a sizership, corresponding to the old Oxford servitorship, at Pembroke Hall, Cambridge, 1569. Here he made two friends, Gabriel Harvey, a true friend, if a rather pedantic Don, the hobbinal of his shepherd's calendar, and E. Kirk, the E. K. who furnished the notes explanatory of Old English words in that poem. Spencer also gained the good graces of Grindal, then Bishop of London, later primate, a Puritan, who fell into Elizabeth's disgrace, and is applauded as Algrind by Spencer in the shepherd's calendar. Spencer's youth was passed in an England disturbed by the claims of the captive Mary Stuart to the crown, by the rebellion of her adherents in the north. By the papal excommunication of Elizabeth, and by the pretensions of the extreme Puritan exiles who, driven abroad by the Marian persecution, had imbibed at Geneva the doctrines of Calvin. In their attacks on the English bishops they outwearied even the successors of Calvin in Geneva, who regarded them as men not to be satisfied by any concessions. A sect of perilous consequence who would have no king but a presbytery, said Elizabeth. Here were all the elements which caused Elizabeth's cruel persecution of Catholics, the long struggle of the Puritans under Elizabeth and James I, the wars under Charles I, and the strife with Spain and Catholic Ireland. In the words of James VI, it was, a world Walter, and Spencer, as a poor young man, eager to make his fortune, had to swim as best he might in the cross-currents of this troublesome world. He never enjoyed the peaceful leisure of a Tennyson or a Wordsworth, 
he had to play an active part in strenuous and most unhappy affairs. His nature, too, was divided. With all his love of pleasure and of beauty he leaned, though not virulently, towards the Puritan party, and, as a good patriot, loathed and detested Rome. It is probable that, when a freshman at the age of seventeen, he contributed to a miscellany, Van der Nutt's Theatre of Worldlings, 1569, translations in blank verse of certain sonnets of the French poet Joachim du Bellay, and of Petrarch. These, recast into the form of sonnets, recur in a volume of Spencer's, of 1591. After taking his master's degree, 1576, Spencer visited Lancashire, and if his words as Colin Clout in the Shepherd's Calendar be autobiographical, lost his heart to a lady whom he calls Rosalind, the widow's daughter of the Glen. According to Gabriel Harvey she christened him her senior Pegaso, though neither his poetry nor his wooing won her from her cruelty. Many years later he still writes of her with chivalrous affection, so, like Scott, he had his heart broken and cleverly pieced again. By 1579 Spencer was in London, a literary retainer or protégé of Elizabeth's favourite, the Earl of Leicester. While he also enjoyed the friendship of Leicester's nephew, Sir Philip Sidney, the flower of chivalry, himself a poet, and the best beloved man of his time. Now, 1579, Spencer published, and dedicated to Sidney, his Shepherd's Calendar, a set of twelve eclogues or pastoral poems, one for each month. The pastoral had wandered far from the rural beauty of Theocritus, and, in the hands of Montoin and Clement Marot, had become a vehicle for allegory, and even of Protestant argumentation. Spencer does not stray far into party and puritanic politics, but they are not unknown to his shepherds. In January, as Colin Clout, he bewails the coldness of Rosalind. She laughs the songs that Colin Clout doth make. Which is carrying cruelty very far. February is occupied with a rustic dispute between youth and age, the meter is one of the measures of the lay of the last minstrel. Who will not suffer the stormy time? Where will he live tyll the lustry prime? Shepherd's Calendar, February, 11. 15, 16. They burned the chapel for very rage. And cursed Lord Cranstown's goblin page. Lay of the last minstrel, c. 2, stanza, 33. March, with the dialogue of Willie and Though Malin about the strange bird, love, is adapted from the Greek of Bayan in a most pleasant manner, and April contains a melodious song of fair Eliza, a maiden queen. Which probably procured Spencer's presentation to Elizabeth. The great variety of melodious verse of which Spencer was already a perfect master is, for us, perhaps the chief merit of his pastorals. Through life Spencer keeps up the shepherd's mask, and Raleigh, in his verse, is, the shepherd of ocean. The rival Protestant and Catholic clergy also appear as shepherds, good or bad, while in another eclogue the perfect poet, Cuddy, complains, like Theocritus, of public indifference, and is advised to sing of redoubt nights, and, indeed. Spencer had already conceived the idea of his knightly romantic poem, The Fairy Queen, and was ambitious to excel his model, Ariosto. In this Harvey discouraged him, Hobgoblin must not run away with the garland from Apollo. Fortunately Spencer followed his own genius, and, though he dallied with the fashion for wedding Greek measures to English words, as in the English hexameters of Watson and Harvey, he dropped many projects at which he had glanced. And was constant to his, fairy queen. The manuscript of that great poem must have been the companion of Spencer in many strange wanderings. In savage soil far from Parnassus Mount. As he says. He was attached, as we have seen, in 1578, to the household of Leicester, and may have gone on a mission of his to France. To be patronized by Leicester was to risk incurring the enmity of Burley. The long rivalry between Elizabeth's brilliant and wavering favorite, who once so nearly brought her into a plight almost as bad as that of Mary Stuart, and her sagacious counselor. Sir William Cecil, Lord Burley, who now and again saved his queen, as by fire, might have furnished Spencer with a high theme for a poetic allegory. But chance had made him Leicester's man, not Burley's man, so that he never won the fortune for which he sought. Who, indeed, 
would seek fortune in Ireland. Spencer did, accompanying Lord Grey of Wilton to an isle more than commonly distressful. To the natural hatred between the Irish and their English invaders was now added the fury of religious rancor. Rebellion after rebellion was punished by horrible reprisals. Lord Grey is notorious for his massacre of 600 disarmed Italian and Spanish filibusters at Smerwick, November, 1580, and the poet of the Fairy Queen was present at this abominable deed. It was neither without precedent nor imitation. Seventy years later David Leslie, urged on by a preacher, massacred the remnant of Montrose's Irish contingent at Dunavery. Spencer himself in his most interesting view of the present state of Ireland says concerning the foreign prisoners, there was no other way but to make that short way with them which was made. He defends Gray's ruthless policy. He had made Ireland ready for reformation when he was recalled, on the charge of being a bloody man who had left the country in ashes, 1582. Gray was pursued by the clamor of a horrified people, that is, he was Spencer's Sir Arthegal, molested by the blatant beast, the public. The idea of the public is a blatant beast is borrowed from Plato. It was in the service of Gray, and in a land laid waste, that Spencer, acting as Gray's secretary during the horrors of the war in Munster, wrote part of the Fairy Queen. He held public posts, was clerk of decrees, and clerk of the Council of Munster, he received three thousand acres of land, and a ruinous castle of the Desmond family, Kilcolman, between Mallow and Limerick, 1586. Unhappy was his fortune, but, in absence from London, he had the advantage of being beyond the influences of the critical literary society of the capital with its reviews in form of pamphlets, its satires, jealousies, and quarrels. There is a record of a conversation of 1584, published in 1606, in which Spencer described to his friends the aim and scope of the Fairy Queen. Each virtue was to be incarnate in a knight, whose adventures should teach it by example. In a letter to Raleigh, whom he met in Ireland, Spencer says that Prince Arthur, as in the first canto, is to be a perfect exemplar of the twelve private virtues. The Fairy Queen herself is, first, glory in general and next Gloriana, the royal and most virtuous and beautiful Queen Elizabeth, who also appears as Belfoebe. He is to begin in the middle, before telling how knights, ladies, dwarfs, and a palmer bearing an infant with bloody hands came seeking adventures to a festival of the Fairy Queen. Many other adventures are intermeddled. The Fairy Queen is not and does not aim at being an epic. It is without beginning, middle, or end, for the last six books were not written, or the manuscript perished when Spencer was driven from Kilcolman. The original scheme is that of the Mort d'Arthur, moralized, and intermingled with allegory. The poem is an allegorical romance adapted to the state of England, Ireland, and the continent under Elizabeth, and to the War of the Reformation against the Dragon of Rome and the Scarlet Woman of the Seven Hills. The seeming fair and inwardly filthy Duessa, who is occasionally meant for Mary Stuart. Such unity as the poem possesses is given by the conflict of good, as Spencer understood it, against evil, private and public, the vices, and the Church of Rome. The Red Cross Knight wears the armor which St. Paul describes, and in which Bunyan equipped Christian and Greatheart. There are people, says Spencer, who prefer to have virtue sermoned at large as they use. But while Spencer insists on being taken as a moral preacher in his way, his true ideal is beauty, and it is the gleam of beauty that he follows as he wanders with knights and ladies through enchanted forests, and otters dire. Like the knights in the Mort d'Arthur, he rides at adventure, in every page a new adventure opens, and leads to others endlessly, through conflicts with Saracens, Sans Foy, Sans Loy, Sans Joy, with the wily magician, Archimage, and his glamour. With despair, in a wonderful passage, with dragons and dragonettes, with Acrasia and all the charms of her abode of wanton bliss, which is depicted with great enthusiasm, Book 2, Canto 12. This canto is remote indeed from the Puritan taste, despite its moral ending. Let Gryll be Gryll, and have his hoggish mind. But let us hence depart, whilst weather serves and wind. The whole is derived, in the last resort, 
from the palace of Circe in the tenth book of the Odyssey, and it is curious to compare the severe and classic charm of the Greek with the boundless luxury of the Italian Renaissance in Spencer. The fairy queen, indeed, despite the moral intention, which is perfectly sincere, is the very lotus land of poetry. It is a garden of endless varieties of delight, endless but not prolix, for there is a perpetual change of scene and of characters and nothing is constant but the long and ever-varying music of the verse, Spencer's own measure. In which each stanza is a poem, while the strong stream of melody carries the half-dreaming reader down the enchanted river, and forth into the fairy seas. The Spencerian measure with the Alexandrine that ends the stanza may not be the best vehicle for narrative. But Spencer's stream does flow from the mountains of Lotusland, and the air of Lotusland occasionally lulls the vigilance of the poet as well as of the the reader. The stanza, Book Six, Canto X, which opens. One day, as they all three together went. To the green wood to gather strawberries. There chanced to them a dangerous accident. A tigre forth out of the wood did rise. Narrates an accident as unexpected as dangerous. We cannot but be reminded of the Swiss family Robinson, and when Spencer makes Sir Calidore kill the tiger and cut off its head with a shepherd's crook, he is plainly overcome by drowsy head. 19. It is true that Spencer soon lost hold of his main allegory, and allegorized the moving events and some of the personages of his time. The gods, in Euripides, make a false Helen of clouds and sunbeams and for her the Trojans and Achaeans war and die. So, in Spencer's poem, the witch makes a false Florimel of snow, informed by, a wicked sprite, with burning eyes for the destruction of mankind, and the false Florimel is another form of the white witch, Mary Stuart. The affairs of Ireland, France, Belgium, and Spain appear in knightly or magical disguise in the procession of dissolving views. A pageant of the rivers of Ireland and England anticipates Drayton's Polly Albion, the romance becomes, like Piers Plowman, a farrago of all that is in the poet's mind. Of Spencer, Ben Jonson might have said, as of Shakespeare, Sufflaminandus Erat, he needed to have the drag put on. Like Pinder in youth, he sewed from the sack, not from the hand. His archaic words and unsuccessful imitations of archaic words annoyed the critics of his time more than they vex us. If he writ no language, writ the language of no time, as Ben Jonson said, that Gilead, and Odyssey, too, are in the language of no time, represent no one dialect that ever was actually spoken. But Spencer was writing about no actual time, his own age is confused with the fairy age of chivalry, and the ages of the Mort d'Arthur, and of Greek mythology. With Spencer we are, out of space, out of time, and of his adoration of Chaucer, his ancient words keep us in mind. That great and noble effort towards perfection, the spirit of chivalry, was his ideal. And in Sir Philip he saw the last of the gentle and perfect knights. To the flattery of Elizabeth we must submit, she needed it all if to her subjects she was to, stand for England and their love of England. Spencer's blemishes are of his age. No pure and perfect work of immaculate art could arise in a poetry which was only emerging from a kind of chaos, too much learning being the successor of too much ignorance. And a divine genius being left at large with no control from sane and temperate criticism. Somewhat eclipsed by the new star of Elizabeth's fresh favorite, Essex, Raleigh visited his Irish lands in 1589, met Spencer, read the Fairy Queen, in manuscript, and brought Colin Clout home again. The poem of that name, 1591, while full of sugared compliments to Elizabeth, is also touched with satire of her new courtiers. Sidney was dead, Lester was dead, Burley hated poetry and painting. The first part of the Fairy Queen, 1590, had made Spencer famous, but had won him no prize of court favor save a small pension. His Mother Hubbard's Tale of the Ape and the Fox may have been written earlier and now was published. In this the satire is much more keen. The poet finds even the comic stage defaced and vulgarized, in his Tears of the Muses, where our pleasant Willie that is dead of late, cannot conceivably be Shakespeare, the silence of John Lilly may be intended. When Spencer returned to Ireland a collection of his miscellaneous poems was published, containing, 
among other things, Mother Hubbard's Tale, The Tears of the Muses, The Ruins of Rome, Sonnets from the French of Joachim du Bellay. The Ruins of Time, dedicated to Sidney's sister, Pembroke's mother, Lady Pembroke, begins with a vision of the genius of the ruined Roman city, Verlum, and in a far-off way reminds us of the Anglo-Saxon poem on the ruined city. There is a lament for the fall of ancient empires, and the sorrows of the House of Dudley. Spencer's mood was that of melancholy and disappointment, presently cheered by his marriage with Elizabeth Boyle. From his love came his sonnets, and his matchless epithalamian, his love-learned song. If the fairy queen, and all else that Spencer did were lost, the epithalamian, and the prothalamian, would win for him the crown of the chief of English poets before Shakespeare. The marriage occurred in June, 1594, then troubles with the Irish whom he had supplanted, or some other cause, sent him to England, with the last three books of his romance. The affair of Duessa's treatment caused James VI to remonstrate through Bower, the English ambassador to Holyrood, and though the poet was not punished, his designs may not have been advanced. He now published his hymns to love and beauty, earthly and heavenly, the latter under the influence of Plato, and his Prothalamian, for the ladies Elizabeth and Catherine Somerset. These splendid poems were his swan song. Ireland called him, and in October, 1598, the natives whom he had despoiled drove him from Kilcolman, which they burned. Spencer died, a ruined man, in Westminster, January 16, 1599, Essex paid for his funeral, he lies in Westminster Abbey. As Hephaestus, when he fashioned the arms of Achilles, melted bronze and gold and silver in his furnace, so Spencer combined the wealth of Greece and Italy, France, Rome, and England in the great crucible of his genius. In the Epithalamium, for example, we find a translation of four lines from a sonnet of Ronsar, mingling with notes from Theocritus and the Song of Songs, with all the beautiful things of all the creeds. It would, perhaps, be unfair to call the style of Spencer, as it appears in the Fairy Queen, Corinthian. Yet the metal in which he works is like that, Corinthian bronze, formed, at the conflagration of the city, from the molten gold and silver and copper of the sacred vessels and images of the gods. The spoils of all old poetry are mingled with his own. He has been called the poet's poet, his successors have taken from him his very tones. As has been said well, when Spencer writes, Scarcely had Phoebus in the glowing east. Yet harnessed his fiery-footed team. That is Shakespeare, the Shakespeare of Romeo and Juliet. And taking usury of time forepast. Fit for such ladies and such lovely knights. That is Shakespeare again, the Shakespeare of the sonnets. Many an angel's voice. Singing before the eternal majesty. For their triune triplicities on high. That is the younger voice of Milton. And ever and anon the rosy red. Flashed through her face. One might fancy the unmistakable note and accent of Tennyson. 20. English poetry fell with the neglect of Spencer, who was buried and forgotten from the middle of the 17th century till Thomson revived his measures in the middle of the 18th. And English poetry came fully to her own again when the magic book of Spencer was opened by Keats. 19. The Elizabethan Stage and Playwrights The rejoicing age of Elizabeth was fond of variety entertainments. The court masks, such as those of Lily, and George Peel's Arraignment of Paris, abounded in songs, music, and dancing, and were expensively furnished. The universities had their own amateur authors and performers. The children of St. Paul's and other schools acted so naturally that, as we read in Hamlet, they became serious rivals of the professional actors. 21. An area of children, little Iases, that cry out on the top of question, and are most tyrannically clapped for it, these are now the fashion. Polonius indicates the many sorts of plays, tragedy, comedy, pastoral, pastoral comical, historical pastoral, tragical historical, tragical comical, historical pastoral, scene individual, or poem unlimited. Seneca cannot be too heavy or Plautus too light. From authors of the heavy Senecan school came blank verse, the light people, continued, 
when Shakespeare wrote Love's Labor's Lost, to employ rhymes in many measures. Till Peel, and above all Marlowe, introduced a more free and varied and accomplished blank verse. The general taste turned from many imitations of the ponderous Seneca to plays of more freedom, but even moralities and interludes of the old sort continued to be played in the age of the Shakespearean drama. There were countless troops of players, vagabonds in the eyes of the law, those who held no license from a noble, as, the Earl of Leicester's men, the Admiral's men, and many others, hardly scaped whipping. In Ratsay's Ghost a company of strollers, bottoms and snugs, stage-stricken, are licensed by a highwayman. They acted where they could, mere barnstormers, mainly in the yards of inns, under the galleries. The city was puritanic, or, at all events, was adverse to the nuisance caused by crowds of roisterers and hangers-on of the theatre, and by 1577 James Burbage built his theatre beyond the municipal bounds, in Shoreditch. The curtain and the fortune were in the same region. Southwark, south of the river, a noisy quarter, gave hospitality to the Rose, and, in 1599, to the Globe, built by Burbage's son, the famous Richard, Shakespeare's friend. The diary of Philip Henslow, who financed players and authors, among his other enterprises, contains the jottings of this avaricious and uneducated patron. There were many small, private theatres, which had a scrambling existence. The pit was unseated, and open to the rain and sun, the galleries above were less uncomfortable. The noble and wealthy sat in galleries round the pit, or on the stage, which was covered over or partly covered from the air. The heiress, or tapestry hangings, concealed the prompter, and Polonius in Hamlet. Scenes in bedrooms were at the back, and when such a scene closed, the hangings fell over it. There was no scene shifting, as with us, pasteboard rocks and trees were easily moved about. A painted frame with a name over it in large letters, stood for town gate, and for the town. 22. There were no women actors, boys took women's parts till the restoration. Such clowns, dancers, singers, and practical jokers as Tarleton and Kemp, and such actors as held shares in their theatres, made good livelihoods. The authors, who sold them dramas for a sum down, and had no more profit from them in any way, were paid sums ranging from six pounds to twenty pounds, according to modern rate of purchasing power from fifty pounds to one hundred and sixty pounds. The play then became the property of the speculator, like Henslow, or manager, or company of authors, which had paid for it. Robert Greene, the celebrated literary man of whom we have to speak presently, was accused of selling a copy of a play to one company, and then, when that company went, on tour, through provincial towns, of selling another copy to another company. He was very capable of having it happen to him. When any speculator or company had once bought a play, they could hand it over to any author with orders to alter it as he pleased. This was annoying to the first author or authors, for sometimes two men, sometimes three, sometimes five or six would combine to make a play. The consequence is that modern critics spend much time and ink in trying to discover which author wrote each part of a comedy or tragedy, and how much of the original work of the first author, or authors, was kept in a play which, perhaps, Shakespeare himself took up and rewrote. We have no space for such discussions, which seldom lead to any certain conclusions, but we must remember that the actors much objected to the printing of any plays which they owned, for, once printed. It was not easy to prevent other companies from acting them. But publishers sent shorthand reporters to take down the words during the performance, and wild work they often made of it. These printed plays, small cheap square volumes or quartos, may be very correct or very incorrect copies of the author's words, some of Shakespeare's quartos are good texts, some are execrable. The playwrights were usually young men who had been at one of the universities, and had picked up all that they could learn of the newest French and Italian literature, ideas, and manners. They were very scornful of play writers who, like Kidd, Shakespeare, and even Ben Jonson, far more learned than any of them, had not been at Oxford or Cambridge. The pamphlets of the university men tell us much of the little we know about their rivals, often their betters, who had not studied at Oxford or Cambridge. John Lilly From the university wits whose plays prelude to Shakespeare, John Lilly 
1554-1606, of Magdalen, Oxford, stands a little apart. He wrote dramas to be acted before the Maiden Queen by the boy singers of the Chapel Royal and of St. Paul's. Unlike some of his brethren, he remembered the reverence due to boys and virgins, and his pieces are remarkable for delicacy of tone, while the refined and romantic sentiment, the pure and hopeless passion of his Endymion, for example, and the style of the prose in his dialogue, are all in the manner of his Euphues. When he aimed at broad mirth, he was not broad enough or facetious enough to be amusing. His characters usually, as in Endymion, and The Woman in the Moon, are the gods, goddesses, heroes, and heroines of classical mythology, but their manners are those of the court of Elizabeth, though more refined. Allegory on events of the day is suspected of lurking in the plays, Cynthia, for example, has always some complimentary reference to Elizabeth. Mother Bombi, is not a successful essay in low comedy, Campaspe, a love story of the court of Alexander the Great, where Plato finds himself, somehow, is quite a pretty approach, as is Galatea, towards the romantic comedy. But in Shakespeare's early, Love's Labour's Lost, we see that, at the first attempt, he far surpassed his predecessor. Puns, alliteration, and anecdotes of unnatural history are nearly as prevalent in the plays as in the Euphues of Lily. Several of his songs are pretty, some of his scenes of love-making when the lady, though coy, is willing to be won, are graceful, and the prose of the dialogue, conceits apart, is lucid and in good taste. His blank verse in The Woman in the Moon is not specially characteristic. Peel George Peel would have a far better claim than Kidd to the title of Sporting, if there were even a little truth in the tract about him called Merry Conceited Jests of George Peel, Gentleman. While to the title of Gentleman, he would have no moral pretensions. The jests are rough and far from honest practical jokes, but the author had some knowledge of Peel's position as a director of pageants and masks. There is no smoke without fire, and the contemporary stories of the bohemian life of pranks and poverty led by young poor university wits connected with the stage may be exaggerated but can scarcely be baseless. George Peel is thought to have been of Devonshire, he was born about 1558, was a member, in 1574, of Broadgates Hall, now Dr. Johnson's College of Pembroke in Oxford, took his bachelor's degree about 1577, his master's in 1579. His Tale of Troy, in rhymed heroic couplets, published 1589, he probably wrote at Oxford. It is a pocket epic and summary of the Trojan War, based partly on the Iliad, partly on the later Ionian legends, as of Polymedes, and the love of Achilles for Polyxena, daughter of Priam. By 1581 Peel was in London. In 1584 his Arraignment of Paris was published, it was acted in that year before Elizabeth by the children of the Chapel Royal. It is strange sport for ladies, and Mrs. Quickly might have said, you do ill to teach the child such words. The piece in which Paris is arraigned for giving the apple to Venus, is a pastoral written in a variety of rhymed meters, with some speeches in creditable blank verse, there is a pretty song. Fair, and fair, and twice as fair. And fair as any may be. At the close Diana presents the famous apple, with the ascent of Venus, Juno, and Pallas, to Queen Elizabeth. Peel also arranged pageants for the Lord Mayor, and wrote, 1593, a chronicle history of Edward I, a play based on an absurd ballad about the profligacy and fabulous cruelty of Eleanor, the worthy queen of Longshanks. Friar David A. P. Tuck provides a comic part, in prose. John Balliol, King of Scotland, brags and submits in blank verse, the best of the blank verse is assigned to the wicked Eleanor, the lines are not usually, stopped, in the stiff old style. In 1593 Peel also wrote his, Honour of the Garter, a poetic vision of, lovely knights, of old days. The prologue contains a lament for Marlowe. The muse's darling for thy verse. Fit to write passions for the souls below. The old wives' tale, is thought to have suggested a poem very unlike it, Milton's, Comus. The date of Peel's, David and Bathsheba, a remain of the fashion of scripture plays, is uncertain, published in 1599. This is the best of Peel's extant work, 
and the blank verse is not unworthy of Marlowe. David says of the dead Absalom. Touch no hair of him. Not that fair hair with which the wanton wins. Delight to play, and love to make it curl. Wherein the nightingales would build their nests. And make sweet bowers in every golden tress. To sing their lover every night to sleep. With Peel and Marlowe we are coming close to the perfection of the verse of Shakespeare. Peel died in 1597. Two years earlier he was poor and in sickness. Probably some of his plays are lost, the Battle of Alcazar is but doubtfully assigned to him. Peel cannot have taught Shakespeare much, though he greatly improved blank verse. He only proves that spectators were not intolerant of real poetry in plays. Green Robert Green was a Norwich man, born about 1560, the son of parents of substance, at St. John's College, Cambridge, he graduated in 1578. Norwich was a Puritan town, but the indulgence of Green's mother, as he tells us, enabled him to make the Italian tour, probably between 1578 and 1580. An Englishman that is Italianate. Doth quickly prove a devil incarnate. Said the proverb. And Green, a man greatly given to fits of repentance, describes his dissipations much as St. Augustine describes his own. At all events he learned Italian and could borrow from novels in that language. He lived among wags as loose as myself, both in Italy and London. Neither the effects of a rousing sermon nor an early marriage, 1585, 1586, to a wife with whom he soon parted company could withdraw Green from the bottle and his wild comrades. He was the conventional, gentleman of the press, living by a very rapid pen, yarking up a pamphlet, with unprecedented speed, says Nash, and his wares, we learn, were well paid. He had also many noble patrons, at least he dedicated his, love pamphlets, romances in the manner of Lily, to many ladies. They are pure in tone, and his favorite female character is a chaste and long-suffering patient Grizzle, like Enid in the Welsh Mabinogen, and Enid in the Idols of the King. Between 1583 and 1589 he wrote at least eight of those love stories and pamphlets, including Euphues, his censure to Philotus, and, as five were dedicated to ladies of rank, they were probably of the sort which women enjoyed. Later he was either remorseful, or affected remorse, for his way of living, and turned his experience of the town to use, in tracts on cosinage and coney catching, exposures of the devices of courtesans, usurers, and other harpies. His Repentance, and his Groatsworth of Wit, 1592, with the notorious allusion to Shake Scene, were among his last efforts. The Groatsworth of Wit describes the jealousies between the playwrights and the actors, who, then as always, gained most of the popularity and then gained most of the money yielded by the stage. It is almost impossible for unbiased readers to avoid detecting in Green's Johannes Factotum, the only shake scene in the country, an allusion to Shakespeare. Whether he partook too freely of pickled herrings and Rhine wine, as gossip averred, or not, he fell into a fatal illness, and died in debt to his landlord and landlady, in September, 1592. Harvey attacked and Nash defended his memory, but, even according to Nash he was a ruffler. Penning of plays, Green says, was his continual exercise, but at what date he began it is uncertain. He appears to have been stung by some comment in a play by two other authors on the unfashionable character of his own dramas, for that I could not make my verses jet upon the stage in tragical buskins. That is, apparently, he did not try to write the sonorous blank verse of Marlowe, or tried and failed to produce in Nash's words, the swelling bombast of a bragging blank verse. If Alphonsus, King of Aragon, be his first play, as it gives Tamerlane on a small scale it may have been suggested by Marlowe's drama, however Alphonsus, after Napoleonic victories, marries his own true love. The daughter of the Sultan and Green's play, like the tragedies preferred by Charles II, ends happily. The blank verse is inferior to that of the Ninevite play in which Lodge took part, A Looking Glass for London and England. Orlando Furioso is a strange medley. There is prose, blank verse, and even a speech in Latin, the materials are drawn, of course, from Ariosto, 
the paladins deal enormously in classical illusions. In Friar Bacon and Friar Bungai, the Prince of Wales, afterwards Edward I, falls in love with a gamekeeper's daughter, and describes her charms in blank verse, and in a very pretty pastoral manner. By the old trick of novels and of the stage he sends Lacey, a courtier, to woo for him, as in Much Ado About Nothing, Twelfth Night, and Two Gentlemen of Verona, and the usual consequences follow. The friars Bacon and Bungai are shown at their pranks, with a devil, and Lacey, in country apparel, flirts with the keeper's daughter in talk of Apollo's courtship of Semele, mother of Dionysus by Zeus. The king beholds their courtship by dint of crystal gazing, while they are also on the stage. The plot becomes extremely complicated, and poor Margaret, the keeper's daughter, has to play the patient Grizzle to Lacey. She is cruelly treated, but marries Lacey in the end, while Edward pairs off with Eleanor. The servant of Friar Bacon, Miles, and a devil provide some comic matter. The blank verse is now much more accomplished, and imitates the cadences of Marlowe. The play of James IV is so absurdly unhistorical, it transfers the plot of an Italian novel by Cynthia to the court of Holyrood, that it can hardly be read with patience, but Green's sweet, patient, long-enduring heroine, Dorothea. Appears again, in the part historically filled by a very different person, Margaret Tudor, whose passion for being alternately married, finally to Lord Muffin, and divorced, was rebuked by her brother, Henry VIII, himself no model of constancy. Green introduced and Shakespeare continued the practice of taking plots for romantic comedies, such as, As You Like It, from Italian novels. And, like Shakespeare, he is the poet of good women, the homer of women, as his friend Nash said with hyperbole of compliment. Lodge. The memoirs of Thomas Lodge, had he left them to us, would be of more interest than are his writings. He had an or in every paper boat, says the Cambridge satirist in the play, The Return from Parnassus, but he had oars in other boats that were not of paper. Born about 1558, he was the second son of Sir Thomas Lodge, an eminent grocer. He was educated at Trinity College, Oxford, being by one academic generation junior to Lily. Going to the Inns of Court, London, he answered Gosson's attack on poetry, the school of abuse, in an abusive style very unlike that of Sir Philip Sidney's defense of poesy. He and Barnaby Rich, the supposed author of a most vivacious translation of two books of Herodotus, were friends, and wrote commendatory verses, each for the other's work, 1581. If in his, Alarum Against Usurers, 1584, Lodge is speaking from his personal experience, he already knew, the ignoble melancholy of pecuniary embarrassment, thanks to the expensive acquaintance of Mrs. Minx, and long bills due to his tailor. He warns the young against the temptations of the town, at tedious length and with overabundance of classical allusions. In an unreadable romance, 1584, Lily's Euphues, being the model, for Bonius and Proceria, he inserts many not unreadable verses. Glaucus and Scylla, is a work of the same genre as Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis, a classical tale told in stanzas of six lines. Delays in tragic tales provoke offenses. Says Lodge, and his tale is too prolix, verbose, and full of delays. There are harmonious cadences, and pretty descriptions, but Lodge's poetic vein is best in his brief lyrics. He found time, on sea or land, to write, Rosalind, Euphue's Golden Legacy. This contains the tale which Shakespeare made immortal by transfiguring it in, as you like it. The vagrant and affected prolixity of this kind of story had a popularity that endured for a century, and surprises us as much as our popular novels will doubtless astonish future generations. Such as the style was, Lodge had mastered it, and redeemed it by the intercalated verses. Rosalind had Vogue and Lodge, who had set forth on a freebooting expedition with young Thomas Cavendish, wrote probably the only novel, A Marguerite of America, 1596, ever composed in the frosty Straits of Magellan. His next novel was Euphues's Shadow, the Euphuism of the shadow is equal to that of the substance. His play, A Looking Glass for London and England, written in collaboration with Green, was acted in 1592. We are introduced to Razni, king of Nineveh, with three kings of Cilicia, 
Crete, and Paphlagonia, returning from the overthrow of Jeroboam, king of Jerusalem. Green and Lodge are magnificently disdainful of local color. The Cilician king, in very sonorous blank verse, proclaims the Assyrian monarch to be more beautiful than Hyacinthus and Endymion, personages of Greek mythology. Osea's the prophet, brought in by an angel, listens to an angelic harangue of some thirty lines, and tersely replies, The will of the Lord be done. To him enter, clown and a crew of ruffians, and we have several pages of humors in prose. Mainly the talk is of ale and horses. After a prolonged and chaotic performance, Nineveh repents under the preaching of Jonah, and these amiable moralists, Green and Lodge, bid London go and do likewise. That the blank verse is not bad, and that the satire of Razney's flatterers may be a hit at the adulators of Elizabeth, is the best that can be said for this scriptural drama. After all it is not so tedious as Lodge's play from Roman history, The Wounds of Civil War. It is needless to speak of such mere hackwork as his books on William Longbeard and Robert the Devil, but his, Fig for Momus, satires and rhyming heroic couplets, accredit him, contrary to the boast of Joseph Hall, as the first English satirist. Not popular in literature, Lodge, 1600, turned physician, taking his M.D. degree at Avignon. Now he really flourished, and was in good practice, till his death in 1625. His reputation rests on his lyrics. For the advance of the drama he did nothing. Nash. With no special gifts except reckless fluency, Thomas Nash, or Nash, made his name one of the most frequently quoted in the history of Elizabethan literature. The son of William Nash, minister, not improbably a Puritan preacher, Nash was born at Lowestoft in Suffolk in November, 1567. The Christian names of his brothers and sisters, Nathaniel, Israel, Martha, Rebecca are of the biblical sort favored by the brethren. Nash made no claim to the title, gentleman, then used in the heraldic sense. He was, 1582, either a sizer, at Oxford, servitor, or Lady Margaret Scholar of St. John's College, Cambridge, and was in residence for nearly seven years. By 1589 he was in London, a literary hack, employed, for example, to write an introduction to Green's Menaphon. He addresses the students of both universities in his irrepressibly rattling way, and it is hardly possible to doubt that in a long passage he rails at the unfortunate kid in his capacities as playwright and translator from the Italian. He rapidly reviewed contemporary literature and mocked at English hexameters, the darlings of Gabriel Harvey. With him Nash later had a war of pamphlets, the best known is, Have With You to Saffron Walden, containing a full answer to the eldest son of the Haltermaker, 1596. The pamphlets are only of interest for their personal hints, the feud arose from a sliding allusion by Green to Harvey's parentage, quip for an upstart courtier. Nash took up the cudgels, as his weapons of wit may be called, for Green. Harvey pursued Green's memory beyond the tomb, and government at last put an end to the publication of the pamphlets. Nash and Marlowe worked together at the play of Dido, mainly based on the Aeneid of Virgil, with an opening scene in unvirgilian bad taste, and highly unedifying to the players, the children of Her Majesty's Chapel the play is in blank verse. Usually better than Nash's own in his Summer's Last Will and Testament. Much of this is in Nash's hasty prose, a blank verse tirade in praise of dogs is amusing. To come to speech, they have it questionless. Although we understand them not so well. They bark as good old Saxon as may be. In 1597, Nash was imprisoned for a play, The Isle of Dogs. It is impossible to enumerate his tracts, of which his turbulent prose satire, Pierce Penniless, his supplication to the devil, is the most spirited. His, Unfortunate Traveller, or The Life of Jack Wilton, 1594, is a crude anticipation of Gil Blas, and the novel of unscrupulous wandering adventurers, and contains the feigned story of the loves of Surrey and his Geraldine. Which was taken to be historical. Nash lived a scrambling life, a bookseller's hack, destitute of patrons, and died about 1601. For the advance of the drama, despite his playwriting, Nash did nothing. Marlowe. 
Christopher Marlowe is happily on the right side of the line which separates poets who may be read from poets who must be written about. He was born on February 6, 1564, being the son of an eminent shoemaker at Canterbury. He was educated at the King's School of that city, where he held a little scholarship of a pound, quarterly, and went to Corpus Christi College, Cambridge, with one of the scholarships founded there for Canterbury Boys by Archbishop Parker, 1581. In 1584 he took his bachelor's degree, being a contemporary of Nash and Green, and three years later put on his master's gown. His translations of Ovid's Amores may have been executed at Cambridge, he did not publish them. His first public work was the first part of the play of Tamerlane, acted in 1587 or 1588. The drama, in both parts, is destitute of construction. The hero, Tamerlane, the scourge of God, merely overruns a vast extent of country, subduing kings, massacring maidens, and glutting his unbounded rage for universal conquest. His only human weakness is his passion for divine Xenocrate, his wife, and he might be called a martyr to megalomania, trampling on divine names no less than on the backs of emperors. The scene in which he enters in his chariot drawn by the kings of Trebizond and Soria, bit in mouth, and cries. Hala, ye pampered jades of Asia! Was matter of constant jest and parody, a proof of the popularity of the drama. In his youth, if we may interpret his nature by his early plays, Marlowe was, a desirer of things impossible, intoxicated with the thought of what man may achieve. Nature, he makes Tamerlane say, doth teach us all to have aspiring minds. Our souls whose faculties can comprehend the wondrous architecture of the world and measure every wandering planet's course, still climbing after knowledge infinite and always moving as the restless spheres, wills us to wear ourselves and never rest, until we reach the ripest fruit of all. But after this scientific prelude, worthy of Bacon, Tamerlane sinks to finding felicity in, an earthly crown. The genius of Marlowe, which was great, but scarcely dramatic, places in the lips of his ferocious monster these astonishing lines on the aspiration of the poet towards the beautiful. If all the pens that poets ever held had fed the feeling of their master's thoughts and every sweetness that inspired their hearts, their minds and muses on admired themes, if all the heavenly quintessence they still from their immortal flowers of poesy, wherein, as in a mirror, we perceive the highest reaches of a human wit, if these had made one poem's period, and all combined in beauty's worthiness. Yet should there hover in their restless heads one thought, one grace, one wonder at the least, which into words no virtue can digest. This is the vision of beauty which haunts and evades Marlowe, as the shadow of the mother of Odysseus in Hades fades away from his embrace. Sometimes it appears to him, like women or unmarried maids, shadowing more beauty in their airy brows, than have the white breasts of the queen of love. Again, in Dyar. Faustus, a new Tamerlane who seeks the impossible in magic, not by arms, and sells his soul to the adversary, the vision arises in the form of Helen of Troy, that ancient symbol of the world's desire. Was this the face that launched a thousand ships? And burnt the topless towers of Ilium? Oh, thou art fairer than the evening air, clad in the beauty of a thousand stars. In this absolute perfection of the magic of verse, we see the true conquest of Marlowe, as in the agonies of the last hour of Faustus. Cut is the branch that might have grown full straight. And burned is Apollo's laurel bough. The last act is full of pity and of terror. The dagger thrust that slew Marlowe in a Deptford tavern, at the end of May, 1593, robbed English poetry of a genius whose future performance cannot be measured, nor can the form which it might have taken be guessed. The comic prose scenes in Faustus are very stupid and may perhaps be by another hand, but nothing in Marlowe indicates the gift of humor. In The Jew of Malta, Barabbas, on a scale less disproportionate than Tamerlane, represents immeasurable desire of wealth, not of royalty. 
In the earlier scenes the speeches of Barabbas, with the recurrence of romantic and sonorous names, in a way remind us of Milton. The Jew, ill-treated as he is, is not allowed to be sympathetic, and the monstrosity of his crimes reminds the modern reader of A-Town's Vermilion, with a touch of the story of the hunchback in the Arabian Nights. Though Barabbas has a beloved daughter, rapidly converted to Christianity, though his ducats and his daughter are all that he loves, he lags very far behind Shylock. The play was well calculated for popularity, but, save Barabbas, it contains no character of marked merit. Edward II has been much praised in modern times, and even preferred to the Richard II of Shakespeare. Neither king was a good subject for tragedy, though both endured the extremes of misfortune. But in Richard there were noble elements, debased by a long struggle with some of his uncles, and undermined by a period of absolute power. In Edward II we know nothing estimable, save a moment of princely valour when he was all but taken at Bannockburn. His doting devotion to Piers Gaveston, who is well sketched by Marlowe, his intolerable insults to his queen, place him quite beyond sympathy, till his awful last hours and appalling end. The instantaneous change of the queen from a loving, forgiving, and intolerably wronged woman to a monster of cruel hypocrisy cannot be called artistic. And though the play, compared with Marlowe's other dramas, is regular, and opens the path to what we may call the legitimate drama, without the monstrosities of The Jew of Malta. It does not contain such surprising excellencies as occur in Tamburlaine and Faustus. The noblest passage, the speech of the fallen king to Leicester, could scarcely come from the Edward of the earlier acts. The Massacre of Paris, the Bartholomew Massacre of 1572, is of no importance among Marlowe's works. If we could agree with his too fond biographer that Marlowe wrote the passages of Henry VI, in which Jean d'Arc is worthy of herself, and that Shakespeare contributed the scandalous scenes of her debasement. We might regard Marlowe as a wonder of clear-sighted appreciation. But nothing in their works confirms this conjecture. What share, if any, Marlowe had in Henry VI and Titus Andronicus, and precisely what Shakespeare did for both of these dramas is unknown. Marlowe's beautiful lyric, Come live with me and be my love, is forever fragrant, and his Hero and Leander, stiffly finished by Chapman, it is said at Marlowe's own dying request, is at least the equal of. And may even be preferred by many readers to the first fruits of Shakespeare's invention, Venus and Adonis. Shakespeare's dead shepherd did not die unlamented by his brother poets, he had patrons in Raleigh and Sir Thomas Walsingham, and it is not necessary to criticize here certain horrible libels on his life and conversation. Point 23. Kid. The irony of chance, by a freak of Ben Jonson's, has attached to the most ill fated of authors the name of Sporting Kid. Born about 1558, the son of a scrivener in the city, Kid was educated at Merchant Taylor's School. He was not a member of either university. It is by a piece of luck, for his biographers, that he was satirized by Nash as one who stole from a French translation of Seneca's tragedies. And so produced a play, Pompey the Great, his fair Cornelius tragedy, one who will afford you whole hamlets, and who took up the business of translating from the Italian. By pursuing these and other sarcastic hints of Nash's, Kidd has been identified as the author of the most truly popular of early Elizabethan plays, the Spanish tragedy, of what the Germans call the You Are Hamlet, the oldest English Hamlet play. And the translator of The Householder's Philosophic, in prose, while he is thought guiltless of the first part of Geronimo, a prelude, meant to be humorous, to his Spanish tragedy. To that work, again, additions were made, and Ben Jonson was paid for making them, though they are thought not to resemble his manner, and he frequently girds in his own later dramas at the popular, Spanish tragedy. It is a long tissue of horrors and revenges in blank verse, old Hieronimo slowly pursuing the slayers of his son, Horatio, and contains, like Hamlet, a play within a play, in which the actors in a fencing scene slay each other in earnest. To glut Hieronimo's revenge. As in, Hamlet, there is a ghost, but ghosts were common in the dramas of Seneca and his English imitators. Hieronimo, when apprehended, bites his tongue out, 
and stabs himself and a duke who happens to be convenient in his neighborhood. If Kidd were really the author of the first play of Hamlet, based on a Danish story which English actors who played in Germany in 1587 may have brought home, the fact would be interesting. If we only possessed a copy of this first Hamlet, we should know how much, if anything at all, Shakespeare retained from the original play. Kidd is credited with being the first to show the change and development of characters under the sway of the events of the drama, though this can scarcely be proved save by a long comparison of all the characters in the plays of other writers. Grotesque as are his horrors, when we compare those of Titus Andronicus and of successors of Shakespeare who ought to have known better, we wonder at his moderation. Kidd's end was lamentable. He was arrested, and tortured, in May, 1593, on suspicion of having written a placard threatening a massacre of undesirable aliens in London, who interfered with home industries. In his papers was found part of a perfectly serious though heterodox discourse on a theological topic, apparently intended to be submitted to a bishop. He cleared himself of the placard, and, in a letter to Puckering, the Lord Keeper, said that he had the theological piece from Marlowe, that it was among his papers by accident, and that Marlowe, then just dead, was an evil man. And no friend of his. Kidd now lost the patronage of a peer, unnamed, and by December in the following year he was dead, his family renounced the administration of what possessions he may have left behind him. He has of late been the subject of minute English and German research, like everyone who had, or may have had, the faintest connection with Shakespeare. The Indecision of Hieronymo, Act 3. Scene 12, in revenging himself on Balthasar for slaying Horatio, Hieronymo's son, and hanging him up in Hieronymo's summer house, has other motives than the indecision of Hamlet. But this indecision, and the play within the play, and Kidd's supposed authorship of the You Are Hamlet, which lies behind the first quarto of Hamlet, make Kidd interesting to critical specialists. These predecessors of Shakespeare need to be mentioned, though perhaps only Marlowe's dramas are now commonly read by lovers of poetry. Though these men wandered in the wilderness, so to speak, they pointed out the way to Shakespeare, and made the world familiar with rude forecasts of the forms of the romantic comedy, the historical play, and the tragedy. Several wrote blank verse well, occasionally, Marlowe brought blank verse, not precisely dramatic, but rather reflective, to the highest beauty. Almost all the early dramatists also graced their plays with charming songs. All of these early dramatists had that sweet and birdlike English note of song, wood notes wild, which, to an English ear, is rare in all but the early poetry of France. We have observed this note in the lyrics of the 13th and 14th centuries. Time did not stifle the music, it is prolonged in the fashionable love romances and in the early dramas. Thus even Nash, the least poetical of his associates, has his. Adieu, farewell earth's bliss. This world uncertain is. Which, with its refrain. Lord, have mercy on us. Recalls Dunbar's lament. Timor mortis conturbate me. Dust hath closed Helen's eye. Worms feed on Hector brave. Where are the lovely knights and the ladies of old time? Autumn hath all the summer's fruitful treasure. Written in a time of pestilence, is another lament of Nash's, and Go not yet away, bright soul of the sad year. Peel has His golden locks hath time to silver turned. And the beautiful song of Bethsabe at the bath. Hot sun, cool fire, tempered with sweet air. Green has his Ah, what is love, it is a pretty thing as sweet unto a shepherd as a king. Which is in the spirit of Burns's best songs of rural love, and his courtly love song with the French refrain. Nos res vous, mon bel ami. And his lullaby. Weep not my wanton, smile upon my knee. When thou art old, there's grief enough for thee. This has the charm of the folk songs. Old and plain. And dallying with the innocence of love. It may also be said that, at the opposite pole, green snatches of English hexameters are the best of their kind then written. If nothing else of Lily's existed his. Cupid and my campaspe played. At cards for kisses, Cupid paid. 
would keep his memory green. Lodge has been blamed as a common plagiary because he translated so many of his lyrics, not always or often with due acknowledgement, from Desports and Ronsar. But in some cases he improved the land which he conquered, and his, love in my bosom like a bee, down a down. Thus fill a sung, and, pluck the fruit and taste the pleasures, are genuine additions to English song, and prelude to Shakespeare's, and the music of the coming generation. All of the treasures of his predecessors are not equivalent or nearly equivalent to the small change of Shakespeare's genius. But the best things in his predecessor's work indicate that, in a favorite phrase of Aristotle, nature was wishing to make a Shakespeare. Yet was the birth of his genius none the less a miracle. He did much more than combine all that was good in all the others. He added that which is universal and eternal. Shakespeare. Concerning the life of William Shakespeare, as he signed it, or Shakespeare, as his name was usually spelled, only a few essential facts are known from records of his own time, mainly documents concerning the legal affairs of himself, his family, and the theatrical company with which he was connected. Unlike many of the contemporary playwrights he was not a member of either university, and so college records about him are necessarily absent, and there is no contemporary roll of names of pupils at the school of his native place, Stratford-on-Avon. Again, he was not a pamphleteer or journalist, like Nash, Green, and others, and so he left no account of his friendships and enmities, no prose books about his opinions on art and literature, like Ben Jonson. He wrote no satirical plays, as Ben did, full of angry, contemptuous, and envious attacks on his rivals, and on the actors. As he was no learned scholar, the universities never dreamed of making him, like Ben Jonson, a master of arts. People who wrote criticisms of poetry in prose or verse always spoke highly of him. One, John Davies, remarks that, in the opinion of some, had he not been an actor, he would have been fit company for kings. But anecdotes of him were not sought for till all who had known him had long been dead. His own dramas contain a few topical allusions, and his sonnets appear to be more or less autobiographical, though to what degree, as in the case of Sidney's sonnets, is matter of dispute. He took almost no part in any public services, and in these circumstances little is known of his life, despite the painful researches of many learned students, and the wildest modern conjectures. Concerning even the paternal grandfather of the poet, presumed to have been Richard Shakespeare, a farmer at Snitterfield, within four miles of Stratford-on-Avon, we have little more than probable presumptions. Richard's son John, father of the poet, in 1551 set up in business at Stratford-on-Avon, then a town of some 1500 inhabitants. He was a dealer in agricultural commodities, Aubrey, the antiquary, a century later, heard that he was a butcher. But the trade of a butcher in a tiny town is not lucrative, yet by 1556 he could buy two tenements, one in Henley Street, next door to the so-called birthplace. He held a succession of municipal offices, and was one of two chamberlains of town accounts. In 1557, he married Mary Arden, a daughter of a faraway branch of a good family. She inherited fifty acres of land and a house at Wilmcote, and other property. After the birth of children who died young, came William, baptized on April 26, 1564. His father, still prospering, was chief magistrate in 1568, that year came licensed play actors to Stratford, the Queen's, and the Earl of Worcester's. But after 1572 the affairs of the father turned gradually to the worse. He mortgaged the property near Wilmcote in 1578, he fell into debt, and in 1586 ceased to be an alderman. His family had increased while his fortunes declined. As there was a free grammar school at Stratford, it is natural to suppose that William was educated there from his seventh or eighth to his thirteenth year. If so, he would learn Latin grammar, and read more or less in the popular classics, including, Old Montuan, not Virgil, but a writer of the Italian Renaissance. Supposing Shakespeare to have left school at thirteen, he was at the age of Bacon when he went up to Cambridge. Books have been written about the learning or want of learning of Shakespeare. In all probability he could make out most of the meaning of a Roman writer of comedies, like Plautus, or of a philosopher like Seneca. 
but his use of English translations, whenever he could get them, does not look as if he read Latin with ease, he could ask a friend or pay a poor scholar to help him when he had no translations. And to Ben Johnson his Latin seemed small, because Ben had so much scholarship, and was so proud of it. All general information Shakespeare acquired as easily as he drew breath. Of schoolmasters, judging from allusions in the plays, he entertained the same opinion as Sir Walter Scott. The classics are most in view in his early plays, in some of which he worked over an earlier manuscript by a more scholarly hand. Moreover classical allusions, mythological and historical, lay loose on the surface of all contemporary literature, and abounded in the conversation of the wits. 24 No man ever cared less for historical accuracy and correct local color than Shakespeare, he piled up anachronisms, making Aristotle live before the Trojan War. When not yet 19 years of age, at the close of 1582, Shakespeare married in Hathaway, who had the same dowry, in money, six pounds, thirteenths. For D, as his mother. She was seven or eight years older than he, their first child was born at the end of May, 1583, and the circumstances did not promise domestic happiness. Twins, Hamnet, who died young, and Judith, were born in 1585, and whether Shakespeare did, or did not get into trouble for poaching on the lands of Lucy of Charlecote, against whom his heraldic ridicule, in Merry Wives, Act I, Scene I, indicates a grudge, it was time for him to seek his fortune. Perhaps he made ventures near home, Aubrey, who knew an old actor that had traditions, says he was a schoolmaster, but by 1587 he was probably hanging loose on the town, in London. Here he had a fellow townsman, Field, who later printed his Venus and his Lucrece. The story that Shakespeare held the horses of playgoers outside the doors of a theater comes late into literary anecdote. By 1594, perhaps by 1592, Shakespeare was a member of the company of actors known successively as Lester's, Derby's, died 1592, Hunsdon's, Carey, and, at the accession of James VI and I, 1603, the Kings. With him were the great Richard Burbage, John Heminga, Henry Condell, and Augustine Phillips. By this company all his plays were first acted. By 1592 they used the Rose Theatre, and others, and in 1599 the Globe. There is no proof that Shakespeare ever played in Scotland, he could not pronounce Dunsinane, and accentuated the final syllable, or abroad. From the moment of his departure from Stratford nothing is certainly known of Shakespeare, till the dying green apparently alludes to him in A Groat's Worth of Wit, Bought with a Million of Repentance, 1592. Adjuring his comrades, Nash, Peel, and Marlowe, to forswear sack and the stage, Green seems to remind them of a hardship in their professional position, the rewriting of plays, once sold, by other hands. A new hand might alter it for the owners, the hand might be that of an actor, one of the puppets, says Green, that speak from our mouths. There is an upstart crow, beautified with our feathers, that with his tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide, supposes he is as well able to bombast out a blank verse as the best of you. And being an absolute, Johannes Factotum, jack of all work, is, in his own conceit, the only shake seen in a country. It is a pity men of such rare wit should be subject to the pleasures of such rude grooms. If, as has been suggested, there is no certainty, a piece called Henry VI, Part I, played by Shakespeare's company in March, 1592, was an older drama, bombast, by Shakespeare, and if his conduct was one cause of Green's wrath. We can only regret that Shakespeare set his hand to a work that rejoiced English patriots. The author or authors represent Jean d'Arc in two totally different characters, now as a patriot, equally brave, self-sacrificing, and eloquent. Now as a loose woman who denies her father, and asserts her pregnancy by one or other of several lovers. History is strangely treated, and the materials must have been taken from Anglo-Burgundian scandals, and from a curious French prose chronicle romance, obviously done into prose out of verse, the Chronique de Lorraine. This appears to have been the source of the scenes in which Jean fights at Rouen, many years after her martyrdom in 1431. Shakespeare may have written in the scenes where Jean acts and speaks like herself, 
the others, let us hope so. Maybe by a baser hand. The second and third parts of Henry VI were later much altered, probably by Shakespeare, the scenes with Jack Cade are entirely in his manner. As we have not the original manuscripts, we are often unable to distinguish, in Shakespeare's earlier works, between what is his own and what belongs to a play by an earlier hand, or by a collaborator. The tendency of criticism is to attribute the best passages to Shakespeare and to guess at the authors of what is not so good. The dates especially of the early plays are far from certain. But we can hardly be mistaken in thinking Love's Labour's Lost, a very early example of the poet's playwriting. He has not mastered blank verse, the sense usually ends with the end of each line. Much of the play is written in rhymed verse of various meters, prose is comparatively little used. Some of the personages, as Byron and Longueville, are of the contemporary court of Henry of Navarre, a most unlikely person to contemplate seclusion from female society. The play, of which the plot seems to be Shakespeare's own, 25 is full of promise of good things to come. Byron will blossom into Benedict, Costard and Jaconetta into Touchstone and Audrey. The ladies are predecessors of the poet's many ladies, as Beatrice and Rosalind, who are merry when in love. We have the stock figure of the pedant schoolmaster in Holofernes, of the fantastic talker in Armado, and the songs, On a Day, Alack the Day, and When Daisies Pied and Violets Blue, prelude to all the enchantments of Shakespeare's lyrics. The play was revised and worked over in 1598. Titus Andronicus, certainly extant in 1594, is the play which Burns and his brothers, in boyhood, declined to listen to. It is as full of horrors as an Assyrian bar relief of the torturing of prisoners of war. Tortures were familiar, in practice, to the subjects of Elizabeth, and the horrors are not worse than those of ancient Athenian and other Greek legendary histories. But neither these things or the overabundance of pedantic classical allusions are in Shakespeare's mature taste. Much of the play has been guessed at as the work of Sporting Kid, and a fairly old tradition, published in 1678, says that Shakespeare only touched it up. Long ago Hallam remarked that criticism might come to be as dubious as to Shakespeare's precise share in the plays, as, after Wolfe, 1795, she has been uncertain about Homer's part in his epics. It is clear and certain that plays, when Shakespeare came to the town, were often altered and added to by others than the original authors. Though, Titus Andronicus, was, in 1598, assigned to Shakespeare by Francis Mears, and was included in the first collected edition, the Folio, in 1623, he may, perhaps, have been the last and, as the most popular, the titular bearbiter. Or worker over of the drama. Richard III could scarcely be made to feed more full of horrors on the stage than that prince actually did, as reported by Hollinshed, and the play, if inflated, is less so than Marlowe's Tambelaine. Marlowe's Edward II, again, had its influence on Richard II, a perilous play to be concerned with, from the scene of deposing the king, under the irritable Elizabeth. Acted by order of the Essex conspirators, in 1601, it brought Shakespeare's company under the momentary displeasure of the Queen. The third Richard has all the elements of popularity. He is as hideous as the second Richard was effeminately beautiful, as resolute as his predecessor was weak. It is well that a dramatist should make himself plainly understood. But Shakespeare seems to play with his own art when the splendid rhetoric of Richard III reveals, he soliloquizes more than Hamlet, the cause why he is determined to prove a villain, his spite against the world for his own deformity. And why he is determined to be a hypocrite. With odd old ends stolen forth of holy writ. The scene of the wooing of the Lady Anne, and the dream of Clarence, are among the most familiar passages in English poetry, and the second is rich in the magic of Shakespeare's blank verse. The wavering character of Richard II, ever in extremes of confident arrogance and of sudden dread, like that of Agamemnon, would not have seemed to Aristotle fit for a hero of tragedy. But in memorable passages of poetry, single lines that, once read, can never be forgotten, the play is rich, and such lines are the mark and sign manual of Shakespeare's genius. The real Shakespeare cannot help showing himself here and there. 
And then we are in the presence of something new, of a kind of English poetry that no one has hit upon before. 26. It is in Romeo and Juliet, and the Midsummer Night's Dream, both relatively early pieces, even more than in the chronicle plays, that this ever-present magic of genius, the unequaled command of beautiful fresh phrases. The hurrying rush of exquisite ideas, first shines out most conspicuously, the youth of passion in the Romeo, and the soul of romance, are accompanied by the gay wit of glorious Mercutio and the lax humors of the nurse and the servants. Shakespeare was compelled to kill Mercutio by Tybalt's sword, otherwise a character so congenial to him would have run away with the play, and turn the tragedy into comedy. Shakespeare, says Ben Jonson, had an excellent fantasy, fancy, brave notions and gentle expressions, wherein he flowed with such facility that sometimes it was necessary he should be stopped. Mercutio could only be stopped by a sword thrust. The Midsummer Night's Dream is the enchanted consummation of the worldwide fairy belief, relieved against the rustic comedy of Bottom and Snug. The Two Gentlemen of Verona, like Love's Labor's Lost, is a bud full of promise. Launce is as delightfully humorous as Sylvia is gay and charming, and Julia is the first of the ladies in Page's guise and deep in love. But Romeo and Juliet, and A Midsummer Night's Dream, are already nonpareils, full-blown roses that time cannot wither. The Comedy of Errors, based on Plautus, with the farcical errors of indistinguishable identities in the masters, reduplicated in the servants, would add by its broad farce to Shakespeare's popularity, though not to his fame. But in The Merchant of Venice, the blending of moral tragedy in the somber character of the outraged Jew, Shylock, combined with the delightful and tender romance of the lovers, proved the multifarious versatility of the poet. His power in the delineation of the most various moods and passions, and also the unequaled magic of his verse. On such a night stood Dido with a willow in her hand upon the wild sea banks, and waft her love to come again to Carthage. Here Virgil is equaled or surpassed in the province where Virgil was greatest. In the use of words that by some inexplicable art suggest more than they seem to say, filling the mind with vague and potent emotion, and a longing not to be appeased, as does the beauty of twilight and moonlight. Look how the floor of heaven is thick inlaid with patines of bright gold. There's not the smallest orb which thou beholdest. But in his motion like an angel sings. Still queering to the young-eyed cherubims. Such harmony is in immortal souls. But, whilst this muddy vesture of decay doth grossly close it in, we cannot hear it. In this passage, whether he knew it or not, and we know not how he knew things, Shakespeare soars to the heights of Plato's dreams, in the Phaedrus and the Symposium. Did he go beyond the appreciation of the groundlings in such passages? Did they find mirth in the passion of the Jew, and fail to fathom Shakespeare's deep sympathy with the oppressed? Probably he gave them more and other things than he seemed to give. To them Shylock's may have appeared as a comic part, but indeed we cannot judge that strange Elizabethan audience. Shakespeare knew what they wanted, horrors, ghosts, revenges, manslayings. He gave them these things in Lear and Hamlet, but gave with them the deepest and subtlest thoughts, the most magical poetry, treasures of wit, and all this they could enjoy, as they could follow every point, pass, and parry in the wit combats. It seems probable that Shakespeare's fame as a poet rested, for a while, rather on his verses, Venus and Adonis, published 1593, and Lucrece, 1594, than on all the treasures of his plays. The two poems, the only works of Shakespeare's which he himself saw through the press, are dedicated, in brief terms, to Henry Riothesley, Earl of Southampton, then a lad of twenty, fond of pleasure, art, and letters. The dedications are not fulsome, when we consider the manner of addressing patrons in that age. The second address, of some ten lines, says, The love I dedicate to your lordship is without end. What I have done is yours. What I have to do is yours, being part in all I have, devoted yours. It seems that Southampton had behaved with generosity to the poet, and it looks as if the poet's love were more than the trick phrase of a person obliged. 
The poems themselves, Venus and Adonis, in a six-line stanza, Lucrece, in a seven-line stanza, are remarkable for fluent mastery of verse and rhyme, for lusciousness of description of physical beauties. And for the compassionate passage on the poor hunted hare, and the vigorous description of a horse. Shakespeare manifestly loved a good horse, and probably felt compunctions about riding to harriers. But as to the poetry, it certainly is not superior to the luscious descriptions in Spencer. The verse is by no means superior to, nor, to some tastes, equal to Spencer's, and, if we lost Marlowe's Hero and Leander, the misfortune would be as great as if we lost Venus and Lucrece. The two compositions show us Shakespeare exercising himself on a fashionable class of themes, and with an overflow of fashionable conceits, Suflamin and Erat, says Ben Jonson, the drag needed to be put on. Had we nothing else of Shakespeare's, we could make no guess at his greatness. Indeed his contemporaries could hardly do so, till his plays were pirated and printed, because all their innumerable merits could not be fully appreciated till the plays were meditatively and frequently perused. By 1598, Francis Mears, comparing English with ancient poets, names Shakespeare and others with Homer, Aeschylus, Sophocles and Aristophanes, also Ausonius and Claudian. But he places Warner in the same good company, in Pilatus Timia, or Wit's Treasury, 1598. The plays named by Mears are Two Gentlemen of Verona, Comedy of Errors, Love's Labors Lost, Love's Labors Won. Midsummer Night's Dream, Merchant of Venice, both Richards, Henry IV, King John, Titus Andronicus, and Romeo and Juliet. The soul of Ovid lives in mellifluous and honey-tongued Shakespeare, witness his Venus and Adonis, his Lucrece, his sugared sonnets, among his private friends. Not published till 1609. Gullio, in the Cambridge comedy, The Return from Parnassus, about 1599 to 1602, is a farcical ignorant braggart who says, Let this dunsified world esteem of Spencer and Chaucer, I'll worship sweet Mr. Shakespeare, for his Venus and Adonis. He also quotes Romeo and Juliet, and the university wits manifestly despised Shakespeare, as no scholar and not a university man. They bade Ben Jonson go back to his brickmaking, he was not a university man. Meanwhile Shakespeare, with his share in the company and what he received for his written plays, and from patrons, was thriving, while his father struggled with debt and difficulties. Nonetheless, probably aided pecuniarily and advised by Shakespeare, he applied to the College of Arms for a grant of armorial bearings, 1596. A memorandum exists in which John Shakespeare is said to have lands and tenements of good wealth and substance. The grant was not made till 1599, and the heralds appear to have been very good-natured in permitting these Shakespeare's to write themselves gentlemen. The financial basis, however, was supplied when, in 1597, Shakespeare bought New Place, a large house in the town of Stratford, and two gardens. Sir Sidney Lee reckons his income, allowing for the altered values of money, at £1,040 in our currency. In short, like Scott, Shakespeare lived to found a family of gentility, though Scott naturally inherited the gentility in heraldic quarterings, which Shakespeare did not. He prospered continually. He held, later, shares in the Globe Theatre, and there is abundant proof that in money, acres, and goods he throve to an extent that denotes careful living. He appears as a strict exactor of debts, in nothing was he careless and indifferent except as regarded the immortal works, which, after his death, his stage friends, Hemming and Condell, published as best they might, 1623, the first folio. Shakespeare seems, in fact, to have had even more than Scott's indifference to his literary fame, unless we suppose him to have been firmly persuaded that his works, once given to the stage, must secure their own immortality. Even so, he might have employed the leisure of his last years in preparing a correct text for the press. Yet who knows that Shakespeare did not dream of doing what was unprecedented, of revising and collecting his plays for publication. Playwrights seldom printed their dramas, for reasons already given. But, in 1616, the year of Shakespeare's death, Ben Jonson published his works, he was laughed at for calling them works, in a tall and stately folio. 
It may have been in Shakespeare's mind to do the same thing, but tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. He may have contemplated the difficult task, he may even have made fair copies of some of his manuscripts of his many unprinted plays, the papers which his friends, the actors, say had scarce a blot. But his older manuscripts may have been tattered and worn, and altered for better or worse. To collect and revise all was a serious labor for a retired, perhaps a weary man. He was but fifty-two when he died. He may, we repeat, have dreamed of a task which he put off from day to day, there is no mystery in delays so natural when the custom of play writers was not to publish. The Sonnets It is difficult or impossible to date Shakespeare's sonnets. As we know from Mears, sugared sonnets of his were circulating in manuscript in 1598, the Book of Sonnets was, piratically, published in 1609 with a dark dedication to Mr. W. H. By the pirate, or procurer of piracy, Thorpe, to the only begetter of these sonnets Mr. W. H. All happiness and that eternity promised by our ever-living poet wisheth the well-wishing adventurer in setting forth T.T. T.T. did not wish to be understood. The two most popular theories are that Mr. W. H. is William Herbert, in 1601 Earl of Pembroke, before his accession to the earldom, he was known by, courtesy title, as Lord Herbert. To him then, about 1598 to 1601. The sonnets to a man are addressed. The second theory lays stress on Shakespeare's known devotion to the Earl of Southampton, certainly his patron, and assured of his love in the dedications of Venus and Lucrece in 1593, 1594. The sonnets are therefore dated about 1594, whereas, by the Pembroke theory, they are dated about 1598 to 1601. It is not possible, in this place, to criticize the two theories. The matter is of no importance in itself, but some partisans of the Pembroke theory represent Shakespeare as embittered almost to madness by the affair, constantly alluded to in the sonnets, of a double betrayal by his mistress, the Dark Lady, and by his adored friend the Earl of Pembroke. Henceforth we are to suppose, he revealed his passions in his tragedies, and was a fevered creature, dreaming of, bloody vengeance. There is not a shadow of proof for the hypothesis that the dark lady of the sonnets was a maid of honor, Mary Fitton, whose portraits demonstrate that she was of a fair complexion, with gray eyes and brown hair. We have not the slightest reason to believe that, in 1597-1601, when he was building up an estate, Shakespeare was mad with love of Mary, and jealousy of her lovers who, after 1601, are unknown, till, in 1606, she committed a fault, in the country. Of the two earls, Southampton, rather more probably than Pembroke, was, if either of them was, the beloved friend of the sonnets. 27. The sonnets are not in the Italian or Petrarchian form of recurring rhymes, but are in three verses of four lines, with a rhyming couplet to conclude. In many respects they resemble the sonnets fashionable at the time, with praise of a patron whom the poet loves and who is the inspiration of the poet. The accustomed conceits of Petrarch and his French followers, de Portes, Ronsard, and many others, are transfigured by the poet's genius. It was usual to applaud the beauty of the patron, and to exaggerate the love of the poet. This was matter of common form, but the sonnets of Shakespeare reflect the actual passion of love, or of friendship, passing the love of women, yet always respectful. People wrote thus to Elizabeth in her old age, but Shakespeare conveys an impression of sincerity, whether because he felt what he expresses, or whether his genius makes real and glowing that which was, with other writers, mere matter of compliment. He may be, unlocking his heart, in either case, for he must have known, for some one, the passion which, on the second theory, he dramatically employs to glorify his young inspirer. Yet again, he could imitate and express all thoughts, all passions, his sweetest nature, can scarcely have known the emotions of Shylock. However we may try to distinguish between what is conventional and what is felt in the sonnets, they apparently refer to real persons and real situations. Sonnets 1-17 to urge marriage on the beautiful young patron and friend, his beauties and virtues must live in his children as well as in verse. Sonnets 33-36 hint at some measure of estrangement, some wrong done to the poet by the friend. 
no more be grieved at that which thou hast done. Sonnets XLXLIII suggest that the friend has drawn away the poet's mistress. I do forgive thy robbery, gentle thief. Although thou steal thee all my poverty. Such are. The pretty wrongs that liberty commits. The suffering poet appears to bear no malice, it must be admitted. Thenceforward there are regrets for the absence of the friend, beautiful reflections, promises of immortality in verse, till, LXV, the poet hears that the friend keeps bad company, and though, LXX, this may be an envious slander. The poet has his doubts. In 68 to 93 the poet feels that the patron is preferring other minstrels, and one of these he applauds for. The proud full sail of his great verse. This singer is inspired by that affable familiar ghost, which nightly gulls him with intelligence. 28. Here are personal allusions to some facts or jests, which we cannot hope to discover. The rival poet has been guessed at as Barnaby Barnes, Parthenope and Parthenophil, 1593, who certainly wrote a sonnet on the inspiration of Southampton's eyes. Others think that George Chapman, the translator of Homer, is the rival whom Shakespeare writes of admiringly. In 95 to 96, the poet recurs to the stories which spot the beauty of thy budding name. In CIV, he has loved his friend for three years. Three April perfumes in three hot Junes burned. Yet he goes on in the old strain of love and praise, though. What's new to speak, what new to register? In CXCXI he perhaps laments his own profession as a player, perhaps he refers to changes in his affections. Taking the whole of this and the preceding sonnet together, the second seems the more natural interpretation. In sonnet CXI, fortune is blamed. That did not better for my life provide. Then public means which public manners breeds. Thence comes it that my name receives a brand. The name of actor was, indeed, branded as no better than that of vagabond, while the playwriters constantly called the players, apes, and mimics. Here Shakespeare does seem to speak of his profession. I have gone here and there. And made myself a motley to the view. With CXXVII begin sonnets addressed to a woman, a dark lady, but, CXXX, not very beautiful. My mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. This may be a mere criticism of the absurd hyperboles of admiration by contemporary sonneteers. In CXXXII the poet seems to upbraid the lady for taking his friend from him, and through three sonnets this plaint is poured out with obscure puns on, will, and, will, his name, and, some think, his friend's name. The poet is, CXLIV, placed between, two spirits that suggest me still, one good, is a man, one evil, a woman. To win me soon to hell, my female evil. Tempteth my better angel from my side. And would corrupt my saint to be a devil. In addressing the woman, the poet is much more outspoken than when addressing the man on. The pretty wrongs that liberty commits. The poet, like Catullus with Lesbia, loves against his reason and his knowledge of the woman's true nature, CXLVI. Past cure am I, now reason is past care. And frantic mad with evermore unrest. My thoughts and my discourse as madman's are. At random from the truth vainly expressed. For I have sworn thee fair, and thought thee bright. Who art as black as hell, as dark as night. If all this be in earnest, we have a tragedy of the heart, whether in 1594, or in 1598 to 1601, or in neither. Again and again, in his plays, Shakespeare mocks at sonnets and sonneteers. And though his, in parts, are personal, the depth of their significance, and the persistence of his emotions, must be left to the literary instinct of the reader. We cannot reconstruct Shakespeare's self out of his works, lyrical or dramatic. Had the sonnets been recognized as reflecting a scandalous episode in society, it could scarcely have followed that no sequence of such poems was received more coldly. Those of Sidney, Daniel, Drayton, and Constable, were often reprinted. Shakespeare's had not even a second edition till 1640.29. It is unfortunate that literary history can scarcely pass by, 
leaving these strange guesses about a strange matter unnoticed. The sonnets in themselves are a book of golden verse, shining with gems of beautiful phrases. The stretched meter of an antique song. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. The painful warrior famous for fight. After a thousand victories once foiled. Full many a glorious morning have I seen. Flatter the mountain tops with sovereign eye. When in the chronicle of wasted time. I see descriptions of the fairest whites. And beauty making beautiful old rhyme. In praise of ladies dead and lovely knights. Not mine own fears, nor the prophetic soul. Of the wide world dreaming on things to come. This beautiful poem, C.V. most manifestly refers to Shakespeare's forebodings about my true love, who was supposed as forfeit to a confined doom, Southampton, in 1601, was sentenced to captivity for life. But, the mortal moon hath her eclipse endured, that is Elizabeth, Cynthia, is dead, Luna's extinct, as contemporary versifiers said. In this most balmy time, peace proclaims olives of endless age, that is the accession of James the Sixth, and I put an end to fears of wars of a disputed succession. On April 10, 1603, James released Southampton. Thirty the sonnets, like The Floor of Heaven, are thick inlaid with patines of bright gold, dot never to be dimmed by mists of conjecture, or nonsense about Shakespeare as a sensual sycophantic snob, mad with jealousy and foiled desire. Later Plays Returning to the plays, we find, between 1597 and 1601, Shakespeare in his second period, with Henry IV, The Merry Wives of Windsor, Henry V, Much Ado About Nothing, As You Like It, Twelfth Night, and Julius Caesar. Such was the astonishing harvest of five years. Probably, Henry IV is the play which we would retain, could we keep but one, so delightful is Falstaff, the fat knight, the embodiment of the richest humor. He has given us medicines to make us love him, and even the delightful characters of Hotspur, the Mercutio of the history, and of Lady Percy, take a far lower place. We would banish all, and keep honest Jack. Many cannot bear to see Falstaff have much the worse of the jest, as in, The Merry Wives of Windsor, said to have been composed in a fortnight, at the desire of Elizabeth, who wished to see that impossibility, Falstaff in love. The characters of Shallow, Slender, Sir Hugh, even the transient and page, and all the broad humors of life in an English country town, do not console us for the defeat of the hero. It is in, Henry V, that Shakespeare not only emphasizes his love of England, nobly expressed by John of Gaunt in, Richard II, but makes it the mainspring of the drama. The yeoman soldiers in the play frankly tell the disguised king that they doubt the justice of his cause, and well they may, for no man ever had a worse, and Shakespeare must have known it, but, our country, right or wrong. Must be the motto of the playwright, and he puts into Henry's mouth the speeches that still stir the blood like the sound of a trumpet. Much has been written on Henry's hardness to Falstaff, whose heart he broke, but Henry at least acts in accordance with his actual character, a brave, able, ruthless, and hard man, always convinced of his own righteousness. Pistol's braggart humor is as good as ever, and that learned man of the sword, Fluellen, is a forerunner of Scott's Dougal Dalgety. Much Ado About Nothing, As You Like It, and Twelfth Night, 1599-1600, are the three central stars in the crown of Shakespeare's comic muse. More humorous than Henry IV they cannot be, but in them is no admixture of history, and the women in the three are ladies, whereas in Henry IV Lady Percy is the chief contrast with Falstaff's Mrs. Quickly, and her crew. Shakespeare cannot, we may suppose, have lived in the intimate society of the ladies of Elizabeth's court. He must have divined and created Beatrice, a star danced, and under that was she born, and Hero, sweetly bearing the accusations of her intolerable lover, Claudio. I have marked a thousand blushing apparitions to start into her face, a thousand shames in angel whiteness beat away these blushes, and in her eye there hath appeared a fire to burn the errors that these princes hold against her maiden truth. 
The mirth and high spirit of Beatrice, the humors of Benedict, endear the comedy to every reader, yet the end is huddled up, like the ends of many of the plays. Claudio is lightly taken back into favor, with Shakespeare's almost limitless tolerance. He can scarcely ever bring himself to punish one of his rogues, such as Lucio and Paroles, and is as clement to the less deserving Claudio. The mirth of Twelfth Night might border on the farcical, if Sir Toby, Maria, Sir Andrew Aguecheek, and the rest of the light people, were not so delightfully human and living, like their but, Malvolio. And did not Viola and Olivia lend their exquisite grace? Meanwhile, in As You Like It, we fleet our time carelessly as they did in the golden world, under the greenwood tree, in the enchanted company of Rosalind, Touchstone, the greatest of Shakespeare's clowns, and the melancholy and humorous shock. The Contemplator Returning to historical drama, and using North's translation of Plutarch as his material, fusing North's prose into blank verse, he now produced Julius Caesar, in which the chief personages are Brutus, Marcus Antonius, and the Roman populace. Brutus appears as the virtuous and irresolute man, slave to a pedantic conscience which pushes him on to the slaying of great Caesar. All readers note Shakespeare's way of placing a man of nature more or less noble, but irresolute, in a crisis which demands decision. Hamlet, Brutus, and Macbeth are the great examples. It does not follow that Shakespeare himself was irresolute, and that, when he thought of a man who is obliged to take a constant part, he felt that, had he been that man, he would have wavered. He simply chose to illustrate that tragedy of a soul. Where would be the interest in a play of Hamlet had the prince gone straight to his mark and slain the king at sight? There would have been no play. How could we endure a Brutus who, in his relations with Caesar, mobbed and stabbed the greatest of mortals, in a forthright business manner, with no hesitations? If there were not enough of nobility in Macbeth to unman him, he would be a vulgar usurper. When he chose, Shakespeare could design men as true to their single aim as Richard III and Iago. Tragedy requires in the chief sufferer, as the Greeks saw, greatness with a fatal blemish, this idea runs through their poetry from Achilles to the Ajax and Oedipus of Sophocles. The purpose of Brutus, a deed, to reverse his own words, to make whole men sick, when in contemplation, would not let him eat, nor talk, nor sleep. But, once resolved, his heart is steeled, nor does the ghost of Caesar fright him, as the spectres of his fancy appall Macbeth. The other great character is the fickle Roman crowd, played on by the rhetoric of Antony. Shakespeare was not hostile to the people, but the mob he knew, and drew it relentlessly again and again. Hamlet, 1602, is believed to have been based on a lost drama of 1589, perhaps by Kidd. The original source is the History of the Danes by Saxo Grammaticus, and there was a French version by Belforest. Of Shakespeare's play there are three versions, a hopelessly imperfect text in a pirated quarto of 1603. A better, enlarged to almost as much again, 1604, and the folio edition of 1623. None of these is good, as a text, and the inconsistencies of the play may in part be due to an admixture of the old piece, and to tamperings with the manuscript. Of Hamlet, it is vain to speak briefly, and more than enough of speaking at large has been done by a myriad of commentators. The young prince, full of good qualities, is bound with knots which a real Dane of the saga time would have cut with the short sword. But Hamlet has the prophetic soul of the wide world, dreaming of life, and death, and love, and contrary duties. Thus he, like Oedipus in the Greek tragedy, becomes as fatal to all around him as if he bore the evil eye, and while, like David at Ziklag, he is playing the madman, actual madness hangs over him like the sword of Damocles. Thus Shakespeare has left to the world a marvel of subtle and penetrative thought, of tenderness, of humor, to the critics a wrangle over psychological problems. The same unparalleled powers, the same universality, the same gloomy vision of life, and, in King Lear, another study of true and of feigned madness, inspire Lear, Macbeth, and Othello, the last the most piteous of all. For in Othello it is not the error of a wavering hero, or the ambition of a man tempted, like Macbeth, by portents and prophecies, 
but the sheer inborn devilry of a creature in human form, Iago, that breaks. And brings down death on the most innocent of victims, Desdemona. The pity of it is too awful, the sense of wird, of masterful destiny, is too cruel. Yet, if Shakespeare were to write tragedies, and to write them on the traditional materials which are the basis of these plays, it was inevitable that, as he wrote, he should have regarded life as he does. And human fortunes as the spoil of wayward and cruel fate. Aeschylus could not make pretty melancholy pieces out of the materials of the Agamemnon and Eumenides. He, to be sure, tried to justify the ways of the gods to men, and Shakespeare makes no such effort. His characters, in the immortal words of Nicias to his doomed Athenian army, have done what men may, and endure what men must. The rest is silence. Of Troilus and Cressida, 1603, printed 1609, we can only say that Shakespeare when he wrote it, was for one hour less noble than himself. The piece makes mockery, save for Odysseus, of the heroes of Homer, and of Cressida, whom Chaucer treats with such fine chivalry. Thersites is merely loathsome, Ajax a fool, Achilles a treacherous procurer of the death of Hector. Shakespeare made an impossible blend of Homer, of whom he clearly knew a little, 31 of Ovid, and of the medieval forms of the tale of Troy. The elements are wholly incompatible, and the mood of the poet, whether he wrote the play early or late, was unenviable. Unpleasantness is also the not undeserved charge against, measure for measure. But Cynthia's Italian tale, on which it is founded, was a sordid record of lust and cruelty. Shakespeare, altering the plot, redeemed it by the figure of Isabella, and by the sad Mariana in her moated grange. It cannot be denied that when Shakespeare added Timon of Athens, the tragedy of a misanthrope, to Troilus, and then produced the extremely unpleasant scenes in Pericles, which is not in the folio of 1623. The first edition of his collected plays, he was selecting topics that encouraged the belief in his own bitterness of spirit, while in Antony and Cleopatra, the magnificent study of The Serpent of Old Nile, and of the ruin she wrought. He continues his vein of thought on the accidents that bring courage and greatness to the dust. In Coriolanus, he contrasts the fickleness of the mob with an heroic soul ruined by its relentless exaggeration of its own merits and overweening greatness, the tragedy of Napoleon is a modern instance. Dating the play in 1608 to 1609, critics derive the character of the mother of Coriolanus from Shakespeare's thoughts of his own mother, who died in 1608. Of her character, of course, we know absolutely nothing. The tranquility of Cymbeline, so rich in poetry, and so recklessly constructed, of the Winter's Tale, where the poetry is yet more divine, and the plot is as heaven pleases. And of The Tempest, 1613, where much of the local color is derived from the adventures of English seamen in the Bermudas, 1609 to 1610, is explained by the resignation of increasing years. We cannot reason thus with much confidence. Shakespeare could only have produced The Tempest in the plenitude of his genius, but he might have created it as it stands at any date after 1596, when he happened to take up the materials. Henry VIII was being played in 1613 when the Globe Theatre was burned. That parts are by Shakespeare, parts by Fletcher, is a theory resting on the elusive internal evidence of style and quality. From 1611 till his death in 1616, Shakespeare is thought to have lived mainly at home, at Stratford, where his daughters married men in their own situation of life. Shakespeare died on April 23, 1616. By 1623 his monument in Stratford Church had been erected. Ben Jonson wrote, I loved the man and do honor his memory, on this side idolatry, as much as any. He was indeed honest, and of an open and free nature. Shakespeare, in accordance with Greek and Roman wisdom, had chosen the fall into his Semita Vitae, in his private course he was studiously obscure. His all-embracing and unparalleled genius was exhibited only in his art, and in his profession by which he lived and prospered. He had carried blank verse from the point at which Marlowe left it to a never-equaled pitch of various perfection. While his lyrics are worthy of all the angels singing out of heaven. 
His creations of character are in number, variety, and excellence, unrivaled, he touched with the surest hand every chord in the human heart. He explored every height and depth, and despite the inevitable stains left by his age, and the haste necessitated by his profession, his work attains the high water mark of human genius. Johnson Ben Johnson, born 1572-73, is believed to have been descended from the Annandale border clan of the Johnstones. His father, after suffering troubles under Mary Tudor, became a Protestant preacher. Ben was a posthumous child, his mother's second husband was a bricklayer or builder. The boy was educated at Westminster School, under Camden, the antiquarian and historian, to whom he more than once expressed his gratitude. His name as an undergraduate is not found in the records of either Oxford or Cambridge. Johnson did not long practice his stepfather's useful art, he served through a campaign in Flanders, and told Drummond of Hawthornden that he slew, in single combat, a champion of the enemy. He had more than a literary acquaintance with the fencing terms which his captain Bobadil uses with so much gusto. Returning to England he fell among actors and playwrights, is mentioned as a tragedian by Mears, Pilatus Tamia, in 1598, was challenged by an actor, Gabriel Spencer, whom he slew in fair fight, was imprisoned, turned Catholic, not for long. And, on his release, married. By 1596 he had worked with very minor playwrights at Forgotten Plays, and had tinkered at The Spanish Tragedy. He now wrote Every Man in His Humor, an early form of the play, which he revised. Removing the scene from Florence to London, for its repetition in 1598, when Shakespeare's company were the players. In the prologue he ridiculed, as Sidney had done, the reckless early dramas, in which the hero lives a long life on the stage, while three rusty swords furnish forth a stage army, and squibs and stage thunder delight the audience. He aims at good-humoured comedy of everyday life, laughs at such errors as you'll all confess, and in Master Stephen draws a shadowy shallow, a predecessor of Bob Akers, while that stock figure, the poltroon bragging copper captain Bobadil, survives in loving memory as an excellent study in a familiar character part, the Miles Gloriosus of the Roman comedian. The personages are citizens of the day, the anxious father, the downright squire, town gull, or dupe, Master Matthew, to match the country gull, the melancholy and gentlemanlike Master Stephen, while kitely illustrates the humors of jealousy. The characters are types, each with his humor, or ruling passion of foible, and the standing but is Hieronimo in Kidd's Spanish tragedy. As the author parodies forgotten plays, and makes use of forgotten catchwords, it may justly be said that much of his humor still remains in obscurity. In Shakespearean humor, with its sweet tolerance, enduring quality, and sympathy in gentle melancholy, Ben is totally deficient. His humors are idiosyncrasies or fads or ruling passions carried into ludicrous extremes. The success of Every Man in His Humor prompted Every Man Out of His Humor, acted in 1599, by Shakespeare's company, and printed, containing more than hath been publicly spoken or acted, in 1600. Johnson was as eager to print his plays as Shakespeare was indifferent. The comedy was much too long, and had been cut severely by the players. It has a kind of chorus of spectators and critics, and is an exhibition of humors, the word was then a piece of popular slang, or types. Sobliardo is an amusing bourgeois gentilhomme, who, like Shakespeare, lacks what he calls a cullison, scutcheon, and will stick at no expense to purchase one. The romantic and euphuistic humors of Puntarvolo and his lady are excellent fooling. Massillant, the bitterly envious, suggests, in a more tragic style, his contemporary, Scott Sir Mungo Malagrother, in The Fortunes of Nigel. The coxcomb, fastidious brisk, is an agreeable rattle, especially in his account of his duel and his dresses, boots, hat, and jewelry. And the compliment by Massillant to the Queen is charmingly courtly, coming from that blustering mountain of a man, the author. But the play was not a success. For this, or for any other reason, perhaps because they cut down his plays into manageable size, Ben quarreled with the actors, Shakespeare's company, and began to write satirical plays on the players. 
and on the poets who were more successful than himself, or who had theories that were not his about how plays should be written, about art, in his favorite phrase. In different moods he spoke differently about Shakespeare's art, now saying that he had none, now that without art and labor Shakespeare could not have produced his true filed phrases. Cynthia's Revels, 1600, was acted by The Children of the Royal Chapel and printed in 1601. New scenes were added in the folio edition of 1616. A lively prologue is acted by the boys, who quarrel for the privilege of speaking it. One of them mimics a coxcomb spectator, with three sorts of tobacco to smoke on the stage. Among the humors of the court, Kreitz is taken to represent the author himself, this Kreitz is sour. The exquisite song, Ex Forty Dulcido, Queen and Huntress, Chaste and Fair, outlives the humors, and the satire, which was personal, for the gentlemen of the press and stage, then, as now, liked personal controversy, it is such easy writing. The poet Astor, 1601, runs amuck against actors. They forget that they are in the statute, against vagabonds, the rascals, they are blazoned there, they and their pedigrees, they need no other heralds, I Wisconsin. This was an anachronism, at the court of Augustus, the scene of the play, but appropriate to Shakespeare's new scutcheon. The loves of Ovid and Julia, Virgil reading the Aeneid to Augustus, are mixed with contemporary satire to which Decker replied in Satyromastix, or The Untrussing of the Humorous Poet, acted by Shakespeare's Company, 1602. Marston, Crispinus, was also assailed, and war raged on the lower slopes of the Muses' Hill. Since the beginnings of the theatre, playwriters have parroted and mocked each other's works, as Aristophanes caricatured Euripides, as ancient pistol parroted Marlowe's Jades of Asia. And Moliere made mirth of the tragedies played by the company of the Hotel de Bourgogne. But Ben, though a huge, noisy, and truculent adversary, was placable, and he and Marston became friends. Much ingenuity has been spent in detecting hits at Shakespeare in Ben's plays and epigrams. Very probably some of his cutting allusions are aimed at his successful rival, but it needs two to make a quarrel. When James VI of Scotland came to the English throne, and lived no longer on the allowance of £3,000 a year from Elizabeth, he spent very largely on elaborate masks, courtly entertainments. Not unlike the ballets in which Louis XIV later danced his parts. The hosts of Greek mythology were let loose on the stage, all the sea nymphs, daughters of Oceanus, for example, floating in a shell of mother of pearl, among tritons better schooled in their parts than honest Mike Lamborn in Kenilworth. The dresses scenery, and decorations, the bodily parts, were of Master Inigo Jones's design and act, see, The Mask of Blackness, 1605. The queen and the court ladies acted, or at least appeared as sea nymphs, and Ben produced the words, which were deeply learned, and the exquisite songs. Unrefined as he was, he became intimate with hospitable and generous lords and ladies. Their gifts and his payment from the royal coffers in pensions were of more profit to him than his plays, for which he said that he received only two hundred pounds. It is hardly necessary to add that he had bitter quarrels with Inigo Jones. Johnson's Roman tragedy, Sejanus, 1603, on the fortunes and fall of that favorite of the Emperor Tiberius, is deeply learned. The author, in the printed version, gave references in footnotes, to his authorities, Tacitus, Juvenal, Suetonius, and many others, as if he had been writing a severe work of history. Nothing can be less like Shakespeare's Roman tragedies, with his free handling of North's translation of Plutarch, with his wild mobs, and murder done openly. Ben was classical and accurate. His Romans speak a stately blank verse, his Tiberius, slow, formal, hypocritical, and deceitful above all things, is the Tiberius of Tacitus, his all-daring Sejanus is a less candid Richard III. And though Ben admitted that the ancient chorus, with its chants, was impossible on the English stage, he was, in other respects, conscientiously classical. The whole heavy air of Rome, the terror, the duplicity, the political influence of women, their passion, the servility and the discontent, live in a somewhat ponderous blank verse, of which Ben first wrote the matter in prose. An Uninspired Method
The Catalan and his conspiracy, acted 1611, did not please the populace, nor the court much, as Ben admits in a quotation from Horace, in these jig-given times he asked Pembroke's patronage for a legitimate poem. In fact Johnson with all his amazing energy, vigor, and appreciation of character, that of Cicero is excellent, was too pedantic, and the orations of his Cicero were too long for the stage. The odes of the chorus were not apt to increase the pleasure of the audience. Ben's recognized comic masterpieces were The Fox, Volpone, first acted at the universities, then at the Globe, 1605. The Silent Woman, 1609, The Alchemist, 1610, and Bartholomew Fair, 1614. Both in The Fox and The Alchemist, there is something that reminds us of Marlowe. The Fox, Volpone, a Venetian Magnifico, a childless man, for years pretends to be dying, surrounded by his little court of obscene depravities, and aided by his parasite, Mosca, dulls men who, each in his degree, is an incarnation of cruel greed. Volpone is a voluptuary in his devilish delight in human corruption. The aged Corbaccio he tempts to disinherit his son. The madly jealous Corbino he tempts to prostitute his wife, from the avaricious Voltor and from all of them he wrings rich presents. It is a mask of the deadly sins, and behind them stands murder, hesitating between poison, the dagger, and the smothering pillow, for all the fortune hunters would slay their tormentor if they dared. The scene with the English lady would be, an affected literary lady, who tires Volpone to death with literary chatter, is more than the rest in the true spirit of comedy. Celia, the suffering wife of Corbino, and Bonario, the young son of the evil dotard, Corbaccio, alone represent the soul of good in things evil. The plot is ingeniously entangled and untied, and justice can scarcely add to the torments which the characters owe to their own insatiate greed. In The Alchemist, three scoundrels, occupying by connivance of a servant an empty house, and captained by subtle, an alchemist, play on the greed and lust of many, connies. These each, in Johnson's way, represent a humor. Sir Epicure Mammon, the city knight, is all for unlimited lust, secured by the elixir of life and the philosopher's stone. He is as eager as Faustus for the unlimited, and as learned in his gloating discourses as Johnson himself, who, in subtle, displays all his knowledge of the jargon of alchemy. Dole Common, the decoy, the fairy queen, has an extensive and peculiar knowledge of Billingsgate, Abel Drugger, the tobacconist, hopes to prosper in his trade by magical spells. The gamester, Pertinax Surly, strong in his own marked cards and loaded dice, has a salutary skepticism. And the two Puritans, Ananias and Tribulation Wholesome, are ready for anything which will supply finance for their godly crew of anarchists at Amsterdam. Ben well understood these extreme fanatics, a sect of dangerous consequence that will have no king, but a presbytery, said Queen Elizabeth. They were soon to put an end to Merry England, and, when we look at the quality of much of the mirth in the later Jacobean plays, we are not enamoured of either party in the conflict. The play, with its constant bustle was and long remained popular. So did Bartholomew Fair, a colossal exhibition of a London festival, with all the humours of the joyous populace, interrupted by Rabbi Busy, the fanatic, who has eaten more roast pig than any one and rushes about denouncing all the other Dagons, and idols, like a bloated English tartuffe, le pauvre um. The stocks do not daunt him, his tongue remains as free as Mao's hedrigs. In an introduction to this enormous burlesque Johnson throws scoffs at, the tempest, of Shakespeare. The silent woman, is truly a roaring farce on a singular subject, morose, a gentleman as impatient of noise, and as certain that all silence except his own was golden, as the sage of Chelsea. How he is saddled with a wife who, from being mim as a mouse, becomes the most vociferous of roaring boys, and, indeed to the confusion of some boastful gallants. Is a boy pranked up for the practical jokes whereby Morose nephew extracts Morose money, may be read, with much other mirthful noisy matter, by the curious. The Devil is an Ass, 1616, is a satire on conjurers, crystal gazers, projectors, or, as we say, promoters, of bubble enterprises, and their gulls and connies. 
A Walking Tour to Scotland, 1618-1619, where Johnson was entertained by Drummond of Hawthornden, had for its fruit Drummond's brief notes of his conversation and literary opinions. He did not care much for Drummond's Petrarchian sonnets, cross rhymes. And, as to Shakespeare, whom Drummond himself does not seem to have appreciated, merely said that he wanted art and that, in his geography, he was wrong when he gave Bohemia a sea coast. Happily Ben left splendid tributes otherwhere, in verses attached to the first collected edition of Shakespeare's plays, The Folio, 1623, and in prose, to Shakespeare's genius and character. Drummond's estimate of Ben as a braggart about himself, and a contemner of others, as jealous and vindictive, is only true in part. No man had more or more admiring friends. At taverns he reigned, among the great wits sealed of the tribe of Ben, like an earlier Dryden. His last plays, The New Inn, The Magnetic Lady, and The Tale of a Tub, were badly received, in an ode he left the loathed stage. And the more loathsome age. He lost his place of maskmaker in 1632, but was still befriended by Charles I. He died on August 6, 1637, before the troubles of the covenant came to a head. His great collection of books and his treatise on the poetics of Aristotle and the art of poetry of Horace had already been destroyed by a fire. Many of his beautiful lyrics exhibit that grace, delicacy, and, in the best sense, poetry which are not conspicuous in his plays. His throne is not with the Olympians but with the Titans, and Tennyson could not endure the gloom which he found in Johnson's comedies. Scott, on the other hand, seems to have known them almost by heart and constantly quotes them, and, indeed, the whole host of minor Elizabethan playwrights. The learning of Johnson, in Greek no less than in Latin, is a marvel which is a wonder how his grace should glean it. In his prodigious activity of production, his immortal lyrics attest the delicacy and grace which seldom inspire his plays, and, indeed, are most noted in The Lover, a scholar and a gentleman, of his incoherent play, The New Inn, 1629. Ben's drama is the work of a made writer, the fruit of reflection on what the stage ought to be, and of ponderous industry and diligent observation. We feel that the plays, despite their richness and vigor, their masculine energy, are somewhat prolix, rather pedantic, and they do not hold the stage, like those of Shakespeare, at whom Ben scratched so often. Without moving the master to reply in kind. Johnson's Prose It is not easy to sympathize with the sweet enthusiasts who place Ben Johnson's timber, or discoveries made upon men and matter, above Bacon's essays. These sayings, maxims, and very brief essays were mainly written when Ben was old, and not yet wise enough to be contented. He appears as a contemner of times present, when the poet is no longer taken at his own estimate, which, in Johnson's case, was rather high. Many of the discoveries had, not infrequently or of recent date, been discovered before. Thus of fortune, that which happens to any man, may to every man but it is in his reason what he accounts it, and will make it. This has been put more briefly and better, nothing is good or bad but thinking makes it so. Nothing can be more trite than this of waste of time, but the expression is admirable, what a deal of cold business doth a man, and do most women, miss spend the better part of life in. In scattering compliments, tendering visits, gathering and venting news, following feasts and plays, making a little winter love in a dark corner. But Johnson was not profuse in venting compliments, and, with his enormous reading, can hardly have spent much time in paying calls. The sentences on the decay of taste are passed by elderly men of letters in all ages on railing and tinkling rhymers, whose writings the vulgar more greedily read. Expectation of the vulgar is more drawn with newness than goodness, yet a poet is nothing if he has not something new in manner if not in matter. Johnson says that his memory was once excellent, till he was past forty. Certainly it had ceased to be trustworthy, he attributes to Homer what Homer never said, and to Orpheus what Homer did say. Ben finds the new poems in his old age so bad that a man never would light his tobacco with them. We all remember his sentences on Shakespeare, 
and, how there was ever more in him to be praised than to be pardoned. He had three ways of viewing Shakespeare, one when he had well drunk, and was magnificent, as Howell tells us, about himself and his muse. Thus he said to Hawthornden that Shakespeare wanted art, and did not know that Bohemia lacks a sea coast. The second way is that of his discoveries. The third and excellent way is in his poem, in which he speaks of Shakespeare as the mind of the great world does. He was not for an age but for all time. Was greater than. The comparison. Of all that insolent Greece or haughty Rome. Sent forth. Or since did from their ashes come. To the oratory of Bacon he gives the same praise in the same noble measure. I have in due reverence him for the greatness that was only proper to himself. Against Machiavel's, a prince should exercise his cruelty by his ministers and not by himself, Johnson nobly replies, but I say he puts off man, and goes into a beast, that is cruel, though indeed beasts are not wittingly cruel. And the man that is cruel goes into a devil. Johnson is always manly, his thoughts are ponderous and just rather than remarkable for novelty, they do not cling, like Bacon's, to the memory of the race, nor shine in so many facets with such imperishable colors. XX Other Dramatists Beaumont and Fletcher John Fletcher was born at Rye in December, 1579. Being the son of that Dean of Peterborough who troubled the last moments of Mary, Queen of Scots, and later was Bishop, successively, of Bristol, Worcester, and London. Very early, aged about twelve, the son entered Benet College, Cambridge, but before he was seventeen the death of his father, in poverty, caused him to leave the university. We hear no more of him, on sound authority, till he began to write plays with Francis Beaumont, born in 1584, the third son of Sir Francis Beaumont of Gracedieu, a judge. In 1597 Beaumont entered Pembroke College, Oxford, then known as Broadgates Hall, three years later he entered the Inner Temple. In 1605 Beaumont wrote some prefatory verses to Johnson's play The Fox, Valpone, as also did Fletcher. Phil Astor, 1610, is believed to have been the first play composed in their prolific partnership, but it was also attributed to Beaumont alone. Beaumont died in March, 1616, the death year of Shakespeare, Fletcher in 1625. One need not be a Charles Lamb to discover that, after all, Beaumont and Fletcher were but an inferior sort of Sidney's and Shakespeare's. But perhaps only a reader who is himself a poet can discover, with Mr. Swinburne's certainty, in Beaumont, the gifts of tragic pathos and passion, of tender power and broad strong humor. In Fletcher, a more fiery and fruitful force of invention, a more aerial ease and swiftness of action, a more various readiness and fullness of bright original speech. Others cannot pretend to assign to each author, or to their various allies, their own contributions to each of the fifty-two dramas, which Mr. Swinburne suspected Coleridge of never having really read. Whether Coleridge did or did not carefully peruse the fourteen stout volumes of Weber's edition, it is certain that very few people are more industrious. A French critic, M. Jusra affirms that a friendly hand could make a pleasing selection of scenes, displaying tragical vigor, eloquence, poetry, wit, and that the selection would give the falsest idea of their work. For the lugubrious and the ribald were their chief domain. At all events other qualities than ribaldry will win their readers at present, and it is unnecessary to direct readers to a play in which a woman makes the very satyrs blush at her sight. Coleridge thought it would be interesting to settle a question of statistics, how many of these plays are founded on rapes, how many on incestuous passions, and how many on mere lunacies. Mr. Swinburne provided the statistics, plays 52, rapes 2, incestuous passions 0, lunacies 2. In the throng of plays by Beaumont and Fletcher, of which a folio edition was published in 1647. An uncertain amount of the writing was ascribed to Massinger, it must suffice to speak of but a few. The bald analysis of any of these Jacobean dramas cannot do justice to its merits. The plots of the greatest dramas, those of the Athenian stage and of Shakespeare, rest, now on history, now on inventions of prehistoric antiquity, myths and legends. 
The story of Lear has elements as impossible, and as primitive, as the stories of Oedipus or of Thyestes. The events are monstrous, people don't do these things, but they afford to the dramatist great situations, and they were already familiar in tradition. The events in The Maid's Tragedy, on the other hand, could not have occurred, and have no traditional source. There have been callous and profligate kings, but Charles II, who declared that, in my reign all tragedies must end happily, and for whom Waller later made The Maid's Tragedy end happily, did not seduce innocent girls. Hand them over as brides to courtiers who were already betrothed to other ladies, and retain his victims as his mistresses. The king in The Maid's Tragedy does these things, and is a moral monster. Amin Tor being in love with Aspatia, and she with him, the king forces him, for loyalty and passive obedience are his guiding stars, to reject Aspatia, and wed Evadne, whom nobody suspects of being the royal mistress. At courts, however, these graces are not hid. The bridal eve is not much enlivened by a mask of Neptune and Aeolus, and is saddened by the wails and prophecies of the forlorn Aspatia. Other bridesmaids talk ribaldry enough, but the bridegroom, whose heart is with Aspatia, feels. A grief shoots suddenly through all my veins. Mine eyes rain, this is strange at such a time. The bride receives him coldly. A man has wronged her, will he slay that man? She names the king, to cover shame I took thee, she says. The situation, with the horror-stricken loyalty of Amintor, his heart already a chaos of remorse, regret, and desire. The implacable resolution of Evadne, the murderous Magdalene, whose penitence is of one crimson color with her sin, is undeniably tragically great. Ribaldries as of Pandarus in Troilus and Cressida greet the happy pair in the morning. The secret reaches Melanthius, brother of Evadne in the king's bravest captain. Evadne binds the sleeping king in his bed, wakens him, taunts him, and stabs him for her husband, her brother, and herself. Aspatia disguises herself as her own avenging brother, challenges a mean Tor who has deserted her, strikes him, kicks him, at last he draws, and she falls by the hand of the man she loves. Evadne enters, red-handed from regicide. Am I not fair? Looks not Evadne beauteous with these rites? The seeming dead speaks. I am Aspatia yet. And takes farewell. Amin Tor stabs himself, but not before Evadne has set him the example. Had Ophelia fallen by the sword of Hamlet the tragedy would not have been deeper. Phil Astor, again, is a romantic comedy, that deserves its second title, Love Lies a Bleeding. Phil Astor is kept out of his royalty by the king, who is wedding his daughter, Arethusa, beloved by Phil Astor, to Pharamond, Prince of Spain, a random debauchee. His intrigue with the audacious wanton Megra, a court lady, and the besetting of him by the armed burgesses, devoted to Phil Astor, yield the grim comic material. Phil Astor gives his page, Bellario, really the disguised Euphrasia, who loves him, to Arethusa. She is accused of an intrigue with the page, who is the soul of loyalty to her and to Phil Astor. He, in jealousy, rejects both his lady and his page, they meet in a forest, he dismisses Bellario, and bids Arethusa stab him, or he will stab her. We are two. Earth cannot bear at once. He does stab her, and is attacked by a country fellow, who wounds him, he then flies from some of the court who are approaching. Finding Bellario asleep in a glade, Philaster wounds her. So that the pursuers, who have no mark to know me but my blood, may suppose Bellario to be the assailant of Arethusa. Oh, my heart, what a varlet's this, to offer manslaughter upon the harmless gentlewoman, we may cry, with the grocer's wife in, the night of the burning pestle. We, could hurl things at him, at Phil Astor, whose jealousy does not palliate his cruelty and treachery. Through many complications the plot wins its way, Bellario, who is about to be tortured, proves to be a woman, both she and Arethusa survive. Phil Astor, of whom nobody thinks the worse, marries Arethusa, Pharamond is mobbed, all ends happily except for that most pathetic of patient grizzles, Bellario, who remains contented in the happiness of the others. The purity and sweetness of Arethusa, 
the loyalty of the loving Bellario, and her beautiful speeches, cannot enable this play to escape the blame of being unnatural and repulsive. The naked analysis of the plays of this age, is, of course, no fair criterion of their merit. A bare exposure of the plot of Cymbeline would deter a man from reading it. The authors are protected by the magic of their poetry, which conveys them off in a golden cloud as Aphrodite saved Aeneas. A bare analysis of A King and No King, 1611, with the alternate valor and nobility, brag, and unintelligible clemencies and ferocities of Arbuses, king of Iberia, who has defeated and captured Tigranes, king of Armenia, would move the most austere to mirth. But there is a method in the apparent madness of Arbuses. And Bessus, the braggart poltroon, is an officer worthy to fight under the same standard as Paroles and Bobadil, while virtue and happiness are kept for Arbuses and Panthea, Tigranes and the faithful Spaconia. Through the sudden revelation of Gobrias, the Lord Protector, that Arbuses is a warming pan pretender, and neither son of Queen Arain, who unceasingly tries to have him stabbed or poisoned, nor the brother of Panthea. The last tragedies are The False One and Valentinian. Concerning Thierry and Theodoret, it is not pleasant to speak out, and it is not honest to be silent. Derived, we are told, from the French chronicles of the reign of Clotaire II, the play is rancid with the humours of the lowest London haunts. Marked by wild anachronisms, the Merovingian troops carry muskets, and crammed with impossible crimes. For a contrast we have the eloquence of Thierry, poisoned by a handkerchief that robs him of sleep, after he has been drugged to deprive him of offspring, and the spotless virtues of his wife Ordella. Whom Thierry has been on the point of sacrificing to the gods. The blank verse almost uniformly moves with a loose superfluous foot, as the most remarkable thing in which kings differ from private men, and so on, is a specimen. There is a pearl to be found on this dust heap, the stainless Ordella, the most perfect idea of the female heroic character, says Lamb, but she is found after we have passed through a malodorous labyrinth of unnatural and violent situations. Plays like this, or even like, the Spanish comedy, which opens pleasantly and humorously, and in the cure in his sexton suggests the influence of Cervantes, but closes in a mist of evil passions. Give some show of reason to the opinion of our French critic. A friendly hand selecting with care, might give all of Beaumont and Fletcher's that can please readers not specially devoted to the study of the drama. Even in the beautiful scenes of The Faithful Shepherdess, in poetry worthy of Spencer's pastoral vein, the author, quite needlessly, introduces a shepherdess who resembles the Brunhalt of Thierry and Theodoret, as Brunhalt may have been in girlhood. The Knight of the Burning Pestle, on the other hand, with the grocer critic who insists on a play in which a grocer shall do admirable things. With the humors of the grocer's wife, and the quixotic adventures of Ralph, the apprentice, is lively, and, says the prologue, has endeavored, to be far from unseemly words to make your ears glow. Yet, in the jail delivery of the barber, the authors go out of their way to find ugly ribaldries. Famous among the comedies are, The Scornful Lady, The Humorous Lieutenant, The Wild Goose Chase, and, The Little French Doctor. The lyrics and songs are especially beautiful, even in the Elizabethan wealth of song. A peculiarity of Fletcher's blank verse is his fondness for redundant syllables at the close, and indeed anywhere in the line. This manner was gaining on Shakespeare in his latest plays, and, in authors after Fletcher, led to the decay, almost to the death, of blank verse. Yet Fletcher's lines, as before Marlowe and Shakespeare, were often end stopped, the sense closed with the close of each line, this is not the manner of Shakespeare, or of Beaumont. In his later days Fletcher went for his plots to Spanish tales and romances. Chapman The date of the birth, near Hitchin, of George Chapman, conjecturally placed in 1559, is unknown. He was at Oxford in 1574. The exactness of his scholarship must not be estimated by his translation of Homer, translations, whether in prose or verse, did not then aim at precision. In 1594 he published The Shadow of Night, 
containing verses which have been used to support the theory that he was the poet concerning whose favor Shakespeare expresses uneasiness in his sonnets. He wrote a conclusion to Marlowe's Hero and Leander, attempted the luscious, which did not suit his genius, in Ovid's Banquet of Sense. Celebrated Henry, Prince of Wales, in The Tears of Peace, is mentioned as a dramatist by Mears in 1598, and in that year published his version of Seven Books of the Iliad, not the first seven, while he finished his Iliad in 1611. His Odyssey, some years later. Thanks mainly to the perfect sonnet of Keats, Chapman's Homer is the work by which his memory is kept green except among special students of the Elizabethan drama. To have made Homer common coin was a great benefit to the English public, that had known only the medieval romances based on Ionian, 700 BC, Athenian, and Roman perversions of the poet. The Iliad he did into fourteeners, a jigging old measure, thirty-two, a splendid swinging meter, says Sainsbury, better able than any other English meter to cope with the body as well as the rhythm of the English hexameter. Tastes differ. Here are four lines, Iliad, 15, 596 to 600. The poet speaks of Zeus. For Hector's glory still he stood, and ever went about. To make him cast the fleet such fire as never should go out. Heard Thetis' foul petition, and wished in any wise. The splendor of the burning ships might satiate his eyes. The last line alone would suffice to exhibit Chapman's own splendor at his best, says a critic, and this may be the best of Chapman. But it does not express the meaning of Homer, who says nothing about the foulness of the prayer of Thetis, and whose Zeus does not desire to satiate his eyes with the splendor of the burning ships, but to see one ship set on fire. As, on that signal, he intends to cause the instant rout of the Trojans. It will be observed that Chapman here compresses four Greek hexameters into four English fourteeners. And that the movement of his verse is as rapid as the nature of the fourteener permits. He is, however, rugged and obscure and overloads the simplicity of Homer with Elizabethan conceits of his own invention. The Odyssey he rendered into heroic couplets with a free movement, and, had he been more sparing of his own conceits, the version would be more satisfactory. Unhappily no English measure represents the Homeric hexameter. In 1604-5, Chapman with Marston was imprisoned for a very faint piece of satire on the Scots, in Eastward Ho, and Ben Jonson, who had been no partner to the passage, as a collaborator in Thai play magnanimously insisted on sharing the punishment. Chapman's comedy, all Fools opens with an imitation of a play of Terence, followed by Moliere in Les Coles de Perez. We have the sensible and indulgent, and the severe and deceived father. But the plot becomes painfully involved, and jokes on cuckolds are no longer so delightful as they were for two centuries to English taste. His other comedies are not below the level of his contemporaries, excluding Shakespeare and Johnson. Among Chapman's plays on contemporary French history, the two on Bussy d'Amboise very much from Byron's, Byron's, Conspiracy, and The Tragedy of Charles, Duke of Byron. Bussy d'Amboise has all the faults of fustian, obscurity, bloodshed, torture exercised on the stage, and great palpable ghosts. A friar is the go-between of Le Brave Bussy and Madame de Montsoreau, Chapman's, Tamira, Countess of Montsoreau. He appears and disappears through a trap door, and when he dies, Umbra Friar, the ghost of the holy man, keeps on the business still. Mount Surrey, Montsoreau, too, disguised as the friar, is very busy. A magician summons Behemoth, a monstrous fiend with whom Joan of Arc was accused of being too familiar. Tamira is stabbed frequently on the stage, to make her write a letter inviting Bussy to a fatal tryst. And next, being tortured, she complies and writes in her own blood. Bussy is overpowered by numbers and slain. Charles Lamb admired a long description of a duel between six minions of Henry III, three on each side. The Nuncius, the messenger, a looker-on, tells how Bussy charged his foe exactly as, in his youth, the Nuncius had seen a unicorn charge an Armenian jeweler, and nailed him with his rich antler to a tree. 
In The Revenge of Bussy, his ghost enters and dances with the ghosts of the Duc de Guise, the Cardinal, and Chatillon. The lookers-on are surprised, believing the Guises to be alive and well, when Aumel enters with the news that both have just teen assassinated. The Revenge contains some very noble passages of reflection, in which Chapman always shines, and some reminiscences of Homer. The ghosts, though affable familiar sprites, might be excused by the example of Seneca's tragedies. Dryden found in Bussy d'Ambois a hideous mingle of false poetry and true nonsense, but not all of the poetry is false. There are, indeed, in Chapman's blank verse, passages of exquisite beauty and charm, praise which cannot be denied to passages in the works of all his contemporaries in dramatic writing. John Marston John Marston was of an old Shropshire family, he is supposed to have been born in 1575 and educated at Coventry School. He was a member of Bracenose College, Oxford. His father intended him to be a barrister, but observes in his will that, man proposeth but God disposeth. He wrote satires first, and then plays, later took orders, in 1616 received the living of Christchurch in Hampshire, and died in London in 1634. His plays had been collected and published in 1633. Marston's earliest publications, under the assumed name of Kinsader, 1598, were The Metamorphosis of Pygmalion's Image, with certain satires, and, in the same year, The Scourge of Villainy. As to Pygmalion, my wanton muse lasciviously doth sing. He says, the verses are in the stanza of Venus and Adonis. With a cheerful anachronism, Pygmalion, having made his ivory statue of a woman, invokes the shade of Ovid, who lived much after his time. At his prayer the statue lives, and Marston ceases to sing lasciviously. Of the satires we may say in the words addressed by Mr. Toots to the chicken, the language is coarse and the meaning is obscure. The first attacks one Ruscus, for writing, like Mr. Toots, letters to himself. Parasites and boasting soldados are also satirized. A quarrel with Hall who styled himself the first English satirist, arose, the authors of The Return from Parnassus, 1601, spoke of Marston with coarse but effective contempt. In 1599 this new poet sold a play to Henslow. His Antonio and Melida, Sophonisba, What You Will, and The Malcontent, a misanthrope, as in Moliere and Wycherley, do not receive much praise even from the greatest enthusiasts for the old drama. In the dedication to The Malcontent, Marston made up his quarrel with Ben Jonson, whom he had assailed in Satyromastics, in reply to Ben's Poet Aster, 1601, not before Ben, according to his own account, had beaten him. In 1605 Marston joined Chapman and Ben in composing Eastward Ho. The remarks on the Scots, for which the authors were imprisoned, are merely such as Dr. Johnson used to make for the purpose of teasing Boswell. The play, on the whole, is a very good-humoured study of life in London, rather in Hogarth's manner, with the honest goldsmith, his industrious and his idle apprentice, his ambitious daughter, who would marry a knight with a castle in the air. His quiet daughter, betrothed to the industrious apprentice, the usual number of jokes connected with horns and local colour that was useful to Scott in The Fortunes of Nigel. Probably Marston did little in this favourite comedy. He wearied of playwriting, and was contemptuous of his own works, and careless of his own fame. Decker Thomas Decker, as genial as Marston is crabbed, was a playwright and bookseller's hack, concerning whose life little is known except that he was one of Henslow's hands in 1597, was redeemed by Henslow from prison in the poultry in 1598 and was still producing pamphlets in 1637. A Londoner by birth, he knew some Dutch, and as his Brian in The Honest Whore proves a little Gaelic. His most popular work in prose was The Gull's Hornbook, which is full of the details of life in the taverns, the thieves, the bona robus, usurers, fops, gamblers, all the world which is best known to the modern reader in The Fortunes of Nigel. The social historian finds matter gloomy enough as a rule, in The Wonderful Year of the Accession of James I, and The Seven Deadly Sins of London shows a helpless horror of the crowded poverty of the town. 
Mr. Swinburne found in one of Decker's tracks a genius akin to Goldsmith's, Thackeray's, Stern's, Moliere's, Dickens's, and not unlike Shakespeare's, with Goldsmith he is often compared, he has given men medicines to make them love him. Decker collaborated with other playwrights, and his contributions are discerned by the bewildering light of internal evidence. Of his own pieces, The Shoemaker's Holiday, 1600, is a broadly cheerful comedy, The Jolly Son of Asti. Hugh, Simon Eyre, becomes Lord Mayor, and, in the upper plot, the hero, Lacey, is very readily pardoned after deserting his regiment in France to woo another mayor's daughter in the disguise of a shoemaker. The Honest Whore, in two parts, shows Bellafront as a Magdalene redeemed by a sudden love which does not find its earthly close. She marries a scamp to whom, in the second part, she plays the patient Grizzle, backed by her father disguised as an old serving man. There is abundance of the inevitable ribaldry. In a play devoted to Patient Gristle, that ideal of the dramatists, occurs the lovely lyric, Art thou poor, yet hast thou golden slumbers. In Old Fortunatus, in the story of the magical purse, is Fortune's kind, cry holiday, other pretty songs occur in The Sun's Darling, Ford and Decker. Satyromastics, as we have seen, secures for Decker the praise of audacity, for no craven would have attacked Ben Jonson. There are fine tirades of imaginative blank verse in Fortunatus. Decker admired a thoroughly good woman, whether converted or needing no conversion, as most of his fraternity and as Fielding did. But Fortune, if she sometimes cried holiday to Decker, was never kind. He is best remembered for his songs and for the words. The best of men. That air wore earth about him was a sufferer. A soft, meek, patient, humble, tranquil spirit. The first true gentleman that ever breathed. When Lamb tells us that Decker had poetry enough for anything, when Mr. Swinburne declares that Decker was endowed in the highest degree with the gifts of graceful and melodious fancy, tender and cordial humor, vivid and pathetic realism, a spontaneous refinement, and an exquisite simplicity of expression. We wish to search for his privately reprinted works in prose, and the solitary edition of his plays. But on the other hand we are told that his satyromastics is not too severely called a preposterous medley, that his besetting vice is reckless and sluttish incoherence. That one play can be best explained as the work of an intoxicated man in a debtor's prison, that there are times when we are tempted to denounce the muse of Decker as the most shiftless and shameless of slovens and of sluts. Decker wrote several pamphlets, which, in a sort, resemble some minor work of Daniel Defoe. Middleton Though Ben Jonson said in his haste that Middleton was a base fellow, he was of a gentle house. The date of his birth is unknown, 1570. As early as 1597 he was writing for the press, by 1602 he was working at plays in which five or six other men collaborated. Probably they settled on a plot, or rather on two plots, upper and under, and each author wrote an act, a little ready money came in, but the dramas must have been, in the vaniable part of things lost. Middleton frequently worked with Decker, also with Rowley. They are usually thought to have mainly contributed the noisy and incoherent underplots, but Decker's admirers credit him with the denouement of, the old law, Middleton, Massinger, Decker. Mr. Bullen finds this passage the drollest of things droll. There can be no doubt that it must have evoked hearty laughter on the stage. Easily are Horde and Lucre gold in, a trick to catch the old one, namely the uncle of the young profligate Whitgood. Granting that these ancient chuffs were incredibly credulous, the play is a bustling comedy, with abundance of tricks and turns. The mayor of Queenburg in the play so styled was contemporary with Hengist and Horsa, is full of very serious matter, merrily set down. We must not approach in a spirit of historical pedantry a drama in which the earls of Devonshire and Staffordshire, the sons of Constantine, namely Aurelius Ambrosius, Constantius, and Euther Pendragon, with Vortiger and Horsus, Hengist. The tanner mayor of Quinborough, Aminada, and a number of button makers and professional murderers, also two monks, play their parts. The incoherencies, the button makers, the chaste Constantius, an unwilling monarch, 
his murder by the minions of Vortiger, their murder, in Macbeth's manner, by Vortiger, are the drollest of unconscious drolleries. This monstrous medley of dull disconnected humors, unspeakable villainies, and speeches in excellent blank verse, with the sufferings of the angelic Castiza, contains, as usual, a pearl of wronged and innocent womanhood. Middleton is thought by some to walk more closely in Shakespeare's footsteps than even Webster, and his acknowledged masterpiece is The Changeling, so called from the underplot, by Rowley in which two sane men smuggle themselves as maniac and idiot into a private lunatic asylum. The cheerful interludes of lunacy set off the tragedy. Beatrice Joanna, betrothed to Alonzo de Paracuo, loves Alcemero at first sight, and for Paracuo's murderer suborns de Flores, a man whom she loathes, and whose face seems charged with disaster. De Flores has a violent physical passion for Beatrice, endures her insults, haunts her, and accepts her murderous command. After slaying her betrothed, and cutting off his finger that wears the ring of betrothal, he has that scene with Beatrice in which he rejects all her offers, even her whole fortune, and, by threatening to divulge her crime, compels her to be his mistress. This scene is justly celebrated, it does indeed move terror, and pity for the pitiless. But the adventures of Beatrice's bridal night with Alcemero, the absurd affair of the glasses marked M and C. The burning by de Flores of the girl who here plays the part of Brangwain in the romance of Tristram and Isolt, all these things prove Middleton's inability to keep on the level of his own high conception. After some powerful passages and the reappearance of the bleeding finger with the ring, de Flores murders Beatrice, and dies rejoicing in his success. Tragedy, as Shakespeare and Aristotle understood it, was not concerned with resolute ruffians and girls with violent passions, but with Cordelia and Hamlet, Othello and Desdemona, noble souls, with fate-driven and fallen Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. Or Coriolanus ruined by the excess of his own qualities. Middleton's comedy of The Roaring Girl, a contemporary virago with pipe and sword, idealized as the champion of her sex. His prodigal old Sir Bounteous in A Mad World, and his Chaste Maid in Cheapside, were long popular. While the humors of the duel, and the sterling excellence of Captain Ager in A Fair Quarrel, are contrasted with the horseplay of Middleton's constant partner, Rowley. In 1620, Middleton was appointed chronologer to the city, and did the work for which he was paid. He continued to write for the stage, and his Spanish Gypsy, an intermezzo of a very serious plot with the humors of gentlefolks playing gypsies. His The Witch, with curious resemblances to the witches in Macbeth, and the highly successful, topical, play, A Game of Chess, with the intrigues in the affairs of the Spanish match for Charles, Prince of Wales, are among the most notable of his many dramas. The Spanish ambassador, in August, 1624, caused the political Game of Chess to be withdrawn, for, His Majesty, James I. Remembers well there was a commandment and restraint given against the representing of any modern Christian kings in those stage plays. James might well remember it. In 1604 Shakespeare's company had brought him on the stage, playing his part in the mysterious affair of 1600, the Gowrie Conspiracy. The play was stopped on the third night. Middleton also wrote many city masks. He died on July 4, 1627. Haywood Thomas Haywood was born in Lincolnshire, was a Cambridge man, and by 1596-1598 was an actor and a writer for the stage and the press. He says that it is no custom of his to print his plays, being faithful to the actors, who lost their rights in a play, when printed. He confesses to having, had a hand or at least a main finger, in 220 plays. The strong point in Haywood is his study of domestic manners in Englishmen at home, and as adventurers abroad, as in, The English Traveller, and, The Fair Maid of the West. Here Clem, the son of a baker who, when corn grew to be at a high rate, never doed after, frankly says of four sea captains, I believe they be little better than pirates. Haywood's most celebrated play, A Woman Killed with Kindness, reads as much like a modern novel as a Jacobean drama. There is no ribaldry, no horrors, only a duel between two sets of men over a disputed hawking match. The hero, Frankfurt, 
shelters and entertains a broken gentleman who flees from the field, and the man, though thoroughly conscious of his own villainy, seduces Frankfurt's wife, who is beautiful and hitherto a pearl of virtue. She yields at a word, Frankfurt discovers and spares them, the lady makes a pathetic end, and, dying of remorse, of which her lover has his full share, she is, killed with kindness. The pathos and the details of manners are entirely in the style of many modern novels, and the underplot, also serious, if improbable, has the favorite stainless heroine, Susan, a girl of great nobility. There is a most amusing list of the practicing, mediums, of the day, in, The Wise Woman of Hogsdon. They have their specialties, one, doth pretty well for a thing that is lost. Mother Stetton deals in provision, is for forespeaking. Another, practice the book and key, an automatism, the key is tied into the book, the fingers hold it up under the handle of the key, and the book turns in answer to questions. All do well, says the witch, according to their talent. For myself, let the world speak there are some good speeches and good blank verse in The Iron Age, one of four dramas on the Four Ages of Hesiod's mythology. In The Rape of Lucrece is an extraordinary set of popular songs, some coarse enough, one in Dutch, and among them the beautiful lyric. Pack, clouds, away, and welcome day which, more than his twenty-four surviving dramas, keeps Haywood's memory green and fragrant. He wrote miscellaneous pamphlets and books with enormous industry. There is something sympathetic in his very carelessness, what Lamb precisely meant when he called Haywood a prose Shakespeare is disputed. Possibly he meant that Haywood has sweetness of nature, humor, and knowledge of character, without much poetry. Webster Concerning the life and adventures of John Webster next to nothing is known. In 1602 the account books of Henslow, the financier of the stage, mention two lost plays as being, the first by Decker, Drayton, Middleton, Monday, and Webster, and the second by Webster, Chettle, T. Haywood, Wentworth Smith, and Decker. Dramas by so many hands cannot be masterpieces. Webster was a great and busy collaborator. In the bustling, citizen comedies, Northward Ho, and Westward Ho, he worked with Decker. He is best known by Lamb's extracts from his White Devil and Duchess of Malfi. The White Devil, printed in 1612, is a chronicle play of the career of Vittoria Corombona, but Webster has altered the facts as he pleased. The more tragic humors of the betrayed husband, our liberal fathers gave him a shorter name, are exemplified in her Lord Camillo, who, in the interests of her lover, the Duke of Bracciano, is murdered in a manner intended to disguise the crime, the device is about as subtle as the blowing up of Darnley with gunpowder. The Duchess, another patient grizzle, except so far as Vittoria is concerned, men slay by poisoning the portrait of her faithless husband, which she kisses, and thus imbibes the infection. Cornelia, the mother of Vittoria and of her leading murderer Flaminio, is a pathetic figure, and it is she who sings the beautiful lyric. Call for the robin red breast and the wren. Lamb says of Cornelia, she speaks the dialect of despair. Her tongue has a smatch of Tartarus and the souls in bale. To move a horror skillfully, to touch a soul to the quick, to lay upon fear as much as it can bear, to wean and weary a life till it is ready to drop, and then step in with mortal instruments to take its last forfeit, this only a Webster can do. But if this is all that a Webster can do, and if to do this he needs an accumulation of unnatural horrors, fratricide, the murderer of a brother contemplating the madness which his deed has wrought in his mother. If the slain brother has just been kicking his strumpet sister, then we may ask whether an art that flourishes in these odious and extravagant conditions produces one of the imperishable and ineradicable landmarks of literature. The serene and audacious impudence of Vittoria, when accused of her first husband's, Camillo's, murder, and the Ophelia-like laments and the song of Cornelia. With the all but imperturbable wickedness of Flaminio, yield the extracts which Charles Lamb made current coin. Webster, in fact, returned, with abundant genius, but without discretion, to the class of revenge plays opened by Kidd in The Spanish Tragedy. The behavior of the Duchess of Malfi, in the play of that name, printed 1623, introduced as she is by a noble panegyric, 
does not prepare us for her sudden wooing of her steward, Antonio. Her brothers, like the brothers of Keats's Isabella, determined to punish her, their instrument, Basolo, is a character not wholly lost, who deliberately sells himself to guilt. And the scene in which eight madmen are let loose to dance round the Duchess, they do not shake her resolution, is much admired. She is strangled, the children are strangled on all sides, the servant Cariola is strangled, though, she bites and scratches. The fifth act is a scene of the Kilkenny cats. Almost everybody, including Basolo, is stabbed, and Ford, in commendatory verses, applauds Webster, as at least the equal of the Athenian tragedians. Webster's genius was confessedly, subdued to that it worked in. In the preface to, The White Devil, he complains that the public will not endure a tragedy which observes the critical laws. The sententious chorus, and, the passionate and weighty nuncius, the messenger who, in Greek tragedy, reports the horrors done off the stage. Deprived of the messenger, obliged to work his massacres on the scene, Webster was unsparing in horrors. His, Devil's Lawsuit, is a complicated web of squalid intrigue, the blank verse is utterly degenerate, and, Appius and Virginia, is not remarkable for originality in the representation of that famous Roman story. Webster's idea of a ghost was rather unconventional, Brachiano's phantasm in, The White Devil, wore no common sheet, but, leather cassock and breeches, and boots, with a cowl, in his hand a pot of lily flowers, with a skull in it. Decker advises his gull at the play to laugh aloud in the crisis of the tragedy, and probably there were some hardy or hysterical spectators who thus received the too, too solid spirit of Brachiano. The tragedy of revenge inspired Cyril Turner's Revenger's Tragedy, and horror has her home in this play and his Atheist's Tragedy. What in them deserves reading may be found in Lamb's extracts. Massinger Philip Massinger, born 1583, was the son of a gentleman patronized by the noble house of Pembroke. The poet was educated at St. Alban Hall, Oxford, but left without taking a degree, 1606. He had fallen into debt and commenced playwriting in 1614, his earliest known piece, in which Decker took part, The Virgin Martyr, was acted in 1622. The period represented is that of the persecution under Diocletian, and the piece is old-fashioned enough, introducing the angelic companion of Saint Dorothea, and the devil who attends the persecutor, Theophilus, a very late convert. Torture is introduced on the stage, and Theophilus slays his daughters, whom he had tortured out of Christianity back into the Olympian faith, and whom Dorothea reconverts by arguments with which they must already have long been familiar. There is a tendency to credit Decker both with the most gracious passages of verse in the piece and with the stupid but energetic ribaldries of Hersius and Spongius. The unnatural combat, duel between a son and a father who rivals Cenci in Shelley's tragedy, the Duke of Milan, with a most unnatural plot, the Roman actor, the fatal dowry, are among Massinger's tragedies. Some twelve of his plays were burned in manuscript by Betty Baker, or Barnes, the cook of Warburton, the Herald. If they contain such scenes as that of, the ghost of young Malefort, slain by his father, naked from the waist, full of wounds, leading in the shadow of a lady, her face leprous, our regret for them may not be overwhelming. We have plays enough in which a man is poisoned by the venomed paint on a canvas or on a dead lady's face, plays enough in which victims, as in, the Roman actor, are cruelly tortured on the stage. That Massinger has noble passages and great tirades is undeniable, and he is one of the four or five successors of Shakespeare who are said by their admirers to follow most closely in his footsteps. The play which keeps Massinger's memory green in common recollection is his, A New Way to Pay Old Debts. The great part is that of Sir Giles Overreach, a financial ruffian, suggested probably by a real character equally nefarious, Sir Giles Mompesson. A victim of Overreach's in his own nephew, Wellborn, and the play shows how Wellborn, with the aid of a rich and virtuous widow, Lady Allworth, cousins Overreach into advancing money, how his creature, Marall, chouses him. And how his daughter, Margaret, marries young Allworth, and not the peer for whom the usurer designed her. Described as, both lion and fox, overreach, always ready to fight, is more successful in the furious than in the furtive part of his nature. 
He bullies man and defies God in seeking satisfaction of his two chief desires, to ruin and humiliate his social superiors and to plunder the widow and the orphan or any other victim whose loss may be his gain. But like the mammon worshippers in A Trick to Catch the Old One, Overreach himself is credulous enough, an easy victim of the conspirators against his pride and pocket. Massinger's indelicacy has not always the apology of wit, indeed he is not remarkable for humor, any more than most of his contemporaries, who sought and doubtless got a laugh by stereotyped and witless ribaldries. The character part of Greedy, a parasite of overreaches, remarkable for his appetite, a shield of brawn and a barrel of Colchester oysters were to him a dish of tea before breakfast, must have been diverting on the stage. And when Marall turns against his master, we are reminded of similar surprises by Mr. Micawber and Newman Noggs, though they were not accomplices in the iniquities which they exposed. Massinger's plays are often interwoven with the work of other hands, and deal, in a more or less veiled way, with the political situations of his time. He lived in poverty, as his petitions to the Herbert family prove, and he died in 1640. He was dissatisfied with his fortunes and with public indifference, poverty had forced him into poetry, and hunger had made him hasty in his work, the too common calamity of poor authors. Ford John Ford was a native of Ilsington in Devonshire, baptized on April 17, 1586. He was of good family, entered the Inns of Court, and is said to have practiced in his profession. A contemporary rhymer speaks of him, deep in a dump, with folded arms and melancholy hat. He worked at plays with Decker, and in The Witch of Edmonton, 1622. Four of his comedies were burned or otherwise put out of being by Betty Barnes, or Baker, the celebrated cook of Warburton, Somerset Herald, who made away with at least fifty manuscripts of old plays. His earliest known comedy, 1613, was among Betty's victims. His earliest independent surviving piece, The Lover's Melancholy, was played in 1628. The more serious part has a rather improbable plot turning on the disguise of a girl as a man, but there are many beautiful romantic passages in the loves of Palladier, Prince of Cyprus, and Eroclea. A mask of Bedlamites within the play indicates the strange contemporary taste for the terrors and humors of maniacs. In 1633 the famous plays Tis Pity She's a Whore and The Broken Heart were printed. The former has a plot of incestuous loves, ending in a pretty general massacre. Given the inspiration of the unnatural, Ford could do great things. In the prologue to The Broken Heart, the scene is Sparta, of all unlikely places, Ford reprobates the staple of low contemporary comedy, jests fit for a brothel court's applause, apish laughter, lame jeers at place or persons. Perhaps Ford was not unaffected by Prynne's famous attack on the stage, Histriomastix, 1632. The Broken Heart is free from the customary ribaldries, it is a tragedy of fate, the characters are noble. Ithacles is noble, despite the original wrong which he has committed in separating Orgelus and Penthia, and wedding Penthia to the great dissimulation of the jealous Bassans. Orgelus, who murders Ithacles, is noble in his death, the death of Seneca without the bath. Penthia is noble, and the wanderings of her mind at the end of her slow suicide, are beautiful in their sad fantasy. Finally the dancing of Calantha, while one after another come messengers with the tidings that break her heart, is noble, and probably her endurance is the reason for the placing of the scene in Sparta. As in Greek tragedy, all are doomed by fate. The oracle of Delphi has spoken truth, with the wanted obscurity which only time can unriddle. It is true that the interest shifts, in the last scenes, from Penthia to Calantha, whom we have scarcely looked on previously. But Ford aimed high, and came near to hitting his mark. He ought never to have, attempted his crazy low comedy scenes. Ford's, Perkin Warbeck, is by far the most readable historical play of the old stage, after Marlowe's, Edward II, and Shakespeare's chronicle plays. Perkin's character is resolute and princely, as is that of his Gordon Bride, the White Rose. If he lost his life he died a king, in royal bearing. As King Henry says. The custom, sure, of being called a king. Has fastened in his thought that he is such. Ford, 
in his tragedies, is not to be reckoned among Mr. Swinburne's splendid slovens. His blank verse never degenerates into skimble-scamble slackness, but, compared with most of his contemporaries, he does not shine as a lyric poet. He retired to the country after the overthrow of the stage and the beginning of the Civil War. Shirley James Shirley, of an honorable family, was born in London, in 1596. He entered the Merchant Taylor's School, and, in 1612, went to St. John's, Oxford, where Laud was then master. Laud, who believed in the beauty of holiness, is said to have prevented Shirley, as a blemished man, with a large mole on his face, from taking holy orders. He migrated to Cambridge, to St. Catherine's Hall, published a poem in 1616, did take orders, received a living, left it on becoming a Catholic, turned schoolmaster at St. Albans, and then went to town as a playwright. His Love's Tricks was licensed in 1624 to 1625, a silly play, writes Mr. Pepys in 1667. Shirley was prolific, his Witty Fair One, acted 1628, is thought one of his best comedies. These dramas have a touch of the modern. We hear of balls, a new name then for dancing parties. In The Lady of Pleasure, 1635, Lady Bornwell's contempt for the country life and for country gentlemen, and her determination to spend her husband's fortune on the gaieties of the court, are amusing, and we expect her to be a Lady Teasel. But, despite her husband's stratagem of beating her at her own game, and the humors of the nephew whom she has brought from Oxford, the piece can hardly be read with enthusiastic delight. It is deemed Shirley's masterpiece in comedy, and preludes to the comic drama of the Restoration and the Revolution of 1688. Dryden expresses extreme contempt for both Haywood and Shirley. It is to be feared that his own plays are now no more popular than theirs. After residing at Dublin under the great Earl of Strafford, and producing plays at the Viceregal Court, and after insulting in an ironic dedication of The Bird in a Cage, the Puritan Prin who had been most cruelly punished for allusions in his work against the stage, Histriomastics, surely returned to London. His The Cardinal is imitated from Webster's Duchess of Malfi, and with The Traitor is reckoned, though surely preferred The Cardinal, the best of his flock, in tragedy. Pepys, 1662, writes, There is no great matter in it, but Pepys's dramatic criticisms are no great matter. In 1642 came the shutting up of the theatres, and Shirley, after seeing the wars under his patron, the Duke of Newcastle, returned to his old profession as a schoolmaster. He wrote a preface, 1647, to some hitherto unprinted plays of Beaumont and Fletcher, commending their stage as a school of moral discipline, in this silence of the stage thou hast a liberty to read these inimitable plays. In 1659 Shirley published his Contention of Ajax and Ulysses, containing the noble lines which embalm his memory. The glories of our blood and state. Our shadows, not substantial things. His. Bid me no more good night, because. Tis dark, must I away. Is also a pretty piece, like his song, attributed wrongly to Carew. Shirley's works were often acted at the beginning of the Restoration, but he refused to write more dramas. The shock of the Great Fire of 1666 is said to have caused the deaths, on the same day, of himself and of his wife. The blank verse of Shirley is seldom distinguished. His numerous works suffer somewhat because they come at the end of a long period in which talent like his, with defects of taste often greater than his, have satiated and wearied all but the special student and enthusiastic devotee of the drama. The minor stars in the galaxy of playwrights almost defy enumeration. Space does not permit estimates of the last dramatists of The First Temple, Randolph, Suckling, whose dramatic verse is as chaotically bad as several of his lyrics are exquisite. Davenant, who tried to keep alive a semblance of the drama at the end of Cromwell's Protectorate, Brome, Cartwright, Maine, and others. The blank verse in which the elder poets had so often excelled was left to the care of Milton. The blank verse of the stage became formless, and, during the Restoration, rhymed heroic couplets usurped its place. XXI, Elizabethan and Jacobean Prose Writers 
In sketching the history of the English drama from its beginnings to the close of Ben Jonson's career, we have passed through a long tract of years, rich in other than poetic literature. We must now return to the writers in prose who came after Ascombe and Sidney, and lived through the last period of Elizabeth, and in the reigns of James I, Charles I, and the Commonwealth. The prose writers may be considered in four sets. First we have the purely literary authors, the critics and novelists such as Lilly, Sidney, Green, Nash, and others, of whose style, with its brave conceits, euphuism, and metaphors we have already spoken. Next, too, we have the controversial pamphleteers, who wrangled mainly about religion and church government, defending or attacking the established church with its usages. Or Puritanism with its love of Presbyterian discipline, and hatred of the cross in baptism, the surplus, and other rags of Rome. While government supported the cause of the established church and severely handled recalcitrant ministers of the Puritan party, some Puritan writers went so far as to threaten war against the cause of the detested bishops. On both sides temper rose to fever heat, and the controversy was conducted in a prose style which was full of abuse and satire. Meanwhile, three, Cooker wrote on the same disputed themes in a style lofty, logical, and harmonious. And in his History of the World, Sir Walter Raleigh often played on language with the effect of a solemn music. Lastly, four, Bacon in his essays touched on familiar themes in a style of brief sentences, witty, or poetic, or philosophical, which was all his own, which came home, as he says, to men's business and bosoms. And, of all the manners which we have described, that of Bacon remains by far the most easily and most commonly appreciated. Meanwhile the common fault of men who wrote in prose was the inability to tell a plain tale. To say succinctly, distinctly, and unmistakably what they meant. Perhaps they did not always wish to be understood, but even when Elizabethan and Jacobean writers were anxious to be lucid, their fanciful tropes and long sentences often detain or defy the modern reader. This defect arose partly from imitation of the structure of stately Latin sentences in Roman literature. But in Latin the nature of the grammar does not permit the meaning to be lost. When books were comparatively rare, and leisure was plentiful, readers did not grudge the time passed over tall and massive folios and long stately involved periods. Now and again, in the age of Elizabeth as in the Restoration, the lighter authors took refuge in a style lax, colloquial, and charged with current slang. A century must pass before we arrive at the unadorned plain manner of Dean Swift. It was not that the Elizabethans lacked the power to write tersely, simply, and clearly. So luxuriant a poet as Spencer was the master of a perfectly clear and unadorned prose style, deeply interesting in his work on the condition of Ireland. The letters of such diplomatists as Randolph, Queen Elizabeth's envoy to the court of Mary, Queen of Scots, are as clear and amusing, or, once or twice, as pathetic, today, as when they were written. But the prose of literature was entangled and encumbered by the search of ornament, of esprit at all costs, and by copious antitheses and, among the lighter writers, by clenches, and even by slang. Hooker It is not to be doubted but that Richard Hooker was born at Heavy Tree, near Exeter, says Isaac Walton, about 1553. But skeptics have averred that he was born in Southgate Street, in Exeter. His parents were not rich, and, aided by Bishop Jewell, he entered Corpus Christi College, Oxford, in 1567, as a Bible clerk. In 1577 he obtained a fellowship. In 1579 was reader in Hebrew, a tongue with which few Oxford men were, or are, familiarly acquainted. About four years later he took holy orders, had a severe cold, and married a wife recommended by the lady who had nursed him in his illness. The good man, says Walton, had no cause to rejoice in the wife of his youth, for, the contentions of a wife, at least of Mrs. Hooker, are a continual dropping. He took a living in Buckinghamshire, and experienced, the corroding cares that attend a married priest. Among these was reading Horace while he watched his sheep, and rocking his child's cradle. A friend, Edwin Sandys, finding him in these distressful circumstances, obtained for him the mastership of the temple, 1585, during the Martin Marprelate controversy, 
in which the boisterous Nash bore a part. A lecturer, Travers, opposed Hooker's theological positions, for Hooker, it seems, had maintained that all Catholics are not necessarily damned to all eternity. In 1591 Hooker obtained the living of Boscombe in Wilts, and in 1595 moved to that of Bishopsbourne near Canterbury, where he died in 1600. The first four books of his Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity appeared in 1594, the fifth in 1597, the rest was posthumously published. The book was admired by James VI, who read it in Scotland, and by the Pope and Cardinal Allen. Hooker was a good, devout, simple man, a most laborious parish minister, and so short-sighted that Walton accounts for his choice of a wife, if he could be said to choose her, by this defect of vision. The great work of Hooker, The Ecclesiastical Polity, is an argument against the Puritans who, from matters like the surplus to matters like the liturgy, desired in all things to imitate the discipline of Geneva and of Presbyterian Scotland. In the Martin Mar Prelate controversy, as in all old controversy, the style, as we shall see, had been extremely scurrilous on both sides. Hooker, on the other hand, writes like a gentleman, a scholar, and a Christian. As the dispute was really between men of two opposed temperaments and characters, arguments, however learned, moderate, and logical, could not make converts. The Reformation had brought not peace but a sword. Religious differences, mingled with political differences, soon broke into civil war under Charles I. Hooker begins by stating that the opponents of the Church of England, right well affected and most religiously inclined minds, must, he supposed, have had some marvellous reasonable inducements for desiring to upset the existing ecclesiastical settlement. He therefore studied the subject diligently, and could find no law of God or reason of man against the attitude of the defenders of the settlement, and no proof that the Presbyterian discipline by error and misconceit named the ordinance of Jesus Christ, was so in very deed. After a pathetic request for a fair hearing of the words of one who desireth even to embrace together with you the selfsame truth, if it be the truth, he gave a history of the discipline as introduced by Calvin at Geneva. Calvin, he said, by sifting the very utmost sentence and syllable of the New Testament found that certain passages seemed to him to enjoin that congregations should have elders with power of excommunication, with fearful civil consequences, but Calvin had never proved that Scripture doth necessarily enforce these things, or enforce any other thing in which the Puritans differed from the Church established. Manifestly an opponent would blow away this argument with any isolated scriptural text, whatever its original application, which as he thought backed his opinion. Hooker analyzed Puritan demagogic methods, spiritual pretensions, and habit of leading women captive. But, be they women or be they men, if once they have tasted of that cup, let any man of contrary opinion open his mouth to persuade them, they close up their ears, his reasons they weigh not at all, all is answered with the words of John. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us. All this was, in fact, the case, it was superfluous to write a long book, with quotations about the angels from the pre-Christian Greek Orphic poems, for the purpose of converting people who closed their ears. When Hooker, wrote, some Puritan writers had already threatened civil war, their martyrs, in fact, lay in Newgate, and their blood was up. What they desired was not to be tolerated, but to dominate the consciences of others. One text both parties could use, compel them to come in. The style of Hooker is somewhat rich in Latinized components. He is remote from euphuistic conceits, and does not rise into eloquence except when his subject elevates his mind in style. A celebrated example is his defense of church music. Touching musical harmony whether by instrument or by voice, it being but of high and low in sounds a due proportionable disposition, such notwithstanding is the force thereof. And so pleasing effects it hath in that very part of man which is most divine, that some have been thereby induced to think that the soul itself by nature is or hath in it harmony. A thing which delighteth all ages and beseemeth all states, a thing as seasonable in grief as in joy, as decent being added unto actions of greatest weight and solemnity, as being used when men most sequester themselves from action. 
The reason hereof is an admirable facility which music hath to express and represent to the mind, more inwardly than any other sensible mean, the very standing, rising, and falling, the very steps and inflections every way. The turns and varieties of all passions whereunto the mind is subject. Yea, so to imitate them, that whether it resemble unto us the same state wherein our minds already are, or a clean contrary, we are not more contentedly by the one confirmed, than changed and led away by the other. In harmony the very image and character even of virtue and vice is perceived, the mind delighted with their resemblances, and brought by having them often iterated into a love of the things themselves. Magnificent as is the harmony of these sentences, and severe as is the logical thought which they express, the modern reader finds that he cannot get at the sense of them by merely running his eye over them. The sentences must be carefully construed, and such writing cannot possibly be popular, as, in some degree, some writings of Bacon still remain. The posthumously published books of Hooker were supposed to have been tampered with by the editors. Hooker did not publish his sermons, of which several were put forth after his death. Even his Puritan adversaries could not with decency have complained that they are too short. In one sermon he speaks freely of the Pope as, the man of sin. Martin Marprelate. We cannot here do more than mention the masters of the fierce controversial prose, indeed their names, often, can only be guessed. They fought like wild cats, with the yells of these animals when enraged, in the wordy war of Martin Marprelate, or Bishop Spain. Archbishop Whitgift, 1586, obtained a decree from the Star Chamber for the suppression of pamphlets that attacked the usages of the established church. Till 1593 the Battle of Books lasted, and then Parliament silenced the Puritans, for a while. The authors, taking the name of Martin Marprelate, entered the fray, on the Puritan side, with the weapon of satire, banter, and Billingsgate, in autumn, 1588. Martin, whoever he or they may have been, employed a secret press, owned by one Waldegrave, that was set up now in one place, now in another. The history of the secret presses, of Waldegrave and of his successors, is curious. The learned Udall, John Penry, the father of Welsh descent, and other combatants, were imprisoned, Penry was hanged. There remain seven tracts by Marprelate, in a style of variegated abuse, banter, and gag, Bishop Cooper found that his name yielded gross palpable quips and puns to the Puritan wags who wrote for, the man in the street. Martin was no Pascal, his weapons were not the small sword but the jester's bladder on a stick, and the bully's bludgeon. The anti-Martinists answered with the same weapons, as Nash and Lilly were responsible for certain pamphlets. Green took a hand in the fray, and it faded out in a literary and personal squabble with Gabriel Harvey. The Martin Marprelate tracts were revolutionary, and afford a singular instance in which the wit exhibited itself on the Puritan side. Serious treatment of serious themes, on the other hand, is nobly vindicated in the great work of Richard Hooker. Bacon A style quite unlike that of Hooker is Bacon's. Francis Bacon, later Lord Verlum and Viscount St. Albans, was born in 1561, a younger son of Sir Nicholas Bacon, long-time keeper of the seals under Elizabeth, and of his wife Elizabeth Cook, daughter of Sir Anthony Cook, and sister of the wife of the famous Cecil, Lord Burley. Bacon did not profit much by the high place of his uncle William, and his cousin Robert Cecil. They retarded from jealousy the worldly advancement, to secure which, and to aid the progress of science, were Bacon's leading desires. After leaving Trinity College, Cambridge, and studying law at Gray's Inn, Bacon followed to Paris Sir Amias Paulette, later the jailer of Queen Mary Stuart at Fotheringay. He was called to the bar in 1582, and in 1584 entered Parliament, on the court side. Ben Jonson has left lofty praise of his eloquent sagacity in debate. His memoirs of advice to Elizabeth were more admired than followed in practice. He was in favor of moderation towards both Catholics and Puritans. He attached himself to the fortunes of the Queen's brilliant wayward favorite, Essex. But his wisdom was not what Essex was fitted by nature to follow, he swayed the woman in Elizabeth by his beauty and daring grace, his military ambitions were distasteful to the pacific and parsimonious Queen. 
The mad enterprise of Essex, on Scottish models, to seize the royal person, was no true English political move, it led to his trial, and Bacon was the leading speaker in his benefactor's prosecution. It is the wisdom of rats, says Bacon, that will leave a house some time before it fall, essays, of wisdom for a man's self. He has never been forgiven for an action which could scarcely appear other than judicious, and praiseworthy, and even necessary, to himself. Like Cecil he made advances to James VI of Scotland, when it was clear that Elizabeth could not, as James feared, last as long as sun and moon. On James, Bacon bestowed all his wisdom, and spoke for the project of union between England and Scotland, a project not realized till after the lapse of a century. Partly through the influence of King James's favorite, Buckingham, Bacon received promotion, he became Attorney General, in 1617, Keeper of the Seals, like his father, in 1618, Chancellor, and Baron Verlum, in 1621 Viscount St. Albans. In the same year he was accused of taking gifts from suitors, then a not uncommon practice, pled guilty, with qualifications, and was disgraced. His last years were spent in literary pursuits at his place, Gorhambury, near St. Albans. He caught cold in an experiment in freezing poultry and died in March, 1626. The industry of his biographer, Mr. Spedding, has not wholly redeemed the character of Bacon, whose personality does not endear him to mankind, and was not on a level with his genius. That genius was literary in a very high degree, and was influenced by a desire to benefit humanity through scientific knowledge of the laws of nature and of human nature. To this task he brought an enthusiasm which reminds us of a man so different from himself as Shelley. In Bacon's belief, man might be and ought to be the master of things. And a reasoned account of all things in nature was the inventory of human possessions. To make this inventory, and to discover a new method of interrogating nature, putting her to the question and wrenching from her all her precious secrets, was the main object of his scientific meditations. His first important book, however, The Essays, 1597, was literary, and no doubt was suggested by the Essays of Montaigne, which were also familiar to Shakespeare. In its original form the book contained but ten brief studies, but Bacon kept improving them and adding to their number. There are thirty-four in the edition of 1612, fifty-eight in that of 1625. It is dedicated to Buckingham, who is informed that he has planted things that are like to last, an unlucky prediction. Of all my other works, adds Bacon, my essays have been most current. For that, as it seems, they come home to men's business and bosoms. The phrase is a proverb, indeed the essays, as the man said of Hamlet, are made up of quotations, of phrases that are now household words. The genius of Bacon, in the essay, and even in his scientific works, the advancement of learning, 1605, and the Latin, Novum Organum, 1620, was not desultory, like Montaigne's, but aphoristic. He coined maxims or aphorisms, brief sayings, weighty with wisdom, brilliant with points of wit and fancy, which sometimes remind us of La Rochefoucauld. It is interesting to compare the first drafts of the essays in 1597 with the finished work in 1625, where they are considerably enlarged, and altered in details. A faction is increased fourfold, and strengthened by examples from Roman history. Like all the men of his time, Bacon is rich in classical references and anecdotes which, with him, are not tedious and pedantic. When he quotes Homer it is in Latin hexameters, he cites a Roman altered adaptation, a prophecy, as it seems, of the Roman Empire, which, of course, Homer never predicted. But the Latin form serves Bacon's theory of prophecies that have been of certain memories and from hidden causes. This wise man notes that, the king of Spain's surname, they say, is Norway, in order that a folk prophecy may be fulfilled by the defeat of the Armada. However on the whole he regards fulfilled prophecies, not scriptural, as accidental coincidences. Men mark when they hit, and never mark when they miss, as they do generally also of dreams. There is something pathetic in Bacon's wise futilities and generalities on the most pressing political question of his time, unity in religion. Concerning the means of procuring unity, men must beware, 
that in the procuring or muniting of religious unity they do not dissolve and deface the laws of charity and of human society. Being men, they necessarily defaced both, Laud later had the ears of Puritans cut off, Puritans cut off the head of Laud, and so as to consider men as Christians, we forget that they are men. Bacon is not a little, Jesuitical. Secrecy is often necessary, no man can be secret, except he give himself a little scope of dissimulation, which is, as it were, but the skirts or train of secrecy. Simulation is, more culpable and less politic. Except it be in rare and great matters, rather encouraging to Charles I, for we are bidden to have, dissimulation in seasonable use. Love is rather profitable to the stage than to human existence, in life it doth much mischief, sometimes like a siren, sometimes like a fury. No great and worthy person, except Mark Antony and Appius Claudius, famed for his adoration of Virginia, hath been transported to the mad degree of love. It is impossible to love and be wise. Bacon certainly varied much from Plato and all the poets, in this of love. Bacon knew very well that atheism was apt to follow in the steps of his adored physical science, and consoled himself by assuming that a little philosophy inclines man's mind to atheism. But depth in philosophy bringeth men's minds about to religion. He deemed that without belief there could be no sense of honor, for atheists have died for their opinion, whereas, if they believe that there is no God, why should they trouble themselves? Against atheists the very savages take part with the very subtlest philosophers, which is perfectly true. To the dog, man is instead of a god, or melior natura. As atheism is in all respects hateful, so in this, that it depriveth human nature of the means to exalt itself above human frailty, yet martyr atheists have despised human frailty. For martyrdoms, I reckon them among miracles. Because they seem to exceed the force of human nature. Concerning the extreme reformers, Bacon says, there is a superstition in avoiding superstition, when men think to do best if they go furthest from the superstition formerly received. As in the Scottish Presbyterian burial of the Christian dead with no religious service, one of Knox's innovations. In his essay on, Wisdom for a Man's Self, Bacon speaks, wittingly or unwittingly, of his own mischance, whereas they have all their time sacrificed to themselves, they become in the end themselves sacrifices to the inconstancy of fortune. A word of Bacon's is always apartment, let no nation expect to be great that is not awake upon any just cause of arming. Of colonization, it is a shameful and unblessed thing to take the scum of the people and wicked condemned men, to be the people with whom you plant. If you plant where savages are, use them justly and graciously. Always the counsel is excellent, always the adviser is unheard. Bacon even advises on the stage management of masks. On gardening he writes at much length and with manifest pleasure. His advice to keep caged birds in little turrets with a belly is not that of a poetical imagination. He did not like the Ars Topiaria, images cut out in juniper, or box. His garden contained a heath of a natural wildness, with many artificial additions. Bacon's Promise of Elegancies is a commonplace book, full of germs of essays, pensées. The essays themselves are strings of connected aphorisms, without much consecutiveness of style or skilled transitions. Aphorisms, says Bacon himself, except they should be ridiculous, cannot be made but of the pith and heart of sciences. His aphorisms certainly were more popular, as he knew, than his connected work of 1605, The Advancement of Learning, Divine and Humane. In the dedication of this work to James I, Bacon admires His Majesty's genius, a light of nature I have observed in Your Majesty, who certainly was a clever man, and interested in literature. The book is a plea for the organization of knowledge, Bacon styles it, a small globe of the intellectual world. He surveys all knowledge, and maps it out, with a view to organized study. He meets religious objections in his usual way. It is argued that ignorance is a fine thing, making a more devout dependence on God as the first cause. Bacon replies in the words of Job, Will you lie for God, as one man will do for another to gratify him? Will you offer the author of truth the unclean sacrifice of a lie? 
Bacon attacks the schoolmen as darkening counsel by words and spinning cobwebs out of assumed first principles, instead of collecting facts, and questioning nature by experiments. Practically, experimental philosophy, and the endowment of special research, are the burdens of his argument. He divides knowledge into history, the original sense of the word being inquiry, human, natural, and divine. Anxious that nothing should escape him, he even classifies ciphers, then much used in the secret correspondence of statesmen and conspirators. He had invented a cipher when a young diplomatist in Paris, and, in the later Latin translation of this book, the De Augmentis, he is copious on the subject. The secrets of each writing were usually discovered by the simple process of torturing the conspirators who used them. Poesy, he says, was ever thought to have some anticipation of divineness, because it doth raise and erect the mind, by submitting the shows of things to the desires of the mind. Whereas reason doth buckle and bow the mind unto the nature of things. He conceived that there was a mystic meaning, a record of lost wisdom, in the myths of the Greeks, which are mainly decorated survivals of savage guesses at the causes of things. He asks for more biographies, in an age very careless of biography. He speaks of the inductive method, as opposed to the scholastic reasoning from invented assumptions. And his mind was always busy with a perfect system, instauratio magna, of the interpretation of nature, and the encyclopedic organization of knowledge. This work he never completed. The Novum Organum, 1620, written in Latin, is the most important fragment. He had a vision of his own, but what his great and perfect method really was, in practical operation, he probably did not know himself. Fallacies he could detect and classify in brilliant fashion, the Didola or shadowy dwellers on the threshold of truth, bewildering men who would enter that sanctuary. His work in this kind, especially the Novum Organum, is immensely stimulating, he saw and vision the promised land of science into which he did not enter, and he would have been much disenchanted by the results, as regards human happiness. Of the discoveries which he, not vainly, summoned men to make. He did not urge haste in practical application, the commercializing of science. He insisted on the collection of, contradictory instances, a method always, in accordance with human eagerness, too much neglected. 33. Bacon's mind, in fact, was encyclopedic, and shared the faults common to encyclopedias. The contemporary specialist, like Gilbert with his remarkable experiments in magnetism, is spoken of but slightingly by Bacon. Nor has he much praise for other students who, in his time, were practicing what he was preaching. Bacon's prose, beyond the region of essays and of science, may best be studied in his Reign of Henry VII, the fruit of a few months' labor, after his banishment to the country, in 1621. He had no access to manuscripts of the period, except in copies made for him in the great collection of Sir Robert Cotton, now in the British Museum. The printed books concerning the reign, those of Polydor Virgil, Hollinshed, translating Polydor, Stowe, and Speed, led Bacon into some mistakes about facts. But the book is lucid and sagacious. The character of the king is clearly depicted, without favor or deliberate fault-finding. The study of Perkin Warbeck is full of subtle interest. Himself with long and continued counterfeiting and with often telling a lie was turned, by habit, almost into the thing he seemed to be, and from a liar to a believer. Ford makes Henry VII express the same opinion in his tragedy of Perkin Warbeck. Bacon treats the strange career of Perkin in terms of the stage, speaks of the prompter with his prompt book, and, in the last act, says, therefore now, like the end of a play, a great number came upon the stage at once. The nature of the statecraft of Henry VII, not very apprehensive or forecasting of future events, afar off, but an entertainer of fortune by the day, is admirably analyzed. I have not flattered the king, says Bacon in his dedication to Charles, Prince of Wales, but took him to life as well as I could, sitting so far off, and having no better light. Henry's attempt to secure the canonization of Henry VI is amusingly described. Cardinals were set to examine that poor prince's career, but it died under the reference. The general opinion was that Pope Julius was too dear, and that the king would not come to his rates. 
but Bacon holds that the Pope did not wish to cheapen saintliness, and chose to keep a distance between innocents and saints. The virtues of Henry VI had not the necessary quality of being heroic. The New Atlantis, unfinished in 1624, was published with the Silva Silverum, after Bacon's death, in 1627. Here our author appears as the framer of a philosophical romance, not unlike Moore's Utopia, but concerned, as far as it goes, with the organization of experiment and of knowledge, as practiced by the people of Ben Salem. Somewhere in the Southern Seas. Bacon makes no long story of how he and his company arrived at Ben Salem, an unheard of land, where civilization has survived since the time of Plato's mythical lost Atlantis. Bacon was inclined to suspect that there must have been, in the dark backward and abysm of time, a race more advanced in knowledge than the Greeks or the men of his own age. The Ben Salamites are survivors of that race, people very stately, peaceable, though well provided with improved artillery, and Christian. The tale of their miraculous conversion, through St. Bartholomew, about twenty years after the ascension of our Saviour, and of their acquisition of the Old Testament and the New, including parts of it not yet written, about 53 AD, is the most romantic part of the romance. The Ben Salamites, who are rich in everything, make trading voyages, not for lucre, but for light, knowledge. They have every kind of museum, library, and scientific apparatus which the mind of Bacon could desire, regardless of expense, nor do they seem to have shrunk from vivisection in their search for the secrets of nature. We have some degrees of flying in the air, they have Christian temples, they are extremely moral, kind, and industrious, in fact are a sort of scientific fiations. Far apart they dwell, in the midst of the wash of the waves, and with them are no men conversant, for they help, but do not welcome mariners. Bacon's Latin tracts are numerous, he believed that Latin was a permanent, English a less stable speech, but of course, since his day, knowledge of Latin has more and more decreased, owing to the progress of education and the march of science. The prophetic enthusiasm of his insistence on experimental philosophy, the brilliance of his illustrations, and the sagacity of his aphoristic observations, are the basis of his literary fame. He was not so well fitted to be an experimental philosopher himself, as to be the cause of experimental philosophy in others. Raleigh Sir Walter Raleigh, born 1552, at Hayes Barton, Budley, Devonshire, educated at Oxford, a soldier with the Huguenots in France, familiar with the wits in 1576, when he wrote commendatory verses for Gascoigne's Steel Glass. A courtier who enjoyed the sunshine and suffered from the frosts of Elizabeth's favor, when supplanted by Essex went to Ireland, as we saw, became the friend of Spencer, and was styled by him, the shepherd of the ocean. In life and in literature a fiery and indefatigable adventurer, his productions, from sonnets and the long, and for the most part lost poem, Cynthia, on Elizabeth, to tracts on practical points. Accounts of voyages and of South America, and the gigantic history of the world, give proof of extraordinary energy and fertility. His description of the glorious fight of The Revenge, and the death of Sir Richard Grenville, published in 1596, can never be forgotten. In 1596 appeared, too, his account of his first exploration, 1595, of Guiana, with a description of the great and golden city of Manoa, Mirage. On the death of Elizabeth, James I, on grounds of not unnatural if baseless suspicion, imprisoned Raleigh in the tower, where he was well treated enough, and with what amount of aid from collaborators is uncertain, Ben Jonson said that he had much, but, in any case with portentous industry, Raleigh compiled his History of the World, from the Creation to 130 B. C. The book, 1614-1615, had a very great popularity, even the Puritans read it with admiration. There was then no such world history in English, and though, as history, it is now obsolete of course. It is admired for its vigor, for the character it displays, and the personal observations suggested by the author's wide experience of men. And above all for occasional passages of lofty eloquence, and the organ tones of a magnificent style, as in the famous address to death. 
the capacities of style and original work had never so been exemplified in English, though such examples are but occasional. Raleigh's very title in The Prerogative of Parliaments was offensive to the king, who doted on the prerogative of princes, and the book was not printed till after Raleigh's execution, following his return from his second expedition to Guiana. He also wrote tracts on war in general, on the navy and sea service, on trade and commerce, on a war with Spain, the last thing that James desired, on the arts of empire, published by Milton, 1658. As the Cabinet Council, and doubtless much is lost of the 3,452 sheets of Raleigh's writing which John Hampton was having transcribed before the Great Rebellion. More than Bacon, Raleigh tuned the language of lofty, insolent, and passionate English prose, these terms were applied by Puttenham, Art of English Poesy, to Raleigh's Ditty and Amorous Ode. Insolent, of course, means here, out of the common. Overbury Sir Thomas Overbury was born in Warwickshire in 1581, was the son of a Gloucestershire squire, was a gentleman commoner of Queen's College, Oxford, 1595-1598, entered the Middle Temple, and passed some years abroad. On his return he became, in Scotland, the friend of Robert Carr, or Kerr, son of Kerr of Fernihurst, one of Queen Mary's border partisans. Carr, who was handsome, became King James's minion, and, in 1613, was created Earl of Somerset. His friend Overbury obtained a place at court, and was first the friend, then the foe of Ben Jonson. An ally of Somerset, Overbury dissuaded him from his fatal marriage with Francis Howard, who, after a child marriage, 1606, with the boy Earl of Essex, detested him, loved Somerset, and, backed by James's influence. In spite of the Archbishop of Canterbury, Abbott, obtained a decree of nullity against her husband. The poet Don, as Somerset's advisor, and the poet Campion, as a physician connected with a courtier more or less concerned in the affair, were entangled in this odious and mysterious matter. Overbury, on the other hand, was opposed to the unholy marriage of Somerset, and is thought to have written his popular poem, The Wife, to show him that Lady Essex was not what a wife should be. She plotted in various ways to get rid of Overbury. The offer of a diplomatic post in Paris he refused, with insolence it seems. He was sent to the Tower, and there, through the instigation of Lady Essex, was poisoned, with circumstances of bungling cruelty, for, as we know in the Spanish case of Escovido, the science of poisoning was then quite in its infancy. Overbury died on September 15, 1613. His death provoked many elegies and gave popularity to his poem, The Wife, 1614, which is a very slight merit, and to his, characters, brief mordant sketches of types of men, in prose by Overbury and his friends. They appear to have been suggested rather by the characters of the Greek Theophrastus, than by Montaigne or Bacon. Some pieces are ideal, the good wife, and the charming, fair and happy milkmaid, worthy of Isaac Walton. She is never alone for she is still accompanied with old songs, honest thoughts, and prayers, but short ones. Thus lives she, and all her care is she may die in the springtime, to have store of flowers stuck upon her winding sheet. Most of the other characters are drawn in a mocking style. Of a mere scholar, we learn that the antiquity of his university is his creed, and the excellency of his college, though but for a match of football, an article of his faith. The mere fellow of a house, or don, with his airs of a man of the world, provokes the handsome courtier, an ex-undergraduate of Queen's. This on the scholar is good, university jests are his universal discourse and his news the demeanor of the proctors. Overbury jests at, the melancholy man. Melancholy, as Ben Jonson's master Stephen had proved, was the fashion. A curious proof of this is that, Niobe, of Stafford, 1611, a wonderful piece of railing at, the damnable times, of which a copy bears the arms of Charles I when Prince of Wales. Straggling thoughts, says Overbury, are the melancholy man's content, they make him dream waking, there's his pleasure. Translators Translation was a great, if not to the toilers a profitable industry between the reigns of Edward VI and James I. The wealth of classical, French, Spanish, and Italian learning, 
thought, and poetry was rapidly and strenuously conveyed into English, sometimes rough and ready, and rich in flowers of slang, sometimes replete with elegance and vigor. The translators certainly produced most idiomatic English, the ancients, in their versions, were not, as in reality, concise and classically self-restrained. There was, as a rule, no thought of minute accuracy. In fact, if some learned men were good Greek scholars, they did not write translations, the earlier translators in England used French and Italian versions of the Greek originals. Thus, Thomas Nichols did Thucydides, the greatest of Greek historians, out of a French translation of an Italian version of the difficult original, 1550. Nevertheless if you turn to the tragic pages on the utter ruin of the Athenian expedition to Sicily, the tale is still moving and rich in melancholy. Whoever be, R. was, Barnaby Rich. The translator of the first two books of Herodotus, including his account of, The Beastly Devices, as B. R. says, of the Egyptians, you cannot complain, as Macaulay did of another version, that Herodotus is, as flat as champagne in tumblers. B. R. uses slang, as, the Greeks were in the wrong box. Sir Thomas North, whose translation of Plutarch, 1579, Shakespeare uses in his Roman plays, merely rendered the French version by Amiot. Whereas Plutarch's Greek lives of great men are, though in manner quiet, not frigid, North, picturesque it everywhere. In fact these translators made Greeks and Romans speak as if they had come back to life and were writing in lusty Elizabethan England. Unluckily their volumes are not often to be picked up at bookstalls, and as magnificently printed in Tudor translations, they are expensive. It is strange that the great Athenian dramatists, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, and the comic Aristophanes, were left untranslated, probably because no contemporary foreign versions were easily procurable. What our ancestors knew of ancient tragedy was mainly through the rhetorical Roman imitations by Seneca. Of Plato scarce anything was translated. By 1600 Philemon Holland, born 1552, who actually went to the ancient originals for his texts, published his translation of Livy. As early as 1547 John Wilkinson Englished the Ethics of Aristotle, out of an Italian version. Philemon was rapid, racy, indefatigable. He translated Plutarch's Morals in a year, using but one quill. It was through Florio's English version that Shakespeare read Montaigne's essays. It is hardly necessary to name Richard Stanyhurst's Four Books of Virgil's Aeneid, 1582, written in hideous English hexameters. And Thomas Farr's Virgil, in Fourteeners, like Chapman's Homer, is even more helpless as a reproduction of The Stateliest Measure ever molded by the lips of man. Then Conington's modern version in the meters of The Lay of the Last Minstrel. It was clearly through Arthur Golding's translation of Ovid's Metamorphoses, 1567, for books in 1565, that Shakespeare knew Ovid best. Golding also did Caesar's De Bello Gallico, 1565, and Sir Henry Seville, provost of Eton, undertook Tacitus. Among books from foreign modern authors, William Painter's Palace of Pleasure, 1566-1567, with tales from Boccaccio, Queen Margaret of Navarre, Bondello, and Straparola, as well as from classical sources, was a treasure house of plots and situations for the playwrights. In the tragedies and comedies of the age, Italian characters are predominant. The Spanish novel of the roads and inns and adventures, Lazarillo de Tormes, was done out of Spanish in 1576, and set the example of this kind of fiction to Nash. Ariosto and Tasso were translated, the former by Sir John Harrington, 1591, the latter by Edward Fairfax, in 1600, and Richard Carew, but Dante was neglected. Of Chapman's Homer, elsewhere spoken of, seven books appeared in 1598, and Shakespeare either glanced at it for his Troilus and Cressida, or used, in places, a French or Latin version of Homer. It is impossible to enumerate all the translators, most of them are very readable, more so, in fact, than are most exact literal renderings of Greek and Latin originals into prose. The Authorized Version of the Bible 
The noblest and most enduring monument of Elizabethan prose is, of course, the authorized version of the Bible. The nature of the texts to be translated suppressed all tendency to willful conceits. A substratum of simple English from the time of Wycliffe's versions in Chaucer's day, and from Tyndall's learned rendering, was retained, the lofty poetry of the ancient prophets was echoed in English as stately, balanced, and harmonious. And if it be said that the English does not represent the speech of any one age in the life of England, we may reply that the original texts also are the work of a thousand years in different languages. Pulpit Eloquence It has often been remarked that sermons, in the 16th and 17th centuries, discharged one part of the function of the modern newspaper, though this is more true of Scotland than of England, and that sermons, where published, were a favorite form of reading. That is proved by their abundance in country house libraries, where old sermons usually occupy much valuable wall space, as they cannot be sold, and present an imposing array of calf-backed volumes. Our space does not permit us to do more than name the famous preachers of the Elizabethan age, such as Lancelot Andrews, 1555-1626, Bishop of Winchester under James I. James Usher, Archbishop of Armagh, 1581-1656, a man of varied learning who arranged the chronology of the Bible, Bishop Joseph Hall, 1574-1656, and Don whose prose has many of the merits and defects of his age. 22. Late Elizabethan and Jacobean Poets it may have occurred to the reader that the words which Ben Jonson quoted about Shakespeare, Suflaminandus erat, he flowed so freely that he needed stopping, indicate the great fault of Elizabethan and Jacobean literature. The authors did not know where to stop. The age was luxuriantly rich in genius, and was over wealthy in new ideas, gained from Greece, Rome, France, Spain, and Italy. From the clash of religions, the discoveries in the new world, and the rediscoveries of the treasures of the old world. What the English poets did not rediscover was the Greek lucidity, brevity, condensation, and orderliness. Even in plays of Shakespeare these graces are lacking, even Shakespeare's construction is not his strong point. The intellectual wealth of the poets tempted them to prolixity. The abundance of their ideas provoked them to that fashion of conceits, of comparisons between the things most remote in heaven, earth, and the world of fancy. There was a taste which reappears now and then in literature, from early Icelandic poetry to Browning and George Meredith, for willful abruptness, harshness, and obscurity. But industrious prolixity is not the fault of Don, whom we now approach, his error lay in harshness, obscurity, and a measureless indulgence in conceit. Through these the light which is in him is darkened. Meanwhile rank overabundance, the inability to stop, renders Daniel and Drayton and Phineas Fletcher burdensome, while Giles Fletcher crowds with conceits and points of wit a poem on the most sacred theme. These poets are not now commonly read, except in selections of their best things, and such selections give no idea of their pervading faults. When we extend our knowledge of the authors, and mark the formless character of the age in poetry, the sudden appearance of Milton indicates as great a miracle of genius as the existence of Chaucer, Spencer, and Shakespeare in the throng of their contemporaries. John Donne was born in London, in 1573. His father was an eminent ironmonger, of a Catholic family, his mother's kin, the Haywoods, had suffered much from Protestant persecution. One of them was the writer of interludes which amused the melancholy of Mary Tudor. John entered Hart Hall, Oxford, later Magdalen Hall, in 1584, he also studied at Cambridge, and entered Lincoln's Inn in 1592. A portrait of him in 1591 shows a young man holding the hilt of a very large rapier, and wearing a large earring shaped as a cross. He has a look of audacity, perhaps of sensuality, with a tinge of melancholy. He seems at this time to have studied the controversy between Catholics and Protestants, and in his epistle, rhymed heroic couplets, we perceive that he was of no fervent piety, but rather a doubter. His satires appear to have been written about 1593. They are obscure, and the versification is bad, apparently of set purpose. 
Often the reader is puzzled to guess how a line is meant to be scanned, the natural rules of accent are set at defiance, as Ben Jonson remarked. Probably Don aimed at imitating Perseus, the obscure young Roman satirist. The satires can scarcely be read except by curious students tracing the evolution of Don's thought and style. In 1596 he sailed with Essex to the victory over Spain at Cadiz. Before starting he wrote one of his poetical elegies to a lady with whom he had an intrigue. In 1597 he went on the island's voyage with Essex to capture plate ships. He experienced a tempest, was driven back to Falmouth, wrote the storm, and later, in the tropics, the calm. The men are roasted by the sun and bathe, then. From the sea into the ship we turn. Like parboiled wretches, on the coals to burn. The poems are rude in versification and exaggeration, but most vivid are their pictures of nature and the sea. Returning in the autumn of 1597, Don is supposed to have traveled in Italy and Spain, if it be not more probable that he visited these countries in 1592 to 1596. If Ben Jonson rightly said that Don wrote all his best pieces of verse before he was 25, they must have been finished by 1598. They were not printed till 1633, but circulated in manuscript. Probably most of the pieces in his elegies and songs and sonnets were composed in his tempestuous youth. The amorous conceits in The Flea are equally rich in ingenious fancies and in bad taste. Woman's Constancy and many other poems have the same moral burden as T was last night I swore to thee. That fond impossibility. To be constant. The sun is chidden for too early rising. Go tell court huntsmen that the king will ride. But leave lovers undisturbed. In The Indifferent he brags that he can love all sorts and conditions of women, like Lord Byron and other amorists. He finds in himself something like a heart, but rather rumpled. Of a later period, when he met his future wife, may be a charming song. Just such disparity. As is, twixt air and angel's purity. Twixt women's love and men's will ever be. But the elegies address ladies of whose nature purity is no part, and it may be admitted that the confessions do not win admiration for Don's taste and temper, not to mention his morals, when he wrote them. The curse on a woman, or a man who loves his mistress, far outdoes the epodes of Horace in cold ferocity. The bait contains remarks on the cruelty of angling which must have vexed Isaac Walton to the heart. Love's deity, opening with the charmed lines. I long to talk with some old lover's ghost. Who died before the god of love was born. Thence descends into crabbed and difficult conceits. Two songs, the funeral, and the relic, are on a bracelet of his mistress's hair, whoever exhumes the poet's body will find. A bracelet of bright hair about the bone. These verses of Don's disturbed and adventurous youth, poems ingenious, conceited, passionate, mystical, or cynical, have not the music as a bird songs which rings in the lyrists of that age, nor have the epithalamia the charm of Spencer's. Don in youth was not at ease with himself, he speculates too curiously. He may try to play the sensualist, but there is a dark backward in his genius, there are chords not in tune with mirth and pleasure. He is as unique as Browning, as little like other poets. If his elegies contain, as has been supposed, the story of a love affair, it was of a nature to make him uneasy. In 1597 Don became secretary of the Lord Keeper, Sir Thomas Edgerton, and met his niece, and Moore, daughter of Sir George Moore, lieutenant of the Tower. He married her secretly at the end of 1601, and therefore was imprisoned in the Fleet Jail, in February, 1602, thanks to the lady's angry father, who soon after forgave the young lovers. By 1601 he had begun, The Progress of the Soul, or Metempsychosis, The Adventures of a Soul, placed in most shapes, 34 for example, in that fabulous and mortuary weed, a mandrake, in the row of a fish, in a sparrow, and so forth. All to little purpose. He was unemployed, eager for employment, given to writing long letters, and laments for deaths in verse, and he assisted in a controversy with the Catholics. 
Now come such more or less theological works as Pseudo Martyr, Ignatius his Conclave, and Biathanatos, the first, 1610, is addressed to the king, who finally induced Don to take holy orders. Divine poems he also wrote, but he was not anxious to be a professional divine. Don's conceits were daring to the border of profanity. A visit to Paris with his patron, Sir Robert Drury, while Mrs. Don was about to become a mother, was marked by a telepathic experience. Don saw his wife, then in England, with a dead baby in her arms. Walton says that the day of the vision was that of the child's birth and death, but the dates do not bear out the statement. Walton's remark that Drury sent an express messenger to England, to inquire about Mrs. Don, is certainly untrue. In honor of a daughter of Drury who died young, Don had written two extraordinary poems, the first anniversary of the decease was published in 1611, the second anniversary was written in 1612. There seemed reason to fear that Don would celebrate Miss Drury, whom he had never seen, once a year, while his life endured. The poem as a whole is, an anatomy, of the world, wherein, by occasion of the death of Mistress Elizabeth Drury, the frailty and decay of this whole world is represented. Don indulges in an exaggeration of hyperbole equaled only by the ancient Irish bards who sang the feats of Cuchulain. For example, when Elizabeth joined the saints. This world and that great earthquake languished. For in a common bath of tears it bled. An allusion to Seneca bleeding to death in a bath full of hot water. This manner of hyperbole flourished after Don's time, infecting Crashaw and others. For there's a kind of world remaining still. As Don admits. Poetry on the deplorable brevity of life and the instability of things may be excellent, and that instability is the theme of Don, but Mistress Drury is harped upon too much. And Don was taking this paragon on trust. She whose rich eyes and breast gilt the West Indies and perfumed the East. It is impossible to understand how a poet, now of the mature age of thirty-nine, could write in this fashion if he had any humor. The second anniversary dwelt on the incommodities of the soul in this life, and her exaltation in the next. Don says that the world still has a semblance of life, as when the eyes and tongue of a decapitated man twinkle and roll, while he grasps his hands and he pulls up his feet. So struggles this dead world. Without Elizabeth, whom Don never saw. There are good lines such as her pure and eloquent blood spoke in her cheeks and the satiric remarks on a spongy slack divine who drinks and sucks in th instructions of great men. In return for these poems Drury housed and took care of Don and his large family. The poet now became the adviser of the Earl of Somerset in the hideous suit of nullity, and, when things went against Somerset, who had done nothing for him, Don proposed to publish his poems in a few copies. I apprehend some incongruities in the resolution, and indeed, as Don at this moment intended to take holy orders, which he did in January, 1615, he was wise in breaking his resolution. He now obtained some clerical appointments, but in August, 1617, lost his wife. There is little doubt that his grief changed him from a worldly man into a man of heartfelt piety, the man whom Isaac Walton knew and adored. His holy sonnets, written at this time, have some noble almost Miltonic passages, mingled with lines that cannot be made to scan, and with hyperbolical conceits. Thus, though thou my thirst hast fed, a holy thirsty dropsy melts me yet. He requests the American explorers to lend him new seas, so that he may drown his world in tears of penitence. He makes, yet, rhyme to, spirit. The excuse made for such things is that Don thought Elizabethan poetry too dulcet. He is a poet by flashes, which are very brilliant with strange colored fires. He is not really so obscure as he is reckoned, he can be understood, though Ben Jonson, who esteemed him the first poet in the world in some things, added that, Don from not being understood would perish. Don died on March 31, 1631. His poetry, styled by Dr. Johnson, metaphysical, exercised an influence not wholly favorable on his successors, 
happily it did not affect Lovelace and Herrick. Minor Lyrists In the Elizabethan age it might almost be said that every man was his own poet. The name of poet became a term of contempt, as we learn from Ben Jonson and other sources. Of the best lyrists we have spoken in treating of the dramatists, of Sidney, Raleigh, and the chief sonneteers. Another sonneteer is Thomas Watson, an Oxford man, an ally to Spencer's circle, 15571592. His Hecatompathia, 1582, and Tears of Fancy, posthumously published, are sonnets, either in formal or formal in structure, the Hecatompathia mainly consists of translations from modern languages. Watson had learning in some skill, but not much natural music in his soul. Henry Constable, a Yorkshire man and a Catholic, may have been born about 1562 or earlier, judging by his degree taken at Cambridge in 1580. He passed much of his life abroad, and, on his return, part of it in the Tower, in the last years of Elizabeth. His sonnets, Diana, 1592-1594, are pleasing, more tunable than many sonnets of his own and the succeeding age. Others have been exhumed from manuscript, some are devotional. Willoughby's Avisa, the sonnet sequences usually bore girls' names, would be forgotten but for the magic initials W.S. and allusions to W.S. love affairs. He may have been William Shakespeare, or he may have been Walter Smith, or William Smith, author of another such book as Avisa, Chloris, 1596. With him may pair off Lynch, with Diella, and Griffin with Fidessa, love sonneteers. Richard Barnfield, 1574-1627, an Oxford man, was fertile in 1594-1598, publishing The Affectionate Shepherd, 1594, Cynthia, 1595, The Encomian of Lady Pecunia, 1598. The Shepherd is much too affectionate for Christian and Northern tastes, in the style of Virgil's second eclogue. That horrid one. Beginning with Formosum Pastor Corridon. As Byron describes it. In Cynthia, he enthusiastically admires Spencer. If he wrote the sonnet, If Music and Sweet Poetry Agree, which appears in poems published with Lady Pecunia, and the charming, as it fell upon a day, often ascribed to Shakespeare, in the miscellany England's Helicon. Barnfield was among the true lyrists of his time. Lady Pecunia, is a satire on what wealth can do, and the complaint of poetry for the death of liberality, a satire on what it does not usually care to do. He made experiments in English hexameters, after the age of twenty-four he ceased to write or ceased to publish. Thomas Campion, died in 1620, was, fortunately, a more persevering poet. Though his name was hardly known to modern readers till of recent years, because his lyrics were mainly published with music of his own composition, he was one of the most exquisite and delightful singers in the whole of English literature. Born in London, he went in 1581 to Peterhouse, Cambridge, left in 1585, and entered Gray's Inn in 1586. Five of his poems appear in a miscellany of 1591, his Latin poems are of 1595. In 1601 appeared his first Book of Airs, the music by himself and his friend Philip Rossetter. In 1602 he put forth Observations on the Art of English Poesy, written, strange as it appears, in favor of verses in quantitative meters, without rhyme. He had taken the degree of Doctor of Medicine, he also wrote, 1613, three masks, one was for the wedding of the Princess Elizabeth, the Queen of Hearts, another was for the shameful nuptials of the Earl of Somerset and Francis Howard. Stained as they were with vice, vulgarity, and murder. Campion's later, Books of Heirs, are of 1612 and 1617. He died in March, 1619-1620. Some of Campion's lyrics may have been suggested by and adapted to his own music, in other cases he composed the music for his own words. He employs a great number of meters, all tunable, with him music and sweet poesy agree. To think of these songs, as Thackeray said of some of Scott's novels, is to wish to run to the bookshelves, take them down and read them. Nothing can be more charming than the verses on The Fairy Queen, Proserpina, and Give Beauty All Her Right. 
Silly boy, tis full moon yet. Thy night as day shines clearly. Now let her change I and spare not. Since she proves strange, I care not. Kind are her answers. But her performance keeps no day. Breaks time, as dancers. From their own music when they stray. Drayton. Michael Drayton, born at Harts Hill in Warwickshire, 1563, died 1631, is a poet of nearly the same character and caliber as Daniel, of whom later, with the same beginnings as a sonneteer, the same prolixity in versifying history. And the same steady laborious cast of mind. From the age of ten, as he tells us, he was bent on being a poet, and like greater poets, Burns, for example, he was usually inspired by some model, which, unlike Burns, he did not transfigure and excel. His earliest work, The Harmony of the Church, 1591, contains rhymed paraphrases of biblical songs and prayers. Drayton, like Milton, addresses the heavenly muse, singing, not of toys on Mount Ida, but of triumphs on Mount Shown. Thus from Exodus 15, the triumph over Egypt. The Lord Jehovah is a man of war. Pharaoh, his chariots, and his mighty host. Were by his hand in the wild waters lost. His captains drowned in Red Sea so far. In 1593 appears his Shepherd's Garland. Spencer had made shepherds fashionable, and eclogues were the mode. In one, Beta, Queen Elizabeth was praised, in another, Sir Philip Sidney was lamented. The work, with improvements, was republished in 1606. The Ballad of Dousabel was a pleasant and fortunate addition. And Gudra, later Lady Rainsford, a daughter of Drayton's patron, Sir Henry Gudra, is the person named Idea, in the sonnets collected under that title. If the one famous and immortal sonnet. Since there's no help, come, let us kiss and part. Be really by Drayton, he here showed mastery, and the addresses to Idea may not be mainly fanciful. Another sonnet on rivers, Drayton's favorite theme in the Polyalbion, identifies Idea's home, so far she was certainly a real person. But there are critics who deny to him. Since there's no help, come, let us kiss and part. It has even been attributed to Shakespeare, because of its excellence. Following Daniel's, Complaint of Rosamond, Drayton versified the stories of Piers Gaveston, Matilda, daughter of Lord Robert Fitzwater, Robert Duke of Normandy, and, the great Cromwell, Thomas. Like Daniel, he gave little sack to a monstrous deal of bread, in a close following of prose chronicles. Mortimeriados, 1596, is another legend, in rhyme royal, of the wars of the barons against the second and third Edwards, later recast as, the Baron's Wars, in an eight-line stanza. The English heroical epistles, were a following of the letters of Ovid's heroines, there are twelve lovers and ladies, each writes a letter and receives a reply. Rosamond, Jane Shore, and Geraldine are, naturally, among the ladies. Drayton employs the rhyme decasyllabic couplet, and adds learned notes, comparing, for example, the maze of Rosamond to the Nauschen labyrinth of the Minotaur in Crete. The verses are curiously modern in some places. The poet now did work for Henslow and the stage. Like Daniel he wrote a panegyric of the new king, James VI and I, in 1603, it brought him no advancement, and in the next year he made, the ol, the mouthpiece of a satire, opening with the outworn dream formula which had so long haunted verse. In 1606 he attempted odes, the best known is on, the Virginian voyage, Virginia is a paradise, doubtless the laurel is indigenous, and Drayton foresees a Virginian poet, possibly Edgar Poe, in a way a Virginian. By the famous patriotic, Ballad of Agincourt, Drayton holds his most secure title to popularity. He had long been working at his, Poly Albion, in which the rivers of England, and the great events which occurred in their valleys, are celebrated. The first thirteen books were published in 1612 to 1613. Drayton's best muse is the patriotic. He was not encouraged by the reception of the book, reprinted with twelve new songs in 1622, and unhappily he stopped at the Cumberland Eden, and did not, like Richard Frank in prose. Celebrate the Scottish rivers from the debatable land to the neighbor. 
Drayden's ambling Alexandrian couplets are, at least, interesting to the angler, for he has a minute knowledge of even such burns as the Roaring Yardy, Mark the Yar, as in Cretan and Greek Jardness, Yarrow, and the Australian Yarra Yarra, and the Troutful Mimram, which he calls the Mimer. Had Drayden spoken more particularly of the streams, and been less copious in endeavors, the battle in to bring, battles Celtic, or of the many civil wars, his poem would have more attractions. History, copious and minute, is a stumbling block to poetry in Drayton, and as to history, the public, he says, take a great pride to be ignorant thereof, the idle humorous world must hear of nothing that savors of antiquity. Perhaps the idle world was more kind to the playful poem Nymphidia, 1627, where Titania, to the wrath of Oberon, woos a new bottom, Pigwigan. The tripping measure is that of Chaucer's Sir Thopas, the fairy queen's equipage is thus described. Her chariot of a snail's fine shell, which for the colors did excel. The fair queen Mab becoming well. So lively was the limbing. The seat the soft wool of the bee. The cover, gallantly to see. The wing of a pea-wide butterfly. I trow, was ample trimming. The venerable and undefeated singer returned to pastoral, the quest of Cynthia, and, 1630, gave, the muses Elysium, full of pretty innocent ditties, while, Noah's flood, is naturally in a more solemn strain, as are, Moses. His birth and miracles, and, David and Goliath. These prolix paraphrases do not greatly improve on the heroic prose of Genesis and Samuel. Drayton died in 1631, and was buried in Westminster Abbey, but not in the poet's corner. Daniel Samuel Daniel is one more of the poets whose names linger on in histories of literature because they were contemporaries of Shakespeare and Spencer and may more or less have taken Eliza and R. James. A privately printed edition of 150 copies of Daniel's works, edited by Dr. Grossart, keeps his laurels green in such abundance as his intrinsic literary merits deserve. He seems to have been born near Taunton about 1562-63, his father is described as a music master, he was at Oxford for three years or thereabouts. He published a translation of a tract by Paulus Jovius, of rare inventions both military and amorous called Impres, in 1585. He was patronized by Sidney's sister, Pembroke's mother, and resided at Wilton, where she received much literary society and he may have enjoyed excellent trout fishing in the Natter and the Wiley. In 1591 he commenced poet with 27 of the stereotyped love sonnets, not in the regular Petrarchian form, which appeared and signed in Nash's edition of Astrophel. In 1592 to 1594, three editions, amended, were published. The collection is entitled Delia. So sounds my muse according as she strikes. On my heartstrings attuned unto her fame. Probably Delia did not strike her Samuel's heartstrings with much skill and vigor. What though my muse no honor got thereby? Each bird sings to herself, and so will I. With Delia appeared a long and very tedious complaint of Rosamond, who sleeps in Godstow near Oxford. The piece is in stanzas of seven lines, and is as woeful as the mirror for magistrates. The abbey built by the credulous devout and apt-believing ignorant was already ruined by the great pillage, and the melancholy place by the grey waters is Rosamond's only monument. Her ghost left Daniel, to prosecute the tenor of my woes, there is abundance of moral but very little of music in Rosamond's complaint. Daniel visited Italy about 1592, and in 1594 published Cleopatra, a tragedy in imitation of Seneca, with a chorus. The chorus commences thus. Now every mouth can tell. What close was muttered. How that she did not well. To take the course she did. The prologue and the chorus are the first act. Naturally in Senecan drama Cleopatra does not commit suicide on the stage. A messenger narrates the moving incident in 250 rhyming verses. In 1595 appeared the first four books of Daniel's Civil Wars. A fifth book came out in 1599. In 1600 the poet became tutor to Lady and Clifford, 
but he longed to return to his muse, and did so in 1602. His civil wars were now a seven years' war, and he achieved Book VI. In 1603 he addressed a panegyric to James VI and I, the new king, he obtained a court post in connection with the Queen's masks, and held his place and salary till 1618, wrote a history of England, and died at Beckington, Somerset, in 1619. He had written masks, and a defense of rhyme, against the friends of unrhymed verse in classical meters. His civil wars are a chronicle in rhyme, he spares neither himself nor the infrequent reader. Daniel opens by stating that had England devoted herself solely to fighting abroad, she might have annexed Europe to the Alps, the Rhine, and the Pyrenees. But this is an error, in 1429 the tide of English conquest recoiled from the standard of the maid, and even before the civil wars at home England had failed to hold the lawyer. The poem traces civil war from Richard II onwards to Edward IV, and, as Aristotle rightly said, an epic poem cannot be written in that way. Daniel was an excellent man. A most industrious author, and we may say of him in the words of his own epistle to Lord Henry Howard. Virtue, though luckless, yet shall escape contempt. And though it hath not hap, it shall have fame. Daniel had little of the exuberant fantasy of his time, he is, well-languaged Daniel, and easily intelligible. But even his most frequently quoted sonnet. Care charmer sleep, son of the sable knight is far from being one of the best of poetic hymns to sleep, and his best gnomic poem. He that of such a height hath built his mind. Is far too long. Davies. Sir John Davies, of Tisbury in Wilts, was born about 1569, we may suppose, if he went to Queen's, Oxford, in 1585. As a young Templar he is said to have been a brawler, and to have been expelled from the Society for his vivacities in 1598. In 1599 Davies published his Nos Typesum, Know Thyself, on the nature and properties of the soul and on its immortality. The psychology may be old-fashioned, but the versification is not. Only the best poets of the age could write the four-line decasyllabic verses, with alternate rhymes, with the fluency and harmony of Davies. He has an answer to all objections. But still this crew with questions me pursues. If souls deceased, say they, still living be. Why do they not return, to bring us news? Of that strange world where they such wonder see? Why do not the Eskimo visit us and tell us about the North Pole? Davies replies, not quite convincingly. Henry Moore or Glanville would have answered that souls do return, and made the question one of evidence. Davies's, the orchestra, on dancing, is extremely graceful, melodious and ingenious, the stanzas describing Queen Elizabeth dancing, high and disposedly, are unfortunately lost. Even his acrostics on, Elizabetha Regina, are charming, and wonderfully varied in ornament and compliment, as Verde de Societe none of that age are more admirable. Davies returned to the temple, rose in his profession, sat in the House of Commons, was admired by James VI for his poetry, was knighted, and in 1606 became Attorney General in Ireland. In 1612 he published a valuable book on the Irish question, which should be read with that of Spencer. He died after his return to England, Parliament, and the defence of the cause of an Irish Parliament for Ireland, in 1626. Giles and Phineas Fletcher Drayton and Daniel were not influenced by their great forerunner Spencer, as were the two clerical brothers and poets, Phineas, born 1582, and Giles Fletcher, born 1588. They were the sons of Giles Fletcher, author of Leda, one of the many collections of sonnets published in 1593. He was a scholar, a man of business, and a diplomatist. Christ's Victory and Triumph, 1610, the chief poem of the younger Giles is in stanzas one line shorter than the Spenserian. It begins by observing that the infinite far greater grew by growing less, so that twere greatest were it none at all, as in the case of the other poet whose wound was so great because it was so small. Thus does an unhappy point of wit, a conceit, disturb the reader at the opening of a poem on the same solemn theme as Milton's Paradise Regained. 
the poet admits us to the councils of eternity, and thus sets forth the topic of his sacred song. The stanza is a fair example of his manner. Ye sacred writings, in whose antique leaves The memories of Heaven in treasured lie Say what might be the cause that mercy heaves The dust of sin above th industrious sky And lets it not to dust and ashes fly Could justice be of sin so overwooed Or so great ill be cause of so great good That, bloody man to save, man's saviour shed his blood The phrase that mercy heaves. The dust of sin above th industrious sky. Is typical of late Elizabethan mannerism. Heaves is used to rhyme to leaves, the dust of sin is apparently the redeemed soul, why the sky is industrious, except as a kind of pun on the preceding dust, is not apparent. We are to wonder why the dust of sin is not allowed to fly to dust and ashes, in short a solemn and sacred poem can hardly be written in a style more unhappily out of keeping. When the fate of fallen man is trembling in the balance, mercy smooths the wrinkles of the father's brow, and justice, observing this with displeasure, it is like a Homeric quarrel of Athene and Aphrodite. Throws herself between mercy and the father, like a vapor from a mori slough, and begins a virulent invective against that wretch, beast, caitiff, monster man, who, in Egypt, is disgracing himself by animal worship, while in Greece. Neptune spews out the lady Aphrodite. Your songs exceed your matter, says Giles to other poets. This of mine, the matter which it sings, shall make divine. Alas! The poem, though it has fine occasional passages, some music, and much energy, is written in a style of conceits, and of ingenious antitheses, which are wholly out of accord with the matter. We cannot but see that the poet, in regard to taste, is wholly lost, is too much a child of his time, so rich in everything but perception of form and limit, so fantastically over-adorned in verse as in vesture. Giles wrote of Phineas as The Kentish lad, that lately taught. His Odin read the trumpet's silver sound. Phineas did this in his vast allegorical poem, The Purple Island, 1633, The Human Body. His stanzas are of seven lines, the first four rhyming alternately, the last three have all the same rhyme. Both poets imitate Spencer with a difference in stanza, and a notable difference in genius. Both have musical passages, and both anticipate Milton in their choice of sacred subjects. Quarles saluted Phineas as the Spencer of this age. Phineas is the more musical, but also by far the more lengthy of these Kentish swains. His piscatory eclogues follow Spencer's pastorals. They are of a moral tendency and would not have interested Isaac Walton. The fisher, in salt water there are no anglers, is born to sweat to freeze, to watch, to fast, to toil. Phineas attacks the indolent clergy, as Milton did. They are a crew of idle grooms, idle and bold that never saw the seas. It is probable that Milton, as a Cambridge man, and a man with views like those of Phineas, was well acquainted with the poems of both the Fletchers, which are in fact the sunken stepping stone from Spencer to Milton. The Puritanism of Phineas's long poem, The Locusts or Apollyonists, 1627, preludes to the Civil War. The poet will tell. Of priests, oh no. Mass priests, priests cannibal. And. Thou purple whore, mounted on scarlet beast. Namely the Church of Rome. Satan says. Meantime I burn, I broil, I burst with spite. As the Puritans in fact, between fear of popery and hatred of Laud and his measures, were actually broiling and bursting. Satan, however, is vexed by the triumphs of Protestantism in England. His fiends form Jesuits out of matter, foul hearts, seared consciences, feet swift to blood, and all this when Jesuit missionaries were dying under unspeakable tortures at the hands of the Iroquois. While Catholics were being hanged in England, and dreaded a massacre in Scotland, Phineas ends loyally. Thrice happy who that whore shall doubly pay. 
This, royal Charles, this be thy happy meed. Unhappy Charles who found in the Catholics his most loyal subjects. It is easy but erroneous to confuse the Piscatory Dialogues of Phineas with his drama, Sislides, a Piscatory, acted at King's College, Cambridge, published, 1631. The dialogue is partly in rhymed heroic couplets of much fluency and partly in prose, the play is of a happier date, 1614, than The Apollonists, and is written in a merry pin. Phineas wrote many other things, including a pretty bashful epithalamium. Corbett. Richard Corbett, 1582-1635, born at Yule in Surrey, and educated at Westminster and Christ Church, Oxford, was a merry clergyman, who laughed at but did not abuse Puritans, was liked at court, and successively held the sees of Oxford and Norwich. In Aubrey's gossip there are well-known tales about the bishop's gaieties, and his rhymes on a tour to Paris and on another in the north were reckoned choicely facetious. His best poem has lost nothing in the course of time. Farewell rewards and fairies. Good housewives now may say. For now foul sluts in dairies. Do fare as well as they. There is also a pretty piece to his son Vincent, on attaining his third birthday. Corbett's humorous pieces have much more vigor than refinement, his verses were not intended for publication, and did not appear till ten years after his death. Sir John Beaumont Sir John Beaumont was the elder brother of Francis Beaumont, the celebrated partner of Fletcher in the drama. He was born, 1582, at Grace Dew in Leicestershire, was of Broadgates Hall, now Pembroke College, in Oxford, 1596, lived chiefly at his country place, was created a baronet in 1626, and died in 1628. A sacred poem of his, The Crown of Thorns, in eight books, is lost, his Bosworth Field with other pieces was brought out by his eldest son, in 1629, and dedicated to Charles I. Ben Jonson, in Prefatory Verses, wrote. This book will live, it hath a genius. Above his reader. Few readers are below the level of the poem, which Ben calls. The bound and frontier of our poesy. Bosworth Field is written in rhyming decasyllabic couplets, which come near to the measure as later used for heroic and satiric poetry, though the lines sometimes carry on the sense in the style disused by Pope. The story of the death of Richard III, disdaining to fly, is spirited, though it cannot rival the old ballad on the same subject. In translations from the Satires of Horace, Beaumont comes nearer to the model of Dryden and Pope. An Ode of the Blessed Trinity is perhaps the most pleasing of the sacred poems. Beaumont could have taught much to the royal prentice in verse, James I, whom he salutes as his master. Your judicious rules have been my guide. He translated the tenth satire of Juvenal and wrote many verses to friends and elegies. William Brown, born about 1590-91, of a Devonshire family, went to Exeter College, Oxford, and to the Inns of Court. In 1613 he published the first part of his Britannia's Pastorals, with commendatory verses, including some, more cautious than usual, by Ben Jonson. The Pastorals have the usual defects of the obsolete kind of composition and of Brown's own age of conceits. They are extremely prolix, very artificial, rich in classical allusions, and occasionally in puns. The rhymed decasyllabic couplets carry on the sense, as was usual before Waller and Pope. The Shepherd's Pipe is a collection of eclogues and dialogues between long-winded shepherds, in a variety of meters. The popular tale of the Father's Bequests, The Ring, Cloth, and Brooch of Magical Qualities, is told in stanzas of seven lines. The swains occasionally conduct themselves very like our liberal shepherds. At other times their songs of nature and the birds are pretty and pleasing. A pastoral elegy for Mr. Thomas Elwood is an elegy and pastoral, in these respects alone it resembles Lycidas. In The Inner Temple Mask, taken from the Odyssey about Ulysses and Circe, the siren's song and Circe's charm are pretty, but not on the highest level of the contemporary lyrics. About 1624 Brown is said to have been the tutor at Oxford of the Honourable Robert Dormer, afterwards Earl of Carnarvon, 
who fell, on the Royalist side, at Newbury in 1643, the date of Brown's own death is unknown. His poems seem never to have been popular. In the vast realm of Spencer can be found all the merits of Brown on a far higher level. And Brown's defects, for he even drops into the allegoric style which dominated the latter Middle Ages and seemed immortal, are exceedingly abundant in all the pastoral verse between Spencer and Milton. George Wither, 1588-1667, was one of the poets who wrote too much and lived too long. Only his song, Shall I Wasting in Despair, can be said to live, despite his pleasant fluency in love of country contentments in Fillerite, 1622, Fidelia, and The Shepherd's Hunting, 1615. He was among the favorites of Charles Lamb, who discovered the neglected poet, the laughingstock of the wits of the Restoration. He is also highly praised by Swinburne in a most interesting essay, Charles Lamb and George Wither. Wither is sometimes good, always copious.